blubbering block. Now, at this point, this is the pre-sigmoid dura. Now I am into in correspondence or cerebellar point I name one underneath. So if I, if I keep drilling in here, I will lose the hearing. I can keep myself peri. That's why we practice a lot to do peri labyrinthine approach, which is sparing the hearing. If I have the same advantage in working around, basically I cut the dura coming across this the, uh, um, the uh, endolymphatic sac. Coming across the dura, pre sigmoid dura, coming across the superior pterygoid sinus, and cut into the, the infratemporal uh, version of the. So now, for example, the labyrinth here, at this point, labyrinth has not been taken yet. Now it's taken. You can see now this is the space where the labyrinth used to be, much better exposure, but as a result, the price I had to pay is losing the hearing, right? But the beautiful view is completely unobstructed view. So if I, the, the hearing is already lost because of the lesion, this is the best approach for the cerebellar point anemia because I don't need any retraction whatsoever. This is the flocculus, seven and eight, the fifth. And you can see here underneath this piece of dura is going to be the, the nine, and, nine and ten. Yeah. So glass pharyngeal and vagus underneath it. Right? So basically, transparency, that's why I call X ray vision. You, a good surgeon needs to practice this, understanding where <clears throat> all structures are underneath the bone. Look at these old structures, and and uh, you can see now it's beautiful and obstructed you all the way down to the cerebellar point that angle. But you can see exactly where everything is. That's what you have to achieve by possibly working with the cadaver on, the, or it's difficult to get this one on a patient. I, I mean, I would definitely not encourage to do that. Right? The transcochlear means, again, this is something we used to do a lot before, and I used to do a lot myself, uh, because in, when I was working and in consulting in South America, in different countries, there were ENT at that time were not doing uh, any transcochlear. So I had to do, I was facing a lot of, uh, I was facing a lot of uh, big, large scalp based lesion. So I had to, to do this one myself. That's why I practiced a lot to do transcochlear. And this means transposing the patient out of the way, basically. Nowadays, it's very rarely is used. I hardly use anymore. Just when I'm really dealing with something particular, total pretrosectomy. And by it's a beautiful approach because once you displace the fissional nerve and you have the prize, you may have some palsy of the fissional nerve, particularly at the beginning when you're not very, you know, very experienced. But as you experience it, you practice more, the chances of get some complication get less and less and less. Basically, the concept is lifting the trochlear, the fissure nerve from the fallopian canal all the way to the genical ganglion, and finally cutting the GSPN, freeing the genical ganglion, and uh, transposing posteriorly the, the entire fissure nerve, as you can see. Now, finally, I have the cochlea, so I cut the cochlea, that's why I transcochlear, and then I die, it gives me a beautiful exposure all the way down to the basal artery. So you can see there is no obstruction whatsoever as opposed to the translab, which I have the fish and I'm in the middle. So my superior limit now is the trigemina as before. The inferior limit is nine and 10. I have no limit until. So I can work with two hands, no brain retraction. Everything is immediate exposed. Yeah? And basically the dissection is exactly the same as translab up to a point in which now is the difference. Look, now I dislodge genital ganglion. I transpose the fish and nerve posteriorly and I go in this corridor all the way immediate to the trapezius carotid. You can see this is inferior pedrosa, superior pedrosa, basilar plexus, and go all the way down to the basilar. And the point is just transposing out of the way the fish are Look, just by doing that, I can work with two hands all the way. So this is a beautiful approach. And again, if you already lost the hearing, if you got or total pedrosectomy, it's definitely an incredible approach to go all the way down to the, to the basilar and to the, to the Clios, me portion clio. This is the sixth nerve, which is coming along the brain stem, getting to the, the Dorellos canal. And again, this anatomy is very important to understand in order to be able to do this. And you can see this is a typical aneurysm. Well, this is done, I, I did this, sorry, this is done many years ago, and it basically gives you an unobstructed view of the nowadays a better, better option to do this one, but just in case. It's a good egg to have in your basket, just in case those few cases in which you really need, there's no other alternative. It's good to know how to do it. But again, there's no use any 
Now it's been very much replaced by this approach, which is a combined supra inferentorial subtemporal three sigmoid trans. -oid. It's a lot of names. Basically, what it means, I combine the trans mastoid, which we done the posterior petrosectomy, with the anterior petrosectomy, or with this just a subtemporal. And instead of cutting the labyrinth, I keep the labyrinth in place. I work around the labyrinth. The only difference I cut the dentorium. So basically, I go infradentorium, supradentorium, right? So if I want to project this one on a skull, basically, this is the approach. The blue one, you can see this is the way I'm outlining now. So basically, I combine the posterior perosectomy with the subtemporal, and I can do even anterior perosectomy if I want. And the only thing I work around the difference with the posterior perosectomy, I leave the labyrinth in place. So I, I spare the I spare the, the hearing, right? So the position is exactly the same. The only thing is extending anteriorly. I can do the skin incision in different. I don't want to be dogmatic, I don't take this as a dogma. This is just the orientation. But this I can be doing this one at different, as long as I respect the anatomy of the skin and the, uh, the vascularization. Look, this is uh, once you encompass both, you can see the posterior fossa, retro sigmoid, and this is the temporal lobe in uh, infra I mean the temporal temporal lobe here in on the subtemporal um, trajectory. And then exactly what I said, look at mastoid approach, leaving intact the labe. And then I can combine with anterior pedosectomy, which you've already seen before, but the only difference basically, look, I leave the labe intact, right? Leave the labyrinth in here and do pre sigmoid subtemporal, and I can get like, this is the dura cut pre sigmoid subtemporal. The labyrinth is still there, so I, I open the dura in this way, crossing the superior petrosal sinus. And you can see the beautiful and obstructed view. That's a nice view. The labyrinth is still here, so the patient you know, hypothetically is still uh, the, the hearing is intact. I can see from just to orient the anatomy, this is uh, up to here is sub. Tentor, infratentorial is supratentorial, this is the fifth nerve, seven and eight, nine and ten, eleven, six nerve down there. So this is a supratentorial compartment with the fourth, and uh, this is the ICA, SCA. In, this is the fifth, which is the fifth is the cutoff for supra infratentorial compartment. So everything inferior to the fifth is infratentorial, supratentorial. The dura is open all around. This you can see the supradentorial compartment is the trigeminal. This is the, the, the relation between the, the free edge of the dentorium and the fourth. This is the, the oculomotor motor nerve. This is the, the dura incision. You can see this. Uh, it's very nice to see this. Uh, uh, it's missing the first one, but this is uh, the, the dual incision is coming from the posterior compartment into the anterior trajectory. As you can see, it goes all the way down to the inferior pedal sinus. And once it's open against the entire uh, cerebellar pontine angle with the infra supradentorial compartment all the way to the clivus. So this is a beautiful approach, which is spared the labyrinth. So that the, the, the one is mostly common. You, why I use this a lot of time for petroclival lesion, other than using any more uh, invasive approach. Now let's see a little bit more the posterior fossa. Now we go a little bit more posterior. Uh, so basically, for exposure are most important. Basically, we have the uh, midline approaches, supra cerebella, which is the one posterior. We're going to consider this one separately. Then we have exposure to the fourth ventricle, upper brainstem, pineal region. Uh, <clears throat> plus, we have the lateral suboccipital approaches, which is this one that goes to cerebellar point and angle. And then we have the, the upper lateral suboxima. This is the extreme lateral supracerebellar approach, which is called a little bit more lateral, right? So we go all the supra cerebellar infradentorial, which is this the projection of the median and paramedian. This is supracerebellar infradentorial, which is extreme lateral. This is suboccipital, lateral suboccipital or retro sigmoid, which is different modification. I'm going to go through all this modification. It'll take two days. To work the, to, to talk about all the approaches, right? Or it's synthesized a little bit. And this is the midline suboccipital approach for any lesion on the fourth ventricle or posterior for an magnum and stuff like that. 
So now we're considering the posterior post approach. So basically, we're closing the circle as far as posterior. Um, and as you can see here, the approach is basically we're going to consider are going to be the retro sigmoid, which is the most popular, which has different modification will be upper retro sig, middle retro sig, inferior retro sig, or the entire retro sigmoid, which is, can be called as well suboccipital, lateral suboccipital. We're going to consider the foramen magnum lesion more inferior to the retro sig, which is going to be the far lateral, and the old supracerebral inclinatory approach, which is uh, the median. Uh, midline, the median, paramedian, and lateral approaches, right? The retro sigma is extremely popular. Um, and again, it's been, as I mentioned before, has been replacing the midline suboxial approach, which used to be used a lot before for accessing lesion, which was even not only for the posterior foramen magnum, but also for lesion where more lateral and more anterior in the foramen magnum aim to the cerebral point anymore. So now can you imagine the long surgical route, that's why it is much more feasible, much better, much less retraction of the cerebellum. It still has a lot of limitations. Indication of pontine cover normal, pica aneurysm, uh, SCA aneurysm, uh, CPA tumor, uh, microvascular decompression on five and seven, foramen magnum lesion, particularly with C1 laminectomy. Right? Limitation uh, is the, the limit imposed by the imposed by the working angles, right? But the working angles because particularly if you want to go all use this trajectory to go all the way down to the pterocliver region, to the clivus, you need to work in between the cranial nerves and you need to push posteriorly, medially a lot the cerebellar hemisphere. That's why, and then you end up working on the like brainstem as well. So if you want to go to anterior, uh, it's objectable, although a lot of people use it and they master this trajectory. Uh, I, I'm not a strong advocate to use it, uh, this approach for anything anterior to seven and eight. Um, and the endoscope, again, um, they still, it, it, it can extend the, the, the limit of the microscopic view, but it's still there's some limits in the exposure for anything anterior. Um, the setup of the eye is going to be a little different. Of course, it will be the, the assistant because you are behind the patient, the assistant is going to be on the other side. So it's like kind of specular of what we're seeing because it's a lateral um, position. Uh, this one I was uh, I was mentioning as I learned from the from Spetzer because he puts he, he uses the same lateral position. Make sure that uh, this is very important uh, the position in this case because we have an unobstructed view coming from posterior and you want to keep the head in a neutral position because you don't have any you don't want to have any venous engorgement, particularly the venous osing is very troublesome to just. Uh, um, to just um, uh, um, um, overtake, right? So it's always trying to make this one the head as, as neutral as possible. And usually, where I put the, 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 the arm on underneath the table now, just to avoid brachial plexus injury at this level, and to be able to rotate the head a little bit better without having to, a, too much of an angle in uh, rotation on the other side. So basically, you know, wrapping properly the patient to the, to the table or our table. And this again, what I use now, I put the, the, the arm underneath instead of wrapping like this. So that's the only difference from this uh, modified park bench. Landmarks are very important because you really want to project on the surface the asterion, which is going to be very likely the, your transition between transverse sinus and sigma sinus. And that's why you want to use uh, is your limited your crani uh, craniotomy using a single burrow. So the more you know, and the more you master the projection, the deep landmark on the surface, the more successful you're going to be your bone flap, and you're going to be, because particularly at the beginning, your tendons are going to be so mad at you. If you, a lot of times you miss the bone flap, it, it happens this all the time, you'll be surprised, even in some more experienced surgeon, but that's a, a moment of experience. Of the more you understand and the knowledge of the anatomy, you really understand that you, a some patient are different from each other, but with experience, you understand the bony landmarks change according to some, uh, uh, some anthropological feature of the patient. Some patients have different bone, for example, if I find this one to be inferior, I know that the dura is going to be all inferior. So everything is going to be changed when I do these approaches. You need to look at the patient. You need to, nothing has to be uh, underestimated. Everything has to be carefully looked at, any landmark, because it tells you that the, the, is a language. You're basically, the landmarks are going to tell you a lot of what's going to happen and how to avoid any complications. 
So basically, what they use is LS is LSES. So again, I don't want to uh, go too much to a skin incision. Everybody's got their own. It doesn't matter what you use as long as you have a good exposure of the bone. And look at this, this is a single bore hole, which is going to skirt the sigma, sigma sinus anteriorly. And possibly you want to reach, particularly if you go with the full retro sigmoid, you want to reach the junction between uh, transverse sinus and sigma sinus, uh, particularly if you want to go out superiorly. You don't have to, but just in case, I'm just considering now the entire retro sigmoid uh, perspective, right? The dura opening, different fashion. You can do anterior, you can do posterior, but basically the idea is just have an unobstructed view on the cerebellum point, particularly the lateral cerebellum point angle. You see the dura has been stuck anteriorly, and then you have beautiful exposure. The only disadvantage, again, this is a beautiful approach for anything which is lateral cerebellum point. The only disadvantage, if you want to go anterior to 7 and 8, you have to work in within this cranial nerve, and you need to retract a lot of retraction on the or the uh, cerebellum surface, right? So this is the only disadvantage. That's why I would do something different for purely um, um, petrochlival lesion, which is anterior to 7 8. And this is a typical anatomy. You saw this one in any rotten dissection, which is a beautiful dissection, a beautiful publication. But again, I would strongly emphasize this is a good for a, it's a good starting point, but you need just to appreciate this one in a real thing, right? So basically, hopefully, the gold gold standard should be cadaver. Unfortunately, now with this with climate, with this problem with the virus, now we have to stop our course. Hopefully, we can reestablish soon. We have a major program, of course, at Cornell that we do. We go through basic approaches, complex approaches, basic neurosurgery. We've been very successful the last 10 years now. We do at least uh, six, seven courses a year, basically. So you are more than uh, encouraged just to go on our website for any, any educational activity we do. But look at it, you can see the cerebral point angle, you see 9 and 10, 7 and 8, you can see the ICA in the bike branching out and looping at this level, you see the core plexus. And this is very beautiful anatomy once you really approach properly. Again, exposure is obvious, it makes a huge difference. Understanding particularly what's going on into internal acoustic canal, because at one point, if the lesion is, in, is insinuating inside the canal, you might need to expose that canal. You cannot do all the way down to the fundus if you come retro sigmoid because it means you are going to, if you go to the fundus, it means I, you lose the hearing because you need to go through the labyrinth. So there is some limitation as much as you can drill on the uh, posterior wall of the canal and, uh, and you need to stop if you don't want to lose the hearing. Microvascular decompression use the same kind of approach, but the idea is just that you manage to avoid the conflict between the, vessel and uh, the the fifth nerve or the facial nerve which is a hemifacial spasm basically and the same trajectory same exposure allows you once you open properly the arachnoid and they open the cisterna magna you have a brain relaxation you open up the idea is always of course to minimize brain retraction right and uh, open up and use less spatula as possible the other thing is open properly spending all the time and training yourself opening the arachnoid because that open arachnoid would reveal beautifully by magic all the anatomy underneath, right? So never over overemphasize how to uh, how important just to uh, meticulously open the arachnoid, they open up those bases. And now we got pike aneurysm, same thing, we can do a retro sigmoid. Now when you come for this to pike, I would rather do a different approach. It comes after, which is the far lateral. Because now for any approach which go a little bit more inferior to the foramen magnum, I had to use a in approach, which goes a little bit more inferior. Look, now I can show it here. So this is the territory of the, if I was using the retro signal posteriorly, now if I had to go a little bit more posterior, inferior, and then I had to involve the foramen magnum, for example, pike aneurysm, uh, foramen magnum lesion. And I don't want to go in details because I can combine this one for other skull-based approaches for lesion at that level, right? So, um, so this one is, uh, Let's consider the far lateral. For lateral, uh, a lot of people, I mean, you, you hear a lot in your practice, well, it's important to take the condyle or it's not, the jugular tubercle is not you know, needed. There's so much publication out there. People trying to, to, be, to be smart. You know, I would strongly advise young residents to learn how to do everything. Just understand the condyle, understand the advantage of taking part of the condyle, only part of the condyle. Understanding the value of taking a jugular tobacco because that will go 
once you need it, those few times you need it, you're going to thank for the time you spend in learning how to do it. Forget people tell you you don't need it. It doesn't matter. Eventually, you're never going to need it, or only two times. And when you need it, it's going to make your life much easier. So don't listen to people say, don't worry about it, you don't need it. The, that's what I'm talking about, modified park bench to the arm underneath the table to avoid brachial plexus injury. As far as the skin, this uh, angulation of flexion, uh, there's so many different things. I don't want to go to too much now, but landmarks are very important again, because you need to go all the way down to the foramen magnum. Uh, you don't want to have a position which is completely give you an obstructive view all the way down to the anterolateral brainstem and the foramen magnum. So these are all important. What I identify in four points with my resident fellows, what's very important in the approach, identify the vertebral artery, amylaminectomy, taking the lamina because you want to go with the dura opening all the way down to C2. Learning how to take the only partial condyle, only a little bit, just enough not to destabilize the patient. I don't want to bring back the patient for stabilization, so I do my best not to destabilize the patient. And so I have to learn how to do it and how to resect the jugular tubercle. This jugular tubercle is something insignificant anatomically because it's only three, four, five, six millimeters, but technically is a challenge because immediately, immediately to the jugular tubercle is going to be nine and 10, 11. So if you make a mistake, you can cause a trouble. It's technically, it's very simple, but the, the chance of complication is very high. A lot of people are going to tell you, you really don't need it. Believe me, just learn how to do it. It will take, even if you need only a few times, particularly if you end up doing vascular surgery, you will go after, for example, a, 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 a aneurysm, vertebral basic aneurysm, which is very medial and giant. It's not possible to embolize for any reason. If you don't take that jugular tobacco, you'll have troubles. Anyway. Uh, learning the muscles are very important. Muscle layer, never, or big, but in, in surgery, you're never going to identify a single muscle, like superficial layer, the middle layer, deep layer. But this one is very good to understand to avoid complication because once you close, you want to just really stitch a single layer with the, the one corresponding. That's why I avoid a lot of complication. I see a lot of this complication. The CSF leak and in the wound is very, is very, I mean, the, it really conditions success of your, your, your job. This one is very important, deep layer, rectus cavis, posterior smiles, in big oblique or superior oblique to identify which is something, the suboccipital tremor, which is something that the resident fear a lot because particularly when you are faced in, your, in a surgery, in doing a far lateral approach, you don't ever know where the vertebral artery is going to be and you don't want to injure the vertebral artery, the birth, the, the spectrum, right? So there is a, a long way. We do this one in the courses a lot in the lab, how to identify the safest way using landmarks, particularly this muscle. Look, this is superior bleed. And then it's going to hide in what's very important, the atlanto-occipital junction. This is the inferior bleed, where it tells me where the lamina or C1 is going to be, together with the C2 ganglion and together with the, the birth on top of the sucrose arteriosus. And this rectus cavitus posterior minor is going to tell me the limit or the the craniotomy all the way down to foramen magnum. And once I do the amylaminectomy, go all the way down to C2. So all this muscle, they're telling me if I identify this one in a cadaver first, and then in patient, I know how to distinguish. They're going to tell me exactly what's going on. And even this muscle, rectus cavity, is telling me where the jugular foramen is going to be. So anatomy is very, very important. And again, it's not just the book anatomy, but in Israeli anatomy. So this is the look amenectomy, the dura flap, the dura, the craniotomy, go all the way down to the foramen magnum. And then once I take the C1, I go all the way down to C2 with the dura opening. And then finally, when I open the dura, this is different fashion opening dura. Usually I use a, a little bit more anterior to the skirting the, the sigma sinus. I make a dura cuff around the bird so I can close everything back when I open and have a very nice and obstructive view. So I'm obstructing all the way to the anterolateral portion of the brainstem. This is going to be the, the condyle and the jugular tubercle is going to be at that level as well. So when I open the dura and I cut the arachnoid um, and I have a beautiful unobstructed view, you can see all the, see if I position the patient properly, if I use a proper microscope, angulation on the microscope, I have a nice view. And sometimes particularly the tumor is pushing, it's making a corridor uh, and I don't need to use a spatula. There is no need most of the times if you're done properly. 
if you are flush, you take a little bit of condyle, only the posterior third, so not to destabilize that patient. And then plus I choose, I close the waist and I water tight function. function. The midline, um, midline approach is going to be particularly, we don't use anymore, as I was mentioning, for more anterior approach, particularly for foramen, posterior foramen magnum, for uh, fourth ventricle, and, and for, uh, for example, Chiari malformation, all these approaches can be, can, only lesion can be approached with the with midline uh, suboxidium. Now there is different seating position, which is a very, uh, in theory, is a good position. A lot of surgeons use it. I don't particularly favor it, just my own, I don't use it because I, I don't like in, uh, being tired with my hands, particularly today I work for a long time, pineal, particularly for pineal lesion. And another thing, because venous embolism, air embolism, and that's a very bad complication as well. From position, I usually don't use, I use mostly the modified park bench, ladder of the cubicles, or very popular is the prone position as well. Skin incision in midline goes all the way from the um, torque all the way down to the C2, C3, and according to what you're after to, you know, if you have lesion on the fourth ventricle, or for decompression, posterior decompression, for a carry malformation and stuff like that. In, for a pineal, of course, you go a little bit more superior. Um, the dura incision, dura opening is, uh, uh, is important that you be able to control the arachnoid. Once you open the arachnoid, it's much better. Uh, it's good exposure. And then closure, usually for the carry malformation, for example, um, if after I decompress the tonsil, the tonsils, and um, and the floor of the fourth ventricle, and, um, and then you inspect the opex. You see the floor of the ventricle. You make sure everything is okay, and you can put a loose, uh, very loose dura graft, which is sewn in place in a wire water type fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some options for the graft. It will include, for example, fascia lata with harvest from the leg, or you can use a bovine or cadaver dura graft, or even possibly a pericranium. Um, it usually it's difficult to obtain a piece of pericranium which is large enough to cover the entire the entire the dura opening for this particular operation uh, but you know it's possible but it's good particularly if you need to decompress usually put a dura flap at this level yeah. now this approaches to the pineal region um, you in order to get to the pineal region you can use infratentorial uh, or supratentorial um, um, surgical corridor. Infradentoria, we have the infradentoria supracerebellar. Supradentoria, we have the suboccipital transdentoria, which is the most popular. But again, also the posterior transcarosal, transcortical, transventricular, the subtemporal. But the most useful supradentoria is suboccipital transdentoria. So basically, as I've shown you before, these are the major approaches, right? So uh, the, the skin, the bone flap, skin flap is pretty much overlapping for the supra cerebellar infradentorial. Suboccipital will be more superior, and then we go, you go underneath the medial to occipital lobe, and you go through the dentorium to get to the pineal gland. Whereas with this one, you go through the midline, and the supra cerebellar is dividing median, paramedian, and, uh, and lateral. Um, the venous anatomy, I know it's very important to understand the venous anatomy. I don't, I'm, going, I'm, not, I'm not going to spend too much time because I, won't, I don't have time, but it is extremely important to understand uh, the anatomy at this level, uh, particularly when you, when you need to open uh, all the way down to the pineal gland region. Uh, this is a typical skin incision for a... Uh, Suboccipital transdentorial, this beautiful view in, trans in projection. Uh, this is a May, the Atlas made my May area. This is a nice view in projection on the, uh, the tentorium. And you can see once I open this to be the skin, the skin flap and the bone flap, uh, skirting the superior side of the sinus at this level and a lifting a little bit the occipital lobe. Uh, now, in this case, when you do a sitting position, it, it, you don't have the advantage of the gravity because basically your occipital lobe is going to be uh, pushing on the tentorium, right? Whereas if you go inferior to that, the sitting position is going to be more advantageous because the cerebellar is going to 
go down because because you want to go in between the cerebellum and the tentorium, right? So that's the advantage and disadvantage of the two surgical positions. Uh, when I go through trans-occipital, I need to pull up a little bit the occipital lobe and push a little bit more lateral because I need to expose the tent, the tentorial, tentorium at this level, this cut tentorium, that's why trans-tentorium, I get all the way down to the pineal gland. So basically, that's your move. Uh, you cut, look, you push lateral and superiorly the occipital lobe, cut tentorium, and you go and you access the, the pineal region. Uh, the corpus callosum is displays a little bit if you need it, but you have a good exposure, particularly the lesion, they involve the pineal region, pineal gland or region or tetra region, but they go a little bit more superior. That should be, instead of going from inferior cut tentorium, particularly if the extension is mostly super, super tentorium, you, I would prefer this one as opposed to the other one if you have mostly infra tentorium, sometimes only a little component supra tentorium, I would use the inflammatory suprasebellum. So basically, these are the, the suprasebellum infradentoria, as I mentioned before, this one median, paramedian, lateral, extreme lateral. These are the major approaches uh, we've seen before already. And this is a nice view, uh, for example, like we've seen all these approaches uh, uh, in the same traje different trajectory. So I have the median. This one, I, have a, I had more time when doing my fellowship, do all this animation, they, they work, I was working a lot in this. But this is a median, paramedian, and the extreme lateral. Basically, trajectory is different according to what you after to. So basically, the tetra region, the colliculi, you can see if I have something in the middle line, I will go from particularly infra dentoria, I'll go to a median approach. If I go a little bit more lateral, I'll go to paramedian. And an extreme lateral is something in the perimesencephalic system. Basically, this one will be pretty much corresponding to the retro a little bit more superior and more posterior. And this one can be even uh, enhanced with the tentorial cutting. So either I can go, I can go even super tentorial or infra tentorial, cut the uh, tentorium to join the two compartments, super and infra tentorium. So this is a very nice approach for lateral place lesion, lateral brain stem. Look, this is a very nice view of the, the entire option, the low option. And this, the dura cut is pretty much the same as the midline suboccipital, it will be more superior because you are, and that's the one for the, um, from uh, paramedian and extreme lateral. This is the sitting position, which I don't favor, although in theory, technically is very good because the cerebellar hemispheres are falling down, falling down in a way that you open properly because it gives you more space, super cerebellar underneath the ventorium. But because of the other complication, because of the awkward position of my arms, uh, my deltoids are going to uh, complain. So I always, I try, I use always a lateral uh, approach, modify. Bringing main, cut the bringing main, understanding anatomy is, again, it's, a, it's a difficult. It, it, there should be like a lecture only on anatomy of this approach. Uh, but the main point is taking the anatomy. Um, and uh, under magnification of the microscope, uh, the surgeon extended the dissection deeper towards the precentral vein, basically. And it's basically, you need to put a retractor most of the time there, just a single retractor, or the roof of the cerebellum. And uh, you can see the precentral vein basically is uh, uh, unsheathed and by arachnoid and extend, extend to the gallium, the vein of gallium. Yeah, gallium. Um, there are many tributaries to the uh, precentral vein. And this vein could be, should be cauterized and divided in order to be able to just gain access a little bit more inferior, I mean, uh, deeper. Uh, and finally, we have tumor exposure. You can see this is always a sitting position, but you can see the cerebellum is even lower. You can push a little bit less than you should in a different position. If you have a very direct and un unobstructed exposure all the way down to the point by near blood. And then you can see the final exposure after tumor resection, basically. Um, as far as cortical, uh, I think we're just, uh, uh, um, cortical, uh, something I usually, um, uh, because I, I, I mostly do skull base and muscular, but after you've done technically, of course, and much easier, uh, the problem is uh, uh, localized the lesion, which sometimes might be particular lesion, or metastatic lesion, which are, they are not 
surface, it will be difficult if you don't use, but now, nowadays with the proper tools and like near navigation, before it was stereotactics, now near navigation, uh, echography, ultrasound is much easier to identify. And uh, that allows to uh, create the least complication possible at the least corticotomy possible to choose the right surface so, so the complications are much less. Um, the position, um, two good position on the lateral decubitus position with the head parallel to the floor and the supine position with the head straight up. Both of these positions are helpful in surgical orientation. If the lateral decubitus position is chosen, it is important as, as in any other approach to make sure that the neck is not over rotated. That's why I always use a place towers or blanket, blankets under the shoulder and to relieve the tension on the neck. So this is very important. Keep in mind when you do a surgical position to make sure that you, um, you, you, you consider taking count of this, uh, this possible complication. Right? Uh, the dura, I mean, this is typical, the dura is stuck to the margin of the, 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 the bone flap. And uh, neural navigation is very important now because it helps to minimize the size of the craniotomy and the brain exposure. Um, sometimes the exact location of the pre-central gyrus usually is not clear. And so the, it's, it's very advisable to use somatosensory, somatosensory above potential monitoring. And these are very useful to identify the central sulcus. Um, I don't want to, I don't get into detail of the different, uh, you know, the different electrodes, like in this case, A, B, and C, they are, they are going to be placed, one on the pre-central gyrus, one is the central sulcus, and the other one is the post-central gyrus. But this one, in, in alternative, this one will be mapping uh, with direct electrical stimulation on the cerebral cortex, Nowadays, it's very, it's much easier than before to identify, before it was just a clinical and a visual feedback. Now it's much easier to identify the uh, functional eloquent cortex, just trying to, to do the least damage possible, right? Um, other than that, technically, I mean, going through the sulco, identify the sulco, and get into the lesion and then do a deep walking is a, a supposable with what we've seen so far is that technicality is much easier it's just understanding and ends up uh, to the experience of a surgeon distinguish the normal tissue from uh, pathology, you know, and, but it's very important understanding, um, I mean, using the neural navigation, particularly to avoid to do further damage to the cortex. And so the convexity uh, is, is, I mean, neural navigation makes this local orientation much easier nowadays. Um, now let's do a, a little bit of um, just to close the circle. Basically, let's do some uh, uh, how to how to approach. Let's see how we approach the ventricles. Um, they are de depend, of course, the, what kind of ventricle. What, what uh, um, if it's the body of the ventricle, third ventricle, lateral ventricle. Um, there would be different organization. Mostly, what we use is use it always the interhemispheric approach or the transcortical approach. One is a, is a more advantage compared to the other, vice versa, because I honestly, when I can, I always use the interim spheric transcalosal uh, if I can, uh, instead of transcortical, for obvious reason, try not to transgress the cortex, which always can carry some potential complication of particular uh, seizures. Landmarks is very important. Um, for example, this is standard coronal section through the brain and level of the foramen magnum. And then you can see the relation between the fornix, this is very important, the fornix and the core plexus at this level uh, with, the, with the foramen morum. The, uh, the, the coronal picture, uh, the coronal section, you can see is showing the relation of the coronal suture, which is very important to understand this relation, to the lateral ventricle and the foramen morum. So there's always this kind of fixed relation, which is very, very important, particularly if you do a transcortical, because you really want to manipulate that cortex as least as possible. But this is something we have, we're all familiar because particular for placing external ventricular drainage to understand how to identify the body of the ventricle from the uh, cortical projection, skin projection. Ventricular anatomy, uh, this again, I mean, there's no, 
plays inside the brain, of course, where anatomy is not very important. And we as a neurosurgeon should be extremely familiar with all this anatomy. This obviously goes without saying, I'm not going to spend any more time because I'll take a different lecture to do that. Uh, and actually, my fellows spend a lot of time in understanding this anatomy, although in a, in a cadaver, uh, scalp-based surgery practice much easier than transventricular uh, practice because of the, the, the bench will sometimes are collapsed. But it's very, very good to understand, particularly if you use a lot of formally, for example, understanding the intraventricular anatomy, although you don't simulate surgery because that is going to affect your surgery. So understanding, uh, for example, the uh, superior choroidal vein, I'm going to the body, the phonics, the thalamus, um, exactly what those structures are, where, how to get in, that's extremely important. Um, the, the positioning, um, I, the, heads, the patient heads is fixed in the pinion, as usual. Um, the, the, in some, most surgeons, uh, they will use the head at, at zero degree of orientation and slightly flex, uh, flex it and elevate the above level of the head to decrease intracranial pressure. Um, there are possible two craniotomy. One is a square one, and one is a triangular. And usually, the opening is centered on the typical point. It's like two, three centimeters anterior to the corona suture, two, two centimeters lateral to the midline. Right? Uh, I don't particularly like this position, but that's that's just my preference. I I like instead of this uh, lateral um, lateral position because of the head lateral. I mean, not the supine with the head. Uh, um, uh, uh, rotating on the other side because that allows me to work with two hands. And with this one, basically, I can uh, reach any any vision at that level, particularly because I go from contralateral on the other side. And that allows me that allows me to work with two hands, left and right, no one hand on top of the other, like I would do in this area. So I prefer this one. And this one I, it allows me to use the gravity as well, which I, again, my point is really trying to use the least brain attraction as possible. So I, I've been using this one for many years and I still like it as opposed to the other one. It, these are the main advantages, visualization, eyes are horizontal, gravity, um, hand coordination, surgeon comfort, of course. So that's why I prefer this one. Um, the, the dura, basically once you do the opening, whether you do a, uh, square or the triangle. Basically, the dura opening is based on the superior such the sinus, which you try and try the best not to damage, but you still need to be prepared to uh, repair a surgical a, 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 a tear on a sagittal surgical, surgical sinus. Um, damage of the sinus, of course, uh, you, you, of course, you know, is more, uh, is more um, uh, forgiven. Uh, if it's anterior, less forgiving is posterior, particularly for uh, uh, venous ischemic events. Um, so that's why you have to be very much prepared. We do a lot of training for this. Actually, even the medical book camp, the last series, we had a beautiful simulation um, uh, system just to, to train people how to repair sagittal sinus uh, tears just in case they occur. Um, and after the right frontal lobe has been protected, as you see with the, with the cottonoids, it generally I use a, a retractor to gently retract the, 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 the frontal lobe. And then you have to cut any arachnoid over bridging veins. And, uh, but if you can just preserve the bridging vein as much as you can, it's good. You should just cut this bridging vein just when it's absolutely needed because you don't have space, but just yeah, you're on a you know, surgical trajectory, basically. Um, and for example, in, in case of the, in this case, we would be imitating a collar cyst. Um, I rather approach this one from the right lateral ventricle instead of using an interphonesial approach. Interphonesial, you go in between the two phonesics, phonesis, um, particularly because, you know, the obvious problem of memory loss, complication. So I particularly like just going through a lateral ventricle. And it's easy to identify the corpus callosum because it's whitish and uh, it's got whitish appearance as opposed to the rest of the field. And usually the incision in corpus callosum is approximately 1.5 centimeters long. And that allows you a good access in within, inside the ventricle. Once you enter the ventricle, again, the anatomy is very important. It's, it's important the surgeon needs to to find all the identify and recognize all the structure 
which are the choral plexus, the thalamus triad vein, the anterior septal vein, and the anterior coded vein. vein. These are all important structures in you because they, they uh, once you identify, they, they orient you, they orient the surgeon in, uh, within the ventricle. And believe me, if you are not experienced, it's very easy to get lost and to even misplace, misunderstand one ventricle for the other. So experience uh, is very important. And that's why training is very important. Um, sometimes the bulge, when, you, when you're dealing with the colitis, the bulge is very, very evident. Um, but it's very, still very important to identify this structure to become oriented at the beginning, in particular to identify the formings, because that's the one is more prone or complicated, it's more the major source of complication when you do this kind of approach. And after you do an incision, um, uh, it's in case of colloid cysts, it's very the incision is made in the cyst itself through the um, particularly see the bulging and caused it by the cyst in within and through the foramen model. Uh, but again, it's simple technically, but it's very complicated uh, because uh, it's, diff it's very easy to get lost if you don't identify, if you don't know the structure at the beginning. Some of the structure might be distorted by lesions. So, I understanding the normal anatomy is extremely helpful. Uh, for particular in, a, in when the anatomy is distorted. And I use contralateral approach, a transcalose approach. The position is the same because it allows me a much, it's more for, a, for a exposure purposes because on the other side, as you can see, I have a much better visualization. If by taking advantage of the gravity in this position, a surgical position, I have the, the brain is just automatically um, goes down a little bit, so I have much, an obstruct, a more unobstructed view, and I can encompass the entire lesion at, that, lesion at that level. So I go underneath the fox, basically, and I make an incision inside the corpus callosum on the other side. Transcortical, as I mentioned before, um, I use sparingly, uh, particularly for the complication, potential for complication, um, I use mostly the, the, the interhemispheric transcalosal. Um, it's one of the advantages only of transcortical, the indication I would say particularly is that uh, uh, when the, the lateral ventricle is enlarged, it's much easier to find to locate it, but still you have to go through the transcortical. And this is a, it is still a good alternative to interhemispheric. Uh, and usually you go through the middle frontal gyrus. Uh, and usually can be achieved with a small graphene uh, type of craniotomy, which is only three centimeters, uh, always from the midline and two centimeters in front of the coronary institution. Basically the same as we've seen before, the location is very easy. If you are very much uh, oriented because you've done external ventricular drainage. The transcortical route, as far as access and exposure, is that it provides an excellent exposure of the, in this case, still a colloid cyst, for example, uh, and, and the, particularly for the angle of the exposure. But this advantage of the approach, as I was mentioning, is the incision, which is on the cortex. And, and the bus, it, it has to be made, and there is a, a small risk, but still a risk of uh, for postoperative seizure after that. That's why I still favor the the um, intermesphere transcalosum. Um, I don't know if we have any time left just to cover some uh, trauma surgery. Um, just briefly, we see some epidura, epidura hematoma, for example. Um, the, um, the the evacuation of extra axial hematomas after trauma. A, it can be a life save intervention. That's why it's extremely important. Um, there is no absolute cutoff time after which patient become worse. It's very difficult to predict when a patient is getting really worse. And some is a very controversial study out there. There are actually some com a conflict study, uh, but some studies have demonstrated better outcomes with the earlier evacuation. Um, surgical planning is very important, uh, particularly if it's the presence of other intracranial lesion and uh, according to the patient clinical status. And then, of course, the patient polytraumatized 
be, you are taking account the hemodynamic status and uh, coagulopathy, all this kind of stuff. But let's uh, keep ourselves purely technical. Uh, this is the indication for surgery, so this is something more clinical. I don't want to go into just briefly. I mean, everybody knows when in, in neurosurgery by handbooks, when the, the volume is more than 30 cubic centimeters, or there is a midline shift more than five mm, equal or more than five centimeters, Glasgow comma scale minus eight. There's a strong indication, uh, a phase system and the neurological status deteriorating in a very uh, absolute indication for surgery. For epidural, for a subdural hematoma, same thickness more than 10, equal or more than 10 millimeters. Midline shift, which is a very typical feature, the same as the epidural, is more than five millimeters uh, with the oncolate niche possible. That's very important. Just one, uh, in particular, if you have uh, acid asymmetric pupils, watch they show you that there's some uh, very high, high intracranial pressure, and there is an uh, oncolate niche at that level. Or there is a neurological worsening by two or more points of GSCS. But uh, <clears throat> again, you guys are very familiar with this, so I don't, I don't want to get into it. The position it was pretty straightforward. We've seen so far which the supine position for terminal approach is the one that really will uh, uh, will be the best position for all this evacuation. Skin incision usually it goes all the way from the anterior to the tragus. In this case, we go a little bit more because it's like a question mark. Is of course what you do for the typical terminal incision. Go a little bit more posterior. Um, it's like a reverse question mark. Um, a other skin incision can may be utilized to evacuate the smaller hematomas, however, but you know, usually the best one I would strongly suggest to do is still a, like a little bit bigger incision, uh, curving a little bit more posterior. Because sometimes, you know, it's difficult to predict maybe some degree of brain swelling at this level. So in that case, you have a little bit more exposure. The, you, you remember in this case, you, you need to have a rapid evacuation. Time is very important in particular cases, but in particular cases are very dramatic. So in that case, you want to do one single uh, skin flap and uh, um, the temporized muscle together with skin is elevated simultaneously. And that gives you much uh, control time, much will make you much faster. This is the case in which you might want to place more, more than one bubbles in different locations, all around along the skin, uh, the skin skirting, the skin flap, for example. You know, in case of epidural hematoma, you can appreciate immediately the, the black collection as soon as you lift the bone flap. And usually this one has to be evacuated properly, but the, the first thing you really want to do with the source of the bleeding should be addressed as quickly as possible. And either usually with a bipolar cautery uh, on the vessel or bone wax on depend on the foramen spinosum or where the vessel is entering the cranium, basically. You know? So early identification of the, um, the bleeding, the source of bleeding is very important. And again, once you, in epidural hematoma, once you take out the bone flap, you can see immediately the collection of the blood. blood. So instead of in presence of a subdural hematoma, the collection is not so obvious. So the dura has to be open as quickly as possible to, to allow access to, to, to as much as the dura space as possible in a very small time in, in within the, the exposure of the craniotomy. So time is very important and in particular we have it in, in some dramatic situation. So the, the, dura, the, the dura has to open as quick as possible. Closure, as we do close, usually the, the typical closure would be like the cranial plating. Uh, in the past, we used to go for wires, but now it's still, you know, cranial plating. And usually you can put a stuck up suture. Um, uh, there is a central epidural tucking stitch right in the middle of the bone flap, basically, to secure the dura layer directly to the bone flap and then avoid the, the, the dead space underneath will be potential. Uh, accumulation uh, of, uh, of blood. Uh, drain, as we mentioned before. So decompressive craniectomy. Um, 
there is there has been accumulating evidence in, the, in recent years to support the use of decompressive craniectomy, craniectomy um, for traumatic brain injury. Um, and some other, some other indication as well before large cerebral infarction, for example, which can be uh, can produce like severe edema and mass effect. Um, there are two types of decompressive craniectomies. One is the frontotemporal parietal occipital decompressive AMI craniectomy. And usually this procedure is mostly indicated for a traumatic lesion or edema concentrated in one hemisphere with the middle line shift and with risk of the own herniation. So if you have a, uh, a imminent risk of onion herniation, you can see like your pupil anisocoric and stuff like that is a very strong indication for a decompressed cranial craniectomies. Um, this is a typical frontotemporal parietal occipital craniectomy. The patient is uh, pushing position supine as usual, and the head is secured with the, still with a three point, um, uh, head holder and is turned to a minimum 60 degree on the other side ideally it would be like 90 degree um, and usually you know it's always advisable to put a roll underneath the ipsilateral shoulder to avoid some the 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 the, um, the turning on that will cause some uh, uh, venous engorgement as usual The opening again is the same as before, but will be extending further posteriorly. Usually it starts at the level of the zygomatic arch in one centimeter in front of the travels, as we see in many skin incision of our anterolateral uh, skin flap, and extends superiorly and posteriorly in the same reverse question mark uh, fashion we've seen before, and then ends anteriorly and uh, still at the uh, mid pupillary line on the same side. The burrow has before this be at least 12, 15 centimeters in the diameter. Many burrows are placed along the, the, the bone flap, a bit the skin flap incision. That would be because it will allow the, the brain to expand and that would be the main point just to release the pressure, intracranial pressure. And the bone dissection usually is extending inferiorly there is a new trend now. Some people have been advocating doing the same dissections in a skull based fashion, open the arachnoid just to uh, facilitate, the, uh, facilitate the expansion of the brain, particularly in the presence of a um, great degree of brain swelling. But there's no really scientific study which has been uh, uh, confirming that. But some people still do it, they're strongly advocating the use of the same technique as a, as a as, a, as in skull base, open up the arachnoid. There is some rationale actually, but there's no scientific evidence for that. Um, so once you, when you do the decompressed cranectomy, the dura is open, the surface of the brain usually is inspected for a subdural hematoma. And the, of course, if they are present, it should be evacuated. Uh, usually the, the, it's better to do a duroplasty uh, usually you can do duroplasty with an uh, autogenous material like pericranium or synthetic, but usually be implants, for example. It is very important doing a duroplasty in this case, because otherwise it is obvious because you want to make sure the brain is expanding and releasing the intracranial pressure. The pericranium can be harvested easily from uh, its um, gallial attachment with a sharp dissection, just using max bound. Um, if the pericranium is damaged, for example, in polytrauma patient or contaminated, in that case, you can use an artificial implant. So this is this is very simple, small technique. I don't want to go too much in the detail, but usually it's better, usually the, you don't pull back the bone flap in this case. And that's why it's important to do an incision in the right lower quadrant of the abdomen. And usually because that's where you place the bone flap uh, which is introduced into the subcutaneous pocket, basically you create it with a scissor. And the skin at this level should be closed in at least two layers uh, because you want to avoid infection on the bone flap. Uh, the other thing, the other fashion doing decompressed craniotomy would be like a bifrontal, 
which basically follow the same guidelines as far as technique, the one we're using for the bifrontal, um, unifront, I mean, bifrontal, uh, sub, uh, bilateral, subfrontal approach. The only difference is that this skin incision will be a little bit more posterior, basically will pass the corona suture. Um, and, and again, there are very different techniques to make this uh, skin a bit bone flap on opening. Uh, the one mostly common, you start starting the same with the uh, inside the temporalis fossa and then going to the, through the burrow within the proterional. And usually it's a lot of people at different functions. People do a burrow directly on a sagittal sinus. I still prefer to do to place the two burrows on both sides to be able to control the sinus properly. But again, if you even if you do the same on top of the sinus with a good cranial to a more perforator, you'll be able to achieve the same result. And most important to do is as open as possible, I mean, as wide as possible to allow the brain to uh, relieve the pressure, basically. And you do, at the end, same duraplasty as we described before. Um, I close, I want to close now, uh, just by uh, reminding everybody, just a quick message. Of course, I was difficult to go through an entire spectrum on your surgical approach is only three hours. I, I, I try to give like a, not only give some overview of the approaches, but I, I try with this lecture to spark some interest in the young people and make sure they understand the message of practice and practice, particularly now that you're young and trying to do everything, learn everything. I just, I know, take with a pinch of salt, maybe don't listen too much. If people are too dogmatic, say, oh, you don't need to do that. When are you going to do it? Because eventually, there might be a point in your career which you need to use that little nuance, that little surgical technique which you wish you had learned before when you were young. That's why I strongly emphasize, now that you got the time with the patient, believe me, you see later on, um, the time is very important to learn any possible technique and then just uh, practice a lot because everybody can do it. As you see this little kit, but you need, everybody can draw in between a ocular motor name and a carotid, but you need some practice if you want to avoid disaster. And the other thing that's why I say always train, train, train the lab. And again, I see many labs around the country and beautiful labs. And it's sad sometimes I see they are not used properly or they're not used at all. Or I see people random go there for some dissections. It's a shame because it's an incredible, incredible, invaluable resource for any neurosurgical department. And as a resident in the future, Try to always find some time to pass by that lab in the arts. Practice your skills with some rationale, though, not just go there, just mess up with those cadavers. Remember, those cadavers are very difficult to come by, very expensive, and it's very important. And the other quick message, I hope I don't offend anybody with this one, but what I want to say is just nowadays, it is a lot, it's so fashionable, everything we follow fashion just to make some fame, just get some fame out, just make minimal invasive. Everything has to be minimal invasive, just, but just think about the patient, right? Sometimes this is a message I got years, years ago. And again, I hope I don't offend anybody, but uh, years ago from Dr. Ammeth, you remember the first lecture, be like 20 years ago, that he, he say, if you really want to enjoy it, sometimes you have to open that door. I mean, you really need to just make sure that you open, sometimes bone dissection is not being invasive, but you need to use the bone flap opening, take out the support of the bone to allow the brain just to relax together with a good surgical position, a dissecting the, the arachnoid properly and mobilize structure all together will make your dissection, your surgery much safer and much more successful. All right, thank you very much for your attention. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world. And so we're going to talk some uh, a little bit about some of the less invasive options as well. Uh, what you see on the left is the NeuroPace device, which is a neurostimulation device. Um, uh, it's similar to a defibrillator in the heart. Uh, on the top right, you can see that's a uh, focused ultrasound. That's a, a newer technology that actually doesn't involve any kind of incision on the scalp. Um, and then the bottom right is a uh, laser ablation. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about each of those. And 
the neuropace and the laser ablation are things that we do here at UCI very commonly. Um, and I understand that the, with focused ultrasound, we should be getting that when we get our new hospital in the next few years. So we'll talk a little bit about that newer technology. So with regards to neuromodulation, we have three devices that we use. There's responsive neurostimulation, deep brain stimulation, and vagus nerve stimulation. So with responsive neurostimulation, as I mentioned before, if you imagine that a, a patient, we, we do all the invasive monitoring and we see that the patient has seizures and let's say their language area are very close to one another. Well, obviously if we remove that area, they'll have a language problem. And you know that, that's a functional deficit that we obviously never wanna give our patients. Up until about 2013, before that time, we had no options available for those patients. So we would tell them, you know, unfortunately we can't do anything to treat this. But thankfully, since the time and the development of responsive neurostimulation, we've actually been able to really help this very difficult and challenging group of patients. So the way that it works is that we implant those electrodes onto the area where we know seizures are coming from. And then we also implant the battery into the skull as well. And the device is constantly listening for seizures. This is a true closed loop system in that it's listening for seizures. And as you can see here, when it sees that a seizure is developing, it'll send a electro electrical stimulation and that can either abort or shorten the seizure. And uh, really it's become a, a major, major uh, help for us because again, as I mentioned prior to this, we had no real options available for patients with this type of epilepsy. This was a paper that we wrote a, a couple of years back looking at um, our experience using the robot as well as the NeuroPACE device. And, We've done it now on over 25 patients and we've had really great success with that. Now I'm going to talk about deep brain stimulation. And interestingly, even though it's a very different stimulation pattern, a different area that we're stimulating, the long-term outcomes have show, been shown to be very similar. And so with this device, we're actually targeting the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. So it's a very specific area. And what you see here is this, this is important to look at because um, over time you see that the seizure reduction in patients actually improves. So we go from 50% reduction in the first year all the way up to 70%. We know that at around nine years, we actually see about 75% reduction in seizures by about 50%. Now with all the neuromodulatory devices, I forgot, I didn't mention this earlier, but one of the important things to think about is that we're not our goal is not necessarily to make patients seizure free. Our goal is to reduce the seizure burden, uh, especially if we can get it below 50% of what their baseline is. Um, because of the type of the nature of the disease and, and because of the type of stimulations we're doing, it's very rare that we get patients who become seizure free with this type of device. Although we have been uh, fortunate to have some patients actually develop that. And then the last option is vagus nerve stimulation. This is our oldest device. We've had this for about 30 years. Um, we basically implant a generator in the left chest wall and then uh, place a small lead over the vagus nerve, <clears throat> again, in the left uh, neck. Uh, with this type of device, we, we tell patients that about 50% of patients get a 50% reduction in their seizures. And so again, we don't fully understand how these devices work but we do know that um, it is better than medication because we know that once you fail two or three medications, the likelihood of becoming seizure-free with medication alone pretty much goes down to zero. Um, laser ablation is another very exciting and uh, novel treatment that we have available to us in epilepsy surgery. This is an actual patient that we did at UCI. And what you see here is that there's essentially a pinhole opening that we have um, when we, when we remove it, we just put one staple in that hole and that's actually how we close that, that incision. Really the benefit here is that it's minimally invasive. Uh, it, it, um, it requires us to go to the MRI machine because it actually is performing that ablation in real time. We use the MRI as an actual, um, uh, real time observation of the, the ablation. And then one of the very nice parts of it is that we can actually get to very deep parts of the brain and uh, avoid damaging any of that collateral tissue, which is very important, um, especially when I show you some of these lesions that we've, we've treated. So what you can see here on the left is mesial temporal sclerosis. So 
With that procedure, we actually place the laser fiber from a posterior approach. And then we go right down the barrel of the hippocampus and the amygdala, and we can perform a very nice uh, oblong type ablation, usually in the range of three to four centimeters. The, the middle uh, graphic you see is a perinodular heterotopia. And just like you can imagine, to get to that point um, with open surgery does create a lot more collateral damage to the brain, to the surrounding tissue. And, uh, and so by doing it this way with a very small fiber, we can address these, these areas without actually doing open surgery and, and potentially injuring normal tissue. And the, what you see on the right there, that to me is the ideal use for this uh, laser ablation. So hypothalamic heterotopias are very difficult to treat. Um, if you imagine that a, uh, a basketball, and if you imagine that right in the center of that basketball is a small tic-tac, that is like the, the, it's very similar to how a hypothalamic heterotopia works in that, you know, open surgery requires us to traverse essentially the entirety of the brain from above to get down to that area. And any injury to the hypothalamus can cause significant and long-term uh, endocrine disorders. Whereas if you look here, you can see that with this very small fiber, we can get all the way down to that hypothalamus and treat that area without causing any collateral damage. Positioning for lumbar surgery. The thing I want, want to know is that the bed has been what we call reversed, or the, the normal head of the bed has been placed on the longer side. And what this does, it allows more room in between the base and the arms to get a, a fluoroscope in underneath and localize for surgery. The other thing I want to call your attention to is how the arms are positioned. So in this position, he's a little bit too extended. This is going to uh, cause increased risk for both ulnar and axillary nerve palsies postoperatively, so we want to minimize that. We're going to bring his arm into a more neutral position or what we call Superman. And you want to think 90 degrees here and 90 degrees here. So if he's like that, he's going to be much more comfortable. We're also going to provide additional padding over his elbow here and pad the ulnar nerve. And that is going to pad two things actually. So one, when the C arm comes up, if the image intensifier rests against his arm here, it can hit his ulnar nerve here, but it can also compress the radial nerve and the radial groove along the humerus here. This morning, it is my sincere pleasure to welcome our esteemed visiting professor, Dr. Robert Spetzler. Thank you, thank you. Neurosurgery has undergone extreme innovation in my lifetime. It's truly remarkable, and I'm really excited to spend time here today reflecting on this and meeting all of you. Before we start, Dr. Spetzler, I just want to say I really admire the, the great institution you built in Arizona. It's truly phenomenal the absolute best anyone has ever seen. Why, thank you, Donald. That is very kind of you. Donnie, shut up and let the man speak. Go to sleep, Joe. It's important to acknowledge greatness. Like you, Dr. Spetzler, I too want to build something great and fantastic along the southern border of Arizona. The people of Arizona will say it's the most magnificent thing they've ever seen. It will be the BNI of border security. Donald, that's enough about the wall. Let's please get back to business. Dr. Spetzler has a lot to cover. He, did Dr. Spetzler ask about me? Traditionally, uh, the boot camp has been uh, an opportunity to gain hands-on skills-based experience with some clinical anatomy thrown in. As such, I'd like to make this as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions as we go along, please, please don't hesitate to enter them using the Q&A function in Zoom. Um, we'll stop periodically so Michael uh, and, and Graham can read the questions um, and we can go back as necessary. Uh, we can also field some audio questions at the end uh, using the raised hands feature. Um, so <clears throat> my goal today um, is to increase your familiarity and comfort with the cerebrovascular system. We're gonna take a, a virtual journey through the major vessels and see what we encounter along their respective courses. As those who have taken any of my courses know well, this is an image I, I personally despise, and an image I'm sure most of you um, are very familiar with. While this is a convenient tool for rote learning, it doesn't convey much useful information, most simply because anatomy is not 2D. Some resources make an attempt uh, and while this is a slightly better representation, it's not a perspective aside from CTs that
that you will ever use clinically. And understanding the substantial topography of the circle of Willis, which I call the stairwell of Willis, from a 2D representation is nearly impossible. And I think it puts an undue burden onto you as learners. Even this is not a complete representation of cranial circulation, although it's certainly better. So in order to understand cranial circulation in context um, and, and how that vasculature interacts with its surrounding structures, we need to put all of the various pieces together. Many years ago, as an attempt to, I think, unnecessarily simplify neuroanatomy, the subject was broken up into different systems, which are still taught independently from each other. No other area of the body or an anatomy is taught this way. Um, so when I ask students, for example, what vein does the trigeminal nerve pass under after it originates from the pons, or the... Uh, relationship between the ICA and cranial nerve 7 and 8, I often get blank stares. And <clears throat> this is where um, I believe that undue burden comes into play, as I think it's unfair to ask you to mentally merge all of these different components on their own when you are rarely taught how they interact. Nowhere do these components exist naturally, uh, individually. They are all part of a complete intertwined system. So learning them individually forces you to essentially study the same region multiple times um, piecemeal. So today we're going to look at how these systems come together and hopefully give you a more complete understanding of the anatomy as a whole because using this image to understand this and this is nearly impossible. So I'm going to ask you to approach this with me as, as a virtual road trip where we shrink our perspective down significantly in order to travel along the vasculature um, and really see what we encounter along the way. Um, and <clears throat> you put yourself in the perspective of a, say like a red blood cell traveling along. And as we, we look around at different points uh, and we see what's around us and we understand um, from the perspective of the vessel what else it's encountering. So <clears throat> before we shrink ourselves down, let's just take some time to review the basic bony anatomy that we're going to encounter. So this is obviously the base of the skull, something I hope most of you are familiar with. Today we will be mostly traveling within the middle cranial fossa and the posterior cranial fossa. So <clears throat> zooming in, this is a top-down view of the midline skull base. So the top of our image here is going to be anterior, the bottom is uh, inferior uh, and posterior, and the sides are lateral. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's take a look at some of the key bony landmarks we're going to use beginning anteriorly and moving posteriorly and inferiorly, so down and back. So first, we find our optic canals, which is where we, of course, find the optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery as they exit the skull and enter the orbit. Remember that cranial nerves are numbered from superior to inferior, so we're going to start with two, work our way three, four, and down. Just posterior lateral to the optic canal, we find the anterior clinoid process which is a projection coming off the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. And this will come into play when we travel along the carotid shortly. Just underneath and anterior to the anterior clinoid, we find the superior orbital fissure, which is a very busy thoroughfare where we're going to find cranial nerves 3, 4, V1, and 6 all exiting the skull going into the orbit. And on the middle fossa floor, we of course have the foramen rotundum, where we find the maxillary nerve, V2, exiting. And the foramen ovale, where we find the mandibular nerve, as well as the lesser petrosal nerve. And the foramen spinosum, where we find the very important middle meningeal artery. 
as we come back a little bit posterior medial, we also have the foramen lacerum. We find only small arteries and veins passing through, but we find the carotid passing on top. So this is important again when we talk about the carotid. And just supramedial to that, we find the posterior clinoid process. So here's our anterior clinoid process coming off the lesser wing, and we have the posterior clinoid process, which is a projection off of the clivus. And the clivus is the central bone of the skull base, and it, it connects the, via the petroclival fissure here, which runs down to the jugular foramen, to the petrous portion of the temporal bone, which of course contains the internal auditory canals where we find cranial nerves seven and eight, as well as the, uh, the labyrinthian artery. I, I'm, I'm listing these simply as a review as we're gonna see most of these structures later in, in depth as we go through. Um, <clears throat> below that, we have the jugular foramen where we of course find cranial nerves uh, nine, 10, and 11, um, as well as the inferior petrosal sinus and the jugular bulb. <clears throat> and below that, we have the hypoglossal canal, where we find the hypoglossal nerve. And last but not least, the largest and most highly trafficked, this is, of course, the foramen magnum, through which we find the medulla, the accessory nerve, the vertebral artery, and the anterior and posterior spinal arteries. So this is a portion of our map. And it's a gross depiction of part of the route we're going to take. Now, the bone and brain have clearly been removed here. But let's, just from uh, this position, descend down a little bit. So we're just moving our perspective slightly inferior. Um, and now we can add the bone back in. Okay. So here we are. This is the posterior fossa over here. And here we have the middle fossa and the anterior fossa over here. We're looking into the middle fossa here. So um, is, do you think this is a left or a right side? What do you think? We're sending out a poll question here. Yeah, so most of you are right. This is indeed a right side. So this is an anterolateral view of midline right side skull base. So this is the right middle fossa. So this is kind of, this is an extradural perspective of the right middle fossa. This is an, actually an intradural perspective of the posterior fossa because you can see the dura here has been left intact where the dura here has been removed. This is the white covering. So all of that is intact. You can see it was cut right along the midline right here in the anterior skull base. So before we move on, let's orient ourselves with this image. So this direction here is anterior. So this is going towards the nose. This is posterior going towards the back of the head, the occiput. Um, <clears throat> this is our midline. So right in the midline here, we have the pituitary gland. So this is true midline skull base. And as we move in this direction, we're moving lateral towards the ear. Up here, this is superior, and down in this direction would be inferior, and then this would be lateral on the left side. So this is all the right side, this is the left side, mostly intradural here, the dura has been removed, so we're extradural and anterior. And we're looking slightly down onto the right side uh, of the middle fossa floor. Now let's look at that in relation to the bone that we just uh, looked at a few, a few minutes ago. Um, so don't be confused by all of the additional structures that were added in. It's the same um, bony anatomy that you're very familiar with. Um, and so again, we have the nose, the vertex, the ear, and the occiput. And so let's identify these surroundings quickly before we journey through the vasculature so we can correlate what, what we see uh, later on. So this uh, is a very important bony structure we saw on the dry skull. This is the anterior clinoid process. And the carotid here is coming 
up just underneath the clinoid. So this becomes very important for accessing the clinoid surgically. We also have the, the optic nerve running right here. So there's our anterior clinoid processes. This is the anterior surface of the petrous portion of the temporal bone. The petrous apex is highlighted in yellow. Now, let's move forward by peeling away the epineurium that's covering the nerves here. So now that we have everything clearly exposed, um, on the very bottom, we can see the foramen spinosum um, cut, I'm sorry, the, the middle meningeal artery coming through the foramen spinosum uh, cut right here. And here we can see where the foramen spinosum is on the dry skull. And moving a little more medially, we find the foramen ovale. And of course, through the foramen ovale, we have the V3 or the mandibular, the V3 branch of the trigeminal nerve. Moving more medially, we have the foramen rotundum and the V2, the maxillary nerve. And of course, the superior orbital fissure where we find V1, the ophthalmic nerve, as well as the trochlear nerve, cranial nerve four here in yellow, uh, which originates on the posterior surface um, uh, the back of the brainstem, and it turns anterior, anteriorly, and it courses laterally around the brainstem. So it has a really long course. It originates all the way in the back, goes around the sides of the brainstem, and then joins and runs with the tentorium, um, and is pretty parallel to the free edge of the tentorium, which we see here in the green arrows. And the uh, and fourth nerve comes in with the free edge of the tentorium, goes into the cavernous sinus uh, and exits through the superior orbital fissure. Um, and uh, so we have third nerve. Third nerve has a much more um, short and direct course. Uh, it comes slightly down. It has a little bit of a superior origin that goes directly down and it comes on top of the posterior clinoid process right here. So this is the clivus, right? And this is the posterior clinoid process. This is the free edge of the tentorium passing uh, laterally to the, the posterior clinoid. And just above it, we have third nerve coming down from its origin and going through the ocular motor triangle, exiting the dura, entering the cavernous sinus on its way to the superior orbital fissure. And down here, deep under here, we have the sixth nerve, the abducens nerve. The, the sixth nerve has a short, direct, and slightly upward intradural trajectory. Um, it exits the dura right here through this opening called Dorello's Canal, enters the cavernous sinus, and travels underneath V1 on top of the carotid on its way to the superior orbital fissure. As it travels through Dorello's Canal, it passes underneath the petrosphenoidal ligament, otherwise known as Gruber's ligament, which forms the roof of Dorello's canal. Another important structure uh, we find in the middle fossa is the greater superficial petrosal nerve, which emerges in the middle fossa as it comes out of this opening here called the facial hiatus. And it, it courses directly medially underneath V3, before it enters the Vidian Canal deep. Um, and this is also very important because we'll see why shortly that this is a great superficial landmark for the petrous portion of the internal carotid artery. So let's go through this anatomy, everything we see here. And all the way up here, we can see intradurally first nerve as it exits the dura and it's going anteriorly um, and then it'll, it'll innervate down through the cribriform plate. Second nerve runs on top of the carotid here, entering the, um, op the optic canal and going into the orbit, right just medial to the anterior clinoid process. 
Then we have third nerve from its more superior origin. It has a slightly inferior direct course, goes on top of the posterior clinoid process, goes through the ocular motor triangle, exiting the dura, entering the cavernous sinus on its way to the superior orbital fissure. Then we have fourth nerve. Remember, we're numbering down. So one, two, three, four. We have fourth nerve originating all the way posteriorly on the posterior margin of the brainstem, coming around laterally the brainstem, coming anteriorly, running with the fridge, the tentorium. The tentorium is cut here. This is a cut. Um, and it's coming in, it's coming with the ten, free edge of the tentorium, it's uh, exiting the dura, entering the cavernous sinus on its way to the superior orbital fissure. Then uh, we have fifth nerve. Fifth nerve has a course that's pretty straight, except as it comes up from the brainstem, it kinks up ever so slightly to go on top of the petrous ridge right here. So it kinks up and it, ent it exits the dura by going into, into Meckel's cave. Enters Meckel's cave, comes out in the middle fossa, so up and over the petrous ridge, into Meckel's cave, into the middle fossa, and trifurcating into V1, going to the SOF, through the cavernous sinus, V2, going through the cavernous sinus to foramen rotundum, and V3, which is not, which is extra cavernous, and going to foramen ovale, going on top of the GSPN, which is running underneath on its way to the vidium canal. Down here, which we don't see in this picture, we also have sixth nerve. Sixth nerve is going straight into Dorello's canal, going underneath V1 on top of the carotid, the cavernous carotid, which is hidden all the way down here, um, and running pretty straight all the way underneath V1, all the way to the SOF, uh, where it exits and enters the orbit. So given what we just said about the right side over here, um, what can, 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 let's see, can you, uh, can you name the structure in yellow? Take a close look at it. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry, that's uh, the wrong poll. Let me see. There we go. About 30% 30, 30 have said it's contralateral abducens. 18% um, say it's contralateral. Um, third nerve. Um, this, is, this is actually still the abducens nerve, but this is the contralateral sixth nerve. Um, and the reason we can uh, say that, um, there are a few reasons. One is this is our clivus, right? So this is the long axis of the clivus, the anterior or the superior to inferior, the caudal or the cranial and caudal direction. Um, cranial up here, so it's coming down the slope. And we know the third nerve passes on top of the posterior clinoid, which is projecting off the superior end of the clivus. So if we follow that around to the other side, this is the opposite side uh, almost. It goes a little bit further. Um, sorry, my mouse wasn't on. Where you can see uh, this is, the, this is the posterior clinoid here, um, and the opposite one would be about here. This is the midline where we find the pituitary. So this is too low to be um, third nerve. And it's, it's, it's just about medial enough to be sixth nerve. And we know that because we generally find sixth nerve um, at the angle between the clivus and the petrous ridge, and that's usually where you find Dorello's canal. So the last thing here 
you might know what this is. This, this may not look familiar, but it should be something you know very well. And this is what we collectively know as the cavernous sinus. You're probably used to seeing the cavernous sinus as this really uh, boring 2D image. Um, but a very easy way to remember it is uh, Odom the cat. Uh, ocular motor, trochlear, ophthalmic, maxillary, carotid abducens. From medial to lateral, from superior to inferior. And we can translate that roughly to what we see uh, in, in a real specimen. So this uh, is a top-down view of the cavernous sinus. The top of the image is, is anterior and the right side is lateral. So this is the right uh, middle fossa, and this is all dura. So this is an intradural perspective at the moment looking out. So now imagine we're hovering here in a helicopter, and we're just going to keep that perspective, but we're going to descend down a little bit. So now we're hovering in the posterior fossa, looking anteriorly. On the left, uh, we are intradural, and on the right, we're extradural. So the white is the dura, it's been removed on the right. Um, so now we can go through that same anatomy from this perspective. So we, we have second nerve here, going into the optic canal, on top of the carotid. It's coming from here where the optic chiasm would be, which is in the midline, just above the pituitary. Here's its stalk. Uh, here's third nerve, and third nerve, as you can see, is going right over, up and over the um, uh, posterior clinoid process, and we can see on the left side that it's exiting the ocular motor, ex or entering the ocular motor triangle, exiting the dura, entering the cavernous sinus. On, this, on the same side, we can see fourth nerve as it's running with the free edge of the tentorium here. Um, the tentorium right here has been cut, but you can see this was the direction four was coming in. So four is coming in, e exiting the dura, entering the cavernous sinus on its way to the superior orbital fissure. As we move down, here's five. And this is the dural entrance into Meckel's cave. So five is coming from about here, very short intradural course, coming up, up and over the Petrus Ridge, entering Meckel's cave. And then you can see it's fanning out on the floor of the middle fossa here. So here's our cavernous sinus down to V2. So V3 going to foramen ovale, V2 to rotundum, and V1 to the superior orbital fissure. And we can see um, just underneath it, here we have sixth nerve. And sixth nerve is pretty inferior to um, five. It's much easier to see in 3D. It's pretty inferior and medial to five. So one, two, sorry, two, three, one's over here. One, two, three, four, five, six. And six is coming up a little bit, going into Dorello's canal, which is covered by Gruber's ligament, entering the cavernous sinus, underneath V1, on its way to the superior orbital fissure. And we have V1, six, four, and three, all interacting with the carotid and the cavernous sinus right here. So before we move on, uh, are there any questions? Okay, well, let's continue. All right, to begin very briefly, the common carotid originates on the left from the aortic arch and on the right from the brachiocephalic artery, uh, which comes off of the aortic arch. Um, so as the common carotid comes up the neck, it bifurcates at the green arrows um, and forming the internal and external carotids. So for our journey along the internal carotid, we'll be navigating using what's known as the Boutier or the Van Loveren classification, which is numbered from proximal to distal following blood flow. Um, so now we'll shrink ourselves down and take on the perspective of carotid as if we were a red blood cell going through. Um, and we begin in the first segment, which starts at a fork in the road. So we're coming up 
And if you close your eyes, you're coming up and you see a fork. And we can either go to the more medial or to the more lateral. Um, and uh, this travels up the neck. So hence the C1 is the cervical segment. And it begins at the bifurcation and goes all the way up to the uh, entrance into the carotid canal. So the first segment of the ICA is the C1 cervical segment, which is long. Uh, travel straight up from the bifurcation until the entrance into the, into the carotid canal. So when you come to that fork in the road, you can either go to the internal or the external carotid. So we're gonna go obviously into the internal carotid. And as we enter the tunnel of the carotid canal, uh, we also enter the petrous bone. Um, and this is unsurprisingly the C2 or the petrous segment of the ICA. And for a moment, we continue, to we continue to travel upward before we encounter the first genu, the first major bend of the carotid. As we, as, as we come up and approach the petrous apex, we take a very sharp, almost 90 degree turn anteromedially, all within the petrous bone. So this is, as we come up right here, this is that first bend, and everything is covered by bone here. Um, we're passing a lot of important structures of the middle ear um, and the internal auditory canal. So we're coming up and we're having that first big bend. And as we do, and we're now we're coming back to a view that we now know, the bone is removed. Um, the, and we can see the carotid right here um, as it emerges from this first bend underneath the GSPN that we saw before. So this is the same view we have up here, just using the dry skull. So that's our first bend, we come up and over the bend. As we look up, we would see normally bone, but since the bone's been removed, here we look up and we see the GSPN running on top of us. So we know we're running in, an, in a lateral to medial direction, ever so slightly anterior. So now here, the, the carotid is as it would normally be, covered by bone. So if, if you can imagine, you're sitting here, and you look up, and you see a very thin uh, layer of bone with a very straight and parallel nerve on top of it. And this is our GSPN as it's going from laterally to medially on its way to go underneath V3. So, the C2 petrous segment continues medially, ever so slightly anteriorly within the petrous bone until going underneath V3 and the trigeminal ganglion, all the way until it reaches the posterior margin of the frame and lacerate. So again, we have C1 from the bifurcation, C1 cervical segment from the bifurcation, all the way up to the entrance into the carotid canal. Then we begin our C2 segment, which begins entering the canal. So we're inside this tunnel of bone. We're going up, up, and then we finally emerge. We turn and we flatten out, we turn up and over, and we're now running medially in the petrous bone. So we go from the C2 cervical, from the uh, entrance into the carotid canal to the posterior margin of the foramen lacer. And during this course, the C2 segment gives off two branches. The first is the carotico-tympanic artery to the middle ear, and the other is the vidian artery, which is going to go in the vidian canal, which would be here. Here is the petrous segment zoomed in with the trigeminal removed. So here we can see, um, to orient ourselves, we have cranial nerve 3, so again, this is the ocular motor nerve, and this is where the ocular motor triangle would be. Um, and it uh, enters the cavernous sinus, exiting the dura, on its way to the superior orbital fissure, which would be here. This is fourth nerve, right here, coming in, exiting the dura, entering the cavernous sinus, on its way to the superior orbital fissure. This is uh, a cut V1 right here. Underneath it, we can see sixth nerve. So here's sixth nerve coming up 
entering Dorella's canal, going underneath Gruber's ligament. This is where the clivus and the petrous bone meet, right here. So this is where sixth nerve comes in, going on top of the carotid, underneath V1, on its course to the superior orbital fissure. This is V2 cut and V3 cut as well. And as we said earlier, the ICA doesn't pass through the frame and lacerum, but rather on top of it. So thus, we have the C3, or the lacerum segment, which begins at the posterior margin of the frame and lacerum, and which is, that, which is roughly beneath V1, uh, or the area between V1 and V2, uh, underneath the, the trigeminal ganglion. Um, actually, let's take a moment here. We can see, uh, here's fifth nerve from its origin, it coming up, going up and over, the petrous ridge has been drilled here. So this is the intradural course of five, going up over that petrous ridge and fanning out so beautifully in the middle fossa, uh, V1, V2, and V3, all of this being the cavernous sinus. Uh, here we have fourth nerve coming all the way around the brain stem from its posterior origin, coming in with that free edge of the tentorium, entering the cavernous sinus. Here's that third nerve course. Again, a little superior origin coming at a slight angle down, downwards into uh, the oculomotor triangle, exiting the dura into the cavernous sinus, uh, and all of them going to the superior orbital fissure. Uh, you can't really see six here. You can see contralateral uh, three, though, quite nicely. Um, and this is where the, the posterior clinoid would be. This is the clivus right here, and that's the long axis of the clivus where we're later going to see the basilar artery. Up here, we have first nerve and second nerve and the pituitary in the midline. This is our orbit. Everything here, the extraocular muscles, you can see the globe right here. Also, we have the uh, middle meningeal artery coming out of the frame and spinosum right here. Here's seven and eight going into the internal auditory canal and going, coming, the seventh nerve is coming into the geniculate ganglion and it's giving off the GSPN um, that we looked at before. And the GSPN is exiting through the facial hiatus, running very superficially on top of the petrous carotid here. So when you're surgically trying to identify the location of the petrous carotid, the GSPN is really invaluable because it's really perfectly superficial and parallel to. So if you're using, doing uh, an anterior transpetrosal approach where you're removing a portion of uh, the petrous ridge right here, it's very useful to know uh, how to avoid the carotid. So this is a, a nice approximation of where the frame and lacerum is, uh, right about uh, V1, V2. Um, and so this is where the carotid has its next major bend. So we had the first major bend as we came up to the, uh, into the petrous bone and we turned medially and then we ran straight through the petrous bone medially towards the midline uh, going from the petrous segment to the lacerum segment on top of the frame and lacerum and now we're going to turn upwards again. We're going to have another one of those really sharp 90 degree angle upward bends as we come in and uh, as we turn superiorly, I should say. So we're going me anterior medial, and then now we're curving superiorly. And as we curve superiorly, we encounter this structure in yellow here. Does anyone know what this structure is? I see there are some questions that came in. I'll answer quickly. Uh, the ligament, uh, well, I'll answer after this one. Is the GS, uh, GSPN the same nerve uh, as the pterygoid canal? Um, yeah, so the GSPN, there, there are three different nerves here. There's the deep petrosal, the lesser petrosal. Um, GSPN comes in, joins uh, with, with the other and becomes the nerve of the pterygoid canal, the vidian nerve. Okay, so the guess here, 32% uh, uh, said this is the petrosphenoidal ligament. 
um, and 26% said this is the anterior petroclinoid ligament. Um, no, actually, this is the petrolingual ligament. Uh, and you don't really see this much surgically because it's really deep in here. Um, and you really have to remove the, well, in theory, would have to remove the trigeminal to see it. But it's a really, it has a really nice function because it really holds the carotid inside the region here. It pins the carotid to the bone. Um, so the carotid isn't twisting around and tearing when you're turning your head left to right. Um, so this um, uh, extends from uh, the petrous apex over here to the lingula of the sphenoid bone. Um, and, and this is important, uh, not just from an evolutionary standpoint, but because here it denotes where the carotid enters the cavernous sinus. So before this, the carotid is extra cavernous. In here, the carotid enters the cavernous sinus. So again, we have the C1 cervical segment from the carotid bifurcation all the way to the entrance into the carotid canal, straight, no branches. Then we have the C2 or the petrous segment from the carotid canal up, curving medially inside the petrous bone all the way to the posterior margin of the foramen lacerum. And the C2 segment gives off the carotico-tympanic in the median arteries. And then we have the lacerum segment from the posterior margin of foramen and lacerum bending upwards superiorly uh, until we go underneath the petrolingual ligament and enter the cavernous sinus. And the C3 lacerum segment does not give off any branches. So now we have the C4 uh, or the cavernous segment, which begins at the petrolingual ligament and continues up traveling underneath the abducens nerve, which we, we saw before. Here's our sixth nerve. We can see right here as well, Dorello's canal, Gruber's or the petrosphenoidal ligament up here, petrosphenoidal ligament, petrolingual ligament, um, and going underneath V1. So um, as the carotid comes up, as we're going through the carotid and we, go, we come underneath this petrolingual ligament, this sort of archway, we look up and we're going underneath this small uh, two-layered thoroughfare. We have one uh, overpass here with, with six nerve, and on top of that is a little bit larger of an overpass with six nerve. As we continue up, we're also going to encounter the much smaller fourth nerve and then also the pretty large uh, third nerve. So the cavernous ICA uh, then bends inferiorly uh, this time, and it kinks out ever so slightly laterally. So it's going up and then down and then slightly kinking out laterally. Um, and then turning again and going upward until we get to the proximal dural ring. So C4, petrolingual ligament all the way up and then down slightly lateral then going back up again it's almost like an s shape um, it's not it's not this perfect in every person uh, but it you usually find at least one uh, and a half major bends um, maybe not so acute um, so we then we find the proximal all the way to the proximal dural ring here uh, which is found just underneath where the anterior clinoid process would be, the so-called clinoid space. And this is where the anterior clinoid process would project. So if you drill it out and you remove it, you have created the clinoid space, which is important if you want to access these structures uh, to cut them and mobilize the carotid um, laterally. And we'll see why in a minute. Um, so, um, over, over the course of the cavernous sinus, the internal of the cavernous segment here gives off three main branches. The first is the meningohypophyseal trunk over here, then the infralateral trunk down here, and also some McConnell's capsular arteries on the medial aspect. The meningohypophyseal trunk, the MHT, arises um, 
from the posterior aspect of that first downward bend. So we're coming up and then down. And this is, uh, this is the MHT right here. So you can see it's the posterior surface right here, and it's projecting posterior medially. Um, and as we can also see, if we keep looking, so that we have that first bend, and now we're coming down, and you can see how the carotid kinks out ever so laterally, uh, slightly, ever so slightly laterally, before it turns back up and comes to the proximal dural ring right here. Proximal dural ring is also a nice feature to keep that carotid tethered to the bone. So just looking quickly at the anatomy again here, here's the clivus, right? Here's where the posterior clinoid is on the edge. Um, this is third nerve, so we've come over the posterior clinoid, going down, ex entering the oculomotor triangle, exiting the dura, entering the cavernous sinus, the SOF, second nerve, um, as it enters the optic canal, uh, you can see uh, this ridge of uh, dura here is the falciform ligament. Um, here we have fourth nerve running with that free edge of the tentorium. Free edge is, or the tentorium itself is cut more posteriorly here. So you can really appreciate the relationship between fourth nerve and the tentorium as it exits the dura, entering the cavernous sinus, also going to the superior orbital fissure. Um, down here, we have fifth nerve uh, exiting the dura, entering Meckel's cave, going out into the middle fossa again and fanning out. And here's sixth nerve right here. And you can see as it goes into Durell's canal, again, covered by Gruber's ligament, going underneath V1 on its way to the uh, superior orbital fissure. So here we have the meningohypophyseal trunk. And this trunk consists of three to four main branches. The first is the inferior hypophyseal artery. So I like to imagine this is, as we're coming down, you know, we're coming up the, uh, the C4 highway here, this is our first exit ramp. And when this can take us to several small towns along the way. So the first one is the inferior hypophyseal artery, um, and that goes to uh, the pituitary gland. Um, then we have the artery of Bernasconi and Castanari, which is the tentorial artery, um, going towards the tentorium, which has been removed here, so we don't really see it. And then we have the dorsal meningeal artery, the dura uh, of the upper clivus, um, going towards the dura of the upper clivus, um, as well as some small clival branches scattered throughout. So you can really appreciate this branch nicely here. Okay, so just for fun, let's answer a, a neurosurgery board review question about the MHT. So what is the most constant branch of the MHT? The overwhelming response seems to be the inferior hypophyseal artery. I believe the most constant branch is the artery of Bernasconi and Casanari, or the tentorial artery. Um, but uh, I, I, maybe the literature has changed since the, the last board review book was published. But uh, as far as I know, it's the Italian artery. The artery of Bern Bernasconi and Casanari is the most constant branch. Uh, what does most constant mean? It means that you, what you find most commonly uh, on angio. So what, what is the most uh, consistently found branch? Um, okay, so now as we continue down towards the second genu, um, we find the infralateral trunk. And we find that here because it is both inferior and lateral. So all the way up here, we have the meningohypophyseal trunk, but as we come down, we have uh, coming off the inferior and lateral surface of the vessel as well, the infralateral trunk, which gives three to, three to four small branches that uh, supply the nearby cranial nerves. Here, uh, we see a branch going to V1, not the most common, but uh, it's quite clear. Um, so from here, the ICA comes up and passes through the proximal dural ring. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, and it's exiting the cavernous sinus 
and becoming um, both extra cavernous and extra dural. So we're coming, we have C1 from the uh, bifurcation to the carotid canal, C2 from the carotid canal to the posterior margin of foramen lacerum, giving off the carotid or tympanic and vidian arteries. We have C3 from the foramen lacerum to the petrolingual ligament, giving off no branches. And we have C4 from the petrolingual ligament coming up, giving off the MHT up here, coming down, giving off the infralateral trunk down here, coming up and going through or ending at the proximal dural ring. And then the carotid is passing through the proximal dural ring and it's exiting the cavernous sinus right here. So this proximal dural ring, uh, together with all the meningeal architecture in this area, is really sealing that cavernous sinus off together. So now as we're exiting the cavernous sinus, we're becoming both extra cavernous and extra dural. And we enter the C5 or the clinoid segment. And of course, this is named the clinoid segment because we're now in the clinoid space where the anterior clinoid would normally cover. And this is a very small but very important segment of the carotid. And it extends from the proximal dural ring until the distal dural ring, which, is, which are both underneath the anterior clinoid process. And so what it means by being both extra cavernous and extra dural is that if you had a bleed here, it would not be a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So, um, and this segment ends at the distal dural ring where the carotid does in fact enter the, enter the dura. So it differentiates the type of bleed as well. So here's our distal dural ring and this is where the carotid now enters the dura and goes into the dura properly and becomes intradural. So let's take a closer look at this C5 region before we move extra, uh, intradural, excuse me. Um, okay. So again, here's, here's where the frame and last room would be. This is the internal opening of the um, carotid canal um, frame and last room. Um, and uh, this is the clivus. This is a right side uh, ICA. Here's the anterior clinoid process. This is the cella. So this is where the pituitary would be. Uh, this is where the posterior clinoid process would be up here. So carotid's coming in. It's coming. This is where the petrolingual ligament would be right here. And in, in actually, in some people, it's completely ossified. So it's solid bone. Um, and as you come up, uh, we have that first bend coming superiorly, coming up. We have our exit road or the meningo hypophyseal trunk. Um, that's our first possible exit. Then we're going to come back down the slope uh, and we can exit uh, if we wanted to go to the cranial nerves or exit the skull right here. A very easy way would be hop on the infralateral trunk and it could take us out to the cranial nerves and to the foramen that are right there. If not, we come back up and we go underneath the anterior clinoid process and we exit the cavernous sinus and we go in between the proximal and distal dural rings. So if we look at this uh, really nice illustration on the right, there's so much information you can glean from this. Um, and we can see down here, this is the proximal dural ring. So this is this, you can see how this seals off the cavernous sinus. This, these lines here are supposed to represent the venous plexus of the cavernous sinus. And on the right, uh, this is, these would be the nerves here. So three, four, and V1. And this is the, the anterior clinoid process. So as we come up, we're exiting that cavernous sinus, and we're now extradural, extra cavernous. As we go enter the distal dural ring here, we enter the dura and become intradural. And both the proximal dura and di uh, I'm sorry, the distal and proximal dural rings meet and connect posteriorly. And in many texts, you'll find this is referred to as the carotid collar. And it's not as confusing as many books and, and publications make it out to be. Um, uh, you know, and your deed's technically challenging to deal with, but the anatomy here really isn't so complicated. Um, and these rings uh, join in the back, so you have to, to, and you can open them up if you wanted to access this region. Um, and the reason you would do so is because this is not an uncommon site for aneurysms. This is the carotid cave, the medial aspect 
of the carotid. So you can get a carotid cave aneurysm here. Um, so you have to come in, shave down the anterior clinoid process, cut the distal dural ring, mobilize the carotid laterally, and you can expose the carotid cave. So before we move intradurally, until this point again, we have C1, cervical segment, we have the fork in the road we come to, we hop on the internal carotid artery highway, so we go from the C1 bifurcation all the way into our entrance into the carotid canal. We enter the carotid canal, we go into our tunnel, we have the petrous segment, um, if, and we uh, go in all the way straight up and we curve over. If we wanted to go to the middle ear, we can get on the carotid tympanic artery. If we wanted to go uh, you know, into the vidian canal, we can hop on the vidian artery. If not, we stay straight anteromedially. Um, we, we emerge from the carotid canal underneath the trigeminal nerve um, and uh, on top of the frame and lacerum. We get, we're in the lacerum segment now, which extends all the way up to the petrolingual ligament, which we'll find right here. Um, so we want to go to the cavernous sinus. We take the bend of this road superiorly all the way up. We're intracavernous. We look up. We can see sixth nerve on top of sixth nerve. We know there's a V1 because those two run on, you know, run uh, one on top of the other. Um, as and here's sixth nerve uh, separated to show. As we go further, we're going to encounter fourth nerve on top of us. Um, then we can uh, exit by the meningohypophyseal trunk if we're going to one of these small places around here. If not, we keep going, we come down. There's third nerve on top of us. Um, third nerve and fourth nerve can cross the carotid you know, two to three times in this region. Um, and as we come down, if we wanted to exit and go to any of these little uh, vascular outposts here to the cranial nerves exiting, we can hop on the infralateral trunk. If not, we stay on the carotid, so C4, uh, petrolingual ligament all the way to the proximal dural ring um, and then we're underneath the anterior clinoid process and uh, we come up just uh, immediately up to the anterior clinoid process and then we're between the proximal and distal dural rings and the clinoid C5 segment um, and then we can if we wanted to go intradural we can go through that distal dural ring so before we move uh, intradural, uh, are there any questions? I'll, I'll give you a minute because I saw someone posted last time after I asked it. Someone said, could you point that out again? I don't know what that refers to. Uh, the petro, petro Okay, so uh, yeah, so the, um, can you demonstrate the petrosphenoidal and, pe and petrolingual ligaments, I think? So this is the petrosphenoidal um, ligament, the Gruber's ligament. And it goes from um, the clivus, the petrous apex. It runs almost medial to lateral. And if you imagine, let me see if this other previous image shows it better, yeah. So the, the clivus comes down and at some point it joins the petrous ridge and that forms an angle. And so the Gruber's ligament just covers that little angle between the clivus and the petrous ridge. And that in, within that angle is Dorello's canal. And that's where we find sixth nerve. And it's, it's about at the level of the petrous ridge. About drawing, which is the complete one, which is not. Can you explain? Um, I don't. I don't know fully what you mean by complete. Um, they both wrap completely around the carotid, and they meet posteriorly, and, and both the proximal and dural rings connect posteriorly. Um, which cranial nerves actually go through the cavernous sinus versus go, going along the dura of the cavernous sinus? That's actually a fairly loaded question. Um, because if you ask a, a histopathologist uh, versus a neurosurgeon, you'll probably get two different answers. Um, the way um, it's traditionally taught is that uh, V2 all the way up to 
third nerve or run through the dura of the cavernous sinus, which makes up the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. We're actually putting a big paper out about this uh, next week. Um, so you'll find in the dura propria of the cavernous sinus, you'll find three, four, uh, V1, and deep to that, you'll find six. Um, let's see. Do you find much anatomical variation in the main structures? Um, not a ton. Uh, you will see some variation in the curvature of the carotid here. Um, also, the angle of the carotid. Um, you, actually, we just published a paper looking at what happens if the carotid uh, is low coursing uh, and you have an aneurysm here and it shortens this opening. So you have to figure out how to deal with that. Um, but in general, you don't find a ton of variation. Three and four almost always run together um, and on their way to the SOF. Um, and given the bone, the large bone openings of the SOF, the foramen rotundum and the foramen ovale, it's pretty consistent. The most, in general, uh, cranially, the most uh, anatomically variant structures are veins. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, what other indications for creating the clinoid space and mobilizing the carotid laterate? Uh, I don't want to get too much into the specifics of, um, I'll stop my video. I don't want to get too much into the specifics of uh, indications for skull base surgery, but uh, there are a number of reasons why you might drill the clinoid, not just mobilizing the carotid. In some cases, you have to open up the superior orbital fissure to mobilize uh, third or fourth nerve. Um, if you need to get into or through the cavernous sinus, that's another reason. Uh, if you need to just make space, there are two main surgical windows here. One is the optico-carotid window, meaning you're creating a window between the uh, optic nerve and the internal carotid. The other is the carotid ocular motor window. As you can even see from this image, one is going to be much larger than the other. So just to, to create that window, you can cut the distal dual ring to to mobilize the carotid slightly and open it up. Um, if you were doing a really extensive skull base opening and you wanted to go all the way into the posterior fossa up here, you could uh, mobilize, you could do those things, create, uh, expand the carotid ocular motor window to get to the petrous, I'm sorry, the posterior clinoid process. You could drill down the posterior clinoid process all the way here, which gives you access to the base of the tip region especially if you have a little bit lower, lower riding basal than in this image. Uh, basilar tip, most basilar tip aneurysms are coiled these days, uh, but you know, not everywhere in the world uh, has endovascular capabilities. So that's one indication. Also, if you wanted to get to the SCA right at its origin um, or anything on the upper third, that's a, that's a good skull base way to do it, is going doing the, uh, uh, oh, sorry, my mouse wasn't on. Uh, basilar tip is over here. This is the SCA. PCA, so you could take down some of the um, uh, posterior clinoid process to get into this region by going through this window here. Um, the easier to know surgical clip and aneurysm that is between the distal and proximal dural rings compared to others? Uh, definitely not. Um, so anything more superficial, like a superficial MCA aneurysm, would be uh, much easier. Uh, at which point the carotid on its way into the carotid canal and distally pierces the dura. Um, okay, sure. So again, um, carotid enters the skull at the carotid canal. Um, uh, I'm sorry, it enters the skull at the carotid canal, it comes up, and then it emerges, let me see if we get a better image, and it comes up here, so it's coming this way, right? So this is the midline in this image, so this is lateral. So it's coming up, and you can see the angle here is slightly anterior. That's why I say it courses medially and slightly anterior as it comes up. So it's coming up, and it emerges at the intracranial orifice of the carotid canal. So we start to see it here. Um, and it's coming underneath the trigeminal nerve, and GSPN will be running on top of it. And then it kinks up, and it goes underneath the petrolingual ligament, and that's where it enters the cavernous sinus. So it's intracavernous here, right? So it's extradural, extradural, intracavernous, after the petrolingual ligament, intracavernous all the way until the proximal dural ring, 
then it becomes extra cavernous, extra dural, and then it goes to the distal dural ring right here, and it, it enters the dura, and it becomes truly intradural. Um, Okay. Um, uh, you know what? If whoever asked about Parkinson's triangle, ask me again at the very end, and uh, we can pull up some images to look at because I don't want to get too much into cavernous sinus triangles right now. But six nerves would be here, and V1 runs on top of it. Um, so it's it's over here, but we, we can we can look at that a little more laterally. Um, there are a number of different uh, middle fossa triangles that can be used to work in and around this area. Um, okay, so let's keep going. Um, but before we, we jump into the dura, let's just stop for a moment to take a quick look at the middle meningeal artery um, as it's clinically important. Uh, at the carotid bifurcation, the external carotid comes up parallel to the internal carotid and it, it terminates into two branches. The first is the superficial temporal artery, which runs laterally up the uh, side of the skull with the temporalis muscle. It's a great uh, uh, target for bypass, um, as well as the internal maxillary artery, which is running in this direction uh, towards the uh, infratemporal integral palatine fossae. Um, and the internal maxillary artery gives off the middle meningeal artery in most cases. Uh, and then the MMA then enters the skull through the foramen spinosa. And here we can see, again, from our perspective that we should be comfortable with now, here's the foramen spinosum, here's the middle, menin middle meningeal artery entering. And the middle meningeal artery um, tethers the dura of the temporal lobe down to the floor of the middle fossa. So if you, if you wanted to move that dura, you have to, one of the things you have to do is, is ligate this artery. So it comes up, and again, here's our GSPN going over the carotid. We can see the carotid here as it's coming out of the carotid canal. This has been drilled out so you can see it. Um, it would naturally come out a little bit more medial, and then the carotid's coming up underneath uh, here, entering the cavernous sinus, and we can see as a quick mention, this is the distal dural ring. So you can see very clearly how it comes up. This is the proximal dural ring. So right here is C5. So it's extra cavernous, extra dural, then it's coming up and in, it's very short. Um, this is the clinoid space where the anterior clinoid would have been. And this is the carotid entering the dura through the distal dural ring right here. And we can see it's going right underneath second nerve as it's going into the optic canal. And then again, third nerve coming off the brainstem, that's its origin. This is its entire intradural course. Um, don't forget that, well, we would normally down here see the, the SCA and the PCA, uh, which have been cut. This is the basilar artery. So we have third nerve coming in, going all the way on top of that posterior clinoid process into the oculomotor triangle, down into the cavernous sinus. Fourth nerve would be in here with the free edge of the tentorium, which is also wrapping around the brainstem. So back to the middle meningeal artery, is, which is clinically important because it is the most common site of epidural hematomas. So very briefly on the left, uh, we have an axial non-contrast CT that shows a large uh, right biconvex hyperdensity consistent with an epidural hematoma. And as we can see, it's causing mass effect here. And that mass effect is also causing, we see, is causing midline shift. And we can see the midline shift because as we can identify the fox right here, we can see it's not uh, in the midline. It's being displaced uh, uh, to the contralateral side. So in general, um, epidurals look like lemons. They are extra dural. Um, and they are emergent in part because they can cause uncle herniation. And I'm sure in your textbooks, you've, you've learned a lot about different herniation syndromes uh, in the brain, but it's much easier when you take a look at what that actually means. So where's the uncus? Uh, the uncus is the medial part of the temporal lobe. It's the most medial part. And when it comes down, uh, because of swelling or being pushed or mass effect, it comes down and it's pushing on the third nerve. And that is why you see a blown pupil. 
So it comes down and pushes on the third nerve. And this of itself is not necessarily life-threatening, but what is life-threatening is uh, if untreated, the uncus can also compress the midbrain, uh, causing respiratory arrest and death. So um, you can see here, this is superior, right? Here's our midbrain going up. There's the medial portion of the temporal lobe. And again, here's the origin of third nerve going straight on top of uh, the posterior clinoid. This is the free edge of the tentorium wrapping around. So we'd expect to see fourth nerve running with this. And this is coming over the posterior clinoid and exiting the dermis. So uh, a couple clinical correlations here. One is uncle herniation. The other is the middle meningeal artery. Uh, most common site of epidural hematomas. Okay, so now back to the internal carotid artery. We have gone uh, extradurally from the bifurcation through the petrous bone, through the cavernous sinus, and up to the distal dural ring. Now we pass through the distal dural ring right here, and uh, we enter the dura. And we turn yet again. Um, I just wanna make sure we're familiar with this view. This is a top-down view of the midline skull base. So anterior, we are superior looking down. So this is anterior, we're looking infer uh, inferiorly. And this would be lateral. And this is the midline. So this is the long axis of the clivus. When I say long axis, I mean superior to inferior and slightly anterior to posterior. It comes down towards the foramen magnum down, down at the bottom. We very clearly see the posterior clinoid process here. This is our pituitary, our pituitary stalk. Here is third nerve coming up. It was when we saw it in the last image, it was right about here. We saw it coming up. Now it's going straight. Again, ocular motor triangle, cavernous sinus, superior orbital fissure, second nerve, optic canal. Fourth nerve, we can see here. We don't really see it here very much, but it's coming in exiting the dura, going into the cavernous sinus on top of the carotid, cavernous carotid, uh, on its way to the superior orbital fissure. Um, we have fifth nerve going up and over that petrous ridge, coming down, fanning out V1, uh, V2, and V3. Um, here we can see the GSPN. The middle meningeal artery is right here. And here's our petrous carotid. So our petrous carotid, again, coming through carotid canal, foramen lacerum, up, petrolingual ligament, cur coursing up, giving off that uh, meningohypophyseal trunk, coming down. You can see the kinking laterally very clearly here. Um, it's very noticeable in angio. Uh, and then you can see the, uh, or here we have the infralateral trunk. And then we come back up. We exit the cavernous sinus via the proximal, proximal dural ring. We have our clinoid segment. Um, and then we come up and we can enter the dura through the distal dural ring. So this segment here is the C6 or ophthalmic segment as it gives off the ophthalmic artery right here. And it extends from the distal dural ring to just proximal to the posterior communicating artery. In addition to the ophthalmic artery right here, the C6 segment gives off the superior hypophyseal artery. And when we saw the inferior hypophyseal artery coming off the meningohypophyseal trunk, going inferiorly to the pituitary, and this is the superior hypophyseal coming off the carotid and going superiorly to the superior uh, surface up here of the pituitary. So there's our C6 segment. So um, just to, uh, you can kind of figure out where we are. This is, uh, we're anteriorly now looking. Posteriorly, these are the ears on either side. These are the, the top of the orbit here, the superorbital, the eyelids. Uh, you can see the frontal sinus here. So the brain uh, on the end, you know, the front of the brain here, the frontal lobe has been cut. These are the roof of the orbits here. Um, and this is the uh, left, this is the right and left optic nerves going into the uh, optic canals. Um, so we're just gonna flip this image to take a closer look. Okay, so now on to the last segment of the ICA, the C7 or the communicating segment, which extends from the 
uh, posterior communicating artery origin to the terminal bifurcation into the anterior and middle cerebral arteries. Let's take a closer look. But before we go, let's, before we do, let's just go back and quickly take a look at our, our real circle of Willis to see what we're looking for. So remember, this is our cavernous segment, right? And as the carotid comes up here, we can see it comes up and it gives off, so we have C6 right here, gives off that uh, uh, posterior communicating artery, which is going all the way to the PCA, the posterior cerebral artery. Um, so it becomes the C7 segment and then it comes up and it gives off the ACA medially and the MCA laterally. And as it enters the dura, um, actually, let's go back for one second. Uh, as, as the carotid enters the dura, it's turning yet again. So we have, we're coming back up, distal dura ring, and then all of a sudden, we're going back on top of ourselves. So we're coming almost directly posteriorly, slightly laterally. So this is our course and until we form the ACA and the MCA. So we're going to take this view. Let's flip it upside down and see that. So here we are, here is the carotid, right, coming up and forming the MCA and the ACA. Let's skip ahead. Okay, so now we're going to zoom in. So now our frontal lobes are here. Let's just orient ourselves since we flipped again. Um, this, is in, this is inferior. We are anterior looking posterior. Um, and these are the frontal lobes that are being retracted superiorly. And of course, when I'm speaking about anatomical terms, I'm referring um, to the uh, I'm referring to the um, anatomical orientation, not our orientation. So, you know, even though this is down, this is in a superior direction that they're being pulled. Um, so, what we're looking at is we're looking down into the anterior skull base. So, this is the anterior skull base. This is our pituitary gland. This is uh, the pituitary stalk. Um, and we can see the ICA coming up underneath that second nerve, like we saw before, coming up and terminating into the MCA and ACA. So this, this is our first nerve. First nerve has a very simple, straight and direct course. It goes uh, from its origin all the way down to the cribriform plate, and that's it. It's, unless you have a meningioma here, not really con that common to interact with. And then for the second nerve, uh, we have the optic chiasm here. So we have the left optic nerve and the right optic nerve going into the optic canals and then into the orbit. So as we follow the ICA up, we come to that fork in the road. Um, we have our medial road. We can either go uh, medial or lateral. So if we go medial, uh, we join the anterior cerebral artery, which comes pretty much on top of the chiasm or the lamina terminalis, which is that kind of clear membrane part over here posterior to the chiasm. Uh, and we come and we course upwards and we form our A1 segment. And then we have the other side that goes lateral, which is the middle cerebral artery and the M1 segment of the MCA. So, here we have that same image, but the clivus has been removed. Same perspective. And if you think about what we're really looking at here, this is the entire so-called circle of Willis. Let's look at that 2D uh, image again. Does it look like anything you're actually looking at here? Not really, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's incredibly challenging to try and understand this, whether you're seeing it in surgery or you're seeing it on angiography or on, on, uh, on any type of scan. Uh, it's very difficult. This is actually uh, our basal, our vertebral artery. Here. This is our basal artery. This is our carotid coming up. This is our uh, the first segment uh, entrance into the uh, carotid canal. So our, our C2 segment coming up. And then we can see our cavernous segment after it comes and immediately courses up is our cavernous ICA coming up and it's exiting and entering the dura right here. It comes up, so going underneath the second nerve, coming up and giving off the MCA and the ACA. So 
this gives you, oh, sorry, this gives you a slightly better idea of what uh, we're looking at here um, in terms of this image. You can see this is, this, is real, this is now in an anatomical position. Superior is up, inferior is down. Here's the brainstem, all bone removed. Um, and here's the posterior circulation and anterior circulation. And you can see that here as well, posterior circulation, anterior circulation. Okay, so um, this uh, image may be familiar to some of you. This is um, a textbook presentation of a, of a right MCA infarct, uh, otherwise known as an ischemic stroke. Um, and the reason uh, you see it, and it looks this way, um, is because the MCA supplies the entire hemisphere. So when you have an infarct that's stopping blood flow, it's essentially lights out, depending, obviously depending on where the infarct is. But if you have it low enough on the MCA, um, you can get a, a true a lights out of the whole uh, affected hemisphere. And we can see that here. Um, and we can see as, let's take a look at the carotid again. As we come up, this is the carotid right at the very bottom. We're coming up from into the carotid canal. That's our first genu of the C2 segment. So we're inside the petrous bone. You can even see, this is, this is angio, right? So it's, it's x-ray, it's fluoroscopy. You can see that this is more uh, white than this segment because this is bone. So this is the carotid canal. It's coming in and then it's exiting the carotid canal here. You can see it becomes darker and more clear right here. So this is the opening of the carotid canal. Foramen lacerum is right here. It's coming up. This is probably where the petrolingual ligament is. It's coming up. And then the reason it's not flat, we, we see too, is because remember we said that inferior bend of the cavernous segment kinks out ever so slightly laterally. That's why we see something that's thick and not, because this is an anterior posterior perspective. So if they were perfectly in line, it would look like one single vessel to us. But because they're not perfectly aligned, you do see that anterior bend a little bit more. So it comes back up, the, the illustration's a little more clear on this one. So it comes back up um, uh, and then it goes through the uh, proximal dural ring, exits the cavernous sinus, uh, goes to the distal dural ring, enters the dura. We can see it coming up right here comes up uh, and then this is where it'll give up the ophthalmic and superior hypophyseal artery. You can see the superior hypophyseal there. Um, this is very likely the ophthalmic artery and it comes up and then it, it ends at in the, either the ACA going medially or the MCA going laterally. So you can see why if we have a, an obstruction of flow right here to our more distal segments, why um, they're we get that, that appearance on uh, an ischemic stroke because um, an infarct here really cuts off the whole supply. There's not a lot of contralateral flow right about here. Um, and you can see here, uh, the M1 segment uh, comes up uh, right here. So M1 comes up, it gives off the lenticulostriate arteries here. Uh, and then it comes into the sylvian fissure um, and it has the sylvian segment, the M2 segment, the M3 is the opercular segment, and then up here, M4, uh, we have the cortical segment. So the MCA is a hugely important uh, vessel for uh, cortical supply. So let's take another look um, at the intradural segments of the carotid, but this time from a surgical perspective. This is what's known as a frontoorbitozygomatic approach where you, you do a terrional approach, you remove the roof and lateral wall of the orbit, as well as the zygoma. Um, and once the dura is open here, uh, the sylvian fissure can be split, and this is what's known as a transylvian view. So here we have a right side sylvian fissure open. Here's our temporal lobe, here's our frontal lobe, Here's our more distal sylvian segment of the MCA. So MCA aneurysm is very common. You can see uh, aneurysms uh, in this area too. And then we have the insula. So this is going 
opening up the full sylvian fissure. Normally, you can just open up some up here to get down here. But, uh, um, but if we zoom in, and just actually before we do, just take note of the orientation here, right? So this is the right eye, right side. This is the right eye. Um, and this is inferior in this direction, superior, posterior, down here. So we're zooming in up at the front. So this is the most anterior portion of the temporal lobe, the anterior horn. Um, and then uh, we, as we come in between here, this is where the sylvian fissure is. We can start to see the optic nerve. So let's zoom in further. Okay, so again, let's orient ourselves. So this direction, the top of the image, is anterior. The bottom of the image is, this direction is posterior. This is inferior, down, going down, and then towards us a little bit is lateral. So anterior, posterior, we're lateral looking medial. Right, so here again, we have the carotid coming up. So this right here is that distal dural ring. So this is where the carotid enters the dura. And you can see this perspective is a true intradural perspective. We haven't, we haven't opened the dura to look extradurally. We haven't gone extradural. First here, we're just we've gone through the sylvian fissure. We've opened up the, the dura of the temporal lobe, gone through the sylvian fissure, and now we're intradural. So we see the carotid coming up and the carotid is entering the dura here at the distal dural ring. This is actually the falciform ligament right here that's been cut. So you, you can, and it's been cut to show the ophthalmic artery. And here we can see, this is the beginning of that C6 segment. Here's the ophthalmic artery. Here's the superior hypophyseal artery, which is going to the pituitary. This is second nerve coming in, going into the optic canal. So this same exact perspective, but uh, just a different specimen. Um, and here, this is that C6 segment. So this is uh, the entrance into the dura distal dura ring, second nerve. Here's third nerve, right? This is the free edge of the tentorium. Here's third nerve going into the ocular motor triangle. So just underneath it, here we find the anterior clinoid process. So uh, this is C6. Uh, and which goes all the way um, uh, until the, um, uh, just uh, to the posterior communicating artery, which we find here. And the posterior communicating artery connects anterior circulation to posterior circulation, anastomosing with the posterior cerebral artery. And you can see the PCOM here gives off a lot of perforators. Then, as we continue moving along, now remember, we're intradural. So if we opened up all this dura and we looked down, we'd see the carotid coming back over itself again, right? Because remember, it's coursing posteriorly here. And it's parallel to the uh, second nerve. And as it comes up C7 segment, just proximal to the origin of the PCOM, all the way until it's terminated as we go laterally into the MCA and medially into the ACA. So we've said from the beginning, C1, bifurcation to canal, no branches. C2, canal to foramen lacerum, carotico-tympanic and vidian artery. C3, foramen lacerum to the petrolingual ligament, no branches. C4, cavernous, from petrolingual ligament to the proximal dural ring, gives off the MHT, the ILT, and McConnell's capsular arteries. C5, between the dural rings, between the proximal and distal dural rings, no branches. C6, like we saw, comes in from the distal dural ring to the posterior communicating artery, and it gives off the um, ophthalmic artery and the superior hypophyseal artery. C7 comes in, it gives off the posterior communicating artery, the middle cerebral artery, the anterior cerebral artery, I'm sorry, the middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery, and as well as one other vessel down here. Um, just see if that's our next question. 
This is yes. What vessel is this? Wow, people are really uh, are overwhelmingly voting for Webner. And the reason is actually now that I'm looking at this, I apologize. I did not put the correct answer into the poll. So uh, I don't want to confuse you by this. I meant to put in uh, the anterior choroidal artery, which is what uh, we're looking at here. So I, I apologize, I got this one wrong. Um, this is the anterior choroidal artery, which supplies a number of eloquent cortical structures, as well as the choroid plexus, the lateral ventricle, hence the name choroidal. Sorry about the poll. Ah, I, so I see my mistake now. Actually, the poll, the, let me try this again. The poll is asking about this artery. So yeah, most of you are on the right track that it's something in posterior circulation. So remember, this is anterior circulation coming up, and then this is going laterally, sorry, medially, and this is going laterally. And we said this is the posterior communicating artery, which comes off an anastomosis with posterior circulation, specifically the posterior cerebral artery. This from here, sorry, from here to here is the PCOM. This is the posterior cerebral artery. So this is PCOM coming, and this is right where an anastomosis with the posterior cerebral artery. And this is the basal artery right back here. So coming up, and it's terminating in the posterior uh, cerebral artery. This is that anastomosis, which would make this the SCA. We also can tell that it's the SCA because it's inferior to third nerve, and it's infratentorial. The PCA is supratentorial, the SCA is infratentorial. Okay, so moving a little bit medial, we can see the ICA giving off, actually here again, so we were just zoomed in, very similar perspective. Here's our uh, carotid coming, there it is giving off the MCA, there's our ACA. So here we can see the ACA coming up, um, and it is, you can see right here, it's anastomosing with the anterior communicating artery. And the anterior communicating artery, the ACOM, is very tiny. And this is it. It's also a very common site for aneurysms. So on this side, this is the contralateral. This is the left carotid. Remember, we're on the right side. So this is the left carotid coming up. There's the left MCA. There's the right MCA. And we can see the right MCA coming up. I'm sorry, uh, right ACA. I apologize. Right ACA coming up. Uh, there's our ACOM. Uh, Oh, sorry, left ACA coming up, ACOM, right ACA. Right ACA, left ACA, communicating via the anterior communicating artery. Left side, right side. Right MCA, left MCA. One of the questions I always ask um, when I start a new course is I ask uh, how many cranial nerves there are. Because, and most, most people will answer 12 or 13, depending on what you read. And I, I point out that no, the answer is 24, because you always have to be thinking bilaterally. Because very rarely, whether, you know, even if it's looking at a scanner, you're going to be really just looking at one side. Or, if, for example, from this perspective, we're looking at both left and right. Or before, you can see both third nerve. Or like when we saw contralateral six at the beginning. So it's very important to keep in mind that it's not ever a unilateral perspective. You always have to consider that you're seeing the contralateral side. And surgically, sometimes a vascular surgeon might elect to approach a, 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 an aneurysm, even contra, contralaterally, depending on its extension. 
So you would go the long way. So always keep in mind, you're looking for, for bilaterality. So um, here again, we can see a little bit more clearly, right side, left side, right uh, ICA coming up, right MCA, uh, right ACA coming up, there's their anterior communicating artery, left ICA, ACA, MCA. In the middle, we have the pituitary stalk, the pituitary, the superior hypophyseal artery. We'd expect to find the ophthalmic artery right here. And these are the frontal lobes being retracted because we're a little more medial. And uh, coming back to this view, we can see where the ACAs go, right? Here's our, our carotid coming up. There's our A1. Um, this is our anterior communicating artery. And they just go vertically up. Um, and you don't really see the corpus callosum here, but this is it for, you know, it forms the pericolosal arteries and it comes all the way up and supplies the cortex up here. So let's quickly take a look at this anatomy on angio. This um, is the arterial phase of a left carotid angiogram. Um, it's a lateral view, uh, left side lateral view. So in this case, you have contrast medium injected into the left internal carotid passing through the anterior and middle cerebral arteries up here, let's follow it. So, and this uh, dotted line is the base of the skull. So as we come up, this is our cervical carotid. As we turn, uh, sorry, we enter, we enter right here, the carotid canal, uh, the, the petrous bone carotid canal, inside the petrous bone, we turn. Now remember, you're looking laterally. So uh, you have to imagine the plane you're looking at. So this is what this, that turn, medially looks like from this perspective. And then we come in straight and we turn again. And this time we're, we're coursing up, we're going underneath that petrolingual ligament. We're coming up, we have our cavernous segment um, and we're coming up, we're entering uh, the dura, giving off the uh, ophthalmic artery, uh, coming up and then dividing into um, the ACA medially and the MCA laterally. Similarly, um, this is the arterial phase of a right, right side, this time right carotid angiogram. Um, this is an anterior posterior view. And so again, we can come up, this is anterior posterior, so we're not seeing much uh, of that depth. Uh, so we come up, we're coursing, that's our big course medially, that first bend in the carotid canal coming up in the cavernous sinus. Now remember, if it were in a single plane, it would look like a single vessel. But you can see it's a little bit thicker than a vessel because that anterior bend is kinking laterally. So it comes up, we come up, we're in the dura. Now we're coming towards us with this vessel and slightly above. So the course looks smaller from an anterior posterior view. As we come up, we come up very nicely. We give off the ACA immediately and the MCA laterally, and you can follow that MCA. Now, interestingly, what you see on this side is the contralateral uh, portions of the ACA because it's receiving um, perfusion uh, via the anterior communicating artery right here. So you're seeing uh, supplementary flow uh, into the left ACA territory perfusion. Okay, as another brief uh, aside, let's go back to this image. Um, so this was the, the opening uh, uh, before, before we go to the transylvian. Uh, in blue, we can see many of the superficial cortical bridging veins. And these are also very clinically important as they are the main cause of subdural hematomas. So we looked at epidural hematomas before. Here on the left, uh, we have an axial non-contrast CT showing uh, a large hyperdense crescent centric hematoma um, extending across all the suture lines there, and that's very consistent with an acute subdural hematoma. We can also see right to left midline shift um, and subfalcine herniation, which we can see at that arrow there, and is generally caused by um, unilateral frontal parietal or temporal lobe disease that produces mass effect medially 
pushing the ipsilateral cingulate gyrus beneath the free edge of the fox. So uh, we can see anatomically here what this means. Um, this is a medial perspective. This is the third, the you know, lateral third ventricles. Um, the left hemisphere has been removed. And we can see this is the fox. This is the free edge of the tent. This is an opening that's been cut. So the fox separates the left and right hemispheres vertically. Uh, the uh, tentorium separates the brainstem from the cortex. Um, there's our carotid. Um, and what we can see here is um, the cingulate gyrus um, would be pushed underneath the free edge of the fox. And this is subfalcine or below the fox uh, herniation. And which is the most common uh, cerebral herniation pattern. So to sum up anterior circulation, um, let's take a look at everything that we can put together from this original image. So starting at the top, um, we have second nerve. Um, we can work our way down. We have second nerve, optic chiasm, second nerve going into the optic canal. Just above that, we have our A1 segments of the anterior cerebral artery that are meeting with the anterior communicating artery. They're coming down uh, to the carotid here. This is the carotid, internal carotid bifurcation. And this is uh, the MCA going laterally. So the carotid's coming up. It's entering the dura through the distal dural ring. This is that clinoid space where the anterior clinoid would have been. Um, and it's coming up through the distal dural ring, coming up and then bifurcating. Um, and we also have the posterior communicating artery here, which is communicating with the PCA, which is our supratentorial, as you can see, here's the free edge of the tent going on top of the tent uh, artery, whereas the SCA is going infratentorial down here near fifth nerve. So we have fifth nerve right here, going up and over the Petrus Ridge into Meckel's Cave, fanning out in the middle fossa V1, superior orbital fissure V2, foramen rotundum V3, foramen ovale. Um, right, uh, um, inferior and medial to five, we have six nerve going uh, slightly upward into Dorello's canal, underneath Grouper's ligament into the cavernous sinus, uh, on its way to the SOF, underneath V1, which is also in the cavernous sinus along with V2. Uh, here, up here, we have fourth nerve running with the free edge of the centorium into the cavernous sinus, into the superior orbital fissure. And here we have third nerve coming slightly downward on top of the uh, posterior clinoid process, going into the cavernous sinus um, and going, uh, uh, sorry, uh, into the uh, oculomotor triangle, exiting the dura, cavernous sinus, superior orbital fissure. We also have the anterior choroidal artery up here coming off of the carotid, and you can see a little bit of choroid plexus here as well. Um, just quickly down here, the vertebral arteries uh, coming into the basilar artery, uh, and the basilar, this is the basilar tip we looked at before. And the basal artery runs along that long axis of the clivus we've been talking about. Um, and that's pretty much cranial nerves. We don't see one here, but one we saw before. One, two, three, four, five, and six, and anterior circulation. Unfortunately, I think we're out of time, so I don't know that we're going to be able to go into posterior circulation too much. We can definitely do another one of these for uh, posterior uh, circulation. Um, so uh, let's take some questions. Um, let's see what we have here. Which portion is the supraclinoid carotid artery? That's the ophthalmic portion is the supraclinoid carotid. Did it compression? Okay. Yeah, sorry, as Ryan said, we'll put, we'll put a posterior circulation lecture up uh, soon. We can, um, we can do one on the ventricles too. We can, we have, and actually at the end, we have a survey for everybody um, um, with uh, some questions about what other topics you'd like to see. We can put together some other lectures on different topics. I'm just reading briefly through the questions here. Um, do you have any recommendations for us to learn this anatomy in 3D while we're preparing for sub -I? Um, yeah, I will. First of all, I would, I would recommend that you don't spend too much time reading books. Um, I would just spend time uh, looking at uh, anatomical images. And 
unfortunately, there are not a lot of uh, medical school-based resources for these type of things. So you really have to look in the neurosurgical literature. For um, uh, cerebrovascular, um, even though the pictures aren't great, I really like Susan Osborne's book on diagnostic cerebral angiography. Uh, it's a great way just to learn the anatomy. She makes it really simple to understand. Um, the, uh, there's a new atlas uh, by the late Al Roten with um, uh, Maria from Albany. She, uh, the, that's just pictures. That's what I would go. Um, as well as um, for learning approaches, very, very simply, I would read keyhole approaches in neurosurgery. Ignore the approach itself. Just look at the anatomy. It's a beautiful stepwise anatomical view through the different approaches. Um, uh, sure, I can change. <laughs> I will change the pointer color next time. Um, I, I can I can give you a list of books. We have a list of resources on our website here. I can I can provide them uh, to be emailed out. Um, Um, in terms of recording, you'll have to talk to uh, Ryan. I'm sure we'll make it available at some point. Um, okay, well, if there are, does anyone else have any other questions? Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. That's very kind. All right. Well, I thank you. I thank you all for coming. I, I appreciate it. Um, I, I hope this was helpful to you, and I hope we can put other on some other lectures that may be useful in simplifying some of this anatomy. I see um, a lot. You know, people. Like I said at the beginning, you're you're you have to spend four to five times the amount of time studying a specific region because you're learning everything separately. If you put it together, you really understand how things interact and it cuts your studying time down significantly. And gaining that 3D uh, perspective is, is difficult. If your home institution has a facility um, similar to ours or a small skull-based lab where you can go and just look at some neuroanatomy or, or watch, it's, it's very useful. I, I really highly recommend it. Well, thank you again, and I, I hope to see you all uh, at uh, future webinars and future Brain and Spine Group events, or actually, and hopefully soon, another uh, in-person training camp. Thank you, Ryan. All right. Hey, everyone. Sorry I didn't uh, get a chance for you all to see me earlier when I introduced things. I was doing the best I could to... Uh, answer the flurry of emails uh, for tech problems coming in at the same time. But uh, just to answer some of the questions real quick that uh, keep coming up. Yes, the session was recorded. We're gonna send the recording to our video editor to reformat it and uh, clean up, you know, take out all the interim fluff so that way you can get some really good streamlined, high quality videos to review afterwards. Um, also, we will get uh, the next webinar sessions up and coming and posted on the website as soon as possible. We are actively getting the neurosurgerytraining.org website populated with all the new stuff going on. Uh, our seminar series is going to be a weekly meeting uh, with a very structured annual schedule. So that way, you know, students really have a good longitudinal uh, learning curriculum that you can follow in uh, online. Uh, and um, we'll also have the virtual training camp, which is gonna be doing the onsite training camp online as best as we possibly can. Obviously, the hands-on experience won't be the same, but, uh, you know, hopefully we'll have really great demonstrations for a lot of those hands-on procedures. In terms of where you can get the video, we will send an email out to everyone once we have uh, an online video platform available. But we're, our goal is to build out a video library on the neurosurgerytraining.org website. So hopefully 
uh, you should be able to see everything there. Okay. Does anybody have any other general questions about uh, the organization or the courses or anything that I can answer while I'm here? I just wanted to say briefly, I put in the chat, if everyone could please fill out the post webinar survey, that'll be really helpful for us uh, to develop future courses that best fit your academic needs and interests. Uh, everything is totally anonymous, but the feedback will be really important for us going forward. Also, one more thing. Um, here at our Neurosurgical Innovations and Training Center at Cornell, um, you know, during non-pandemic times, we do have a medical student program for people who actually want to come and work with us uh, for, you know, four to six weeks uh, or longer, depending on your availability on these type of things. So um, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, if that's something you'd be interested in. We are obviously not taking anyone at the moment, but we anticipate resuming operations either in the late summer or early fall. Yeah, and we'll be sending out emails about all the future stuff as well as posting it on the new website. Um, you can go to the new website and sign up for specific email lists. There's a, a, a list specific to the seminar series, a list specific to the various webinars. Uh, you can go to the website and sign up for any email list you want, and we'll make sure that you get, you'll be the first ones to get notification about uh, new courses as they're posted. So hopefully we'll get uh, another webinar planned and posted uh, with registration uh, within early next week. Well, I, this was a very successful uh, webinar with a lot of interest. And uh, because of that, we will not uh, dilly dally on getting the next one set up for you all. Okay. It looks like you may have had an issue with the survey link. But um, I will continue to answer questions. Uh, you can email me or hit a, uh, use any of the contact forms on the website and uh, we'll get back to you as soon as possible. I will leave the session open for the next couple minutes for uh, you know, any last minute questions and uh, we'll turn it off here in a minute or two. Thanks again. Take care and stay safe. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us again for those, uh, who joined us for our previous webinar on anterior circulation, this will roughly pick up where we left uh, off and, and hopefully complete the picture of cranial circulation. If you were not here for the last one, I encourage you uh, after to go and watch that on YouTube. Um, given that we're um, a fairly small group today, especially compared to last time, um, I encourage everyone to use the question and answer feature as we go, um, and I can stop along the way. We'll stop uh, at certain points to, to take questions, but uh, I'll keep an eye if, if questions pop up, we can, we can address them uh, right then. So let's get started. So in our last session, we reviewed anterior circulation and we followed the internal carotid from its origin in the neck until its bifurcation into the ACA and MCA seeing everything that it crossed in its course. And we briefly looked at what MCA and ACA territory look like. Today, I'm going to ask you again to shrink down your perspective so we can travel through posterior circulation and see what we encounter um, there. Um, but let's first just quickly review the main elements of anterior circulation um, and some basic anatomy um, because we're going to be jumping around a little bit in terms of perspectives today. So I want to make sure everyone is comfortable with what we're looking at um, and oriented. 
Our previous journey along the internal carotid followed a map known as the Boutier or the Van Loveren classification, which numbers the segments of the ICA from proximal to distal following the blood flow. And we started in the neck um, at the carotid bifurcation, uh, where the common carotid splits to give rise to the internal and external carotid arteries. Um, this is where our first segment begins. And that's, of course, the cervical or C1 segment, um, which extends from the bifurcation um, until the entrance of the ICA into the carotid canal. Um, and it doesn't give off any branches. As the carotid comes up and enters the carotid canal, we enter the petrous segment, the C2 petrous segment, uh, which makes that first big bend right here. Um, and it bends anteromedially inside the petrous bone, giving off the carotico-tympanic and vidian arteries until it reaches um, just uh, outside the foramen lacerum. Then we have the C3, or the, the lacerum segment, um, which bends upwards and travels underneath the, the petrolingual ligament and entering uh, the cavernous sinus and becomes the cavernous segment, or the C4 cavernous segment. And this segment has um, a quite a torturous, tortuous course as it comes up and then it bends uh, and courses anteriorly and inferiorly, slightly kinking medially here. And then it comes up and has another genu and a big bend as it comes up, uh, passing through the proximal dural ring underneath the anterior clinoid process. And as it comes up, remember it gives off the meningohypophyseal trunk here and the infralateral trunk down here. And it comes up, exits the cavernous sinus through the proximal dural ring, and uh, actually here we can see the meningohypophyseal trunk. So this is that first genu as it comes up. All the way over here, it's inside the carotid canal and the petrous bone. So it's coming up underneath fifth nerve, over frame and lacerum, bending up, entering the cavernous sinus, at the petrolingual ligament, coming up and bending to go inferior and anterior. And you can see that slight lateral kinking right here. It kinks a little bit outward. And then uh, and that first bend, it gives off the meningohypophyseal trunk. Down here, it gives off the infralateral trunk, and it also gives off McConnell's capsular arteries. And then it exits the cavernous sinus about here, um, underneath where the anterior clinoid process would be, which is, here, right side is uh, extradural because the dura has been removed. Left side here is intradural. So the dura here is all covering. Here's the pre edge of the tentorium, covering where the anterior clinoid would be over here. Um, and so, this is where the clinoid would be, and this is our clinoid segment of the carotid between the proximal and distal dural rings. So uh, this segment extends between the rings, and it's both extracavernous and extradural, and it then goes through the distal dural ring here. We see it extradurally here. We can see it intradurally, and this marks the dural entrance of the carotid. So the carotid enters the dura by traveling through the distal dural ring, and then it becomes the C6 uh, or ophthalmic segment. Actually, sorry, let's, let's hold on for a second. Since we're extra dural, um, here's that distal dural ring, just uh, as a neat little note. So this is the clinoid ICA where the clinoid's been removed. Here's V1. And if, and if we cut that distal dural ring, we can then be and see intradural, and there's second nerve, and there's the ophthalmic artery, and this is the clinoid ICA, and then this is distal dural ring, and then this is the ophthalmic segment of the ICA. So it comes superiorly, coursing posteriorly as it turns back, giving off the ophthalmic uh, artery. And so now, um, it, all, actually it also gives off the superior hypophyseal artery, which we can see here. So clinoid ICA, distal dural ring, intradural C6 ICA gives off ophthalmic and superior hypophyseal arteries. So now let's transition to a, an intradural perspective to see the rest of the carotid. So here we have a right side sylvian fissure open. Here's our temporal lobe. Here's our frontal lobe. Here's the sylvian fissure open. Um, and the, the more distal aspects of the MCA here are exposed. So if we zoom into this region here, we can start to see the right optic nerve, 
right where that right the sorry right, right where that white arrow is pointing, and uh, we can zoom in even further. And let's just orient ourselves quickly. So this is a right side. This is you know we're from a lateral perspective looking medial. This direction is anterior. This direction is posterior. Down here would be inferior. This direction up would be superior. Um, so we are entirely intradural here. We can see that same portion of the carotid that we just saw. This is that distal dural ring. So the carotid's entering the dura and we're now intradural. Here's the ophthalmic artery arising from that C6 segment. And you can even see the superior hypophyseal artery right here coming off the carotid. Um, and this C6 segment extends all the way until just proximal to the posterior communicating artery, which is about here. We don't see it from this perspective. Um, and, um, and the posterior communicating artery, of course, connects to anterior to posterior circulation, which we'll be seeing in, in detail in a little bit um, via anastomosing with the, with the posterior cerebral artery. And finally, we have the C7 uh, ICA, which extends from the posterior communicating artery um, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, from, from the posterior communicating artery until the internal carotid bifurcation, which gives rise um, to the ACA, which goes medially, and the MCA, which goes laterally. And there's our posterior communicating artery. We also have the anterior choroidal artery here as well. So there's that anterior clinoid process, free edge of the tentorum. We can see third nerve exiting the dura through the ocular motor triangle here, coming off down into the exiting the dura in cavernous sinus on its way to the superior orbital fissure, just like we saw last time. Um, and then here's that carotid coming up. This is right where that anterior clinoid would be, going through the proximal distal dural ring, entering the dura, and coursing superiorly and posteriorly to break off and or to branch off into the ACA and MCA and connecting posteriorly with the posterior communicating artery. So collectively, you know, this is pretty much everything we saw last time. Again, we're intradural because the dura has been left on the right, extradural on the left. We can see fifth nerve uh, and uh, we can see third nerve here, second nerve. So two, three, four is going to be running with the free edge of the tentorium, which we see here. Um, and uh, we here we have the basal artery coming up, which we're going to see in quite in depth. Um, and uh, here's our carotid entering the dura coming up. Here's that posterior communicating artery connecting from uh, the carotid to the uh, PCA. And we have our MC, sorry, ACA medially connecting via the anterior communicating artery and MCA, which is going laterally. We can also see our anterior choroidal artery. Um, so uh, now I know that was an extremely rapid overview, but if you're confused by any of that, just go back and rewatch the previous lecture where we went, where, where we went over all of this area um, in depth. So yeah, last time we spent the majority of our time in the anterior and middle cranial fossae. Today we're going to be focusing on the posterior cranial fossa. So this is a top-down view of the midline skull base. The top of the image here is anterior, the bottom uh, is inferior and posterior, and the left and right sides are lateral. The key bony landmarks we're going to see along our journey today are the clivus, which is the central bone of the skull base, and where we'll find the basilar trunk and the vertebral basilar junction. And um, it connects to the petrous portions of the temporal, uh, the temporal bones. Um, and let's have a closer look here at this. We're gonna take on a, a perspective uh, using a helicopter today. Um, and so we're just zooming in here. So I'm going to, <clears throat> here is the clivus. So this is the long axis of the clivus in this direction. Um, so up in this direction would be superior and down would be inferior. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we're hovering in the posterior fossa and we're 
looking right here at the posterior surface of the petrous bone. And we're looking past the ridge here. This is the petrous ridge. And we're looking from the posterior fossa. Here's the posterior surface of the petrous bone. And we're looking up and over into the middle fossa here. So where we can see this. What do you think this is? I see uh, there's some issues with my pointer. Let me try and sort that. Is that better now? Can you see that? Okay, so uh, yeah, that, most of you were correct there. That is the foramen ovale. So let's, let's zoom out again, just to make sure that we understand this perspective. So there's the foramen ovale. There's our helicopter. From, that's our, our perspective is from that helicopter is the big image. So you can see we're projecting, we're looking all the way here at the posterior surface of the petrous bone. We're looking up and over, and we can see the foramen ovale there. So other than the petrous segment of the ICA, the petrous bone also contains the internal auditory canal through which um, cranial nerve seven and eight, as well as the labyrinthine and subarcuate arteries pass. So it's a very, petrous bone is a highly trafficked structure. We have a lot coming in here. We have the, the, the labyrinth, we have the carotid, we have all sorts of stuff going on, including seventh and eighth nerve. And here, that can, you know, between the clivus here and the petrous bone here, we, they're connected by the petroclival fissure. And that junction um, over which we'll find the inferior petrosal sinus as it's coming down here on its course to the jugular bowl. And as we'll see as we go along today, we're also going to find the superior petrosal sinus running inside the tentorium along the petrous ridge here. And you can see that in the image here. So we have, you know, the cavernous sinus draining down. We have the superior petrosal sinus running along the petrous ridge. Um, over here is transverse sigmoid junction, sigmoid sinus coming down, inferior petrosal sinus running in the groove right here. Uh, in that fissure um, on its way down towards the jugular frame. And we're going to fill in the rest today. Down here is a groove where we would expect to find the sigmoid sinus, just like we see here. And the sigmoid sinus, as it comes down, curves, enters the jugular foramen, uh, and joins with the inferior petrosal sinus to, to form that jugular bulb. And of course, here's the jugular foramen, which we'll be seeing in a lot more detail shortly. And here's where we're going to find cranial nerves uh, 9, the glossopharyngeal, 10, the vagus, uh, and 11, the accessory, exiting the skull along with the sigmoid sinus and the inferior petrosal sinus. Moving down from the jugular foramen, we of course find the hypoglossal canal, where we find the hypoglossal nerve, 12th nerve. And last but not least, the largest and most highly trafficked, this is of course the foramen magnum through which we find um, the medulla, the accessory nerve, the vertebral artery, and the anterior and posterior spinal arteries. So our goal today, in addition to covering posterior circulation, is to understand how those vessels fit in with the surrounding structures, particularly cranial nerves uh, seven through 12. You can see here, um, so there, you can see here, uh, there's a lot going on. Last time we started at the bottom in the neck, we actually started right down here because this is the external carotid. This is the internal carotid here. 
So the carotid bifurcation is just beneath the picture. And we started and we worked our way up through the carotid into the entrance to the carotid canal here, into the petrous bone, and so on. Today, we're going to start in the middle. We're going to start in the cerebellopontine angle, and we're going to work our way down along the cranial nerves to understand the surrounding anatomy. And then we're going to go down to the cranial cervical junction, and we're going to work our way back up via the uh, posterior circulation. So we started last time by spending a while looking at this region in the middle fossa um, on, the, on the anterior surface here of the petrous bone, um, including uh, fifth nerve, uh, GSPN coming underneath, um, fourth nerve running with that free edge of the tentorium, third nerve in its straight course, down over the posterior clinoid process, exiting the dura uh, via the ocular motor triangle, entering the cavernous sinus on its way to the superior orbital fissure. I should say fourth nerve also, you know, exiting the dura, entering the cavernous sinus. Um, we have second nerve here coming on top of the ophthalmic segment of the carotid um, and uh, entering the optic canal on its way to the orbit. Here's our anterior clinoid process. Here's our pituitary gland. Um, and here's second nerve on the other side. Here's uh, uh, the posterior clinoid on the other side. Um, and this is contralateral third nerve also exiting via that ocular motor triangle. Fourth nerve exiting into the cavernous sinus. Um, contralateral five entering Meckel's cave. And we're going to be seeing a little bit more of this from a different perspective. But remember that fifth nerve going up and then over that petrous ridge into the middle fossa. Um, as well as sixth nerve entering Dorello's canal, also going into the cavernous sinus. Um, so today we're going to be moving to the posterior surface, like we said, of the temporal bone, um, inferior to the level of the petrous ridge. So right, right where that, we're going to be coming down right where that white arrow uh, is, um, just in this area underneath uh, fifth nerve. So to do that, we're going to take on the perspective of a retrosigmoid approach. So coming from behind the sigmoid sinus on the right side, removing the bone, opening the dura, and we're going to put our virtual microscope in the field and, and zoom in. And then we're going to retract that right cerebellar hemisphere immediately to reveal our cranial nerve complexes here. And here would be fifth nerve at the very top. That's our, that's the upper portion, and then seven and eight in the middle, and nine, 10, 11, and 12 on the bottom. And we're gonna start here and we're gonna work all the way down. So here we are. Let's reorient ourselves again. Now we're hovering in the posterior fossa, looking down the long axis of the petrous bone, just like the yellow arrows, or the yellow arrow uh, right here. And we are lateral looking medial towards the climbus. So the first thing we see from this perspective is the superior cerebellar artery. And the superior cerebellar artery, as we'll come again and see, comes off the basilar artery. So here we have that free edge of the tentorium right here. And this, the tentorium has been cut, so we're looking, we're looking in this direction. Um, and here's our fourth nerve, which originates all the way posteriorly on the back of the brainstem and wraps around midbrain coming up, joining a free edge of the tentorium um, and going into the cavernous sinus. And so just deep to that or more medial to that here, here we have our SCA, which is coming and wrapping around posteriorly and medially to supply the superior surface of the cerebellum, hence superior cerebellar artery. Then we have fourth nerve, as we saw last time, running with that free edge. Now remember, the cranial nerves are numbered from superior to inferior, so as we move down, the numbers will increase, which means we now find fifth nerve. 
So this is that posterior view um, of the fifth nerve that we, we were just looking at a minute ago in the middle fossa and we spent a lot of time looking at before. And this is it inside the cerebellum pontine angle. And it's called that because here's the cerebellum, there's the pons, and you're creating an angle between them and all the structures that fall in between. And as we're looking deep along that long axis of the petrous bone, we can see fifth nerve coming off its origin in the root entry zone of five, going doing that, as we said, up and over that petrous ridge, which we don't fully see here, but this is where it would be, entering Meckel's cave um, and um, uh, trifurcating in the middle fossa. So down here, what do we have here with this bony lump on top? This is, of course, uh, the IAC. Our perspective here is that of the green arrow. And in the main image, we can see seven and eight entering the IAC along with the ICA here, the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, um, which also comes off the basilar artery. And we, we know the basilar artery runs along the clivus, so that would be in this direction, because here's the clivus, here's that petroclival fissure, and we're looking right here at that bump, which is the fundus of the internal auditory canal. And actually we can see the ICA passing through, in this case, the, seven, uh, the seventh and eighth nerve forming um, its loop. So now let's just take this perspective and move a little bit more superior um, and put ourselves in the perspective of that helicopter pilot. So we're going to climb up. And as we zoom out, we can see more from the top and we can add in some more things that we've seen previously. Here, we have the tentorium, which has been cut right here. We can see it on both sides of our screen and this is where it was cut so we can see everything that's there. Now on the right side of the image, um, we can see that it's attaching to the petrous ridge, which is running right here, um, within which runs the, that superior uh, petrosal sinus. We can also see branches of the SCA here. They're coming off and supplying that superior surface of the cerebellum. So we're hovering here looking medial. Where is this arrow pointing? and the majority of the structures here are located where? I'm asking this just to, to gauge your understanding of what we're looking at, so to see if we need to reorient at all. Okay, so uh, the majority of you were, were correct. The arrow is pointing into the middle fossa. So this is that petrous ridge. We're hovering in the, in the posterior fossa here. Our arrow pointing into the middle fossa. This is the petrous ridge. So imagine this like some sort of mountainous canyon. So you can walk up to the edge in the middle fossa all the way out of the edge of the petrous ridge and you can look down and there's this big gorge or drop here on the side of this mountain. And within this mountain, you know, there, there are caves like the internal auditory canal where, you know, things go in and then come out elsewhere. So, and then on, on that ridge there, we have this flowing river, if you will, that is the superior petrosal sinus. So we have the superior petrosal sinus here, that inferior petrosal sinus, which would be running in this direction. Um, we don't really see from this perspective, but yes, this is middle fossa and everything behind this or to the left of this in the image is posterior fossa and everything beneath this level is infratentorium. And remember the tentorium is that dural structure that contains the venous sinuses and it also separates you know everything um, uh, beneath the cortex or it separates the cortex from everything else beneath it 
Um, so it runs just on the superior surface of the cerebellum here, um, and it runs and it separates vertically from uh, the cortex, see in the same way that the fox separates the left and right hemispheres. And those, those structures are all uh, congruent with each other. So yeah, very good. So I'm glad everyone is, yeah, is uh, oriented well here. So underneath the tentorium, we of course see fifth nerve. And we see fifth nerve coming again from its root entry zone, exiting the dura, entering Meckel's cave, up and over the Petrus Ridge, and trifurcating in the middle fossa, as we've seen before. From anterior, this is an anterior perspective, looking back, there's that root entry zone. So we're hovering, our helicopter is probably over here. So um, when we're looking at it from the side perspective, now we're looking at it from front to back in this image, and we can see it coming off, coming up and over. The Petrus Ridge has been drilled a little bit here, but it comes up and over, and of course trifurcates into V1 and V2, which enter the cavernous sinus, V1 going through the superior orbital fissure, V2 going through the foramen rotundum, and V3 going through the foramen ovale. And as it comes up and over uh, the Petrus Ridge right here, we can see also, which has been cut here as well, um, we can see that superior petrosal sinus, um, which would be running along the, uh, along the Petrus Ridge. So if this is the fifth nerve, What does that make this? Well, by, by nature of deduction alone, that's the sixth nerve because we're moving down. So yeah, this is the sixth nerve. Remember fifth nerve has a, a, a very short um, intradural direct course, goes slightly up and then over that petrous ridge and then down into the middle fossa um, along its, the anterior surface of the petrous bone. Sixth nerve comes up a, a direct upwards course, um, just uh, just above that petroclival fissure, um, and uh, it enters Dorello's canal, entering the cavernous sinus, um, underneath V1, all the way until it gets the superior orbital fissure. I see a question's popped up. The yellow arrow pointing to the middle fossa was supratentorial, and to the left with the neurovascular structures were located infratentorially. That is correct, yes. And of course, um, as, we've, as we've just seen here, we have seven and eight entering the internal auditory canal. That, that little guy in the middle between them is the nervous intermedius. So let's keep moving inferiorly to see the rest of our, our lower cranial, or the, the lower cranial nerves here. Um, but as we descend, keep your eyes on seven and eight. This will be our reference as we move down. The same way five was our reference when we were looking uh, up here, as we move down, seven and eight are gonna be our reference. So we're gonna keep them highlighted as we switch perspectives. So now we're just a bit, a bit lower. Seven and eight still highlighted here as they enter the IAC. We can see six nerve deep to that. Um, and looking to the nerves below us, we first find ninth nerve. So remember five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Now most of the nerves here either had a slightly upward or, or um, uh, straight course. These have a slightly inferior course and nine is going from its origin straight, a little bit inferior until it enters the jugular foramen, passing just underneath, in this case, the pica the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which again, we're gonna come back to when we come back up and see that circulation. So, and, and here this all, and which also the pica comes off the vertebral artery. And we also have 10th nerve, the vagus nerve, uh, which is a, of course a very important nerve, has a lot of functions. Um, and it's, and you, you can tell that from its, uh, from its size, the number of rootlets we see here. So the vagus nerve, 10th nerve, comes off, also a straight course inferior to nine, directly into the jugular foramen here. And then we have the accessory nerve. 
the 11th nerve, which has two main components. It has its cranial component, which have rootlets that are in a uh, direct course um, into the jugular foramen, as well as its spinal course that's coming up through the foramen magnum, joining with its cranial components, and going into the jugular foramen. And just superficial here to the lower cranial nerves, we can also see the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle and the foramen of Lushka. So given our retrosigmoid perspective, note those yellow arrows are pointing in the same medial direction along that long axis of the petrous bone. What would you guess those green uh, arrows are pointing to at the midline there? We're going to be coming back to these shortly, but these of course are the left or the right and left vertebral arteries coming up to form the vertebral basilar junction here. So this is the midline, there's the right and left verts coming up, vertebral basilar junction, and then we have the basilar trunk coming up along the clivus. Since we're looking medial um, along the long axis of the posterior surface of the petrous bone, what do you think this is? So it seems the results on this one are a little bit more mixed, but the majority seem to think this is the sigmoid sinus. Well, yes, this is the sigmoid sinus. Remember, from that perspective, we're retrosigmoid. So we're posterior to the sigmoid sinus. Um, so meaning that everything that our cerebellum is on the left and the dura with the sigmoid sinus running into it would be on the right. So we're kind of following this green arrow here. I tried to draw it in as, as best I could, but it's a, it's a little bit of a tough perspective. But we're taking that, as you see here, we're retracting that um, cerebellum uh, medially, and we're looking straight down past it onto the long axis in this direction where my pointer is, in, in that direction, um, same highlighted by that green arrow here, all the way towards the midline. In, you know, and when we're talking about the skull base, we often talk about the clivus um, as the target of, of many skull base uh, openings. And um, it's, it's quite true because at the, at the deep end of, of all of these perspectives, you're pointing towards the clivus, which is at the center. Here you can see you know, the, the confluence of sinuses um, you know, by the occiput. Uh, coming around with the transverse sinus, transverse sigmoid junction, and this is the area we're working in just posterior to the sigmoid sinus. Sigmoid sinus comes down, goes in that groove we talked about before, um, you know, drains into the uh, jugular bulb, jugular foramen, becomes the internal jugular vein. And we're going to see that in a little bit more depth. So we can zoom out a little to see the craniocervical junction in addition to all of the uh, intracranial components we just looked at, um, the courses of all the lower cranial nerves. And this is same perspective, just zoomed out a little bit. You know, this is our cranial direction in this, uh, this way. So this is superior, uh, actually it was superior, anterior, inferior. And we can look, again, there's that, um, there's seven and eight going into the IAC. There's that, that fundus, the bump of the IAC we talked about before. Uh, as we move down, we can see the posterior and inferior cerebellar arteries. We have nine, 10, and 11, both the spinal and cranial 
component going all into the jugular foramen. Here's the inferior petrosal vein. Um, and down here, we have 12 on its much lower, but very straight, very direct, very short intracranial course to enter the hypoglossal canal. And uh, underneath all of those, we have the vertebral artery coming up and coursing underneath and around to wrap around the brainstem and become anterior. So now let's move slightly anterior and take a look at what happens once all of those nerves enter and go through the jugular foramen and hypoglossal canal respectively. So first we have ninth nerve. So again, ninth nerve, short, direct, slightly inferior course coming here to the jugular foramen. And notice how nine is separated from 10 and 11 by a small bony prominence here, a small bony septum. It passes superiorly over the rest. On top of, the inter, on top of that interjugular septum, highlighted in yellow, this upper compartment is often referred to as the pars nervosa. And it contains ninth nerve and receives the inferior petrosal sinus. And ninth nerve, comes through and emerges extracranially as the most superficial and the most anterior uh, of the nerves. And you can see that here. Here's nine coming through, and it comes out as the most anterior and the most superficial on top uh, of the carotid here, almost on top. Um, as the carotid comes up, remember, this is our cervical segment of the internal carotid coming up, entering that carotid canal here, becoming the petri segment of the carotid. So um, yeah, here you can also see, here's, here, uh, here it is coming in, uh, nine coming in, there's that interjugular septum separated, and you can see how it comes out and on top of the carotid. Here's the carotid coming up, entering the carotid canal. Then we have 10th nerve, the vagus nerve. So rootlets coming together like a fan, you know, it, it handles a lot, so it's, it has a lot going on there, and it comes together um, and comes through, enters the jugular foramen, and it enters beneath that interjugular septum. And this lower comp the compartment is often referred to as the pars vascularis. And 10 comes through the pars vascularis, and emerges deep to nine and passes underneath the carotid. And we can see that here. Here's 10, comes through, emerges, and it comes deep to the carotid. And you, can, you don't see the carotid here, but you kind of get the idea. And then at the same time, you can see the vert here coming up um, and going underneath these nerves as it wraps around. And then we have you know, um, 11th nerve, the accessory nerve, um, coming from its lower cranial origin, uh, as well as its spinal origin, a spinal component coming up, entering the foramen magnum, coming up, joining with its cranial component, and going through uh, the foramen magnum. I'm sorry, going through the jugular foramen um, and entering the jugular foramen inferiorly to 10 and beneath the septum again, so 9. 10, 11, in the pars vascularis down here, exits posterior to the carotid, and all, in this case, are underneath the internal jugular vein, which you can see here. Here's where that jugular vein would be. And we can see the internal jugular vein with the left of it right here. Let's take a closer look at the uh, at the jugular vein. Oh, sorry, one second. Okay, so now you know here's that sigmoid sinus it's coming down. Uh, sigmoid sinus, you know, uh, jugular bulb coming through the jugular foramen, internal jugular vein coming out, and there it's it's cut so we can see the nerves underneath it, um, and it emerges superficial to all of the nerves coming through uh, the jugular foramen, but deep to this other nerve up here. And this is 
the facial nerve. So this is seven. So seven, remember, has that short direct course into the IAC, and in, after the IAC, it, it goes into the, um, it moves around um, the lateral semicircular canal, comes into the fallopian canal, and then out through the stylomastoid foramen, and then it comes out extracranial. And it's gonna be superficial to, uh, you can see here, this is that lateral semicircular canal, it's wrapping around, entering the fallopian canal, coming out, stylomastoid foramen, extracranial, and superficial to the internal jugular vein. Um, and looking you know, from intracranial, again, we see that sigmoid sinus coming in, but interestingly, it's almost uh, you know, posterior to the cranial nerves here. Um, and it has this kind of interesting course where it comes down, jugular bulb goes through, and you can see it goes, uh, oh, sorry, it goes underneath these cranial nerves before wrapping back around and emerging superficially. We can also very clearly see the internal carotid coming up, uh, entering the carotid canal right here. So the sigmoid sinus has been cut here, but you can, you can follow the course with the yellow arrow as it comes underneath the cranial nerves, um, with the exception of nine. So, uh, and then it comes in courses around or on back on top. There's our carotid. And finally, we have the uh, 12th nerve as it enters um, the hypoglossal canal. So the hypoglossal nerve coming in, entering the hypoglossal canal um, underneath the jugular foramen, which is up here. Here's, oh, here's our vertebral artery coming underneath everything, like we said. Here's that spinal component of the accessory coming up and joining with nine in that superior compartment and uh, 10 in that inferior compartment within the jugular foramen exiting. And we have 12 entering the hypoglossal canal and coming out over here. So, and in the middle of all that, we have the, the right vertebral artery coming up, passing underneath all of these nerve roots underneath and on its anterior and superior course. So now we can find the origin of the vertebral artery and work our way back up via the arteries. But first, are there any questions about uh, the intracranial courses of cranial nerve seven through 12? Uh, sure, let's go back. Okay, so there's a question here um, about the relationship between the internal jugular vein um, and um, its relationship with cranial nerves. Uh, seven, nine, seven and, and nine. So let's take a closer look at that quickly before we keep going. Okay, so <clears throat> here uh, we have nine, um, 10, 11, and 12 is that deep one coming here. This muscle is the um, rectus capitis lateralis. And here's our, here's C1, and here's our vertebral artery coming up. Um, and you can see, so 12, um, 11, 10, and nine. And seven and eight are up here. So nine is gonna come in and around, going through the, um, the pars nervosa coming out of the jugular foramen and it's most um, anterior. And then on top of all of that, the, in, the internal jugular vein is gonna emerge um, extracranial and retrostyloid. And it's gonna come up all, out on top. And, but when it comes out on top, it's still deep to seventh nerve. And we can see that on the right side here. And um, 
the seventh nerve comes out, the, the mastoid's been removed in this picture, but this is that same portion right here on the left and on the right that we're looking at. So here's seventh nerve in the fallopian canal, and it's coming out, and you can see here, this is just superficial to the internal jugular vein. So here's sigmoid sinus coming down, jugular bulb coming out um, into the internal jugular vein underneath seventh nerve and on top of the rest that you can start to see over here and then you can see a little bit more clearly in this image. Um, I don't know if that answered your question fully but we can come back at the end and talk about that a little bit more. Okay, so now let's add in the major vessels. So the, the main reason why, I, why everyone's uh, here today. So we've already traveled along uh, the ICA and we've seen its terminal branches, uh, the ACA and the MCA. Now let's take a look at the vertebral arteries. Like the carotid is the main vessel anteriorly, the vertebral arteries are the, of course the main vessels that supply posterior cranial circulation. And we can, we can easily break down the vertebral artery into its four main segments. The first is the preferaminal segment. And you know, its name really corresponds to its features. It travels up along uh, the spinal column and it doesn't go through any foramina. So it goes straight up uh, from the subclavian all the way up to just beneath the C6 foramen transverse sorin. So, you know, here are spinous processes, cervical spine, and, you know, on the lateral aspect, we have, of course, the foramen transverse aria, and through which the vertebral artery passes. So, our second segment is the foraminal segment. And this is where C6, I'm sorry, this is where the vertebral artery travels up through the C6 foramen transverse aureum, up through C5, C4, C3, um, C2, and um, this is where we have our next segment. So preforaminal, foraminal, and then we have our suboccipital segment. And this is very useful because you can find the location of this uh, within what's called the suboccipital triangle of muscles here. And there are a lot of muscles that connect uh, with the, uh, in this craniocervical junction region. And um, so from C2, uh, it comes up, um, it goes through the C1 frame and transverse arm, it curves around and enters the dura, and we have our intracranial segment beginning at the frame and magnum all the way to the vertebral basilar junction where the vert uh, ceases to exist, becomes the basilar artery. So this is an anterior view, um, and we can see here preforaminal subclavian all the way just proximal to C6, and then foraminal from the C6 frame and transverse aureum to the C2 frame and transverse aureum. And then we have uh, the suboccipital segment from the C2 up to the frame and magnum. And this is where, uh, like the ICA, the vertebral artery takes on this torturous course. At this point, it's not interacting with anything other than its own venous plexus and muscles and bone. There's not a lot of cranial nerve action going on here um, or even spinal nerve root because um, everything would be uh, down here. Um, and uh, we can look at another point at the dural relationships, but um, the VA uh, comes up through the frame in the transverse arm of C2, very straight course up through the C1 and then it has this first genu, the first bend. And let's take a look from a lateral perspective. It's kind of an oblique view, actually. Um, so here's, you know, here's C1, here's C2, spinous process. So this is truly posterior. And this direction up is, is uh, um, superior. And we're, we're posterior looking in this direction anterior. So we can see coming up, frame and transversarium, and then we have that first major bend. And we're curving posteriorly and slightly um, media, or medially and, and slightly anteriorly. Um, but we're turning around in this direction backwards. 
So we're going up and we're turning. And after this turn here, the vertebral artery falls into this little groove. And this little groove on C1 is known as the sulcus arteriosus. And it kind of provides a nice little uh, hand or a little support underneath the vert as it comes up and then it, it courses again, it bends again, and then it moves superior as it enters the dura um, around the foramen magnum. So let's have a closer look. So um, here, this is um, a posterior to anterior perspective. We're looking straight onto the spine from behind, and we can see that vertebral artery coming out of the C1 frame and transversarium. We can see that uh, first uh, uh, posterior um, and medial bend right here, and it's going on top of the sulcus arteriosus. Um, here we actually see the, C, the C1 nerve root. Um, and then we see it coming up and then it's curving again until it pierces the dura and becomes intradural. Here is that, um, for, here's the opening of the foramen magnum. Um, and you can see a little bit here of the occipital condyle that's, that's been drilled. Um, and then here's the, here's the dura surrounding the brainstem. And here's where we would expect to find cerebellum. So now we can look inside the dura to see the vertebral artery as it pierces the dura and continues to curve up superiorly, going underneath those lower cranial nerves, which are you know, nine through 12, before wrapping anteriorly around the spinal cord and brainstem. So it's coming up the sides and it's kind of hugging around. Like you would give somebody a hug with your hands. It comes up and hugs around um, the brainstem uh, towards the clivus anteriorly before forming that vertebral basilar junction. So now in this perspective here, here we have, you can see this, this is the dura right here. So here are, um, you know, here's our, our C2 uh, spinal nerve uh, right here. C1, this is extradural. Everything to the left of this line is intradural. So this is where the dura was open. So you can see the C1 spinal nerve rootlets going into the nerve itself. Here are the rootlets for C2 going out extradural. Um, here is uh, C1 that's been cut, uh, a laminectomy here, um, and here's our frame and magnum. So what do we think this guy is right here? I don't have a question for this one, but um, I'll tell you, this, this, is, this is the spinal component of the accessory nerve that's coming up to join with its cranial component and enter the jugular foramen. So here's our frame and magnum. Here's the verte right vertebral artery coming in. Here's its dural entrance. So remember, it's running along that sulcus arteriosus. Then it's coming up, entering the dura, coming in, going underneath all of these highly trafficked cranial nerve areas, um, and wrapping around anteriorly, giving that brainstem a nice hug as it, as it meets its contralateral counterpart um, on the clivus, and they form the vertebral basilar junction. Now, in this perspective, remember, here's, here's the frame and magnum, right? This is the level of the frame and magnum. So above us is where we would expect to find the cerebellum. So if we look up from this perspective, we can see those cerebellar hemispheres. And if we move our perspective up and we lift up one of those cerebellar hemispheres, we reveal the pica, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So in most cases, the pica originates um, from the intradural, intracranial vertebral artery. But its origin is pretty variable. 20% of the time, it, it arises extracranially inferior to the frame and magnum. 10% um, of the time, it arises, uh, arises from the basal artery. Um, sometimes they're absent. Um, so it, it's a bit variable. Um, but we can see here, here's our vertebral artery coming up, entering the dura right here. And this is uh, the origin of the uh, pike actually right here where my pointer is. It looks like it's over here, but this is just, uh, I think it's wrapping around. Um, and it comes right here, comes down and has this nice torturous course. So let's, let's have a look and follow the course of the pike quickly. So this is a left side, right? This is our, we're, we're from posterior, we're looking anterior. Uh, this is the left cerebellar hemisphere we're lifting up. And 
as we can see here, as it arises from the vertebral artery right here, it forms its anterior medullary segment. And why? Well, in most cases, it's, it's about at the level of the medulla on its anterior surface, hence anterior medullary segment. So it comes off of the vert anterior medullary segment and it courses laterally around, again, in most cases around the medulla, so it forms its lateral medullary segment, and then it starts to come inferiorly. And this is a very classic um, course for the pica because it forms this loop here that's commonly known as the caudal loop of the pica. In, in cerebrovascular surgery, if you're doing bypass, it's a common bypass site um, because it's very superficial for posterior revascularization and easy to get to. Um, and so it comes down, and in this, this is called the tonsillar medullary segment because, you know, hence the medulla and the cerebellar tonsils. Um, so it comes down, it forms this caudal loop, um, and we, you know, obviously caudal because it's going in, in the direction of the cauda, and it turns around and it comes back up. And it comes underneath the cerebellar hemisphere. It's a really tortuous vessel. It has, it has quite a, an interesting course. So it comes back down, it comes out, or you know, goes around and then down, caudal loop, coming all the way back up underneath the hemisphere um, and forming the telovelotonsillar segment and then it comes up and it comes up and then it courses down again. Uh, it comes up, it courses all the way down and it kind of envelops the uh, cerebellar hemisphere from inferior. You can see that here, that's that it comes up, it turns down. And then from the medial aspect right here, it hugs it all the way around, supplying blood uh, through the cortical segments. So uh, the pica, you know, very interesting, very tortuous vessel. Um, and it arises, um, Actually, we'll see when we go anteriorly at the level with which it arises. So now that we see, we've seen the pica from posterior, let's keep following those vertebral arteries as they course anterior. So in this image, the brain has been taken out here for the most part. So we can see those verts coming up, wrapping around like we said, here they are coming up, here's the dural entrance, coming up, going underneath all those lower cranial nerves, um, coming up and uh, wrapping around anteriorly and forming that vertebro, sorry, forming that vertebro basilar junction um, on the clivus, right? So here's the midline, here's the clivus, and this is where we would expect to see that petroclival fissure we saw earlier, um, and then this is that long axis of the posterior surface of the petrous bone, because here we have seven and eight, here's our petrous ridge, here's fifth nerve coming up and over, um, and there's uh, our, in this direction would be the superior petrosal sinus. So we have five um, and <clears throat> six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12 down here. So in this case, we can also see the pica coming out, um, this is a much higher origin than we looked in the last slide. So pica is branching off here. Um, in this case, it's kind of pulling uh, uh, what looks like a ninth nerve uh, or, or a root with it, and then it's coming up and coursing around, going between the nerves, entering the jugular foramen um, as it loops back around. I think this is, you know, this has been manipulated a little bit, but this one uh, is a little bit more of a natural course. And if we move that brainstem entirely, we can see also the anterior spinal artery that's uh, going down anteriorly to the spine. So now we're going to switch from this posterior view to an anterior view, looking posterior. So let's just reorient ourselves. So now we're sitting anteriorly, we're basically sitting on top of the anterior cranial fossa, and we're looking purely posteriorly in the midline. And um, so here, this is the left side, this is the right side, and we can see those for that vertebral artery coming up right here on both sides, joining together to form the vertebral basilar junction and form the basilar trunk, 
which is the basal artery, from you know, the majority of it, and from which we get the ICA, the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, which comes out in courses between, near seven and eight, about the level of the seventh and eighth nerve as they enter the IAC, right? So which we can see right here. Here's seven and eight. Here's the ICA. Actually, sorry. Here's here. Oh yeah. Here's the ICA, and that ICA also forms a loop. In this case, it's coming up and going through seven and eight. Uh, it might be a little bit different on the other side, but here's the ICA coming off the basal artery um, at about at the level of seven and eight. And um, we can also see here, here's the pica coming off the vertebral artery, inferior to uh, the level of the uh, ica. In this case, this one's wrapping around like we saw. So anterior medullary, um, lateral medullary, and coming around and coursing inferiorly, caudally, to form that caudal loop. And if we just take a quick look of where we are anatomically, we're sitting here, right? So here's our second nerve going in in this direction towards the optic canal on top of the ophthalmic segment of the carotid artery. Here's our pituitary gland, our hypothesis. Uh, here's that free edge of the tentorium. You can kind of match up what's you know being cut here. So starting from the top, we have two, three, coming up, three uh, uh, coming up from its origin, three coming out, oculomotor triangle, cavernous sinus exiting. We have four uh, with the free edge, uh, which would be around, right around here. And we can see it coming around from its, its origin posteriorly. It's wrapping around all the way, joining that free edge and coming out. We have fifth nerve here and here. You know, this is the fifth nerve root entry zone um, coming up and over that petrous ridge uh, and then trifurcating into V3, V2, and V1. And just beneath it, we have sixth nerve um, going into Dorello's canal, and we can see sixth nerve here and here. And then we have seven and eight straight direct into the internal auditory canal. Um, don't forget the GSPN also comes off of the, of the geniculate ganglion from seventh nerve, geniculate ganglion. Then we have the greater superficial petrosal nerve running superior to and parallel to the petrous carotid, which we can see here coming underneath V3 on its way to the Vidian canals. Um, and um, let's zoom in a little bit closer on the right side and have a closer look. So same, same, pretty much same perspective, right side, we're looking down, you know, here's the vertebral artery coming up, here's that vertebral basilar junction, here's the pica coming up, and here's the ica coming off the basilar. So remember, pica comes off the vert, ica comes off the basilar trunk, ica is about the level of seven and eight, fairly consistent, um, also forms a loop, pica variable, um, but at some point usually intradural. Um, what we also see here, here's, remember here's our third nerve going this way on top of the posterior clinoid, fourth nerve again wrapping around, so this is where the free edge of the tent would be. And if this is the free edge of the tent, it would mean that this vessel is infratentorial, which means that this would be the superior cerebellar artery. So the basal artery comes up, forms the basilar tip, gives off the SCA, and then splits into the PCAs, which we'll come back to. SCA comes around and supplies that superior surface of the cerebellum, like we saw before. So three, four, five, six is right here, seven and eight right here. Seven and eight into the internal auditory canal and out and over. So remember, this is the middle fossa, this is that anterior surface of the petrous bone. This is where the petrous ridge was. And then everything down here, posterior fossa um, and uh, posterior circulation. Uh, we can also see here, we have a bunch of perforators that are going uh, to the brainstem, midbrain from uh, the, the vert and the basal. A, high, a lot of perforators going on here of all vessels, not just uh, basilar, but SCA and ICA as well. Um, and if we go, now let's go to the, the other side, let's go to the left side and have a look because the dura here was removed. So let's look at, with the dura intact, what that looks like. So we're just zooming in on, on the left side here. We can still see that vertebral basilar junction. We have the left vert, right vert, basilar trunk again. Here's that ica. You can see the ica in this case is coming in, you know, going 
really towards seven and eight as they enter the IAC, giving off the labyrinthine and subarcuate arteries, very tiny going into the IAC. Um, here's the, the left cerebellar hemisphere. Um, we can see, again, fifth nerve on its straight course into Meckel's cave, sixth nerve right here going into Dorello's canal, third nerve right here, uh, fourth nerve right here. Um, and then a little, if we look a little bit deeper, we can start to see those lower cranial nerves as they are entering the jugular foramen. Here we also have the superior petrosal vein, which is draining into that superior petrosal sinus, which is, as we see right here, running along that free edge of the tentorium. Let's go back, actually, you can see it a little more clearly here, because remember, here, uh, I'm sorry, running, uh, running against the petrous ridge, I meant to say. Here's that petrous ridge like we've, that we've been looking at, same over here, and you can see exactly where that superior petrosal sinus is running. And this is just the vein that it's draining into it. So um, this is a top-down view of the brainstem, and the brainstem is being retracted here. So we're, in this case, we're looking from the top down along that long axis of the clivus. Um, this is not uh, uh, the IAC, um, but I don't want to get you confused. This is where the posterior clinoids would be right here. Here's the carotid. Uh, here's the pituitary in the midline. So we're just pulling that brainstem back. And in this case, we're, we can see six nerve on its way to Dorello's canal exiting the dura. Uh, Dorello's canal, remember, is roofed by the petrosphenoidal ligament or Gruber's ligament. And sixth nerve enters cavernous sinus underneath V1 on the way to the superior orbital fissure. So um, here, uh, so we have um, three. Um, we don't really see four here, but five, six, and seven and eight down here. Um, and, but really, um, we're looking here at the vertebral basilar junction. So we can see those, those left and right verts coming together. We can see the ica coming off the basilar. And um, we can see the relationship, most importantly, between the clivus and the basilar artery. And um, we, we know that the, the basilar artery runs along the clivus. Um, but the vertical point at which the vertebral arteries merge, the level of the vertebral basilar junction, can be variable. Um, and depending on where that is, it's known as high riding um, or low riding relative uh, to the clivus. So um, high riding or low riding basilar refers to the point at which the basilar artery forms in relation to the level of the clivus. Um, and here, this is a pretty normal riding uh, vertebral basilar junction. And uh, we have the vertebral basilar junction, ICA, SCA, and PCA is here. What this, this thing that's cut here is the posterior communicating artery. And that's sixth nerve. Okay, now Sorry, we're jumping around so much in terms of views, but it's hard to show this from a single perspective. This is this is the back of the head. So now we're we're posterior looking anterior again, right? So here we see what's left of C1, um, and here's our vert coming along the sulcus arteriosus and entering the dura. So the left and right margins of the image are lateral, up is superior, and we're looking anteriorly. This is that anterior spinal artery we, we mentioned before. In many, many books and diagrams, you're always going to see the, the basilar artery as this straight structure. In, in, in many, many cases, the basilar artery has curvature to it. Sometimes it has quite a bit of curvature and goes all around. It's not always straight. Um, so uh, let's go through this. Um, just to understand the vertical relationships between the vessels and the nerves in relation to the bone. So we're going to start superior and we're going to move inferior. So up here, I don't know if you notice, but here in, in yellow, um, this is just uh, underneath uh, the level of the carotids here um, coming out. So, and this is uh, probably about where our posterior clinoids are. So that's the third nerve. As we move down, we're going to see the SCA, superior cerebellar artery. So when we have our PCAs up here, basilar tip, SCA, basilar trunk. All these little guys that are cut, these are all perforators. So moving down, here's that, here's fifth nerve. 
Um, we don't we don't really see fourth here. You can see it right here, the tiny little guy right there. Um, but here we have fifth nerve, and you can see. Remember, fifth nerve is coming up and over that petrous ridge. You can see that right here, going into the middle fossa. This is all the posterior surface of the petrous bone. There's that superior petrosal sinus running along the petrous ridge. There's the petrous ridge, um, and this one has been drilled, so you can see. There's the carotid in the petrous bone, in the carotid canal, coming up um, and emerging at the level of the frame and lacerum to become the lacerum segment over here. Um, and then all the way medial to it at the junction, you know, right, right, up, right on top of that petroclival fissure we looked at before is where we'll find Dorello's canal. And that's where we're going to find sixth nerve. And sixth nerve is going straight entering Dorello's canal, uh, exiting the dura, entering the cavernous sinus underneath V1 on its way to the superior orbital fissure. And so remember, third nerve is going to be ab above the SCA. PCA is going to be above um, everything from this perspective because it's supertentorial and everything else is infratentorial. Um, so uh, we have two, three, four, five, six. And then we have the ICA. And as we said, the ICA comes off the basilar. You can notice left and right side are not perfectly symmetrical either in this case. That's you know, often due to that curvature of the basilar artery. So it comes out, it comes off at the level of seven and eight, and you know, oftentimes forms a loop in proximity to seven and eight as they enter the internal auditory canal. So seven and eight have that direct course from their origin as they enter seven and eight, and uh, I'm sorry, as they enter the IAC, and they go in their respective ways. And we saw seven uh, exiting the skull of a four via the stylomastoid foramen. So there are seven and eight. And now as we move a little bit lower, we're now coming down, here's our vertebral basilar junction, here are our left and right vertebral arteries. We can see the pica, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, coming off of the verts. And you can see, it again, it's at the level around the jugular foramen. Not always consistent, but uh, usually intradural. Um, and from uh, the vert, sometimes from the basilar, sometimes absent, sometimes extradural. But most commonly, uh, intradural. And it, it's somewhere around here because it does course around uh, the jugular foramen. So remember, uh, relationship between three and SCA, which, and relationship between three and the posterior clinoid process, um, and the basilar artery relationship with the clivus. Ica is about the level of seven and eight. Pica, variable, often intradural, and will come around uh, the you know nine, ten, eleven, going into the jugular frame. Here's that anterior spinal artery. C1, here's the verts coming in. This is the dural entrance. That blue down there is all venous plexus that surrounds the vertebral artery, comes in, enters the dura, going underneath uh, all of those cranial nerves and giving off the pica. And then there's, of course, 9, 10, and um, 11 uh, going into the jugular foramen. 11, of course, has that spinal uh, component that comes in through the jugular foramen, um, I'm sorry, through the foramen magnum on its way to the jugular foramen, meeting with its cranial component and going through. And, you know, last but not least here, we have 12th nerve. And 12th nerve, short and fear, of course, the hypoglossal canal going through the hypoglossal canal. Um, again, all uh, uh, the nerves are moving superior to the vertebral artery. So, so superior is not the right word from this perspective. The, uh, I mean, the vert's going underneath, so anterior too. Um, so in this perspective, um, we're top down. This is a right side over here, right? Right skull base. This is that anterior surface, and then this is the of the petrous bone. Here's that superior surface. You know, here's the of course. Uh, you know, the landmark I love to throw up because it's so apparent is fifth nerve as it comes up and over the petrous ridge. This is our superior petrosal sinus right here, running along that petrous ridge. This is where Meckel's cave would be. And you can see it, V1 and V2 going into the cavernous sinus, 
be three going into a volley. And um, we can see from this image, uh, the um, SCA is coming around. So let's take a quick look at that. We're just zooming in there in that cerebellar pontine angle, but from above. So we were here laterally earlier. Now we're, we're looking at this area from above um, and we can see, um, uh, we can see that fifth nerve. There it is, intradural five going to Meckel's cave. And then just uh, by, of course, we have the superior cerebellar artery. Now, why is this worth mentioning the proximity of the two? Well, because it, it's the, the, a conflict between these two, a so-called neurovascular conflict between these two can manifest commonly um, as trigeminal neuralgia, which I'm, I'm sure you've uh, learned about in your studies. Um, and this can require a microvascular decompression where um, the offending vessel, whether it be the SCA, the ICA, um, has transposed and moved away to stop beating on the fifth nerve. That's why patients often complain of pulsatile sensations in these cases. So after the superior cerebellar artery, the basal artery uh, bifurcates into the left and right PCAs at the basilar tip. So this is the basilar tip. Basilar tip can form aneurysms too. Often these days those are coiled. Um, these, these are the first vessels in posterior circulation that are supertentorial, as we can see here. So everything underneath them is going beneath the level of the, of the tentorium. Here's that free edge of the tentorium. Here's that SCA wrapping around. Remember, superior cerebellar. So think superior surface of the cerebellum. It's wrapping around, going on top of the superior surface of the cerebellum over here. And here's the PCA, which is coming up above the tentorium. We're going to take a look at its supply in a minute. Also, the PCA, of course, uh, you know, anastomosis with the posterior communicating artery, which we see here coming off of that C7 communicating internal carotid, which is coming up, giving off uh, both the posterior communicating anterior choroidal and then bifurcating in laterally into the MCA, anteriorly into the ACA, and those two are connected by the anterior communicating artery. So the PCA comes off um, as the terminal branch of the basilar, basilar, lateral to the basilar tip, and is both superior to cranial nerve three and the tentorium. It's, um, it's super tentorial, of course, like we said, and it's also posterior to the chiasm. So let's see, we can see this here from a superior and a lateral perspective. Um, you can see SCA is underneath three, three is coming up and down. Remember we say always three is going over that posterior clinoid, medial to the free edge of the tentorium into that ocular motor triangle. And it, all of that is occurring uh, posterior to the optic chiasm where we find two. So let's take a look at that. What does that, what does that look like? So this is a lateral perspective. This is a right side um, where this is that free edge of the tentorium. We're above that free edge. So we're sort of, you know, we're sort of looking super tentorially. Um, and here is our carotid. This is our C7 communicating carotid, right? And we can see the carotid, carotid is giving off that posterior communicating artery. It's coming and it's attaching anastomosing with the posterior cerebral artery. Here we have the basilar trunk coming up, basilar tip. Uh, this is the PCA on the right side, PCA on the left side over here. And underneath it, you don't really see the origin right here, but it's right here. That's the superior cerebellar artery. So see, Superior cerebellar artery is underneath third nerve, infratentorial, going around to the superior surface of the cerebellum. I wish I'd put a poll question in before about this, but what do we think this is right here? Well, this is obviously fourth nerve. Why is it fourth nerve? Uh, not only is it immediately below th three, but it's also coming from much more posterior. The fourth nerve has that that really posterior origin as it wraps around the midbrain um, on its way to join that free edge of the tentorium. And then the bone we would expect to see, of course, right underneath three here is that posterior clinoid process. If I was gonna retract the tentorium a little bit here, I'd see that ocular motor triangle as third nerve is exiting the dura. What am I looking at over here? Well, this is, uh, this is the right, this is the optic chiasm. This is the right uh, uh, optic nerve. 
um, and the middle would be the laminar terminalis. If we followed that all the way back up and we, we went through everything, we'd be in the third ventricle, the optic recess of the third ventricle. And uh, if we follow this, here's our communicating ICA. If it's going, it's bifurcating laterally into the MCA, anteriorly into the ACA, and we may just get a rare glimpse of that, uh, I shouldn't say rare, glimpse of that anterior communicating artery over here. So the part of the brain we mentioned briefly last time over here um, is the uncus. Um, so in you know, an uncle herniation, this can come down and, and compress the, the third nerve right here. Um, I think that's pretty much everything on this picture, SCA, PCA, PCOM, yeah, that's everything. So um, just um, here's the PCA in full, but a brief note before we continue, we would expect to find that fourth nerve origin back here, and that fourth nerve wraps around following the free edge over here where we're higher than it in this image, so we don't see it, but this is the direction it follows. We're also looking up at this picture. Um, so uh, this is uh, third nerve right here. Um, there's second nerve, that's the pituitary stalk. Um, but anyway, this is just to give you an idea of the of PCA territory. So here we see the full PCA. We can see, it, again, it comes off uh, the basal artery, connects with uh, anterior circulation via the posterior communicating artery, and then it turns uh, posteriorly um, around the uh, around the midbrain brainstem. Um, here is the P1 segment, and then we have the P2 segment and the P3 and P4 segments, which supply the cortex. The P1 and P2 segments give off some branches, which supply the thalamus. Let's see that in a little more detail. Um, actually, you can see that here. Uh, and uh, yeah, we can, we can see P3 and P4 closer here, along with their branches, the thalamus and the occipital lobe. Almost, and we can see that here, as well as giving rise to the posterior choroidal artery. So before we finish up uh, quickly, this is um, a vertebral basilar angiogram. This is what's known as a town view, meaning it's from above and in front. It's showing the vertebral basilar arterial system, um, and you can quite clearly see the very large aneurysm arising or large aneurysm arising from the bifurcation. Um, of, of the basal, of the, I'm sorry, the, the basilar tip right here, a basilar tip uh, aneurysm. So let's follow this up from the bottom. Um, so we, here we have our verts, right? So we're looking up and down so we can see the, the length of uh, the SCA and PCA a little bit better. But what would, else would we expect to find around these different levels? Well, first we have the vertebral arteries coming into the dura, coming up. So we would expect the clivus to be around here. Here's our, our, um, our pica coming out. So we can imagine that it's interacting with 9, 10, 11 as they enter the jugular foramen. As we move up, again, vertebral basilar junction in relationship to the clivus. We then have the ica, which comes out and it's forming its loop. So we can also imagine this is about the level of seven, 7 and 8 entering the IAC. As we come up higher, we reach the SCA. So remember, SCA is going to be beneath the tentorium, beneath the third nerve, coming around to, to supply that superior surface of the cerebellum. And then as we come up a little bit further, we encounter this big, uh, this big ball, which is in this case a basilar tip aneurysm. And then we can see the, um, the basilar artery becoming the, uh, each of the posterior cerebral arteries as they go up and back. And we can see this on a lateral view as well. So here's, remember, it's, this is our suboccipital segment coming up of the vert. It's coming up, it's going along that sulcus arteriosus. It's curving around. It's entering the dura. And it's, uh, it's coming up here, here. And now here's where the pica comes out. Remember, here um, uh, comes up. And it, this is that anterior, anterior medullary segment. Um, in this case, the pica, uh, we don't see it fully, or it doesn't take on, you know, it's the most common course, 
So I don't think we see the more caudal aspects, but we see this area as it comes up underneath the cerebellar hemisphere, it comes around with those cortical branches that comes underneath and around. Um, and then here we have the vertebral basilar junction, forming of the vertebral, uh, I'm sorry, the basilar artery. Um, and then we can see, we don't really see the SCA as much here, but we see the, and we don't really see the ICA that much either. We do see the PCA um, as it comes out. And this is where the basilar tip would be. So now, I mean, this image should be pretty clear. You should be able to really uh, navigate this image with these tools with ease um, and use each of the, whether it's bone or soft tissue or dura or nerve or vessel, you can use these as clues to tell you something about the surrounding, right? So we know here's that posterior communicating artery, right? We know if this is the level of third nerve, then we're going to be near that free edge of the tentorium, but underneath it, an SCA should be in our proximity. Um, you know, as we move down, we see the ICA, we know we're going to be around the level of seven and eight, um, and, and so on. Um, and we can see pretty much, again, everything here from two to three uh, to where four would be, five, six, um, seven, eight, and, and so on. And here's our PCA coming back around. Um, and then this is, again, the same, same thing, but more lateral view. Here's, you know, here's three. Actually, let's start from the top. Here's one, two, three, fourth nerve. Fifth nerve, Meckel's cave. Sixth nerve, Dorello's canal. Seven and eight into the IAC. Nine, 10, 11 into the jugular foramen. 12 into the hypoglossal canal. Here the, you can see the origin of the pica. Here's that, uh, uh, probably the ica. Um, third nerve going into the octomotor triangle here. Um, second nerve going into the optic canals. This is our anterior communicating artery connecting the right and left ACA going back to the carotid. Remember the carotid is entering the dura here through that distal dural ring coming up forming ACA and the MCA. Um, what else do we see here? Um, we didn't go into the venous architecture much. Um, we don't really see superior uh, petrosal sinus. This is where we'd expect to find that inferior petrosal sinus. Um, and that's pretty much it. Let's take a look at this. This is a nice video showing a lot of perforators from the BNI. Um, and you can see the, the extent of the perforator network, especially around anterior circulation. So, you know, when you think of vessels, you often think that they're very, you know, you cut the arachnoid, you can move them around a lot, but in most cases, they're quite adhered. Um, to uh, the parenchyma uh, with all these perforators. So here again, here's the, the carotid coming up underneath the anterior clinoid process, um, coming up intradural, PCOM, going back to that PCA. Here's the SCA. We'd expect to find third nerve here above the edge of the 10th. There's third nerve. There's that posterior clinoid process, which is usually always near third nerve. Here's the cella right here, where we'd find the pituitary. Here's the ophthalmic coming off of the um, carotid going into the optic canal. And from this perspective, we can see the vertebral basilar junction, the basilar artery coming up. And that's pretty much cranial circulation. Um, this I saw recently online, and I thought this was a nice, uh, a nice depiction of the different uh, uh, supply territories of all the different vessels and what to look for in scans. You know, this type of material is very didactic and I think this is actually quite easy to learn, um, you know, through books as opposed to the more uh, three-dimensional anatomy. But I, I, I firmly believe that, uh, as I was saying to Michael earlier, that if you, if you really understand the anatomy at, uh, of all these vessels, this kind of comes a uh, second nature because you as you follow them to their innervation or their supply areas um, and you know their courses, uh, understanding this becomes much, much easier. So uh, questions, any questions on cranial circulation?
Um, someone wants to see the thalamus again. Uh, briefly, yeah, we can quickly look at that. There it is. So uh, it's a, in this case, it's quite easy to understand. This is um, this is a view from superior to inferior. So we're looking from beneath the brain. That's why the pituitary stalk you see here is underneath the chiasm. Um, and uh, sorry, you can. I was just reading the questions. You can follow this uh, up here, and you can see, um, you know, the thalamogeniculate artery and the the posterior choroidal artery, um, as well as all the little perforating branches along the way. Um, what else can I think? Which books are good for cerebrovascular anatomy? Yes, um, the book I like the most is, um, let me just pull it up so I don't get the name wrong. Um, Yeah, my, the book I like the most, even though it's not directly about anatomy, is Diagnostic Cerebral Angiography by Anne Osborne. Um, you know, especially the older version, it's uh, very few pictures actually, which is, goes against what I say mostly normally, but she describes the anatomy in a very easy way. You can learn the different segments of things and territories of things, and it helps you correlate um, you know, very visual uh, surgical anatomy with uh, radiological anatomy as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's one of my favorite books. Um, you know, someone asked about the different segments of the ICA and PICA. Um, you know, there are actually, there, there are a couple different classifications or, or, you know, ways to, to call them. It's all, it's a little, it's all very didactic. In terms of the PICA, you know, I like the one that we, that we described earlier because it really matches the surrounding anatomy. Um, See where that was. I guess I just, I just pull that up quickly. Uh, the book was Diagnostic Cerebral Angiography by Anne Osborne. Um, where is my pica? Sorry. Ah, uh, here. Okay. So, yeah, uh, segments of the of the pica. I mean, yeah, the ICA has a, has a couple name segments as well, but the practicality of those is, you know, really depending on what you're doing. Um, uh, but the, the most important generally is the loop of the ICA, which occurs around seven and eight. For the pica, um, given that it has a lot more involvement uh, in, in cerebrovascular disease and surgery, um, it can be a little bit more useful to call it by different names, but its variability does affect the utility of these classifications. Um, but, I, you know, we like this one because it really follows the anatomy. Anterior medullary is on the, you know, the anterior portion of the medulla. Then there's the lateral medullary as it, goes, as it curves around laterally. But most importantly is the tonsil medullary segment, because this is where you find that caudal loop. And that caudal loop is important too, because when you incise that dura and you open the dura right there, the caudal loop is going to be right on top. It's going to be between you and the spinal cord, um, and you have to be very careful of it, or if you want to access it, you have to know where it is. Um, and this caudal loop is useful. And then it curves back up, and then it, it comes underneath the hemisphere in the telovelotonsillar segment, and then it curves back down around, and it kind of fans out and supplies you know, from underneath coming around superficial, um, uh, you know, all, all the surface there in, in its cortical segment. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a surgical neuroanatomist uh, at Cornell um, and uh, if you've seen our, my previous two webinars um, that are available on YouTube, we covered anterior and posterior circulation um, and a fair amount of 
of uh, middle and posterior fossa anatomy. If you haven't seen those, I highly encourage you to go watch them after we finish. Um, today, we're going to focus on the anatomy of a specific region, um, the cerebellum pontine angle, and the anatomy traversed when accessing that region. Um, since we're, we're actually such a, a small group today, um, as we go along, if there's something that you don't understand, just raise your hand on Zoom and uh, I'll stop and we can, we can go through it. Otherwise, I'll stop along the way and we can take questions using the, the Q&A function on Zoom. So first, we're going to discuss what the CPA is, and then we're going to explore the anatomy through the perspective of what is probably the most common approach to the CPA, the retrosigmoid approach. And then we're going to follow cranial nerves seven and eight into the internal auditory canal and explore the anatomy of both the internal auditory canal and the petrous bone, um, as well as the mastoid. And from there, we'll see how we can traverse that anatomy in order to surgically access the cerebellopontine angle by anterior and posterior transpetrosal approaches. So as you may recall from our cranial approaches course, there are a number of different routes that can be used to access the cerebellopontine angle. Today, we'll look at the anatomy of those three routes. I'm not gonna discuss indications for each. I'll leave that to the other great lectures I'm sure you're getting as a part of this Acoustic Neuroma Month, but rather um, we'll focus on understanding navigating these regions. So first we'll look at the most common, which is the retrosigmoid corridor. Uh, the, this blue arrow here. Um, and then we're going to examine um, a pre-sigmoid corridor uh, through the mastoid, um, the translabyrinthian approach. And then we're going to look at an anterior hearing sparing approach, the anterior uh, transpetrosal approach through the petrous bone. So to begin, what is the cerebellopontine? To define it, we need to locate it, and it's found within the posterior fossa, just lateral to the clivus, and just posterior to the petrous temporal bone. Let's descend and take a closer look at the posterior surface um, of the petrous bone. So we're now hovering just behind the petrous bone, looking anterolaterally. So let's first orient ourselves. The red arrow is sitting along the midline of the clivus and it's pointing superiorly. So the, the, the skull here is slightly tilted to the left. So this is the red arrow is, is in the midline along the clivus pointing superior. We can see that here in our little skull model. We're basically that little yellow dot, excuse me. Uh, behind the petrous ridge, looking anteriorly at the foramen ovale. And the yellow arrow uh, is pointing true anterior. So the, anter so the yellow arrow is anterior and the red arrow is superior. So now we're essentially sitting in um, and ho hovering in the cerebellopontine angle, looking anteriorly. Um, and what, mo what might be our most important bony landmark um, that we find here, especially for us in our conversation today, is the internal acoustic canal, the internal auditory canal, um, where we will soon find seventh and eighth cranial nerves, as well as the labyrinthine and subarcuate arteries. This is the petroclival fissure, where the petrous bone meets the clivus. Um, this is virtually the medial limit of the cerebellopontine angle, because medial to this, just behind the clivus, is where we find the prepontine cistern and the basilar artery. The petroclival fissure is also where we find the inferior petrosal sinus, it runs along the fissure, and um, the superior petrosal sinus runs along the petrous ridge right here. So the petrous ridge is here, on the long axis of the petrous bone. This is where we find the superior petrosal sinus inside the tentorium, where, when the tentorium is attaching to the petrous ridge, and then the inferior petrosal sinus running down uh, along the petroclival fissure. And as it runs down inferiorly, we're gonna find the jugular foramen, which is beneath the cerebellopontine angle 
and where we find the lower cranial nerves, nerves nine through 11 here, and then also a 12th nerve going into the hypoglossal canal, but not something we're covering today since it's below our target region. So here um, we have a, a rough depiction of where the cerebellopontine angle is located in relation to the dry skull. It's posterior to the petrous bone, lateral to the petroclival fissure, superior to the jugular foramen, and inferior to the tentorium. Now that we know where it is, what is the CPA? And the, the CPA is just a cistern. And I'm sure you all know a cistern is just an intradural space separated by arachnoid um, and filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Um, and we call it um, an angle in this case because it's located between, uh, at the angle between the anterior surface of the cerebellum and the lateral surface of the pons. As I mentioned before, you can see the medial to the, the cerebellopontine angle is the prepontine cistern um, running along the clivus where we find that the basilar artery. So again, the CPA is inferior to the tentorium, posterior to the petrous bone, lateral to the petroclival fissure, anterior to the cerebellum and pons, and superior to the jugular foramen and lower cranial nerves. Let's take a look at everything together. So we're looking at a right side skull base. The tentorium above the cerebellum is cut to reveal the superior surface of the cerebellum. Um, and the top of the image here is anterior. The back is uh, posterior. The, the right for the right side is lateral. Um, and let's zoom in. We can see uh, the here, we can see the midbrain. We can see third nerve coming up and over the uh, posterior clinoid process and uh, exiting the dura, entering the cavernous sinus, something we looked at in our anterior circulation lecture, which you can go back to. We're not going to cover much today, but uh, just here underneath it, we see the superior cerebellar artery coming around, um, infratentorial, and we know that because this is the, the free edge of the tentorium uh, right here. Um, I don't, can you see my mouse? I'm not sure. But uh, if you can, I, that's where I'm pointing. Um, and then this is cut to reveal uh, the superior surface of the cerebellum. So now let's rotate this image uh, and look at the right side from a lateral view. So now um, we're lateral. Uh, so this is posterior, we're looking medial. This is the, the long axis of the clivus. Here's the basilar artery running up the clivus. Here's the posterior clinoid process. Here's third nerve. Here's fourth nerve running with the tentorium. And here's the free edge of the tentorium. Um, and just down here, we can look in, in that yellow highlighted space into the cerebellopontine angle. So let's move a little anterior. Now, we're positioned anterior looking posterior. Um, at the basilar artery, and we can see the cerebellopontine angle here. Um, and we can see the internal auditory canal. So we know where the CPA is and what, and what the CPA is, but what about its contents? So inside the cerebellopontine angle, we find the intradural segments of cranial nerves five, six, seven, and eight. Um, the flocculus of the cerebellum, which is a small lobe um, of the cerebellum near the middle peduncle. The foramen of Lushka, which connects to the fourth or connects the cistern to the fourth ventricle. Um, and the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, uh, or the ICA, which is a branch of the basilar artery and courses laterally um, in proximity to, to cranial nerves seven and eight before they enter the internal auditory canal. Um, let's also look at some of the surrounding anatomy that we see here. So here's the basilar artery coming up along the clivus. The, the, the fifth nerve is cut here because um, the, the brainstem is pulled back so we can see everything. So this is left side, third nerve coming. We don't see uh, the rest of it. This is fourth nerve also cut. This is on the right side. Um, so three, four, five which would be coming out of its uh, uh, root, coming uh, 
and entering Mechel's cave, exiting the dura. Uh, we have the ica coming off the basilar artery, going towards the internal auditory canal. Um, here we have six nerve, also cut, but this would be on its way to Dorello's canal. This is the pons, obviously, superior surface of the cerebellum, the superior cerebellar artery coming around towards that superior surface of the cerebellum. Um, and then we have the seventh and eighth nerves coming out, uh, entering the internal auditory canal and going through the auditory canal. Here's our flocculus. As seven and eight go through the internal auditory canal, um, they come out, se seven enters the genicular ganglion, gives off the greater superficial petrosal nerve, which is superficial to the petrous carotid running in the middle fossa underneath V3. So this is the petrous ridge. This is the middle fossa and everything behind the petrous ridge is in the posterior fossa. Our view in the middle fossa is extradural. Our view in the posterior fossa here is intradural. So let's take a look at some of the more, actually, let's, so let's go now, we go right to the uh, retrosigmoid approach. So now that we know what the CPA is, let's have a look um, at, its, at the anatomy as seen through a retrosigmoid approach, which is behind the sigmoid sinus, posterior lap. So the retrosigmoid approach, posterior lateral approach behind the sigmoid sinus, watch the orientation of the skull and take careful note of the perspective because this is gonna be our orientation as we go forward. The craniotomy or the craniectomy is fashion. Uh, the cerebellum is, is retracted um, and the corridor is accessed. Um, and we can see three distinct nerve complexes here, which we'll come back to in a minute. So here's our perspective. This is the retrosigmoid perspective, posterior lateral perspective. Uh, this is a nice depiction of the direction we're looking in. We are looking in the direction of the yellow arrow. So from lateral to medial with slightly looking anterior. Um, you can see here in the picture, this is seven and eight. Um, and we are just gently retracting the cerebellum to see in between the posterior surface of the petrous bone uh, and the cerebellum, which is of course, the cerebellum pontine angle, and uh, we are intradural. So let's identify the anatomy we find here. So first up here, we have the SCA, the superior cerebellar artery that we saw before coming off of uh, the basilar artery, curving around, coming in to the superior surface of the cerebellum, and uh, just superficial to that, we have fourth nerve. Fourth nerve originates posteriorly, wraps around with the free edge of the tentorium uh, on its way towards the cavernous sinus. Down here we have uh, the fifth nerve, trigeminal nerve, and the superior petrosal vein, which is entering a superior petrosal sinus, which is running in the tentorium along that petrous ridge. Down here in yellow, we have of course, the internal auditory canal. And this is the, referring to the bony opening here, the meatus of the internal auditory canal. So now let's move a little bit inferior and you see our helicopter here. Let's take on the perspective of that helicopter pilot as he descends. There's our internal auditory canal too. Okay. So now we're taking on this more zoomed in perspective. So this is still our internal auditory canal. This is going, you know, coursing anterior medially. So this is anterior medial, we're lateral, we're looking directly medial along that long axis of the petrous bone, the petrous ridge and tentorium are above us. We don't see them. And this is our fifth nerve. So this is the intradural portion of fifth nerve as it's coming out of the brainstem, going up over the petrous ridge entering Meckel's cave and exiting the dura. Here is seventh nerve. Seventh nerve coming off on its straight direct course into the internal auditory canal. And we have eighth nerve doing very much the same. And in between them here, we have the ica, the anterior inferior cerebellar artery um, and the labyrinthine artery. So if we retract the cerebellar hemisphere a little bit, and we zoom in, we can clearly see that eighth nerve, vestibular nerve. 
there's the ica again, which gives rise to the labyrinthine artery and the subarcuate artery. And down here, this is the origin of seventh nerve. So here we have seven and eight running into the internal auditory canal. And we have the ICA, and in this case, the ICA giving off a labyrinthine and subarcuate artery. Over here, this spongy substance is the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle, just atop the foramen of Lushka, which connects the cistern with the fourth ventricle. And down here, we have our lower complex, which uh, this is the ninth nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve, a little bit lower than the CPA where we're going to be looking today. This is the 10th nerve, vagus nerve, um, and then 11th, uh, the accessory nerve. Now let's keep that same orientation, but zoom out and, and see more from the top and add in some things we've seen before. So here is the tentorium, and it's incised um, along the axis here. And given that this is also the long axis, we're following the, the Petrus ridge. So again, we're lateral, we're looking medial. This is the tentorium. So remember the tentorium for the CPA is our roof. So in this case, it's cut just so we can see a little bit more. Um, and we can also see here within the tentorium, we have that superior Petros sinus and, then, and there's a superior petrosal vein that drains into that superior petrosal sinus. We can see also branches of the SCA. And here, this is fifth nerve. So the trigeminal nerve coming off, going straight up and over that Petrus ridge, entering Meckel's cave, exiting the dura. We're hovering in the posterior fossa. So this yellow arrow, is pointing to the anterior surface of the petrous bone, which is in the middle fossa. So the arrow is supertentorial, and everything above this cut is supertentorial, and everything we're looking at here is infratentorial. So everything underneath is infratentorial, and we're, of course, intradural. So if this is fifth nerve up here, down here, we have sixth nerve. And this is sixth nerve on its straight course from its origin all the way up to Durello's canal as it exits the dura, enters the cavernous sinus through Durello's canal. And of course, as we've just seen, we have seventh and eighth nerves entering the internal acoustic canal. Um, that one in the middle there is the nervous intermedius. Um, so let's continue um, to descend a bit, but we're going to keep our eyes on seventh and eighth uh, as a reference. Okay, so we're just a little bit lower. So now just remember our retrosigmoid perspective here. Um, we are looking medial along the long axis, posterior surface of the petrous bone. And what do we expect to find here? Sorry, that's the sigmoid sinus. So we're retro sigmoid. So we're moving the sigmoid sinus, we're coming behind it. That's the sigmoid sinus. And here we find the vertebral basilar junction. These are the left and right vertebral arteries that are coming up and forming a very high riding or a decently high riding uh, basilar artery. And again, we can see that choroid flex, the fourth ventricle and the foramen of Lushka. And here is ninth nerve, 10th nerve, uh, and 11th nerve all going into the jugular frame. So aside from the opening of the tentorium here, this is the anatomy you see in a, in a retrosigmoid approach. And it, it's worth noting that this approach gives us access to three distinct neurovascular complexes. The upper neurovascular complex, which is the fifth nerve um, and the superior cerebellar artery the middle, which is the seventh and eighth nerves, and the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, and the lower cranial nerves, nine through 12, um, along with the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. The superior corridor can be used for accessing the upper complex, 
um, for, for say microvascular decompression for trigeminal neuralgia. The middle corridor can be used to access a lesion in the mid portion of the CPA, um, like an acoustic neuroma, um, something involving nerve seven and eight. And the inferior corridor can be used to access to some degree the lower neurovascular complex and can also be used in hemifacial spasm because the facial nerve root is there um, and it's only a few millimeters above the glossopharyngeal nerve um, and the pica can, can often be an offending vessel. So now let's continue by following um, the 7A complex into the internal auditory canal and beyond. But before, um, are there any questions so far about the retrosignoid uh, anatomy? Okay, we'll keep going then. Moving on to the temporal bone. The temporal bone is, a, is an anatomically complicated and compact structure that encases so many vital structures, including the internal carotid artery, the semicircular canals, the inner ear, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the jugular, uh, sigmoid sinus jugular bulb, Um, and it can be very difficult to navigate and access due to how compact they are and the fact that they're located all inside of the bone itself. So let's begin in the middle fossa and work our way back towards the internal auditory canal. But let's first reorient ourselves since, uh, since some of you may be new to this. So um, we can use um, these red lines here. So this horizontal line is running from posterior to anterior along the midline. So the right of this image is anterior. The, um, the middle is medial and midline and the posterior and the back of the left side is posterior. Uh, up here we have superior, down would be inferior. Here is medial and here is lateral. We can see that also on the dry skull. And what we were looking at before here is the petrous ridge posterior surface of the petrous bone, but now we're gonna look at the anterior surface of the petrous bone within the middle fossa. Um, then here's the clivus coming up, giving off the posterior clinoid process. Here's the anterior clinoid process. And here are our foramina. So nose, vertex, ear, occiput. So let's just do a quick review of the anatomy here. Um, so this is an extradural view of the floor of the middle fossa. Um, the epineurium covering a lot of the cavernous sinus has been removed. Um, so what we're looking back here is the posterior fossa on the other side. This is all intradural, but the dura is you know, open here. We're underneath the dura. So um, what we see starting from the top is we have second nerve, the optic nerve running into the optic canal. Uh, above the internal carotid artery here, which is uh, just exiting the cavernous sinus. This is the free edge of the tentorium, which has been cut so we can see third nerve. And remember we saw third nerve from that previous perspective. Here, third nerve is coming again up and over that petri the posterior clinoid process, um, exiting the dura through the oculomotor triangle, entering the cavernous sinus uh, on its way to um, the superior orbital fissure. Here's fourth nerve also coming with the tentorium. And here we have fifth nerve that comes, exits the dura through Meckel's cave, comes onto the floor of the middle fossa. Sorry, I should say up and over the Petrus Ridge via Meckel's cave, comes into the middle fossa, gives off V1, goes through superior orbital fissure, V2 uh, through foramen rotundum, and V3 for, through foramen ovale. Um, on the very bottom here, we can see the middle meningeal artery coming through foramen spinosum. And just, uh, on this side here now in yellow, we can see the greater superficial petrosal nerve coming out of the bone and coursing medially along the floor of the middle fossa on top of, of where we expect the petrous segment of the carotid artery to be um, and coursing underneath V3. So let's take the bone away 
and give ourselves x-ray vision through this bone. Now, you can see our little bus here. So we're gonna take a drive and we wanna drive our goal. We're not sitting on V1. So our goal is gonna to be to drive to the external ear. Um, so let's take a look at our, our possible route options to get from sitting on V1 to the external ear. So first, here's that GSPN that we just saw. So GSPN coming off the geniculate ganglion, coursing on top of the petrous segment of the carotid underneath V3. And we can see the deep petrosal nerve in route to join the GSPN um, and enter the vidian canal uh, to become the vidian nerve over here. And we, can, we also have the lesser petrosal nerve on its way to the otic ganglion. So the, we have here the geniculate ganglion, facial nerve, internal auditory canal, geniculate ganglion, greater superficial petrosal nerve on top of the bone. You can see why that's an indicator of where the petrous carotid is because the petrous carotid is running in the bone, toward, you know, uh, in the carotid canal, um, in the petrous bone, running medially towards the cavernous sinus. And we have GSPN, deep petrosal, and lesser petrosal nerves. And that's the genicular ganglion. And the genicular ganglion is the most significant ganglion um, of the facial nerve. Um, and it sits in really close proximity to another very important structure that we're gonna be seeing a lot here. Um, any idea what might be in this area? This is the cochlea. So let's zoom in and take a closer look at this, at this region. So now we put the bone back. Orientation is roughly the same. Here's again, fifth nerve entering Meckel's cave, exiting the dura, coming up and over. Here's our carotid exposed. Here's our GSPN, V1, V2, V3. Here's all the, uh, up here is the cavernous sinus. So we're gonna be focusing on this area now. So we've zoomed in. So we can see now, we can see the superior petrosal sinus here in the tentorium. The, everything to the left of this or behind this is the posterior fossa. Everything here is in the middle fossa. This view is extradural. This view is intradural. So here we can see fifth nerve coming out, coming up and over the petrous ridge and trifurcating. Um, and uh, we, uh, so let's pay attention, spe you know, specifically here to the middle meningeal artery, which is coming through the foramen spinosum, the GSPN on top of the carotid, uh, and V3. We're going to use these to orient ourselves as we go further. And here, of course, is the internal auditory canal. So remember, our goal is to drive to the external ear. So if we drive, if we we're sitting now here uh, on the GSPN, if we take a right, go through the geniculate ganglion into the internal auditory canal, it's probably going to be a dead end. But let's go in and, and see for ourselves. So we're going into the internal auditory canal. Orientation now is a little more top down. We have a little more bone removed so we can see the middle and inner ear, uh, the semicircular canals and the IAC. But everything is roughly the same orientation wise. So now we can clearly see here the facial nerve from its origin, intra, the intradural portion within the cerebellopontine angle as it's entering the internal auditory canal, it's coming go coursing straight and then entering uh, the geniculate ganglion. And the geniculate ganglion is giving off that GSPN. And it continues uh, and curves around to become the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. So, and that's going to the tympanic cavity uh, and entering the fallopian canal, which we're gonna see in a minute from the, from the other side, from the transmastoid perspective. We have the intradural segment, we have the intracanalicular segment of the nerve, now we have the tympanic segment going towards the tympanic membrane, and then we're going to see the fallopian segment in the mastoid.
Here is the vestibular nerve. This is eighth nerve, specifically the superior vestibular nerve. And this one is on its way to the semicircular canals. Um, and we're going to come back and look at the, the relationship between seven and eight within the IAC shortly. So as we saw before, here's that nervous intermedius. Uh, and then uh, here we also see the anterior inferior cerebellar artery coming off the basal artery and coming around. And just medial to the geniculate ganglion, we find that cochlea. So here's our cochlea. You can see the cochlear spirals in there. Um, and, and as we're driving a long seventh nerve from its origin, we want to get extra cranial. We can either go through geniculate ganglion, we can make a left. We can make a left and we can go on to the GSPN or we can make a right and go onto the tympanic segment and go to the mastoid. We don't wanna to go to the Vidian Canal and we just came from that area. So we're gonna go around and follow the tympanic segment. And if we follow that tympanic segment, it brings us here to the labyrinth, which is the inner view. Um, and it's comprised, it's composed of the semicircular canals, including the lateral semicircular canal, sometimes called the horizontal canal, the posterior semicircular canal, which is the most posterior, and the superior semicircular canal. And due to its height, the superior semicircular canal, in some cases, creates a ridge on the base of the skull, known as the arcuate eminence, which you can see here in this really nice depiction. It's not, it's not a good, great correlation, but it, it's a, sometimes a good indicator. Um, and you can see uh, here what that kind of looks like. So just underneath the labyrinth, we have the tympanic cavity, which um, comprises the middle ear and contains the ossicle, uh, the ossicles, which of course include the malleus, the incus, the stapes, which bangs on the tympanic membrane and brings us out into the external auditory canal. On the intracranial side of the tympanic membrane, we have something else here, and it's a muscle. I bet some of you know what this muscle is. It helps us dampen loud sounds. Some people can voluntarily, can, can voluntarily flex it and control it. This is the tensor tympani muscle. And right underneath the tensor tympani muscle, we have the eustachian tube, which connects the middle ear to the nasopharynx. And last but not least, we have, again, our superior petrosal sinus running in the tentorium along that petrous ridge. So now let's zoom in and take a look at the relationships between those structures inside the internal auditory canal. This is a lateral view. We're back in a, a retrosigmoid perspective. So left of the image is posterior, uh, right of the image is kind of anteromedial. So we're lateral looking medial. Um, I'm sorry, I said lateral, but the lateral perspective, medial, looking medially at the internal auditory canal. So here's the internal auditory canal. And we have seventh nerve entering the canal and eighth nerve large beneath it. And here is the anterior inferior cerebellar artery um, separating the two in this case. And again, the subarcuate artery and the labyrinthine artery both of which most commonly originate from the ICA. So this is a mnemonic device, which many of you may be familiar with um, from studying for boards, um, seven up, coke down. Um, but uh, so this basically describes the different compartments of the internal auditory canal. We have anti our superior and inferior compartments, that are divided into anterior and posterior as well. So let's take a look at, let's see what that really means and what that looks like. So here we have seventh nerve 
in the antero superior compartment of the internal auditory canal along with the nervous intermediates and cranial nerve eight in full. And in the superior compartment, um, seven and eight are separated by the vertical crest known as Bill's bar. So this is the superior compartment up here. This is the inferior compartment. And this is what separates the superior compartment uh, into uh, its respective sides. And this is known as Bill's bar, vertical crest. So seven up, superior or seventh nerve, so a superior vestibular nerve, Bill's bar, transverse crest. And we can see eighth nerve is made up of three distinct nerves, the superior vestibular nerve in the posterior a posterior superior compartment of the IEC, separated uh, again by Bill's bar. Oops, um, and separated uh, from its compatriots in the inferior compartment by the transverse, or, or sometimes known as the falciform crest here. And the inferior vestibular nerve in the inferior compartment of the internal auditory canal which runs with the cochlear nerve, sometimes called the auditory nerve. So superior compartment, inferior compartment, separated by the transverse crest, and then the superior compartment separated by Bill's bar. So let's put some more of these pieces together. Let's just take a look at this from a superior perspective. So here we have seventh nerve, running in the IAC, forming the geniculate ganglion, that fork in the road, giving off the greater superficial petrosal nerve, which is going through the facial hiatus, entering the floor of the middle fossa, extradurally, um, on, you know, traveling on top of that petrous carotid on its way underneath V3. And in the vertex of uh, GSPN and seventh nerve, of the angle between them, the vertex of the angle between them, we find the cochlea. You can see it spirals here. And on the other side of the superior compartment, we have the superior vestibular nerve on its way to the labyrinth via the vestibule, which is essentially the central part of the labyrinth. Um, hence why we see the superior semicircular canal here. And just remember that arcuate eminence from earlier. And the superior vestibular nerve, again, is separated in that superior compartment by Bill's bar, the vertical crest, um, Bill's bar named after uh, William House of the House Institute and the House Brackman scale. And separated from the inferior compartment by that transverse or, or falciform crest. And in the inferior compartment, we have the inferior vestibular, the cochlear nerves. Um, and if we follow, and, and the, oh, sorry, and the cochlear nerves. And if we follow the facial nerve into the geniculate ganglion through the GSPN, we know we end up back in the middle fossa going towards the cavernous sinus. So like we said, we wanna follow the seventh nerve out and go towards that tympanic segment. Um, if we follow the cochlear nerve, we're gonna terminate inside the cochlea here, which we don't wanna do. We wanna to get to that external ear. Here's the cochlear nerve coming into the cochlea. If we follow the superior and inferior vestibular nerves, we terminate in the labyrinth. But if we follow the facial nerve through the geniculate ganglion and go the other direction via the tympanic segment, uh, of the facial nerve, we can get all the way to the stylomastoid foramen where the facial nerve exits the skull. Um, and we now we're on the other side. So let's go back for one sec. Here's the facial nerve coming out. Here's geniculate ganglion. Here's the tympanic segment coming up and around the horizontal canal. And let's take a look now from the other side. This is the lateral side. So now we're looking lateral, looking medial. Here's that horizontal canal 
the tympanic segment is, I'm sorry, here's the horizontal canal, that tympanic segment is coming around. So we're following it around and this is where it enters the fallopian canal and becomes the fallopian segment, traveling in the mastoid all the way to the stylomastoid foramen. It's also a really nice shot here of the tympanic membrane. So this is the anatomy of the temporal bone. Uh, before we go on, are there any questions here as to the anatomy of the temporal bone or the internal auditory canal? Okay, so now we can examine the transpetrosal routes, the routes through the petrous temporal bone to the internal auditory canal and cerebellum pontiae. We're going to start with the anterior route, which takes us from the middle fossa through the petrous apex to the internal auditory canal and cerebellum pontiae angle. So here we have a top down view. You can see the superior surface of the cerebellum again. You can see the pons over here. This is where our, our cerebellum pontine angle um, would be found. Um, take a look again here at the at V3, trigeminal nerve V3. Take a actually look at intradural five as well as extradural V3. Um, and we're going to use this uh, as an orientation as we continue. So now we're looking posteriorly. We can see the same thing. Here's that fifth nerve coming up and over Petrus Ridge. There's V3. There's our greater superficial petrosal nerve um, on top of the petrous carotid undergoing underneath V3. And here, this is where the freight of the tentorium was. So this red arrow up top is pointing posterior. This is fourth nerve, this is third nerve. Um, and then this arrow on the left is pointing lateral. So given all the complex structures in the petrous bone, there's one open safe route by the petrous apex from the middle fossa to the cerebellum pontine angle um, along the internal auditory canal um, to the superior to the petrous carotid and medial to the superior semicircular canal. So let's, let's just take a closer look at that. This is known as Kawase's triangle. Um, so as we saw, GSPN is our superficial landmark. Uh, for the internal auditory canal. So keep that in mind. So here's V3, keep that in mind as well. And the superior semicircular canal and arcuate eminence. So we'll use these to orient ourselves. This is the superior petrosal sinus running along the petrous ridge. Here's the intradural fifth nerve coming up and over that petrous ridge um, and entering the middle fossa. So V3, carotid, superior semicircular canal. And at the base here, this is where we expect to find the internal auditory canal uh, with seventh and eighth nerves coming. So it's running in this direction towards the geniculic ganglion. And this is, of course, where we expect to find, uh, sorry, on this side, the cochlea. So this is our route. This is the left side. Um, so we're going to be going through the petrous apex uh, and then coming out here, uh, a lot, exposing the internal auditory canal and coming out with a little bit into the cerebellum pontine angle. So this is the petrous ridge where the drilling would take place. We're going to use the petrous ridge, GSPN, V3 um, as landmarks and uh, arcuate eminence. So let's zoom in to a more surgical view. So now this is a surgical view. We still have V3 here. This is GSPN, the bone's been a little bit drilled out so you can see where that petrous carotid is. Here's the arcuate eminence. So we can start to drill in that, in that triangle because we know we're safe here. We expect the cochlea to be where? So this is V3, petrous ridge is the superior aspect is up here. So seventh and eighth nerves are coming in, coming through as they become more superficial, this direction. So this is where we expect uh, the IAC to be, 
we expect caniculic ganglion to be around here as it gives off GSPN. And in that angle between them is where we expect the cochlea to be. And here's roughly where we expect the superior semicircular canal to be. So let's, as we see here, so let's keep removing bone. And now we have found our cochlea. We left it intact because this is a hearing sparing approach as opposed to the posterior transpetrosal approach with removal of the labyrinth translabyrinthine approach, which we're gonna see after. So we expect, this is the, the dura of the posterior fossa, the dura of the internal auditory canal. It's all closed, but we, if we imagine what's behind there, we know we have seventh and eighth nerve coming off uh, the brainstem entering the internal auditory canal. We know seventh nerve comes up. It makes that you know turn to form the genicular ganglion. We can either go left in this case towards uh, the tympanic segment. We can go right towards the GSPN um, and we expect the cochlea to be in between uh, the GSPN and the uh, seventh nerve. So if we open the dura there and we zoom in, remember our perspective is still the same. This is V3, this is GSPN, this is where our cochlea is. We find intradural fifth nerve. And that may be confusing initially because if we're looking at V3, how are we seeing intradural five? But we've sort of just drilled on top of ourselves. So we've exposed, we drilled that petrous ridge. So we're looking uh, at, at the origin of the fifth nerve as it comes uh, up and over that petrous ridge and then later forms V3. And as we, we turn a little bit lateral and we find intradural seventh and eighth nerves, in this case, the loop of the, of the ICA is separating them and we're following them into the internal auditory canal. And if we take a little, uh, we take a little bit more bone medially and we turn and we look medially, um, we can see six nerve uh, right here. And this is six nerve coming off on its way into Dorello's canal, exiting the dura, entering the cavernous sinus, um, just underneath the anterior inferior cerebellar artery here, which is coming off of the basilar artery right here. And if we look really deep, we can see the vertebral basilar junction. So both verts coming up, forming the basilar artery um, due to the fact this is a high riding basilar artery. So here we can see fifth nerve intradural, sixth nerve intradural. We have the ICA as well as seventh and eighth nerves intradural and the vertebral basal junction. And if we lift the basal artery, we can see this. Any idea what this might be? This is the contralateral ICA on the other side. So this is the anterior transpetrosal route to the cerebellum pontine angle and the internal auditory canal. So now let's take a look um, at a posterior transpetrosal route, route through the mastoid and through the labyrinth that sacrifices here. Earlier we saw the retrosigmoid and now we're seeing a pre-sigmoid perspective. So these green and red arrows here um, are the transmastoid routes. The green is the translabyrinthian approach, which we'll see. So that means we're going through the mastoid, this is the mastoid and its air cells, through the mastoid antrum, through the labyrinth, which is the semicircular canals, and into the cerebellopontine angle. So this one is a right side. This is our mastoid. Let's zoom in. So here we have the mastoid tip. Here is the zygoma and the root of the zygoma. And just beneath it, here we have the external auditory canal and going in, that's where we find the tympanic membrane. So now we need to reorient, this is an anatomical position, let's reorient this into a surgical position. So now top is anterior, Mastoid tip is inferior, 
um, the this portion of the mastoid here um, is posterior, and on the left is superior. So nose, vertex, occiput, foot. So now we're looking at the same thing with the bone put back in place. So this is our view. Actually, the, the image rotation is wrong. Don't look at that. This is correct. This is the mastoid tip. This is the uh, uh, external uh, acoustic canal there. Um, this is what's called the supermeatal spine, the spine of Henle. Um, and here's the lambdoid suture. So this mastoid tip is inferior, um, and we are coming in front of the sigmoid sinus. So as we start to remove bone here, you're going to see the mastoid air cells. You're going to see the middle fossa dura right here. As we take more, as you go deeper, you're going to see the mastoid antrum. If you keep going, you're going to still see the mastoid antrum, and you're also going to see this over here. Take a second and think about what this structure might be. This is the incus. And the incus is useful in this approach because it gives you the rough depth of where the facial nerve is. So you can, once you find the incus, you know what depth the facial nerve is, you can continue to remove bone. And you can see here's the incus and here's the facial nerve. Um, and you can see the canals are starting to, to come in. You, this is the inside of the canal and the labyrinthectomy portion is starting. So, as you skeletonize uh, the, the fallopian canal, this is the fallopian segment of the facial nerve traveling within the fallopian canal, the panic segment coming around that we saw before, entering the fallopian canal, becoming the fallopian segment, traveling inferiorly along the anterior margin of the mastoid towards the stylomastoid foramen where it exits the skull. Um, here we also see the sigmoid sinus with the bone removed. Um, and the, the vestibule here that we saw before. So if you proceed with the labyrinthectomy, you remove the semicircular canals, and then you expose the sinodural angle, uh, the angle between the sigmoid sinus and the dura, as well as the jugular bulb. And if we re remove the rest of the bone here, we find the dura of the internal auditory canal, and the posterior fossa dura. So this is the entire mastoid drilled out, labyrinth removed. Here's the dura of the internal acoustic canal. So extracranially here, we have the mastoid tip. Um, and then stylomastoid foramen, and we can follow the facial nerve all the way back through the fallopian canal, all the way around what would have been the horizontal canal, it's been removed back into that internal acoustic canal Remember, it makes that turn. Here's that turn. Um, and it comes back in. Now we're inside the dura of the internal acoustic canal as it comes back towards uh, the posterior fossa. So just beyond this little bit is where we'd expect to see that intradural portion of seven and eight. So let's open the dura and see. And of course, that's what we see. Here's our here's seventh nerve coming around, and then here's intracanalicular seven, meaning within the canal, and intradural seven, seven, oh, seven and eight, sorry, and um, our flocculus. So here you can see everything labeled. There's the incus, facial nerve, middle fossa dura, and then uh, sigmoid sinus, jugular bulb. We are pre-sigmoid, so in front of the sigmoid sinus this time, as opposed to posterior to the sigmoid sinus in the retrosigmoid approach, um, but uh, you have to remove the semicircular canals to expose this. And here we have, uh, superiorly, we have fifth nerve. Uh, and then closer to us here, we have the facial nerve um, right there. So as we zoom in, welcome back to the cerebellopontine angle. Uh, the retrosigmoid approach, um, again, behind the sigmoid sinus. But here, we're in front of that sigmoid sinus. 
and we can see here's fifth nerve entering Meckel's cave, going up and over that Petrus Ridge, uh, exiting the dura and, and trifurcating on the floor of the middle fossa. Um, don't be thrown off by this. This is just the motor root of the fifth nerve. Um, but down here we have that sixth nerve. So five, six, six coming up, entering Durello's canal, which is covered by Gruber's ligament, uh, exiting the dura, entering the cavernous sinus. Um, and here we have seventh nerve. And eighth nerve. This is the superior vestibular nerve and the inferior vestibular nerve. And then in the middle, we have the nervous intermedius. And together, they are going into the, the internal auditory canal. And between them, we have the ICA. And down here, we have the lower cranial nerves, nine going into the jugular foramen, and 10 going into the jugular foramen. So um, if we look further inside that internal auditory canal, uh, we can see again that entire course now of the seventh nerve. You know, here's eighth nerve, here's seventh nerve coming back. So origin coming all the way up, intracranial portion, intracanalicular portion, going through the canal, coming up where we expect the geniculate ganglion to be, GSPN going medially in the middle fossa, whereas we took that right turn around tympanic segment coming over here where that horizontal canal was, entering the fallopian canal, going through into the fallopian segment, and all the way down to the stylomastoid foramen to exit the skull. So that's the entire course of the seventh nerve. We saw the entire course of the eighth nerve before. And now if we detach uh, that facial nerve from the genicular ganglion, um, we can uh, transpose it backwards. Um, and this is known as a transcochlear approach. It gives access uh, to drill the cochlea and expose the petrous carotid. Not very common anymore, but uh, we can also see here just clearly, uh, if, we, if we go back, we can see that bend where we were talking about stricular ganglion, tympanic segment, there's that nice bend. You can transpose that over. Um, and then we can just continue following that into the stylomastoid foramen, exiting the skull. And we can follow that out. Here with the semicircular canals intact, we can see that horizontal canal again, horizontal, uh, posterior, and the superior canal. Um, superior, you can kind of imagine why that has some relationship to the arcuate eminence based on its location. Uh, you can imagine also that seventh nerve again coming around the, the horizontal or lateral canal, uh, and then coming out here into the mastoid sort of a transition point from the petrous bone to the mastoid, uh, then coming all the way down, going through that stylomastoid foramen. We also see the sigmoid sinus coming around, forming the jugular bulb, going to the jugular foramen down there. I'm not gonna talk too much about. And then here, this is with the jugular foramen open, just so you can see what that looks like. So, we came through the mastoid here. This is the mastoid. These are the mastoid air cells. This is the external auditory canal. We came through the mastoid, through the labyrinth, um, in order to, to find the internal auditory canal, cerebellopontine angle. Here, again, is seven coming around. Here uh, is the genicular ganglion. Here's GSPN. Here's the tympanic segment. And here's the entrance into the fallopian canal that we just looked at, but this is from a different perspective. But the anatomy is the same. You just have to reorient, reorient your mental, uh, mental model of the anatomy. So to review from an anatomical perspective, let's take a look at everything that we can see here. Um, and we can start from the, the very top. This is third nerve. Um, third nerve coming straight down on top of the posterior clinoid process, which is coming off of the clivus, which is anterior to the basilar artery that's running up along the clivus, uh, the prepontine cistern. We have third nerve coming up and over uh, the posterior clinoid, 
um, exiting the dura via the ocular motor triangle, entering the cavernous sinus on its way to the superior orbital fissure. Above that, we have the anterior clinoid process. And medial to that, we can see, in this case, the ophthalmic segment, and then underneath that, the clinoid segment, and then the cavernous segment of the internal carotid artery. We have fourth nerve that originates posteriorly, wrapping around uh, a midbrain coming um, with the free edge of the tentorium, uh, exiting the dura over here, and entering the cavernous sinus also on its way to superior orbital fissure. So three, four, now we have fifth nerve coming from its uh, origin, intradurally going up and over that petrous ridge, as you can see here, entering Meckel's cave, trifurcating on the floor of the middle fossa into V1, which is going to the superior orbital fissure in the cavernous sinus, V2, which is going to the foramen rotundum, uh, exiting the skull in the cavernous sinus, cavernous sinus all the way down to here. Then we have V3 uh, exiting going on top of the GSPN, exiting through foramen ovale. We can also see middle meningeal artery coming up through foramen spinosum. So that's three, four, five. Here we have six nerves, six nerve coming up, exiting the dura through Durello's canal, which is covered by Gruber's ligament, entering the cavernous sinus, going underneath V1 on its way to the superior orbital fissure. Here we have seventh nerve. In this case, it's been cut, so we can see a little bit more. Um, but uh, it's seventh nerve, uh, and this would be the intracranial segment uh, going into the internal auditory canal, coming straight, um, giving off the geniculate ganglion, which gives off the GSPN, and then forcing, making a very sharp turn, going laterally and inferiorly, going around the horizontal canal, entering the fallopian canal and going out uh, towards the stylomastoid foramen. Um, here is our sigmoid sinus, uh, jugular bulb. Here's our lower cranial nerves entering the jugular foramen. We also have eighth nerve here going towards uh, the internal auditory canal. So that's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, um, Vascularly, we have the basal artery coming up from the two verts, uh, a vert giving off the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, the basal giving off the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, coach, uh, which is going towards the IAC at the level of seven and eight, um, and then coming up, giving off uh, the superior cerebellar artery, which is coming around, going on the superior surface of the cerebellum, and all of that is infratentorial. Uh, now, as we go supratentorial, we have the, the PCA, which is coming around here. Uh, we don't see uh, anything above that. So same, same view or same anatomy from a more surgical perspective, the tentorium is also open here. This is a pre-sigmoid view, and it's the same anatomy. So we have the we're just lifting the temporal lobe here. This is the free edge of the tentorium. Here's fourth nerve wrapping around the tentorium. Uh, as we saw, exit, exiting the dura, entering cavernous sinus. Here's fifth nerve going up and over the petrous ridge, uh, Meckel's cave into the middle fossa. Uh, sixth nerve on its way to Durello's canal. Seven and eight coming here. Uh, eight going into uh, the uh, canals and the cochlea. Seventh nerve, as we can see, Geniculate ganglion, GSPN medially, uh, tympanic segment laterally, coming all the way around the fallopian canal, right into the stylomastoid foramen. Uh, and here's that sigmoid sinus and our lower cranial nerve. Uh, and the same zoomed in, this is now just with seventh nerve transposed. Um, and we can see all of, all of the same anatomy there. You can get a much more clear view of sixth nerve. So, that is pretty much the anatomy of the temporal bone and the cerebellopontine angle as seen through three different surgical perspectives. Posterior lateral, which is the retrosigmoid approach, lateral, which is the transmastoid approach or presigmoid approach, and anterolateral, the anterior transmetrosal approach. So that's, that's all I have. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, 
if you have any questions. All right, so that's really the first half of uh, of the talk. Um, I don't know if you want to stop here and ask if you have any specific questions on that, or we can just move straight on in the next 25 minutes and talk about some anatomy. Um, I think I'll just move straight on if that's okay. Um, so, so again, cinematic rendering, I, I think is particularly useful for understanding um, anatomy. I think we're moving uh, progressively towards an era where we're able to visualize things reliably in three dimensions with exceptional granularity. Um, and we're also able to see the, you know, uh, the, with relative perspective, where where various structures lie adjacent to one another in terms of in terms of depth and, and position, and uh, and again just to give you an overview of of you know what what we're what we're capable of, uh, you can see that we're able to you know pull back layers of tissue to depict muscle, and then to detect, depict bone. We're able to um, look at three dimensional volumes in uh, in a comprehensive format from any orientation and any obliquity. Uh, you can see how the individual structures really, really show themselves really well as compared to looking at a two dimensional uh, image. Um, and we can cut through and we can, and we can uh, look at individual structures that, that we may be, that we may be interested in, or that may be relevant for a particular surgical approach. Um, so, let me... so, so just to oops, sorry, sorry. Uh, I was going to ask just a quick question uh, regarding this topic specifically, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so I've seen this a lot on my rotations, and it's always been super exciting and super helpful. And just maybe from your perspective, um, a question I've always had is, can we totally rely on these three D reconstructions for their anatomy? How accurate are they in your mm. opinion? Like, can we depend on these things when we're thinking about surgical approaches? Yeah, interesting. That that's a great question, actually, and and it's it's actually quite a complicated answer. So, in order to answer that, I'll, I'll do that as best I can in the next two minutes. First of all, I think you need to understand how these how these uh, images are derived, and I think by understanding how they derived, uh, that that might give you a sense of of how reliable they 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 might be. So so you acquire a volume of data. And uh, the, if you think about the data in terms of in terms of uh, tiny little blocks of, um, we, we talk about voxels and pixels, right? So a voxel is a volume element of tissue. A pixel is a picture element. So the volume the volume element of tissue corresponds to the picture element that you see on the screen, right? Um, now each of those individual small little blocks that make up this large volume of information or this large volume of tissue can be looked at in various ways. Uh, traditionally, when you look at a CT scan, you're not actually looking, again, in much the same way, you're not actually looking directly at the tissue. And it's important to always bear that in mind. You're looking at a, at a computer algorithm's depiction of the tissue, right? Um, even in a simple CT scan, looking at an axial slice, you're looking at a, at a depiction of, of, of uh, what we call a sinogram um, and the attenuation value is being rendered uh, adjacent to one another and rendered in a certain format based on what the barriers of the tissue look like. But, but we know now after several decades of using that type of imaging that, that, these, are, that these are reliable because you, know, you, you see the CT, you go to the OR and you don't, you don't get a big surprise, right? So, so that's that. Then when you come to something like um, 3D uh, representations, uh, depending on how the um, how on, on the specific vendor and the specific software, there is a different algorithmic approach to to depicting the tissue. The value of cinematic rendering is the fact that what's actually going on is is algorithms are plotting the trajectory, believe it or not, of thousands, in fact, tens of thousands of photons of light from multiple directions projected onto each and every voxel. And then the algorithm then takes all that information, all those trajectories of those photons, and it converts it into a depiction of the structures as you would have seen them if you were looking at a photograph. 
um, which includes considerations of like, where's the light being directed from? Um, how much of a shot? I don't know if you guys do much uh, photography or, or a film or anything like that, but you know, uh, depending on, you know, directionality of light, depending on things like uh, shuddering, um, depending on, on, on a number of, of parameters, you can actually uh, depict these, these uh, structures in various ways, which is what allows us to, to uh, visualize the layers that we, that we see. It also is what allows us to uh, visualize the, 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 dif the different depths and the, and the shadowing of, of, of structures on, on, top of, on top of one another. Um, so, so the, 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 the short answer after all of that is to say that, yes, I think overall, this is an accurate representation of the anatomic structures. Um, but I think you do have to be aware, aware of the fact that there have been several layers of processing and that, um, and that the layers of processing are are dependent on individual decisions as to how they want to depict various structures. Uh, I I don't did that answer your question? Did that did that? Yeah, cover? absolutely. And um, I'll say it's a very exciting part. I mean, I'm interested in neurosurgery, right? But like, I think the big part, the big future for the surgical approach is actually a lot of this imaging because you can only innovate so much in the way you actually operate but the way that you make operating easier with this type of imaging and similar is like a huge exciting future for for us looking into surgical specialties and so it's really exciting and it's good to know that it's um you know it's an accurate uh, thing that that we can use yeah so so yeah so so on that basis um again very useful when you want to be aware of for example vascular structures so you can see you have your common carotid artery your carotid bifurcation uh your internal and external carotid and the various branches and, and you can see the vertebral artery here um and again you know there, there are different ways you could render this so you could render this in a way that 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 shows the bones a lot more clearly that shows the granularity of the surface more clearly that shows the vasculature more clearly or or not so it's important to bear, but again, that that's what it comes back to your question. You know, um, you you could you could so for example, if you were considering whether or not there's a small vessel coursing close to a tumor or, or something like that, you could you could filter that in or filter that out depending on 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 the algorithm, and I think that's where um, where where a mistake could come in, not being aware of the fact that something is being filtered in in a certain way. Um, but I think overall the the um, technology is reliable. Now, now a second a, a corollary to that would be well, could we use this? Because it, you know, when you say something's reliable, it, you kind of have to say reliable for what exactly, right? So, um, if you were planning to use this, I mean, and and we can go on various tangents, um, but just briefly, things like um, augmented reality or virtual reality or um, using this as you know overlays in surgery you know if you if you're looking at robotic surgery with uh, anatomic uh, trajectories to to place your instruments uh, this is not going to be reliable um, and this is not going to be reliable not because the imaging is unreliable but because the technology of um, overlaying imaging on physical objects is not reliable um, i think i think i just throw that out there uh, because you what you'll probably see either now or over the next few years, a lot of vendors purporting to have technology that allows you to uh, visualize uh, structures directly over the skin. And, and uh, in the majority of cases, that's actually not, not the case. There's actually a significant margin of error. Uh, the best um, algorithms that we've seen have, have been um, probably a, a minimum of eight millimeters of, of error if you try to overlay uh, digital information on, on, on soft tissue. Um, particularly soft tissue where, where there's a lot of deformation uh, in, in the course of a surgery. But, but anyway, that's a bit of a tangent. Um, so what I wanted to show you here is again, you know, looking um, at a dorsal uh, uh, projection, this really shows you the, the posterior elements really well. You can see the spinous processes, you can see exactly what they look like. Uh, you can see if, there, if potentially there was an incomplete spinous post, uh, uh, posterior arch at a certain at a certain level as we sometimes see congenitally 
Um, again, getting back to being sure that you've actually rendered it in the correct way, that it's not a fabrication. Um, the interlaminar space between the, between the lamina, being able to see that really well to place a needle or to uh, plan, um, for example, placing an endoscope. Those of you who may be interested in endoscopic spine surgery. Um, and then, of course, you know, your, your facet joints and the orientation of the facet joints from various, from various angles. Um, uh, here, I wanted to uh, just point out a few, a few aspects of uh, the cervical spine anatomy. So people talk about um, some, some critical features of the cerv cervical spine. So as you know, you have the atlas carrying the world on his, sho on his uh, shoulders. Um, also, you know, bio in biomechanics, they talk about the atlas as the cradle. Um, then you have the axis, um, you know, which, which uh, forms a, a pivot of, of rotation. Uh, then you have the C2, C3 junction, which is, which is a particularly important um, biomechanical component uh, uh, called the root. And then you have the remainder of the cervical spine, which uh, people discuss as the, the column. Now, um, on these images, what I'm trying to depict is the fact that the odontoid process of C2 really fits really nice and snugly in the anterior arch of, of, uh, of C1. Um, and, and again, this depicts how you know, form really suits function. You know, the ability to actually rotate about that odontoid uh, process is, is, uh, is, is facilitated. Um, by that, another another thing I wanted to show you guys, which I thought was quite interesting, was if you if you look at the um, the individual uh, vertebral bodies or the intervertebral joints, um, you have a a convex uh, superior margin, you know, sitting inside a concave superior margin, and this this really allows the individual levels to rock side to side. Um, and then when we look at it laterally, you can, you can actually see that at the level of the, and I don't know that I've depicted that as well as I could have, but at the level of the uncovertebral joint um, along the side, you actually, have, um, you actually have the opposite. So you have, you have a biconvex joint. So on the one side, you have, you have concave, convex inside concave um, going superior to inferior and on the other, and, on, and, and, from, and looking laterally, you actually have um, a concave, into convex, um, which allows for uh, anterior and posterior rotation. Uh, so that's that's a very it's a very clever um, um, mechanism, which which uh, you you wouldn't necessarily seen with, without the three D depiction. Um, and here, just uh, again, the 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 um, atlas is called the the cradle for a reason. You can see that that this wouldn't be able to translate anteriorly and posteriorly, but it would be able to rock anteriorly and posteriorly and, and rotate um, with, within that uh, convex margin. So you can see how you have a combination of flexibility and stability. Um, uh, moving on to, uh, and I see we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna go through the rest relatively quickly. Um, again, a projection from an anterior projection and, a, and an oblique anterolateral uh, projection. I really wanted to give you guys a sense of what the neural foramen look like, whether, you know, whether new nerve roots are going to come out. You know, if you look on, if you look on traditional uh, CT or MR, you, you, you know, you often hear people talking about, oh, you know, the neural foramen is narrowed because of facet arthropathy or facet hypertrophy or an unconvertible uh, hypertrophy. And I always, I never really quite like the unconvertible joints were, were always this sort of like, a, like this imaginary magical place that, that, that I only heard about, you know, when, when discussing, you know, nerve roots on, on, on cross-sectional imaging. But I think this really gives you a good sense of, of, what the, of what the unconvertible joints actually look like and why having them being um, uh, hypertrophied may actually contribute to, to the narrowing of, uh, of, of, those, of those nerve roots. Um, and, and how the, and how those unconvertible joints really do relate to the to the vertebral body itself, and again the neural foramen, and of course the facet joints at the back, and how their hypertrophy may contribute to to the um, narrowing of of these nerve roots. And 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 again by by looking in different obliquities, you can you can get a sense of the actual trajectory of that neural foramen. Um, I think looking on on uh, axial sections or on, on single cross sectional sections, you tend to have a sense that that the uh, that the um, 
neural foramen just you know just just uh, courses in in one direction, um, and uh, and uh, it doesn't really do that. You can see that that it's actually a nice little a nice little um, uh, tunnel that 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 can actually that that actually uh, uh, lobulates over time. Um, here a, 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 a different rendering, um, and and on this particular rendering, you can actually see the granularity of the of the surface of the bone, which I think for operative planning is is quite helpful to have a sense of okay, you know, where could I actually realistically uh, place a screw, for example, and and how would how would that relate to the facet joints? Um, in this case, uh, you can see the and this is an important I think anatomic detail that the C two C three the set joint is actually orientated more medially than the remainder of the of the um, facet joints, and and again, you know, uh, biomechanically we talk about C two C three as being the root of the cervical spine um, because of its um, ability to sort of you know maintain that maintain that that position and maintain that lock between um, the uh, Atlanta axial joints above and and the the, the column of the of the spine uh, below and 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 not and not being able to tilt out laterally is, is part of that. Um, so just quickly, again, cinematic rendering, we can do this with MRI as well. This gives it a very almost uh, cad cadaveric quality, I feel. I think that, you know, I, back when I was a, a young lad, uh, you know, sitting in uh, the Hunterian Museum in, in, our, uh, in our medical school in Johannesburg, South Africa, um, looking at, you know, these, um, these uh, plastinated or, or, or you know formalin soaked um, sections, you know they 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 would take these these cadavers and cut them um, in 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 sections and 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 place them in in these in these awful jars that they'd leave in the museum for us to go through. And and this kind of takes me back to that that sort of sense of of you know slicing through a a, a real life specimen. And actually seeing, you know, what what the gross anatomy really looks like. Um, I don't know if you guys get that sense as well, but that that's kind of, or maybe that's just me being being old and and uh, and uh, sentimental, or not, as the case may be. Um, again, depicting that in three D, you can get a sense of, you know, where these structures lie relative to one another. Um, and and again, a, a, some sort of a depth perception. Um, again, I'm you know I'm not going to go through all the ana anatomic structures because obviously you all own textbooks and you all have a subscription to e anatomy or or whatever it is you you use. Um, but again, you know we we can we can depict soft tissue structures very well on on MRI. Uh, here depicting you know individual ligamentous structures, uh, anterior and posterior longitudinal. Ligaments, ligamentum flavum. Important point about the ligamentum flavum: it's not one, it's not one long ligament. It's you, you know you have multiple ligaments in, interposed between the spinous processes. Um, the dorsal soft tissues, the interspinous and supraspinous ligaments, uh, are important to to be aware of. Um, individual muscle groups: uh, we can depict those very nicely. Again, in three D, um, I feel like. If you if if you if there's an area of anatomy you've you've never learned, it's always good to start with a 3D and kind of get a get a broad sense of what you're dealing with and then and then working backwards. Uh, so you go from the 3D to the CT or the MR and then to the the plane film, which is kind of the opposite of what everyone learns because um, because the, the plane film is actually the most hard to understand because it's the one most furthest away from reality, right? So so you learn something in anatomy class in a 3D perceptual holistic environment, and then you kind of work your way back to, um, to cross-sectional imaging and then work back from cross-sectional imaging to composite imaging like ultrasound or, or X-ray. Again, just, just more examples of how we can depict these individual muscle groups. Again, no point me, you know, reading, um, you know, teaching you how to suck eggs, so to speak. The lumbar spine, very similar uh, situation. Um, uh, this is just an example, and this is one of the cases I was going to show you guys at the end of you know augmenting a vertebral body with a with a um, with an implant and uh, and cement. Um, 
just showing you that again, you know, we can go from the outer layers from a whole data set to depicting the 3D volume of the spine uh, using this, in this case, using CT. Here you can see a vertebral compression fracture. You can see how this vertebral compression fracture contributes to the overall kyphosis. You can see the structures that are, in, are involved. Um, you can see the trajectory of the pedicle. So if you were planning to do a percutaneous procedure, this would be useful to know. We can cut through and I'll just stop there, for example, and you can see the individual uh, facet joints, the spinous processes. If you were planning to do some sort of, um, some sort of, uh, you know, minimally inv invasive spine uh, procedure, you can see how this would be uh, particularly helpful. Again, the pedicle on the on the opposite side, the end plates, um, and you can also have a sense of just how osteopenic this poor guy was. He actually, after we treated this vertebra, he ended up fracturing this vertebra. We treated that, um, and uh, you know, finally got him on some anabolic bone agents. That's a top tip for you guys. If you see guys with uh, or people, men and women with uh, with um, osteoporotic fractures, please, please, please get them on uh, the best possible osteoporotic medication as soon as possible. Um, Again, just depicting, you know, your traditional CT versus these volume renders. Um, MRI, again, you know, we're able to depict uh, our, our various anatomic structures very nicely. You can see the fecal sac. Um, you can see the marrow of the bone really well. You can see um, the intervertebral disc spaces and to some degree the a degenerative process um, in the intervertebral disc spaces, spinous processes, interspinous uh, region with interspinous ligaments, the individual ligaments that we saw um, earlier. Uh, again, we can do this on, uh, on cross-sectional view also. You can see the disc really well with the um, annulus fibrosis and the nucleus pulposus really better than we would typically see that. Um, we can see the detail of the bone better than we would typically see it, including the trabecular architecture here. Um, and we can see the individual musculature of the erector spinae, um, starting to see the uh, iliopsoas come in there. I'm not sure what level that was taken at. Again, this is kind of um, probably a bit different to the coronal sections you, you're used to looking at, but but we, we have a good sense of what the vertebra, the intervertebral disc spaces look like, some idea of the um, degenerative process. And I think this really captures that better than traditional MR. Um, here, uh, coronal section through the musculature uh, with uh, the erector spinae depicted here. And you can really see the, you know, the fascicular nature of, of, the, of, the, of the musculature. Um, again, I think we're I don't know, do you want me to stop or do you want me to just uh, do the carry on for another five minutes or so? It's up to you guys. Uh, you can uh, finish up in five minutes, that's fine. Okay, so, so just quickly, the, um, the, the, the uh, angiography, um, I'm sure you guys know what angiography is. Uh, we use fl fluoroscopy, which is a sort of x-ray movie. Um, we place a catheter in individual vessels and inject and uh, take pictures and, and you guys during your neurosurgical training will uh, perform angiography. Um, you know, we train the neurosurgical residents at our uh, practice. Um, uh, it's becoming more and more of an integral part of neurosurgical practice really, uh, particularly if you plan to do any sort of vascular work. Um, and this is just uh, depicting, you know, the, the level of detail that we can, you know, first of all, you need to be aware of the individual structures, obviously the vertebral body or the corpus and, uh, the lamina spinous process, but then that allows you to know that you're dealing with pre-laminar branches and retrocorporal branches, for example. And we depicted these re really nicely using uh, Dyna CT or tomographic CT using angiographic data. Um, the artery of Adamkovitz is a key structure and, and you recognize this guy because of the, the hip and bend um, and its central placement. Uh, so here's the cadaveric section and here's um, the angiographic section, 
this is it's very important in any spinal angiography procedure to be aware of where Adamkiewicz is and also where the other uh, key, um, depending on the region of the spine you're looking at, some of the key what we call radiculomedullary feeders are. Um, here you can see the anterior spinal artery coursing down. Um, the anterior spinal artery is supplied by multiple radiculomedullary feeders in this sort of stepwise process, and you lose more and more of these, fe these feeders as you, as you get older. Um, uh, this is showing you higher up at Damkowitz, and then lower down this uh, anterior spinal artery, which is contiguous all the way down, um, ends in what we call the basket, and, and uh, the basket is contiguous with the paired posterior spinal arteries, which are also fed by radiculomedullary feeders here. And um, that's just labeled on this, on this section. Um, this, uh, this is just uh, an example of getting faked out, thinking that you're seeing the, uh, the Adamkovitz when, when you're not really, um, and, and different ways you can, you can uh, figure out what, you, what you're actually looking at. Um, this is an example of a, of a dural AVF and, and just a reminder to uh, more to, you know, angiographers to, to be aware that they need to look at all levels of the spine um, in, order to, in order to try and fight feeders for um, shunts such as dural arteriovenous fistulae. Um, just to show you that, you know, our technology is getting better at cross-sectional imaging. Um, you know, we can, we can use uh, CT angiography and MR angiography to uh, depict a lot of these vascular structures, which were only really feasible using angiography. Nowadays, what we'll typically do if, if there's a clinical suspicion of, for example, a dural AVF, we'll uh, perform an MRI and an MRA first. Um, that often would get, well, not always, but, you know, probably the majority of the time when there is a dural AVF, we'll be able to see uh, the feeder um, on, on the MRA. Um, and, and then that will allow us to do a limited uh, angiogram rather than doing an angiogram of uh, the whole spine, which is obviously uh, preferential for the patient. Um, and again, using cinematic rendering, we can take the same data set and we can really depict Adamkovitz really nicely, really depict these individual feeders supplying the anterior spinal artery. Um, so you have anterior spinal artery, radicular medullary feeder, and then an additional radicular medullary feeder, this being the principal one, which we'd call Adamkovitz. Uh, just some more views of that. And uh, the fun cases, I'll just go through in, in like one minute, um, just to show you guys. Uh, here's an example of a spinal tumor, a hemangioblastoma, which we found on angiography and just showing you the different ways that we can, you know, render this. You can see how, you know, if you were planning some sort of uh, operative intervention, how it would be helpful to be aware of the various bony landmarks around uh, the pathology. Uh, this, at the same time, it, it depicts the individual intersegmental artery that we've, that we've um, cannulated and, and how uh, the, the vessels uh, come off that. Um, here an example of um, a dural arteriovenous fistula and just showing that we can really render um, a depiction of the very tortuous prominent uh, veins um, that, that, that we see in the context of dural AVFs. And, and again, their, their relative proximity to surrounding, um, surrounding bony landmarks. Uh, I think this is just one more example of that, just Uh, I think I showed you this earlier example of a vertebral compression fracture treated with uh, implant-assisted kyphoplasty. Um, an example of um, maybe a little bit out of the spine in the pelvis, uh, aneurysmal bone cyst, uh, which was uh, treated with internal fixation and repair, and you can and uh, required more than one surgery, and you can get a sense of you know where your hardware lies relative to the remaining tumor um, and uh, the 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 remainder of the anatomy. I'm going to start giving you a brief overview of the anatomy of the pituitary gland. It's important that you guys understand the pituitary gland, uh, its location, its shape, etc. So as you uh, probably all know, the, the pituitary gland has, this is, a, this is a sagittal view, a side view of the pituitary gland with a midline, mid-sagittal cut. And it has an anterior lobe, which is larger, and uh, um, 
as you as you know, produce a number of hormones, and then we have a posterior lobe that is smaller, is the neurohypothesis, and in between there is something called the pars intermedia, uh, because as you probably studied in embryology, the anterior lobe uh, and the posterior lobe have different embryological origins, and as they come together in development, there is a uh, uh, there is a, a cleft in between called ratsis cleft. Where sometimes probably you've heard about the racid cleft cyst is a type of cyst that forms in this in this uh, cleft in between in both lobes, and then you have the pituitary stalk. The pituitary stalk receives fibers both on the anterior and the posterior lobe. We're looking at the pituitary gland from the top, and all these are dissections done here at my at my lab at at Stanford, and you see the anterior gland, and you see significantly larger than the posterior gland, and uh, you see fibers that come from the posterior gland, but also from the anterior gland here. And uh, they both form the infundibulum or the pituitary stalk that connects superiorly with the hypothalamus. And then you see an eye, uh, another side view of the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland sits on the cella. The cella is this cavity uh, 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 of bone uh, that is on the sphenoid. This is the sphenoid bone seen from above. And you see here, this is the uh, uh, lesser wing of the sphenoid, anteroclinal process. Uh, this is the cell itself. This prominence here we call the tuberculum cella. This uh, bone behind the cella is the dorsum cella, which has the posterior clinoids on each uh, side. So this, these are the boundaries of the cella and of the pituitary gland. And you see there is a groove on each side of the cella. This groove contains a very important structure, of course, which is the pituitary, which is the choroid artery that runs in an area called the cavern of sinus, which we'll explain uh, shortly. If we start putting more structures around, you see this is the pituitary gland now within the cella. The tuberculum cella is at the front of it. The dorsum cell is at the back of it. Do you see how the posterior gland is sort of hidden in that dorsum cella? And this is the anterior gland here. And then you see this is the groove for that choroid artery, which is being cut here. And we call this the paracellar uh, region because it's adjacent to the cella. And this paracellar region is very important. Again, is the area of the cavernous sinus. We're looking again at the pituitary gland from the side. And you see nicely the anterior globe, and then here the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, and then superiorly the uh, pituitary stalk. If we put more structures here, you see again the anterior and posterior lobes, and the stalk going on towards the third ventricle because the stalk uh, connects with the hypothalamus, which is for which forms the part of the floor and the lateral walls of this third ventricle. And as you all know, we have the optic chasm above the pituitary gland. That's why when we have pituitary tumors, we always worry about these tumors as they grow, putting pressure in the optic apparatus above on the optic chasm above the pituitary gland. Um, as we said, the pituitary stalk, as you see here, another dissection done in my laboratory, you see the pituitary gland here, the stalk connects with the area of the hypothalamus, which is a highly complex area. And uh, you see, we have the chasm in front, the stalk going to the third ventricle, the mammary very behind. Uh, this is an area of the midbrain of uh, high complexity. The hypothalamus is what controls, as you all know, the pituitary gland. And you see again, a nice view of the pituitary gland, anterior lobe, posterior lobe, pituitary stalk, connection with the, with the hypothalamus. and uh, you know, uh, my team, my fellows in the lab, these, these amazing dissections of the hypothalamic region. I had an interest in studying this because I do a lot of operations in this area, especially for a type of tumor called craniopharyngioma. It's a tumor that comes not from the pituitary gland, but from the pituitary stalk and the connection of the stalk with the hypothalamus. It's a highly complex tumor that we also operate through an endonasal approach. And it's important for us to understand the anatomy of this area of uh, the hypothalamus. Uh, we can roughly define the hypothalamus in, in, in three uh, uh, areas, anterior, posterior, and intermediate, or what we call also supraoptic area, what we call tuberal infundibular area that it connects with the, with the infundibulum, and the posterior area or the mammillary area where the mammary bodies are uh, located. And these anterior, tuberal, and posterior regions of the hypothalamus, they all have multiple nuclei and different functions. Uh, you know, anterior hypothalamus, as you see here, mostly controls, you know, oxytocin and vasopressin release, which connect with the uh, posterior gland to the 
pituitary stock or implant diploma. Um, and then we have the uh, posterior hypothal hypothalamus that control, uh, you know, many other functions that are, you know, basic for a normal uh, body uh, homeostasis and, and, and regulation. That's why injury to the hypothalamus can have, you know, very severe consequences in, in, in the brain functioning and body functioning. So, you know, we'll talk a little bit about cortical anatomy and just really about how we approach, how we think about and approach cortical lesions. And so I wanted to go over, you know, what, what do we mean by cortical? What do we mean by lesions? What kind of things are we talking about? And how do we think about uh, trying to remove them or deciding about whether we need to remove them? Um, so as um, for the introduction, I'm an assistant professor at of neurosurgery at Wild Cornell. Uh, feel free to email me if you have any questions or you want to talk after the after the lecture. So to talk about just just in broad terms, what are some common pathologies we talk about uh, in the cortex that are uh, neurosurgical or may become neurosurgical? So neoplastic, so anything tumor related, right? So we'll talk a lot about tumors, and I'll go into detail about the most common types of brain tumors that we see. Infectious, abscesses and cysts. Um, abscesses are commonly from strep or staph. We know the more uh, the more rare pathologies like neurocystocercosis and toxoplasmosis are, are very pathognomonic um, and can sometimes be seen, but you know, is definitely definitely more of the zebra than the horse. Um, most, most commonly when we talk about infection, we're talking about abscesses either from the sinus or from hem hematogenous spread. Uh, inflammatory, so very common to have inflammatory pathologies. Demyelinating with MS is the most common. We see PML associated with HIV. Sarcoidosis should always be in the differential for intracranial pathologies if we're not quite sure what's going on. And tuberculosis uh, can cause a leptomeningeal inflammatory pathology as well. Sometimes when we see um, these lesions, it can be very tricky to determine what type of thing it is. We really depend on patterns of enhancement, patterns of signal characteristics on multiple uh, series of MRIs, and we can use advanced imaging if we have any questions about it. But for the most of the time, we, you know, we have a very good sense of what category things are in, and then we usually need tissue to decide uh, what, what area within that it is. Um, so congenital dysplasias are common, cortical dysplasias. Those are just things that people are, are born with irregularities in the gyrus. Uh, they may or may not cause seizures or other types of pathologies that are the presenting symptom. Um, cortical dysplasias, otherwise, if they're not symptomatic, don't necessarily have to be causing a problem. They don't have to be addressed unless or if they're causing new symptomatology. So in the vascular bucket, we talk about cavernous malformations, arterial venous malformations, and dural AV fistulas. Um, so this is just an example of a, an AVM. Uh, on the left here, you see the MRI. When we talk, when we look at these little black spots, we call those flow voids. Those are really pathognomonic for an uh, AVM. This is an angiogram showing, you know, where we actually inject the dye into the intracranial vessels, and we see this very large um, uptake of this tangle of vessels that is an AVM, and it's characterized by these early draining veins. So this is an overview of the most common types of brain tumor. So the most common type for, for what you would know, the most common type of benign brain tumor is a meningioma. So when you think about benign brain tumors, uh, really think about meningioma. Now, majority of meningiomas are grade one. Uh, there's a, sub, a subset are grade two, and very rarely they are grade three or, uh, you know, anaplastic. So, but in the in general, we think about meningiomas as a more benign pathology. Uh, benign doesn't mean that it doesn't cause problems. Benign pathologies can cause a significant local mass effect. They can have be very invasive and be major problems. But when we talk about benign and malignant, we're really talking about how aggressive it is and its metastatic potential. For 
the malignant tumors, the most common type of malignant brain tumor is a metas- is a metastasis. So one, two, and three, almost always what we're seeing are metastatic tumors to the brain. Even though we think a lot about glioblastoma, it's actually much less common than a patient with a metastatic tumor. And that's just by virtue of the numbers of people uh, that have cancer. And this number continues to increase. So as the therapies that we have for metastatic cancer continue to improve and our patients fortunately are living longer, we're seeing more and more patients with metastatic disease to the brain, even when they're doing really well otherwise. So that is becoming an increasing uh, patient population that we're addressing. So intraaxial or extraaxial. So for those of you that don't know what, you know, what does it mean to be intraaxial? So this, this, um, do we have any, are we able to have any participation or is it's kind of like a closed webinar? Uh, yes, I, I have opened the uh, unmute everyone's microphone so okay. they can participate. Okay, so feel free to ask or jump in if you have any questions. But um, so this is an example of a meningioma. It's very, it's a very um, typical example of a skull-based meningioma. We call these types of tumors extra axial because they're actually arising from outside the brain. So these typically arise from the meninges from the dural covering typically, and they actually push into the brain. So you might say, oh, well, you know, this clearly looks like it's inside the brain. Um, and it is, it's in the cranial vault, but it's not actually inside of the parenchyma of the brain of the brain substance itself. It's actually growing from the covering of the brain and it's pushing the brain away, pushing the normal brain away. And that's what we call an extra axial tumor. In contrast, this is you know, very typical of, a, of metastatic tumors. So metastatic tumors are, in, are typically intraaxial tumors that they arise often at what we call the gray-white junction, which is where the gray matter meets the white matter, uh, and these vessels end in those areas. And we see these metastatic tumors. We call those intraaxial tumors because they are actually arising from you know, within the brain. So even though they, they are an abnormal collection of cells that are pushing brain away, they're actually um, arising from within the brain itself as opposed to outside of the brain and pushing in. So we're gonna focus on cortical tumors. Um, and I, I think you'll talk in probably other sessions about, about skull-based tumors and extraaxial tumors, but we're really gonna focus on cortical anatomy, cortical tumors and cortical lesions that are addressed. So when do we need to take something out? Uh, tumors that are increasing in size, creating mass effect or creating swelling in the brain, which we call edema, causing new neurologic symptoms or a neurologic deficit or any tumor that we would expect to be malignant that would benefit from resection. We remove vascular lesions. Uh, AVMs are, have a risk of rupture typically of you know, up to 5% per year that varies depending on how large it is and where it is. Um, but the, given the risk of rupture, depending on the patient's age, we generally advise that those be removed when possible. Uh, and we can talk later about you know, which ones can be removed and which ones can't. But in general, you know, ABMs are considered um, surgical lesions or lesions that need to be treated in some way. We remove things that cause neurologic symptoms, such as seizures. So cavernous malformations typically can cause seizures. And they, um, if they're not causing seizures or they're not causing bleeding, they don't necessarily have to be removed. But anything in the brain that isn't normal can cause irritation, cause seizures. If they've resulted in hemorrhage, so Cavernous malformations, for example, can bleed. Uh, when they bleed, we typically want to remove it because we want to prevent a recurrent bleeding episodes. We remove infections when it's an abscess with a really thick or defined wall. And that's because the antibiotics that we give typically don't penetrate the thick wall once it's formed in the abscess. Uh, and it's very tricky to treat CNS infections like that. So most abscesses need to be drained or, or removed. Abscesses or infections that look near the ventricle, near the fluid spaces in the brain, are at risk of rupturing into the ventricle, and that can cause a really severe ventriculitis or meningitis. So you know, those are ones that we pay special attention to in terms of removing and preventing uh, further infection. Inflammatory lesions. So things like MS, you know, those are not neurosurgical lesions. Those are not things that need to be removed. They can even sometimes cause things that look like tumors, but in general, they don't need to, they're not treated surgically. They're treated with medications, um, with immunomodulators. The only times we as surgeons get involved is if 
we're really not sure what something is and we need to do a biopsy and we take a sample of it. Otherwise, there's typically not a huge role for resection for most inflammatory lesions. So in terms of how we think about doing surgery on things like this, we first determine eloquence. Um, and we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what it means to be eloquent. Um, eloquence in generally just means, does something have a function that can't be replaced by something else in the brain? So does it have a critical function uh, that we rely on for our daily activities? And we'll talk about the different areas that, that are considered eloquent. We assess at-risk structure. So what is it near? So is it near cranial nerves? Is it near the optic nerve? Is it near major blood vessels that we need to worry about in terms of how we're gonna approach it and how we're gonna remove it? Uh, for cortical lesions, we generally try to choose an approach optimizing both the shortest and the safest trajectory. So in general, we like to say, choose the shortest path because you want to go through the least amount of brain to get to anything. So if a tumor, for example, comes to the surface, you wanna start your opening right at that surface. So you're minimizing the manipulation of the brain. In some cases for deeper tumors, it may seem like a path that's short is the best, but if that path is going through an eloquent area, then it might make sense to do a much longer path going through a non-eloquent area uh, in order to preserve function. So we often utilize natural channels, for example, the sylvian fissure, if we need to access a tumor that is at the back of the sylvian fissure or in the insula, and we, we use these natural bases that the brain provides in order to minimize injury to the brain itself. Um, for skull base lesions, so those extra axial lesions we were talking about, like meningiomas, uh, the approach is generally anatomic. So it's guided, it's, it's pure anatomy. We go by skull-based anatomy and we approach it based on the bony anatomy that is needed in order to expose the tumor. And the goal here is really to minimize brain manipulation because we're talking about tumors that are really not arising in the brain, they're arising outside the brain. And so the goal is expose as much as possible and really work uh, in that extra axial space. You have to know what the safe zones are that can be used to access lesions. And so, you know, in, in anatomy labs, we really developed very um, nuanced approaches to lesions. Almost anywhere in the skull base can be accessed using natural corridors and, and taking advantage of that. So using advanced imaging is really important. So when we're not sure what the anatomy is or where the eloquence is, we can use advanced imaging in order to get a better picture of both the functional tracts and also where in any given individual where we think the functional cortex is. Uh, when we are removing lesions from eloquent areas, we can really take advantage of advanced neuromonitoring. So we're able to monitor patients both for their language, we're able to monitor all of their movements. We're able to monitor their um, sensory function. And that really helps us to keep patients safe during surgery while removing tumors and other kinds of lesions from areas that otherwise are either close to or within eloquent areas. In all, almost all cases, what our goal is always to what we call a maximal safe resection, which means we try to remove as much as possible without doing harm. So, you know, very rarely and almost never really are we able, are we accepting of a significant neurologic deficit in order to remove something? Um, you know, unless something is life-threatening, we generally want to remove as much as we can while preserving all of the function uh, that the patient comes in with. So what is eloquent? Well, you know, you could argue that all parts of the brain are important, which is true, but the truth is that there's uh, a great deal of redundancy. And I'm sure Dr. Lewis is gonna talk much more about this, but you know, there's there are certain areas of the brain uh, whose function really can't be reproduced uh, and that are very sensitive to, to damage. So the main areas that we talk about are the motor cortex. So the motor cortex is, the primary motor cortex is located um, in the precentral gyrus, so this is this is this kind of side view of the brain. This is the cerebellum. Um, this is the temporal lobe. This is the frontal lobe. This is the central sulcus that divides the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. This is the occipital lobe. Uh, the central sulcus. In front of the central sulcus, we find primary motor cortex. That's where um, all of the 
primary uh, motor neurons are. And then behind central sulcus, we find the primary somatosensory cortex, which is where all of the uh, primary uh, sensory cortex is. And it, this cortex then sends tracks down through the internal capsule, um, through the brainstem, and that forms the motor tracks that we all together consider you know, eloquent motor function. Um, there, is, there are these areas right in front, this premotor area, there's an area in the sort of middle, um, uh, immediately just in front of this primary motor cortex, we call that the supplementary motor area. That can actually be really important. It helps patients initiate movement. Uh, and so sometimes even if this area, even if the motor area is normal, if this area is damaged, patients may not be able to move. It may look like they have a stroke because they they can't connect the desire to move with the ability to move. Um, generally, that area, though, has redundancy and it recovers function if damaged, typically uh, over a period of weeks to months at the most. So speech, so speech is almost always lateralized, you know, in right-handed people, which is the majority of people, speech is almost always on the left side. Interestingly, you know, even in left-handed people, about 50% of the time, speech is also on the left side. So we're really talking about a vast majority of people for whom um, the left brain is dominant. So in the left brain in the or in the dominant hemisphere, um, if it happens to be right for a left-handed person, we talk about uh, a few major speech areas. So the first one is Broca's area. That's our, our uh, motor speech area. This is located specifically in the frontal operculum. So this is in the inferior frontal gyrus. So it's the sort of bottom of the frontal lobe. And um, the, the correlate to the motor speech area is Wernicke's area. So Wernicke's area is what well, you know, some people refer to as a sensory speech area. This is, um, while Broca's area, a deficit there is gonna give you problems with producing speech, um, but you generally have a good ability to understand speech. In Wernicke's area, the reception of speech is really affected um, and patients can talk but they, they may, they have what we call a fluent aphasia, which is that they're saying words, but they're just not making sense. Now between those, the speech track is what we call the, the arcuate fasciculus. Um, and that tract is, you know, connects the motor speech areas to the sensory areas, among other things and damage anywhere along there can cause any degree of aphasia from um, a partial aphasia to what we call a global aphasia, which is a complete inability to, to speak to either understand or produce language. So speech is really one of the, uh, you know, it's the thing that we pay by far the most attention to, um, you know, and then second would be, would be motor, but speech is really a very sensitive function that is very difficult to get back. So we are very careful um, for any lesions that are near speech areas. Um, in terms of memory, memory, you know, typically the dominant side hippocampus is, is very heavily involved with, with memory, um, but there are instances where, where that uh, is not, not the case, particularly in patients with longstanding seizures and things like that. So the visual cortex is considered eloquent. So the primary visual cortex, um, the occipital lobe is, is the primary visual cortex, and then the optic radiations, which is connecting all of the optic tracts starting from the optic nerves, and the optic chiasm going back into the optic radiations and coming back down into the visual cortex. So, you know, we have to sort of have a really good 3D sense of where everything is um, in this complex space because yes, your occipital lobe is here, but you know, you could be near the ventricle, for example, and that's actually where um, some of your optic radiations are. And so you have to know in any given area, what track, not only what cortex is near you, but what tracks are near you. So to do that, you know, it can be really helpful to use advanced imaging. Um, so fMRIs are functional MRIs. Those are MRIs that we do while people are awake and talking. And we ask them, you know, name objects or, you know, squeeze a ball. And we see as they're doing things, what areas of the brain are lighting up. So we actually get a real time map of where the function in their brain is. And that can be particularly helpful for patients with tumors that push away uh, normal function into areas that you may not expect. Diffusion tensor imaging or DTI. So they're actually, it's a really amazing technology that we have where we can use the MRI to actually extrapolate the white matter tract. So we can actually see where these fibers are in the brain and we can select 
the fibers that are near the area that we're interested in. We can look at specifically motor fibers. We can look at sensory fibers. We can look at the visual fibers and the speech fibers. Um, and it can be very helpful to plan surgeries. So in the, um, the dominant side, like we talked about, the main areas, we talked about frontal lobe, that's where sprochas is, temporal lobe, that's where Wernicke's is, and then the mesial temporal lobe, that's the hippocampus that we talk about. So this is an example um, of an fMRI. This is an example of a, a patient of mine with a very large tumor. If you can see, there's a really bright white spot and this um, ISO intense hypo-enhancing or really non-enhancing lesion here. This is all a, what we call a glioma, it's a glial tumor. And so this, as you can see, is located not only in the temporal lobe, but also in the frontal lobe. And this is on the dominant side, on the left side. And so we worry about, you know, speech should normally sit right here and Wernicke should sit right here and Broca should sit right here. But you can see in this patient, you know, the tumor was really pushing speech up just about to right here. Um, and then we were able to actually track Wernicke's to right here. So that really helped us um, do the surgery. We actually did the surgery with the patient awake and we we're able to remove all of the tumor without affecting uh, his speech at all. Um, so that's sort of how we use that kind of technology. This is an example of uh, diffusion tractography where this is a tumor and I was tracking the motor fibers. Motor should normally be right about here, but motor fibers are actually pushed back here. Um, and it really helps us to be able to plan effect, an effective, safe spot to, to start the surgery. Um, so in terms of neuromonitoring, so we, we can use, we can actually monitor patients' motor function and their sensory function while they're asleep. It's a very useful function. Um, these things we call transcranial motors. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about it, but generally we basically put electrodes in the scalp and we transmit signals uh, through the motor cortex and we can test the whole integrity of the system. So the electrodes are sitting in the head and then they're sitting on the extremities and all of the muscle groups that we're interested in. And we send the signal down all the way through and then see if it's working. And if we receive a signal in the muscle, then we know that the system, that there's integrity to that entire motor tract. Um, when there's any damage, we can get a reduction in the, in the signal that kind of tells us, you know, you know, I think we're, we're really close to this area or we're starting to cause injury here. So we, it helps us to, um, to gauge how aggressive we can be. So somatosensory about potentials, those are just the, the sensory potentials that we use. And then what uh, I use a lot is what we call direct cortical motor stimulation, where we use an electrode and we actually can put it on right over where I know where I expect motor cortex to be. And then we do something we call phase reversal, which basically uh, is kind of this neat tool where we can tell the difference between, we can tell exactly where central sulcus is because motor cortex and, and sensory cortex have the opposite um, the opposite directions of their potential. So as soon as we see that reversal in the phase, then we know that is central sulcus and in front of it is gonna be motor and behind it is gonna be sensory. Um, and then we can do something we call subcortical stimulation. So we use an electrode and we can stimulate deep in the brain and find actually those white matter traps. So that's really helpful. So awake electrocorticography. So that's where we're really doing, we can do direct functional mapping. So we can, you know, with, with someone awake, we can um, stimulate and test for speech areas um, and we can stimulate a motor area and then keep testing their function. We can really find exactly where the eloquence is. So this is sort of an example of how, what patients look like. So these are the scalp, the electrodes. These are some examples of electrodes that are put um, in the scalp. There's different types. These you know, strip electrodes kind of look like this. They look like a little strip, a little clear strip um, with small electrodes on it. Um, and we can sometimes use these little numbers to map out the areas of functionality that we're trying to avoid. Um, and this is an example of subcortical stimulation I was talking about where we use an electrode and we stimulate. This is uh, the motor track and we would stimulate in the area that we're working on and kind of get a sense of how far we are from the motor track. So we might say, okay, well, you know, we're stimulating um, at 15, we're getting some positive signal at 15. So, you know, we're probably, you know, a, a couple millimeters away. And so that's really helpful for us. Um, so awake craniotomies. Um, so this is, this, this is 
sort of, I, I use this from this Pacific Neurosciences Institute because um, I think there is a lot of interest in the idea of using music uh, during an awake craniotomy. I've never done that, but it's certainly the idea of an awake craniotomy is, um, is just that we're trying to preserve function and the best way to preserve function even when we have a good sense of the anatomy is to actually be testing function while we're doing it. So if you can keep someone doing the thing that you want to preserve and you're doing the tumor resection or you're removing the lesion that's abnormal, you can remove more of it if you're able to make sure that while you're doing that, the patient is having good function. And then if there's any sign that they, they start to falter or start to have difficulty, you can stop. Um, we usually have a neuroscientist with us or a, a neurologist with us doing the surgeries concurrently so that they're actually testing some nuances to function to make sure uh, we don't miss subtle, subtle losses in, in speech or subtle losses in motor function. Um, these are really, you know, we commonly do these awake craniotomies for uh, dominant insular tumors. Those are sort of some, like some of the tumors I was showing you before. Um, so this is, th these are just a couple cases that um, just to illustrate kind of when we, when we do what. Um, so this was a 34 year old male who presented with right-sided weakness. His fMRI uh, did demonstrate uh, that he had, uh, uh, sorry, this is actually, he had left-sided dominance. And um, so he, um, because he was left dominant and the tumors on the left, we actually did a transylvian resection um, which means that we used actually the sylvian fissure. So this, this is the sylvian fissure. Uh, we actually split open that fissure, made it wide, and then access the tumor through the fissure without actually removing, going through any of the normal brain. Because you can imagine, this is a very short path right here to get to the tumor, very short path to get to the tumor. But the problem is that this is, this is really where we're talking about eloquent speech function. Um, and so when you, if you try to access the tumor that way, uh, you're, you're really gonna hurt the patient. So you can't, you have to access that through other corridors. Um, th there are other ways to do it by, by finding the tiny little window in the normal brain that you can get used to get to the tumor. And that's another way to remove these tumors. Um, but generally in awake, um, you know, it's helpful to do it. Um, if it's, if it's dominant to do it awake and actually, so this was an example of this patient was right-handed with right hemisphere dominance, which was really unusual. So because of that, we did it asleep, but otherwise that's, that's how we would do that surgery. Um, this is a 20 year old male who presented with seizures and word finding difficulty. We planned this with the preoperative fMRI as well as DTIs. And we uh, did an awake frontoparietal craniotomy. We did intraoperative speech mapping and subcortical stimulation uh, to remove the tumor kind of similar to the other one. Um, one of the problems we run into is that sometimes these tumors, these gliomas, especially these glioblastomas and gliomas, they look almost the same as normal brain. And so one of the tools that we can use is um, this 5-ALA, which is a fluorescent guided surgery. So we actually just give patients a pill, an oral solution. Um, and the tumor actually takes up this 5-ALA, um, which is a protoporphyrin and converts it uh, to this visual visible spectrum. So it converts it to this very bright, avid pink uh, fluorescence. So this allows us to, if you, just to show you an example, under in surgery under blue light, we see the tumor here that we're removing is lighting up this really bright pink. So it helps us to say, okay, well, this is normal brain and this is tumor, helps us to remove, remove that tumor. Um, and you can see like under the, normal white light, it's almost impossible to extinguish, distinguish, especially as you get to closer to the margins. These tumors are very infiltrative. They look very similar to brain. And so it's easy to leave tumor behind, you know, worrying that you don't want to resect normal brain. But when you have something like this, that just says, you know, we know there are tumor cells in there, as long as it's a safe area, we uh, go ahead and remove it. So in keeping with our desire to do minimal approaches and to try at all costs to remove the lesions that we're talking about without hurting or injuring the surrounding brain. You know, there are many ways that we can approach lesions um, through a more, what we call a minimally invasive approach. 
Um, for deep tumors, there is this thing called, we, called brain path, which is essentially a concentric tube that we use that we can pass through, often through even a sulci. So we start planning it through a large sul sul sulcus and we can um, go through, plan the trajectory using our understanding of anatomy and the tracks and make sure we avoid all those tracks and then go right to the tumor. We remove the stylet and then it creates this little um, tunnel that we have in order to access the tumor uh, safely. And we can remove the whole tumor that way through that tiny little hole. And the craniotomy is, is extremely small. So even really large tumors that are deep, we remove this way. Um, and we, we utilize what we call stereotactic guidance, which is that we um, have a map of the patient's um, face and their anatomy, and we that's from their MRI. And that's actually registered with a, a little reference frame. So we use this little wand and we can point to someone, any place on someone's head that's been registered, and we know exactly where that is in the MRI. So that helps us plan exactly based on the MRI, sort of like real time, um, you know, where, where should we go? And then we can use things like ultrasound to actually get real time feedback for, for where abnormalities are. Because the, you know, one of the problems with using that stereotactic guidance is that once you've changed the brain, once you've started to remove things, um, may not be as accurate because it's based on an image that you take before surgery. So neuroendoscopy. So we do a lot of neuroendoscopic surgery. We do um, surgeries of, for the pituitary gland, for cellular pathologies, paracellular pathologies. A lot of those uh, we can really do um, through a transnasal endoscopic approach. And so we do a lot of surgeries, what we call transphenoidal surgeries that way. We can access things kind of here in the frontal lobe in the plenum region that way. We can access tumors in the clivus that way. Um, so it's really a very powerful tool for skull-based tumors, for anterior skull-based tumors. Um, for, for neuroendoscopy transventricular, so we do a lot of ventricular surgeries using an endoscope as well. And so we just do a tiny little burr hole for those surgeries um, and are able to remove tumors and do, perform endoscopic third ventriculostomies um, and treat other kind of intraventricular pathologies that way. These are all minimally invasive and you know there are there certainly there are certain complications associated associated with all of these, but you know they the morbidity relative to much larger skull based approaches is is uh, much much less in general. So laser interstitial thermal therapy. So this is a, a technology, a stereotactic technology using real-time magnetic resonance um, thermometry, which allows us to place electrodes into lesions that are deep in the brain and in real time, ablate it using, um, using, using these thermal probes. So we're actually heating the tumor until the point of cytotoxicity. And we're able to measure the temperature within the lesion and then make sure that the temperature in the surrounding brain uh, remains within a safe level. Um, so that's really a powerful tool that we have to treat things like radiation necrosis and some deep tumors even um, can respond to this. And we kind of consider it as an alternative to surgical resection if, if something is not otherwise resectable or is not accessible. Hello, I'm James Lewis. I'm at the West Virginia University um, <clears throat> Health Science Center, and today I'm going to be talking about localization of function. As uh, Dr. Devine here invited me to give a talk about some of the backdrop behind what we know about the function of cortex, and uh, we're going to have thanks to an unknown Neolithic doctor who invented trephining, uh, Phineas Gage, who taught us some things about uh, how cortex functions if it's lesioned. And uh, Walter Friedman, we'll talk about a little bit at the, at the end, who uh, inventor of the frontal lobotomy, for better or worse. All right, so what I was objectives was trying to do is uh, taking this from a first year medical student uh, course in neuroscience, neuroscience and human behavior, and just kind of getting some introductory level input um, now I'm going to stop share for just a moment and ask a question. How many of you are first year or have not yet had a neuro uh, basic uh, neuroscience curriculum yet? Just show of hands in the uh, raise hand feature. We got one, two, three, a couple have not yet had. Okay, 
and how many of you are second or how many of you already had neuroscience but are trying to refresh before step exam? Uh -huh. Getting a few more hands on that one. Okay, good, good. <laughs> There's always a step exam coming up, so I knew that one would get some answers. All right, so I'm going to try to cater this talk for M1 through M4. Some of this will be new to you, but I'll be kind of zipping through that, and you'll be like, oh, this is what I'll get to learn when I get to neuroscience. And others of you will be like, oh, yeah, I learned that years ago um, and may need some refresher. But I want to encourage uh, questions as we go throughout this. Okay, back to share screen. So what I was going to try to accomplish in the next 45 minutes or so is to identify some common locations of primary and secondary sensory motor cortices. And we're going to touch briefly on, on motor touch, balance, vision, hearing, taste, smell. And then second, describe some general functions of cortical lobes and the anatomical subdivisions therein. Then recognize or predict deficits that are going to result uh, from cortical pathologies, relate this black back to blood supply and the like. And uh, now Dr. Jitani already covered some of the methods for studying, assessing, and treating the brain. I had a few slides there. Uh, if you're interested, I can go into those a little more, but I was going to skip that in the interest of time. Now for the talk, we typically run through uh, this book through Elsevier, Nolte's Human Brain is where many of the uh, figures that I'm com are coming from. And we also use Dwayne Haynes' Neuroanatomy Atlas uh, as sort of the Bible for learning the uh, neuroanatomy underlying brainstem pathways and all those good things. So a lot of what I'm talking about are gonna be coming from resources uh, such as those. All right, and just as a background as to who I am, so, uh, well, my PhD research involved uh, neurosurgery techniques with macaque monkeys to map out different pathways, especially with parietal cortex. And then I moved on to humans, uh, where I don't cut them open anymore, but now I use functional magnetic resonance imaging. And here's a three Tesla scanner at our health science center, uh, and also use electroencephalography or an EEG to study brain signals. Uh, I study uh, sensory perception, mostly hearing perception, but also multi-sensory perception, cognitive behaviors, uh, also studying various populations, autism, uh, chronic pain, and um, opioid use disorders. So kind of applying a bunch of brain mapping techniques to various uh, human health conditions. So that's my background. And if you have questions, do yell out because I cannot see uh, hands being raised in this current version when I'm sharing the screen, but feel free to uh, holler out. So this talk, uh, we look at the central nervous system, the brain, the cerebrum, and of the cerebral hemispheres, we're going to be focusing mostly on cerebral cortex, basal ganglia, hippocampus, thalamus, hypothalamus, usually we reserve those for separate lectures. And so for this talk, we're just going to hit primarily the, the cortices. And the part A of the talk will be with um, primary motor cortices or primary cortices one through seven, for which we have some clinical terms affiliated with uh, deficits to these different regions of the brain, such as vertigo and vestibular, ataxias, visual agnosias visual with vision, central deafness with hearing, and so forth. Then in a part two, <clears throat> we'll go to higher functions and association cortices. We'll talk a little bit more about language systems as picking up where that Dr. Dutani uh, left off, parietal cortices, frontal cortices, and uh, apply to strokes, lesions as we go along the way. And then if we have time, we can talk some more about methods to study and treat the brain. Okay, so now for everyone who's uh, sitting there at home and alone, you can uh, do the following demo, which is to make a fist. So I'm making a fist, right or left hand, doesn't matter. Uh, the brain is basically like a boxing glove, like your fist and your thumb. It's going to be your temporal lobe. Your knuckles are going to be your frontal lobe. Back of your hand is going to be your parietal lobe. And your, your wrist uh, arm is connecting to your wrist is where your occipital lobe is going to be located. And then as we go to the mesial surface, the boundary here is going to form uh, the limbus or the, a boundary where the cortex ends, ends up there in that corpus callosum. And that is just generally referred to as limbic cortex, limbus meaning edge. Now there's multiple things going on in there, but that's sort of the big gross level divvying up of the brain. 
Now you can computationally unfold, inflate, and view cortex. So here's a three-dimensional rendering of a human brain. And I've color-coded in tan, the frontal cortices, green, the parietal, uh, in salmon, pink, the occipital, and the temporal lobe here in blue. And as you can see, you can computationally just increase and reveal the deeper lying sulci. And these are gonna be common in all humans and, and in many primates for that matter. So for instance, we talked earlier, uh, an earlier talk about the central sulcus located here nice centrally in the brain and the sylvian fissure, uh, deep fissure in here, segmenting the thumb out where we have our temporal lobe. And you could just uh, take that extreme and flatten it, what have you. So the flow of information, the general organization for the brain is going to be uh, from this Luria model, where we have sensation coming in from the eyes, skin, the ears, what have you, going up through relay nuclei in the thalamus, and then thalamus up into primary visual cortices, primary somatosensory, primary auditory cortices, and then from there up into uh, secondary or association cortices, and ultimately uh, all this information is coming together in associations uh, which give you a unified perception of a single object. So for instance, if you were to click your finger, I can hear the clicking of my finger, I can see the clicking finger, I have a sense of touch to it. This is a single unified event, and I perceive it as such, even though from a sensory perspective, all of that is uh, being conveyed through different sensory channels. Now, the major thing to remember about organization of the brain is that it's a nice div division from the sensory systems, mostly in posterior portions, and then we have the motor systems, mostly anterior, uh, to the central sulcus. And this is going to be similar to what we saw about the um, in the brainstem, the alar plate opens, and you have that sulcus limitans. You have uh, motor more medially and sensory more laterally. And here in cortex, we also have a rough division of motor more anteriorly and sensory more on the posterior surface. So for instance, we have at the posterior lobe, primary visual cortex, we have laterally, just inside, deep in that sylvian sulcus, auditory cortex, and along that post-central lobule, uh, the primary uh, sensory cortex for sense of touch. Okay, so in the next series of slides, we're gonna hit one through seven, motor, somatosensory, vestibular, vision, hearing, taste, and smell as primary cortical systems before we go to associational areas. Any questions to this point? Okay. So we learn in first uh, first couple blocks of a neuroscience cor course that there's all these uh, horrific tracks and pathways coming up the brainstem to get to the cortex, which we're going to bypass. Other than to say the peripheral nervous system, touch, pain, temperature. Coming up here, for example, into the thalamus. Thalamus is then going to project that information of I'm feeling sensation on my toe to primary somatosensory cortex and also to somatosensory association cortices and put together, I uh, have the sensation. And there's a crossing here. And then similarly with motor cortices coming back down, you have your primary uh, motor cortex, premotor and supplementary motor areas working together kind of as a trifecta of regions that are then going to send information to say, oh, I'm going to wiggle my toe. And you have these cortical bulbar and cortical spinal tracts that then cross at the pyramids uh, and decussate cross. So this sets up the, the point here. This slide is that you have these crossing so that when you hear about the left side of the brain controls the right side of the broad body, well, this is where we're talking about various levels of crossing are occurring. And that's important to keep track of from, that's from a neurosurgeon perspective. So for instance, here are the pyramids and the pyramidal decussation for motor input will be coming down in here. 90% of the fibers are crossing over from the right to the left or vice versa. And that's where that decussation occurs. And similarly, here are those pyramids again. And here's that inferior olive, some, uh, some neuroanatomy to give you some flashbacks to when you had learned this stuff or when you're going to be learning this stuff in upcoming years. Okay, with the motor cortices now, high yield concept is to recall that we have somatotopic representations. And in particular, we have, if you go with foot, leg, 
trunk, arm, and hand. Here we are in primary motor cortex in the purple. We have leg and foot on the mesial wall, medial surface. Trunk, arm, and hand sort of extending out and then face and mouth extending out laterally and further inferior as you go along that precentral gyrus. Then we have a premotor cortex, which also has roughly a somatotopic map, foot, leg, hand, arm, face, mouth. And then on more on the um, superior frontal gyrus, supplementary motor areas, we have leg, arm, face, another somatotopic map. And this is important to relate to if you have, uh, for instance, a stroke that were to take out the ACA, the anterior cerebral artery. Recall that that is gonna wrap up along this pericolossal region and have a pericolossal artery and a supermarginal artery and is gonna be supplying the territories that are mostly covering this leg foot region. So if you have a patient who has a deficit uh, with their left leg, you might be thinking right uh, mesial cortex and an ACA type of stroke there. Versus if there's a MCA stroke, middle cerebral artery, that's gonna be covering more of this lateral surface. And if everyone puts their hand out like so, if this is going to be the distribution of the middle cerebral artery. If you take your hand out, put the palm of your head, just hand just above your ear and wrap it over your head. That is roughly the distribution of the MCA, middle cerebral artery. And so with MCA strokes, as we heard about earlier, you're going to have uh, affecting more the face, hand, arm type of regions rather than the lower limbs. And that's evident based on this rough topography of the brain. Okay, so the motor cortices. More specifically, we have a new color scheme now, but we have the motor cortex. We have the central sulcus, sorry, um, to, to indicated if you can see my cursor moving. The red colored cortex is along the precentral, which is where our primary motor cortex is located. Anterior to that, our premotor cortex, and then superior and mesial to that, supplementary motor areas. Now, these areas, discuss them each sort of individually, but think of them as kind of working together. But if you go uh, back to Dr. Jutani's lab and she were to open up your skull and put some electrodes in there and stimulate, um, we're going to find that stimulation is going to elicit an awake behaving patient, a non-preventable discrete motor movement of one or small group of muscles. So if I were to stimulate in my right motor cortex, right over the hand region, zap, stimulate my hand, zap, stimulate. I'm going to say, okay, don't move my finger, zap, can't present it. It's, it's uh, not preventable. And, and it's crossing. So right side, again, controlling the left side of the, the body. And all the movements are contralateral, except for uh, tongue, masseter, pharynx, and some of the oral uh, features and, and muscles. Now, lesions to primary motor cortex uh, initially will lead to a flaccid paralysis, but then it's going to resolve quickly to hemiparesis, mild spasticity. And you're going to have most evident problems with uh, fine skilled movements. Now, one of the interesting things that uh, Dr. Jackson here back in the 1900s discovered is you can have uh, individuals with seizures where a seizure may initiate, say, at the finger on the uh, left hand, and the seizure would start to cause the body to move and it would propagate up to the arm, and the arm would go to the hand upper arm and then to the neck trunk region, and then might actually cross over the other side of the body. And uh, it goes along this nice somatotopic map. And that was one of the first clues that we had that there is a somatotopic organization in motor cortex or motor topic cor uh, organization in motor cortex. And so that's referred to as a Jacksonian seizure when you see someone who has a seizure where the spread of the epileptic uh, uh, motor spasticity is just spreads along a motor topic um, map like that. And here is the homunculus. I call him Freddy, I think he looks like a Freddy. Uh, if you were to take the amount of cortical real estate that is devoted to the various parts of the body, you've got enormous representation of the tongue, enormous representation of the hands because as we creatures are very much about using our hands and you can see the trunk and so forth is much less uh, relative amount of cortical real estate devoted to control of motor movements that, in that regard. So that's our motor homunculus. Then in premotor cortex in the blue area up in here, you can stimulate up in here. Thresholds are higher to get a movement, but the movements are slower, larger groups of muscles involved. If you lesion 
no paralysis or reflex changes unless you also take out some of the primary motor cortex. If you take out both premotor and motor cortices, you can get then the full-blown uh, spastic hemiparesis. And then the, so, so in general, the premotor cortex is thought to be important for movements guided by external stimuli. So if I want to reach out and grab my pen, let's go ahead and initiate that movement. Boom, I go and do that. These areas are required for that initiation. The third area, the supplementary motor area, SMA, mostly in the uh, purplish color here and on the mesial surface. Here's our paracentral lobule, for instance. And stimulation in these regions are going, uh, in the red, sorry, up in here. Stimulation is going to cause assumption of posture. So stimulate, and you might have a full trunk type of movement, turning the head and the trunk. Uh, sometimes you can cause vocalizations. Uh, you can even lead to speech arrest. So there's some involvement with some more fundamental elements of speech uh, processing here, or speech production rather. And so this is thought to be more involved with the planning and learning of complex intrinsically generated uh, movements. Okay, so here we have a coronal image, a T2, and just looking at some functional landmarks for review here. So in green, we have our central sulcus and our paracentral lobule. It's gonna be on either side of this, a precentral gyrus depicted between the green and the blue line and a postcentral gyrus between the green and the red line here. So those are running along the uh, <clears throat> central sulcus going superior to inferior. And immediately in front of that, our frontal cortices, are going to be running more anterior posterior and here this orange line is delineating for instance our superior frontal gyrus from our middle frontal gyrus in an image such as this. Another important feature is the hand hook. So it turns out so far this is our central sulcus on the right side and you can see this little omega here. The cortex uh, often in many individuals is going to have an actual shape like this so you can actually surgically when you take off the skull plate you can sometimes see what is going to be this hand hook region. Of course, as Dr. Vitani mentioned, you want to make that keep that as eloquent cortex as possible since we are all about using our hands. Uh, and this is often an anatomical feature that can be seen visibly. Of course, better is to map it out using functional MRI, but if you don't have that option, here you can see it in many in individuals. Okay, somatosensory cortices. Any questions so far? Okay, with the primary somatosensory cortices, we have the thalamus, VPM, VPL, projecting up to uh, Rodman areas one, two, and three are generally going to be considered primary somatosensory cortex. And these are so depicted in the far right diagram. So if you have input coming in, touch to your finger, you have a sense of touch coming up in the green, it's going to cross at some point, go up to thalamus and under cortex. And then likewise, your sensation of pain is going to cross right away at the white anterior commissure, go up a separate pathway and go up to cortex. And uh, in primary somatosensory cortex, whether you feel pain or light touch, or deep pressure, that primary sensory cortex is saying, oh, here's where I'm feeling it. It's going to localize where that sensation is on your body type. And so the neurons up in here are going to have sensitivity to light touch and um, as you get to areas one and two, then you get a little bit more association going on and you have more complex receptive fields, such as the limbs position and the shape of an object when you're touching it your, uh, your, with your skin, you can determine some shape features and so forth as you go from three to one to two. Then secondary somatosensory cortex, uh, sorry, primary somatosensory cortex, if you stimulate that, an electrode, I uh, tend to get a tingling or numbness, numbness in that contralateral part of the body. So we stimulate on the right side, somatosensory cortex. I'll feel like a tingling sensation over here in my left hand somewhere. Rarely feel pain. Uh, and sometimes you can elicit a little bit of movements. If you have a lesion here, larger lesions, you can uh, impair finer aspects of sensory uh, sensation. It's hard to tell exactly where in what space you're being stimulated deficit in your sense of position and movement of affected parts, uh, but does not abolish your tactile sensation of pain or for pain. 
So in general, S1, good for localizing pain or touch. But if you want to say the unpleasantness quality of pain, that tends to be other cortical areas. Uh, it's more uh, dis widely distributed throughout the brain. Pain is more difficult to, to deal with. Okay. Oh, and uh, with regard to S2, our second slide here. So our secondary somatosensory cortices, mostly lo uh, located up here along the parietal operculum. Operculum just means lid. Here's the parietal cortex, and here's the lid overlying that sylvian fissure, parietal operculum. And it too has a somatotopic map. So in the lower right diagram, again, we had with S1, we had the lower limb on the mesial surface, then thorax, neck, shoulder, hand. Here we have fingers, and then we go to tongue, and the face is out here. And then with S2, it goes the other direction, face to arm to leg as you go back uh, lateral to medial up under that parietal perculum. So it too has a somatotopic map. And the receptive fields in here, if you go with an electrode and try to map that out on a person, is going to be more bilateral, touch uh, to symmetrical places, uh, slides to activate them, say on both of your index fingers. And with this fun demo, for those of you who happen to have some coins in your pockets, I have here various coins, and you can try this with a friend at home, or if you're with someone in the room there, is to put a coin in your hand. I'm going to put... Uh, I'm going to put this one right here in my hand. And without looking, tactile feel, what is that coin? Is that a nickel? No. Is that a silver dollar? No, I don't think so. Quarter. I can figure out what that is. And that's using stereognosis, where you are grasping the coin, tactile, palpating it, putting together what is that three-dimensional object. And with lesions that take out S2, um, you can then lead to astereognosis or that inability to identify what is this object based on sense of touch. All right, so a question comes up as to why on earth does this, here we have the um, <clears throat> homunculi, Milton and Freddie here, the somatosensory cortex and the motor cortex models. A question that often comes up, why does it go leg to foot to hand and right next to face? Because I mean, your face and your hand are pretty darn far apart anatomically. So I'm going to stop sharing screen for just a moment. Thought question, why is the hand representation near the face representation in cortex? I'll pick on someone who's got their screen on. Sure. Newer, why on earth is the hand representation near the face representation in cortex in us humans? Or Carly? Uh, I'm not 100% certain, but it might have something to do with the um, development or embryological origin, maybe, oh, of how the uh, I like uh, it. development works. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, no, that's a good answer. That is a very good answer. Alexander, Kalina, Carly, any other thoughts as to uh, elaborate on uh, Noor's idea there? I mean, if you were designing a brain yourself, were you going to stick the hand next to the face? I mean, why wouldn't when you got your hand out here, your foot way out here? I mean, how on cortex, why is this somatotopic map like this? Could it be that they're like super, um, like high acuity and like very high sensation? So you want to put the things that are have very high or distinct senses next to each other versus like the leg where it's not as sensory? That's also a good answer. Yeah, I think that's going to be part of it, too. I think that's going to be part of it, too. All right, so I'm going to show you a one, a two-minute video here where I think uh, we can put together behaviorally at least why it might be important. I mean, the answer is not entirely known, obviously. This is more of a thought question, but uh, let me share a screen to this short video. Wait, Dr. For... Lewis? Oh, yes. Um, just a quick thing adding on to Darren and Nora was saying. So is also related to... Um, the fact of like eating essentially and how oh, that stuff is important. Like you need that's your what I'm thinking to too. Food and like your mouth to taste and like to feel. Yep. Yep. So Marquis, I'm going to show you this video and see what you think if this answers. And I think all of you uh, touched on uh, correct answers there. And let's listen to this one. Make sure I can uh, share sound. Okay. Divine holler if you don't hear the audio on this one. It should work, but let me try it. 
Okay, are you seeing that? Yeah. Okay. Ren the homunculus, take four. Here we are at the COVID-19 pandemic makeshift oh, at home me. neuroscience and human behavior laboratory. In this demonstration, we are going to see a participant, a young homo sapiens sapien child, using her fingers and lips during feeding behavior. And I want you to take particular attention on her fingers, hand, and mouth lips representation as we engage in feeding behaviors. Here it is. Banana. Good for you food, unlike cookies. We're going to try now with the gummy bear. <laughs> and you're watching the fingers and mouth as she is placing her fingers up to her mouth as she grabs the food item, palpates it, knows what that object is, and her mouth and hands both have high density of receptors. This is the most information per unit time, and so it kind of makes sense that the hand and mouth representations are close to one another in the brain for efficiency of wiring so you can get more processing quickly to engage in feeding behaviors which are critical for survival for our species and primates who eat with their hands. Say, hi medical students! Cerebral Pete Uncle? No. Oh. Okay. That was great. Did, did that clarify a possible answer? <laughs> so Marquis, is that what you're going after? <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. So that's uh, interesting to think about, especially when you're talking about the eloquent cortex that uh, Dr. Titani was mentioning about the, what circuits are working together and which are close together uh, nearby, which is, is of interest surgically since we are talking ballpark you know, grape size, golf ball size, chunks of cortex that one's generally dealing with pathologies that we can attend to. Okay, so back to the slides. Are there any other thoughts, questions at this time? Hold on a second. I think I got that wrong. Share screen. Okay, so that was our toddler uh, demo eating mnemonic to memorize why the face and hand representations are probably close together in cortex. Important for our species to be able to eat. So with metasensory cortices, there are uh, some interesting things such as uh, Lord Nelson back in 17, late 1700s lost his arm uh, during a battle but could still feel the sensation in his arm. What? How is that possible? Proof of existence of a soul, he thought. And then we had people, uh, let's see, Dr. Mitchell, uh, back in the American Civil War, we had more uh, individuals surviving gunshot wounds to the head and, um, or, sorry, gunshot wounds to various limbs. The limbs would be amputated. And we had hundreds of cases of people with phantom limb, which is, and uh, Dr. Mitchell came up, coined the term phantom limb. And uh, oftentimes you're going to have a sense of illusion that the limb is still there. Oftentimes it's painful. How do you treat a painful limb that's not there? And uh, here is uh, someone came to my lab a few years back, uh, uh, Catherine Baumkamp, and she was working on some prosthetics, like a heat type prosthetic that supplies heat to the edge here uh, as one method to help uh, with phantom limb type pain. It's also a, uh, as a article in uh, Glamour magazine too. Anyway, as a side note. Okay, so going now from motor and sensory motor cortexes to vestibular cortex, going down the line here of different senses, there's no uh, single vestibular cortex per se. I mean, you have a vestibular cochlear nerve affiliated with cranial nerve eight, the vestibular portion of the vestibular cochlear nerve. And that is going to go send projections in posterior insula and parietal lobe. And here you have regions that are activated with caloric stimulation, showing brain regions that are involved with that sense of vestibulation. And it makes sense that it's near the face region in S1, S2 ish kind of land out in here. Now, an interesting point clinically from this is uh, dizzy patients. And oftentimes you can have 
issues with semicircular canals or the nerve, and that can lead to dizziness. That's straightforward, but sometimes you can have responses to medications and have no peripheral issues with the vestibular system, yet the person is dizzy. Well, how the heck is that going on? What's going on with that? And we had a study here, a physician a few years back, a few years ago, looking at areas of the brain, giving us that sensation of uh, vertigo and dizziness, even from a central type of disorder. So that's vestibular cortex, visual cortex. Okay, so again, when we uh, make a fist, the occipital cortex is gonna be where your uh, arm is connecting into your wrist on the very back end here. And on the medial surface, we're gonna have this calcarine sulcus, or it's a hook-like sulcus, separating the superior and infra lobe. We have the cuneus, the cuneate lobe, and the lingual gyrus, this more inferior aspect. And in this image, we can again inflate and expand. So visual cortex is gonna be located here. We have in color various uh, retinotopically mapped areas of the brain on average from about 20 or 30 subjects. And as we inflate and unfold that, we can see the occipital lobe, multiple visual, distinct visual areas. Each one of these colored areas of cortex has a visual topic map I mean, from uh, central out to periphery uh, map of the visual field of one hemivisual field, as we'll see in a moment. But point to mark here is there's our calcarine sulcus, primary visual cortex in the purple here is where this is located. We've got areas for motion processing and a multitude of other areas. That's two more lectures of material on that one, uh, but there's our visual cortex. One last piece I'll put onto there is as a review, you have to remember after the optic chiasm, we had our optic nerves come to the optic chiasm, about half the retinal ganglion fibers cross so that we have going into this lateral geniculate nucleus, you've got um, <clears throat> all the input from the left nasal retina side is going to be looking at your left visual space, goes to the right side of your brain. And in your right eye, that uh, temporal retina which is also conveying the left visual field is going to the right side. So everything in the right side of your vision of where you're, if you're looking straight ahead, and if I put up my fingers here, how many fingers do you see? That is in your, I'm assuming your right visual field that is going to your left occipital cortex for conscious level perception of what you are seeing there. And so that, is occurring at the cross, the optic chiasm. So once we get behind the optic chiasm here in the optic tract, you have a hemifield representation. The contralateral hemifield is represented here, going to the LGN, lateral geniculate nucleus. And to memorize LGN from MGN, L is for light, light LGN. M is for music or sound. Sound processing is more your medial geniculate nucleus. LGN is light, lateral geniculate nucleus. Okay. And then we have our optic radiations that would be coming back here to the calcarine sulcus and these other visual areas. And these inputs are all retinotopically organized or visuotopically organized. So you can have lesions back in here, taking out Myers loop or optic radiations, and you can tell or predict what kind of visual field deficits a patient's gonna have. Won't go into those details, just to remind you that those are kind of high yield concepts that, uh, that come up on uh, step exams. Bigger picture level, what's going in in the visual cortex? Then we start thinking about streams and major pathways. So as you go dorsally directed uh, from say these magnocellular layers in the LGN to various areas of cortex to more parietal superior regions are gonna be involved with your perception of motion and location, where are things in space? So if you have to reach out and grab your beverage, where is it in space? Then you have information flowing along the infratemporal cortices, and these are going to be more about, well, what is that? Is it, what color is that cup? Is it blue? Is it red? What is the shape if you had to um, state what the shape is? And so the information of form or what is it is going to be going down toward vision for perception towards these infratemporal regions of the brain. So the gross level object uh, for action going dorsal, and the object for what is it for perception going more ventrally. Then interestingly with carbon monoxide poisoning, um, it's not 
terribly uncommon to have what's called a condition called uh, blind sight. For whatever reasons, this region's cortex is more sensitive to carbon monoxide poisoning. And if you take out both the left and right occipital cortices along the calcarine sole sci, for instance, you lose your perception of what you are seeing. However, uh, conscious level perception. However, you can still quote unquote see and have more reflexive level of vision. So for instance, here's a patient with blind sight who's uh, and the doctor's here. Okay, what is the orientation of this bar on the TV screen? And they're like, well, consciously the, I can't see anything. Well, just make a guess. All right, a horizontal, I'm like what? So that information is getting through to the brain in other areas, but not at a conscious level of perception. And so this and other lesions like that give us some more clues to understanding how vision works uh, in the human brain. Still don't fully understand it, obviously, but there's some fascinating uh, knowledge about different pathways and routes of information flow. And there are numerous other type of visual lesions, prosopagnosia, achromatopsias, and, and so forth, which again is a topic of another lecture. Dr. Lewis, is that yeah. a permanent? Is that a permanent uh, change that happens with the blind sight, or does that um, does that heal over time? My understanding is that's permanent. Um, if it's, uh, yeah, my guess is permanent, but I don't see patients, and I don't have a full answer for that. I I would imagine you can have a condition where it could be transient, but with the carbon monoxide poisoning, once your neurons die that's it. The, the, the central nervous system, they're not coming back. You're not going to be uh, getting that conscious perception coming back. Any other questions? Okay. Auditory cortex. So you'll recall, and we have our image in the lower left corner. Here's our semicircular canals. Here's our cochlea right next door. And we have this uh, vestibular cochlear nerve coming in here, seven and eight, uh, going through the internal acoustic meatus, all those good things. Focusing on the cochlea, I think of this as a backward piano keyboard because this has basically a tonotopically organized um, organization to it. And um, this information at a tonotopic level is going to go through this auditory nerve, through the vestibular cochlear nerve, into our auto, uh, cochlear nuclei. And from there, it's going to bounce around through half a dozen brainstem areas, work its way up through the inferior colliculus, go out that brachium of the inferior colliculus up to the medial geniculate body. Remember medial for music, MGN. And from the medial geniculate to auditory cortex. And if you take your boxing glove, you make your fist and open that thumb, you're looking inside the sylvian fissure or that lateral sulcus. And in that posterior aspect is a transverse temporal gyrus. And that's where your primary auditory cortex is hanging out. So here's a primary auditory cortex. And you can use functional MRI to map that out. So here are eight people from my lab where we mapped out uh, tonotopic high to medium to low pitches. And on average, here's where the primary auditory cortex is located. And you can map out areas sensitive to vocalization shown in the blue, and then sense uh, areas that are sensitive to speech. Uh, native speech for English speakers in this case. And these areas more in the pink uh, become more sensitive when you hear speech related sounds. So the point of this slide is that as you go from the early tonotopically organized auditory areas to more complex stimuli such as vocalizations and speech sounds, you're going out more laterally uh, and spreading out along the cortical mantle as these more higher association areas put together. What does that sound information put together words for you? and other acoustic objects. Now, if you have, um, oh, and here's a, uh, to go with uh, Dr. Putani's talk here, we have a DTI image looking at some of that tractography going from the medial geniculate nucleus out to uh, transverse temporal gyrus with the fusion tensor imaging shown here. If you have a lesion to one of your primary auditory cortex, may have some difficulties, look, uh, localizing sound, subtle hearing loss, but usually not terribly, terribly bad. You really need to take out both the left and right hemisphere. Uh, and if you do that, then you lose conscious level perception of what you're hearing. Now, if it's just the cortex that you're taking out, you still have acoustic reflexes intact. So if you hear something and jump and respond to that, that's going through that inferior colliculus and brainstem structures, and those are, can be still relatively intact, but you're not consciously aware 
of what you're hearing. Then auditory association cortices, we get to the superior temporal gyrus and superior temporal sulcus region. And when you have damage there, that can lead to what's called central hearing loss. So you might be able to hear that there's a sound, but you may have difficulty putting it, putting it together. What are you hearing? And that ties in with uh, what Dr. Tani was talking about with uh, Wernicke's area. If it's a left hemisphere damage, uh, and this would be a Wernicke's area where right is on the, let's see, right is on the left side of the screen. It's radiologic format. Uh, and if that's affecting your Wernicke's area or your language reception areas, then you have difficulty putting words together. You can hear someone's talking, but you can't tell what they're saying. It's kind of like Charlie Brown, uh, the adults, when they hear the wall, 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 wall. I can tell you're talking, but I don't know what you're saying. That's auditory. Taste, gustation. So just kind of zipping through the rest of our modalities here. And I'll speed up a little bit. Uh, sensation of taste going from the tongue. Remember, cranial nerve seven, nine, and ten are doing taste. Seven, cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve is going to have that cord of tympani, anterior two thirds of the tongue. Sensation of taste, that salty, bitter, sour, sweet umami. That's going to work its way up to the solitary nuclei, go through, works its way to the thalamus, thalamus, then to the superior limiting sulcus of the insula, should I hear in area G gustation. So your primary sense of taste up around in this area. Stimulation up here can cause a sensation of taste and seizures sometimes can be precluded by an aura, including a taste sensation. And this was just a, for those of you who have not yet taken neuroanatomy, um, this is the myelin stain section on the left and a wet brain on the far right and a T2 image in the middle here or a T1 image. And uh, just sort of remind, remind you, you're learning foundational knowledge. You're never gonna see your myelin stain section of your patient. So why do you have to learn this stuff? Uh, but this is just sort of a plug to remember to learn your neuroanatomy. So all this foundational knowledge makes sense to you. So when you start learning some of the high yield uh, terms, you, you really need this foundational knowledge to understand where you are in the brain and what these areas are. Okay. Sense of smell. So for the olfaction, we have in the lower left, going up through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone, sensation going to these 20 or so cranial nerves, go to the olfactory bulb. And then from there, the olfactory bulb goes to the olfactory tract. And that information works its way back to uh, piriform cortex. It's thought sort of to be a primary uh, sense, uh, sense of smell area. But unlike the other senses, smell does not have to go through the thalamus before you can go into the rest of the brain and conscious perception. So it's a different uh, paleocortical type of uh, pathway, more ancient pathway in us humans. So we can have um, stimulation can cause a sensation, a olfactory sensation and seizures. And this one's important clinically if you have uh, seizures that have an epicenter that might be in this region of cortex, you can have a seizure initiate with unpleasant smell like burning rubber. So if a patient's like, yeah, I smell this burning rubber and then I collapse to the floor with some seizure activity, that could be a, a, a clue that you might have an epicenter focus in uh, olfactory related cortex. And smell goes to the amygdala, sense of smell. So you have those powerful uh, memories, mom's baking. Um, and uh, can wake you up, heightened alertness, and uh, you can have some really strong associations with memory. Like you can smell cookies that like, whoa, that takes me back to when I was seven year old in my mom's kitchen smelling those chocolate chip cookies. It has this direct pathway into the cortex, which is thought to convey some of these uh, behaviors for us. Okay, so that was sort of a zip through of primary cortices and before I go to association cortices and higher functions, and it's not terribly long, uh, let's go back to some question answers so far. Share screen again. Any thoughts or questions at this point? I have a question about the auditory cortex. Is that, um, does that project contralaterally or ipsilaterally? Because the um, I think this is the image that you showed, I wasn't necessarily sure. Right, so the auditory cortex is gonna be much more heavily uh, bilateral. So we talk typically about how vision, you know, everything in your right visual field goes to the left side of your brain and sense of touch, your right hand goes to the left hemisphere and your motor to move your hand is the left 
controls the right side. With the auditory system, it's an older system. There is a, a left-right bias for sure. Uh, so if you take out right auditory cortices, you're going to have more of a deficit in your left auditory field. But there are far more uh, crosses and information flowing at the brainstem level that cross over that you're going to quickly overcome that deficit. Hearing is so important for us because you got to be able to hear for predators coming in the middle of the night. You can do it with one ear or the other ear, doesn't matter. It's always on. You don't shut your ears. Um, and so I think of it in those terms. It's much more bilaterally represented early on in the brainstem. So you can compensate uh, for injury to a left or a right side only type of an injury. Does that answer that question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, Doctor, I do have a question. Uh, uh, with the issue, I know this is probably digressing a little bit, but a question about the injury could be permanent or uh, maybe not permanent. I've, I've, I've read some uh, um, brain computer interface research trying to claim that they want to use um, uh, VR or AR to uh, restore some function after a stroke uh, 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 so that maybe using that it could be able to create some neurogenesis or something <laughs> to restore those functions. Is it like, is it a dead end research or is, is there prospect out there? Um, definitely prospects out there for uh, prosthetics and the like. Um, yeah, that's, that's another one or two hours of lecture right there. We have uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Suri and um, Valerie Gritsenko and our WVU here are a couple of researchers that look at uh, prosthetics and, and brain machine interfacing device. Uh, the, the way I look at it is if, if you had function such as vision or hearing and then you lose it, and you can have a prosthetic to, start to restore it if it's peripheral, yeah, then you, can, then you can have a chance at restoring that. If you've never had the sensation from birth, say if you've never had vision since, you were, uh, since birth, the cortex never developed to deal with vision. And so prosthetics aren't gonna do you much because you don't have the neural hardware to interpret what's going on there. That's sort of a fundamental level. So then there's everything in between there as like, when did you lose vision or your hearing or sense of touch? When do you get the prosthetics to how much neuroplasticity there is? And then there's the alter, the way the brain can alternatively try to deal with the information. Uh, for instance, I think some blind people have had input sensors under their tongue and they learned to, to take the tongue stimulation to interpret what was visually coming into a device that would stimulate their tongue. And they could quote unquote, see objects based on tactile the tongue. So there's a huge range uh, to answer that question. Yeah, that's a tough question to answer. <laughs> I'm gonna say, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> good. No, that's a good question because there are there's a lot of uh, research out there about prosthetics, um, vision, hearing, and, and prosthetic arms and the like, and how do you integrate it with a uh, patent neuro uh, nervous system? And um, yeah, that's a loaded question. A lot, a lot of answer to that one. <laughs> yeah, because that really the the concept of permanence and uh, it still seems to baffle me because if somebody gets exposed to some different experience or they maybe they move from one continent to the other start getting exposure to stuff the brain definitely still have to develop a way of uh, forming those consciousness and is that related to forming new kind of neurons that could be in the times of evolution could be perceived as uh, the brain is still growing. Or, I mean, if you don't have it, then you, even if you get as opposed to it, you would not be able to form any neurons. You know what I'm saying? It just always yep. confused me. Yeah, now we're getting into neural philosophy here. So that, that's great. This is <laughs> the philosophy of how the brain, where these concepts, where these perceptions, um, which I guess is a good segue to the next little part of the talk. Uh, Divine, are we going to uh, go to what, another eight minutes or so? Uh, yeah, you can go ahead. I think you, your last few slides are brief, so we can go ahead. And okay, I'll try to zip through some of these higher level association concepts, which we'll only barely touch upon some of these last questions, but uh, at least give us some more fodder uh, to think about. All right, so let me go back to share screen. Okay, so briefly I'll touch on language systems. Parietal cortices for uh, spatial, spatial neglect, 
and then frontal cortices and frontal release signs. So here we have the lateral view of the brain and uh, Dr. Jatani uh, showed an image similar to this earlier. So we have our primary motor cortex and primary sensory cortex for a central lobule for orientation. We have our Wernicke's area in green between that parietal temporal occipital junction and Broca's area for speech production in the left inferior frontal lobule region up in here. And if you want to hear speech, hearing me talk, for instance, the information is coming through these auditory cortex, working its way back to this Wernicke's area, which is more of a conceptual space than any, anything physically real. And then this information goes along the arcuate fasciculus to Broca's area. And if I wanted to repeat what is being said, Broca's area can send this information to motor cortex. Motor cortex then sends it to all the hundred or so muscles involved with speech production so that I can then convey words and phrases to you. Now, if I am reading words, the information goes through visual cortex, also works this way to Wernicke's area so I can read information. And if I can read Braille, tactile information, you can take Braille and that also works this way through Wernicke's area for language reception. And then Broca's for the production. And as mentioned in most right-handers, 95 to 98% of the time, these Broca's and Wernicke's is gonna be on the left hemisphere, occasionally flips over. And for left-handers out there, uh, it's usually about 75% show strong left lateralization and then different percentages, it can be either completely flipped to the other hemisphere or more bilaterally represented. And that's when you wanna have fMRI and other tasks uh, to try to map that out more specifically for, for your patient. Here's an image showing the arcuate fasciculus in the left hemisphere. This is most strongly developed in us uh, humans relative to apes and to monkeys. And here is a lesion, for instance, back in Wernicke's. Here we can see our there's our thumb from the temporal lobe. There's our sylvian fissure and our middle temporal gyrus, uh, superior temporal gyrus, middle temporal gyrus, and so forth. Just refreshing our anatomy. Here we had a, uh, from Dr. Broca back in 1800s, a patient who had Broca's area uh, damaged and in the inferior frontal lobule. And here are areas that are involved with language production in another uh, individual. You can see mostly in that left inferior frontal gyrus region, but you also have with language production, some areas of the brain light up with a functional image such as this. So it's more complicated than just these areas, but thinking about Broca's and Wernicke's is a good starting point for thinking about language systems. With aphasias, if you wipe out back in this temporal parietal occipital junction, it's gonna be affiliated with the Wernicke's aphasia, again, up inferior frontal lobule Broca's, if you cut between the two, supramarginal gyrus and that fascicular, arcuate fasciculus, you can have what's called a conduction aphasia. So what you're hearing doesn't get conveyed over to what you're speaking. And then all of this would be a global aphasia. Here in the lower left is a high yield aphasia square. Make sure you guys memorize that. And basically, if you have good comprehension or poor comprehension, fluent speech or non-fluent speech are the major two by two. And then whether you can repeat or not is going to be important. So if you can say arcuate fasciculus, and then Divine says arcuate fasciculus, then I will know that he had good comprehension and good uh, fluency, and the information could go from the posterior sensory side of things to the motor uh, anterior motor side of things. And so these are the four basic elements for classifying the different forms of aphasia or inability to use language. And that tends to be uh, lateralized to the left hemisphere, but not always. Here's a cool syndrome to help think about this. <clears throat> uh, alexia without agraphia. So if you have a lesion to the posterior cerebral artery, taking out, say, the left PCA, if you are um, the information, that vi visual cortex, so if you were to write down your name, so if your name was Divine Nafar, you write down D-I-V-I-N-E, great. And now if you wanted to read that, you would have visual cortex back in here and here would see the words and send the information to Wernicke's area to see what you're reading. But with this particular stroke, the visual input with the PCA lesion here, there's no uh, visual processing. So this area of the brain is not talking to Wernicke's area. And if you took out the splenium of the corpus callosum, the right hemisphere cannot, it can read, but it can't send the information to Wernicke's area. 
So with this person with this lesion, they could write down their name, but if you ask them to read what they wrote, they wouldn't be, would not be able to read it. What? Alexia without a graphia. So syndromes like these, this is called a disconnection syndrome, also give us some clues about the nature of how the, the human mind works. All right, parotid cortex cortices in one minute or less. So the parotid cortex is where, again, you're getting information from all the senses, your auditory, visual, somatosensory, coming in here to establish and maintain a sense of spatial relationships of things relative to you in the outside world. And so, for instance, if you were not this drill sergeant here, not this guy who's being uh, tutored, but rather this guy in the red arrow, if he's looking front and center, you, where is his spatial attention at this time? Do you think his spatial attention is on the wall where he's looking over here? Heck no. His spatial attention is right here on what this drill sergeant is doing to make sure he's not next to be, uh, to be uh, tutored here. And the areas of the brain shown in the green and yellow are part of the spatial attention network. So you got these superior parietal regions and some of this motor cortical regions here. So he is sensing what's out there in space. Where is it in space? Even though he's not looking directly at it, right? It's, it could be separated from where you're looking as to what you're attending to. Uh, but this, these, this network is critical, this frontal parietal, connect, uh, parietal network for a spatial attention network, your spotlight of attention. Where are you attending in space, regardless of vision, auditory, or tactile? You can have uh, lesions. Here's a, a large right lesion leading to called uh, spatial neglect or parietal neglect. So the left parietal lobe represents your right hemifield of space where you're seeing and hearing out there and tactile feeling. Your right parietal cortex is representing, has left and right, has a little bit of both representations, more dominant for spatial orienting. So if you have right parietal damage, there is no part of your brain that can now deal with the left side of your space. And so someone with right parietal damage will be ignoring the right side of their space. They may fail to shave the left side of their body. They may not dress the left side of their body. They may not leap from the left side of a plate. And these are some classic examples of someone to here draw a clock. They draw the clock, they completely ignore the left side. Draw the picture of this house, they ignore most of the left side of the house. Bisect this line into two equal halves, they're way off due to this parietal neglect. And Gerstmann syndrome is what you associate with that. So if you want to, okay, everybody put your hand out and scratch your head like this. Good, so you had the willful intent to go and scratch your head. Now, if you had someone with the lesion taking out in the uh, brown here, you may have that, lose that ability to send the information, that intent to make that movement to go and scratch your head when I asked you to do that. However, if you had an itch on your head, you might well just go and scratch it just reflexively. So the motor planning to, to make that motor movement is intact, but the willful act to intend to and have that um, happen can be disrupted. Prefrontal cortices in one minute or less. Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex involved with working memory, motor planning, organization, and intellectual function. And then we have the ventral medial prefrontal cortices involved also in uh, executive functions and planning, foresight, personality, some elements of intelligence thought to be here. And again, this is where Phineas Gage comes in, he had the tampening rod shoot up through his eyes, miraculously survived. He used to be a person who um, was very hardworking, responsible, clever, very respectable individual. And after the accident, taking out ventral medial prefrontal cortex, he became tactless, impulsive, loses money, lost his relationships, led bad relationships, to totally changed the personality. So again, uh, we learned something about uh, human behavior through uh, case studies like these. And perhaps even more extreme, and we have Dr. Uh, Walter Friedman, who back in 1930s uh, to mid 60s, he'd go around uh, to various hospitals and perform frontal lobotomies. This is before drugs like Thorazine were around and is thought to cure problems such as suicidal behavior, hallucinations, severe headaches, uh, incurably mentally ill people uh, that what he would do is go and take in the upper left a little electroshock device for some local anesthesia around your orbit. Then he would take this little uh, ice pick device here, put it up in the orbital frontal region. And here is uh, one of his patients, Dr. Or Howard Dulley. 
and showing an image of the frontal lobotomy done here. And this is a link to an NPR study with this guy telling his life now that he survived a frontal lobotomy uh, with Dr. Friedman here. Anyway, here in our West state of West Virginia, he did about 200 plus cases and did as many as 25 lobotomies in one day. For, so for those uh, burgeoning neurosurgeons out there, that's, that's a lot of surgeries in one day. But we don't do frontal lobotomies much, much anymore. So, um, so we'll leave it there. All right, so I will end on that note. So starting with frontal lobe. So when you think about the frontal lobe, Imagine that you're putting your palm on the patient's forehead and you're laying your first three fingers over their frontal lobe. And that's a good way to think about the anatomy of the major gyri of the frontal lobe. So looking at my cartoon here, you can see there's, there's two sulci running in an AP uh, direction that divide the frontal lobe into a superior frontal gyrus, middle frontal gyrus, inferior frontal gyrus. And those are gonna run perpendicular to the pre-central gyrus. So here's that superior, middle, and inferior frontal gyrus. And then the inferior frontal gyrus is just a little bit more complex. So you might break it up into these three parts, pars of percularis, pars triangularis, and pars orbitalis. So I said those three run in an AP direction perpendicular to the pre-central gyrus right in front of the central sulcus, which is right in front of the post-central gyrus. You have to think about the medial surface of the hemisphere when you're thinking about the frontal lobe as well. So the medial surface is formed by the medial surface of the superior frontal gyrus, anterior half of the paracentral lobule, and the cingulate gyrus. So here, here we go on the medial hemisphere, you can see this very large superior frontal gyrus, the medial portion of that. And that comes back. And here is that paracentral lobule. And the anterior half of that is the end of the frontal lobe there. And just to remind you, the cingulate and the superior frontal gyri wrap around the genu of the corpus callosum here. And the paraterminal and olfactory gyri sit below the rostrum of the corpus callosum in front of the lamina terminalis. So I'm sure you, as you read about surgical approaches into the third ventricular space, there's a well-described approach that goes through that lamina terminalis. Temporal lobe. So same thing, if you imagine laying three, your first three fingers about where the temporal lobe would be, that's a good way to think about the, the basic anatomy of the temporal lobe here. So there's two transverse sulci dividing it into a superior frontal, I'm sorry, superior temporal gyrus, middle temporal and inferior temporal gyrus there. Transverse or Heschel's gyrus runs anterolaterally over the superior aspect of the superior temporal gyrus. So Heschel's gyrus is kind of up here on top of the superior temporal gyrus, kind of tucked in the sylvian fissure. A little bit more. So medial, you also have to think about the medial surface of the temporal lobe. So that's formed by the rounded medial surface of the hippocampal gyrus and the uncus that you can see in the picture down here. There are sort of three major gyri or strips. There's the parahippocampal gyrus inferiorly, the dentate gyrus more medially, and then the fimbria of the fornix. The parahippocampal gyrus projects medially along the edge of the tentorium and forms a large part of the basal surface of that temporal lobe. The oncus is the medially pointing anterior part of that uh, parahippocampal gyrus. And we'll look at that in some uh, pictures down, down the road here. All right, parietal lobe. So the parietal lobe uh, back here uh, consists of a, a large transverse intraparietal sulcus that divides it into a superior parietal lobule and an inferior parietal lobule. And for the most part, we think of the inferior parietal lobule consisting of that supermarginal gyrus right here, which caps that sylvian fissure, and then the angular gyrus that caps that uh, superior temporal sulcus. All right, occipital lobe. The occipital convexity is, is not as 
well defined and well separated by clearly defined sulci. Most consistent sulcus is the lateral occipital sulcus that divides the superior and inferior um, occipital gyri. And we'll look at that from the medial surface in a second as well. So medially, the occipital lobe is separated from the parietal lobe by a parietal occipital sulcus. The calcium fissure extends forward and divides the occipital lobe into the cuneus and ling lingua. Um, on the medial surface of the hemisphere, I, I just wanted to point out this one particular structure, the marginal sulcus is a radial sulcus off of the end of the cingulate sulcus that separates the paracentral lobule from the precuneus. So if you think about that cingulate sulcus coming back, it swings up and becomes a marginal sulcus. And I just point that out because a lot of times on MRIs, when we're looking at pathology, we're trying to figure out where the uh, primary sensory cortex for leg is and the primary motor cortex. And if you can find that marginal sulcus, that loops up right behind that primary sensory cortex. So it's a, usually a pretty prominent sulcus that you can find, and it can help you find this eloquent cortex. All right, so quick overview of some of the cortical structures. Of course, uh, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's a a quick introduction to it. So what about some of the functions of some of these areas we just quickly touched on? Primary sensory. So the primary sensory cortex uh, is here in this kind of bluish um, color, right behind the central sulcus. That primary sensory cortex located in the post-central gyrus of the parietal lobe and posterior par paracentral lobule. So you're going to see references to Broadman areas. Uh, I think these are a little bit outdated, but since they crop up a lot, I left them in this, uh, in this uh, lecture. So this primary sensory cortex is Broadman areas one, two, and three. The sensory cortex receives fibers uh, largely from the VPL and VPN uh, nuclei of the thalamus, convey general sensory like touch, pain, temperature, proprioception, and vibration, and also receives visual fibers from the contralateral primary sensory cortex through the corpus callosum. So remember the primary sensory cortex has a sensory homunculus that represents that contralateral half of the body. And so there's a good reminder of what that homunculus uh, looks like uh, for the somatosensory cortex. You can see uh, where hand and face are located a bit more laterally, leg, uh, more medial. So there's a disproportionately large representation of face, lips, hand, thumb, index finger, places where you won't really hide discriminative touch. Uh, pharynx, tongue, jaw, they're more ventral, leg and foot uh, on the medial surface, just above the cingulate gyrus. And face and tongue are represented bilaterally. So uh, we think of this as primarily representing the contralateral side but keep in mind that face has a very strong, robust bilateral uh, input. And that's why uh, you can sometimes resect uh, face sensory or face motor and the patient may not have any deficits. Uh, the problem though is once you get beyond that into the rest of the primary motor cortex, uh, you, you start to have significant obvious deficits. Primary sensory cortex, so ablation of this area will result in immediate loss of sensory modalities, but pain and temperature sensations can return. And that's thought to be primarily uh, due to the thalamic input. Therefore, you're left with complete loss of discriminative touch, proprioception, but you can continue to have a crude awareness of pain. I'm sure, uh, you probably have come across the Lamic pain syndromes, especially, for example, in stroke patients. <clears throat> so uh, when we think about all these sensory cortices, remember there's always 
um, association or secondary cortices for all of these uh, primary sensory cortices. So there's a very robust uh, sensory association cortex for primary sensory. <clears throat> I'm gonna uh, let you guys just read through some of that, but just uh, the, keep the concept in mind and, um, and then you can read through this to kind of think a little bit more about uh, the relevance of it with regards to function and what happens when you uh, lesion those areas. How about the visual sensation? So primary visual cortex. So we've uh, introduced that a little bit back here in the occipital lobe. So the calcarine gyrus on the medial surface of the lobe um, is, is split by the calcarine sulcus. That's Broadman's area 17. Uh, you probably have come across this prominent band of white matter uh, called the band of Gennari, this very thickened layer uh, four in the cortex. So remember, most cortex layers have six layers. Uh, receives, uh, the visual cortex receives fibers from the lateral geniculate. Each uh, visual cortex receives input from the ipsilateral half of each retina, representing the contralateral visual field. So uh, if you look at the color schemes here, just to point out <clears throat> uh, the area uh, below the calcarine fissure that corresponds to the visual field um, superiorly. And then as you uh, get closer to the pole of the occipital lobe, you get closer to where central vision is located. And then remember that uh, it represents a contralateral visual field. So this is the uh, right hemisphere, and this is showing the left visual field for those. So I'm sure you all remember, you know, the entire visual pathway. So this is important to, to learn very well because it's one of the longest pathways through the brain where a lot of pathology can interfere with it. So if you have a good grasp of that visual pathway and you can understand the visual deficits that come from pathology along that pathway, then that can really help you localize uh, lesions. And so I'm sure you all will recognize this sort of chart where they've mapped out the visual pathways, where it decussates, where it comes back to the lateral genicular nucleus, and then you have the optic radiations that swing out into the temporal lobe and then swing up into the parietal lobe. And if you have lesions at various places, you're gonna have a very characteristic visual field defect. So this is a, a very important uh, a bit of information to study and learn very well. And so I, I encourage you to spend a little bit more time on this. So as a couple examples, uh, E, represents those optic radiations that swing out into the temporal lobe. And so if you have a temporal lobe lesion out there, you get this characteristic visual field deficit or this pie in the sky deficit, a superior contralateral quadrantinopsia. F is meant to represent a lesion in the optic radiations as they swing up into the parietal lobe. And so F, gives you this sort of visual field defect where you have a uh, inferior uh, quadrantinopsia on the contralateral side. So anyway, make sure you, you know these pathways very well. It can go a long ways in helping you uh, localize lesions um, after examining patients. So a bit more about the primary visual cortex. Lesions produce visual field defects in the contralateral visual field. Lesions inferior of the of the calcarine fissure uh, give you a contralateral quadrantinopsia. Lesions of the whole visual cortex in one hemisphere result in loss of vision in the contralateral visual field. If the lesion is vascular, for example, occlusion of uh, a PCA, that patient might actually have macular sparing or sparing of their central vision uh, because that very critical the eloquent cortex receives collateral blood supply also from the MCA distribution. 
Uh, so again, there's secondary visual um, areas, and I'll let you guys study that on your own time. Uh, I'm Dr. Bernardo again. Uh, I'm a faculty at Cornell, um, but I basically I do mostly skull based and vascular, and I consult in many countries. But I am very much dedicated to teaching as well. That's why I run the skull based teaching program at Cornell, uh, and I do courses in uh, neurosurgical courses, complex skull based, basically all over the world in uh, U.S. and uh, overseas as well. Uh, we have a, now no, I mean, many medical students already passed by our lab. We have a nice teaching facility at Cornell with a five workstation. And we have fellows that come from all over the place and they spend with us from uh, three, six months, sometimes to one year. And we, we, we build in a huge archive, collecting a huge archive of digital pictures, videos for a publication. Uh, and, uh, and to teach and uh, residents and fellows in our facility. And I mean, for all my experience, I can, uh, I'm humbly, I would like to provide, first of all, some, uh, some guidelines for people that are approaching this specialty, uh, or as a medical student that think you're approaching a special, or somebody who's already into the residency program. Uh, I, that's what I say constantly to my fellows, my residents, the people that come to our, my courses. And I always say, remember complications and learn from a complication to avoid to make the same mistake again. Uh, because this sounds very obvious, because usually complication never come alone. It means you've done something wrong. So the more you know about the anatomy, the more you know about what you're doing, uh, the least chance you have just to cause some complications. Uh, the other thing is be realistic about your technical skills. Neurosurgery, neurosurgery it is a very complicated field. It needs a lot of um, training. And, but at the end, we need to be honest about what we can do. And we have to transfer that professionally honest, honestly to our patient. Uh, it's required a profound knowledge of the anatomy that goes without saying, but it's very important. I mean, uh, understanding the, the anatomy, uh, we have to negotiate with while doing these approaches. Practice surgical skills in a microsurgical lab. This is extremely important. And unfortunately, sometimes I see uh, residents, they do have the beautiful dissection labs in the uh, training programs, but they don't use sufficiently, which is a shame because sometimes, they, and I, it's understandable because residents are extremely busy clinically, but it will be important and valuable to spend some time in a dissection lab if you have a luxury to have a dissection lab in your neurosurgical department. And unfortunately, I do courses around the US, and sometimes I feel really sad to see some really nice dissection places, lab, and people don't use or they show up for random dissection, and that's a real shame. So if you do have a lab, trying to make always some time to pass by a lab and do some dissection, this is extremely important to refine your surgical skills and to learn the anatomy. The other thing is be extremely familiar with the instruments available. I say that from the top of my experience because I work in so many different ORs in the world. For me, it's much easier. And I found it was extremely important in the beginning to understand what I had available in that particular, particular OR setting because in any OR, I found different, different tools. But believe me, you will find extremely important when it's time for you to use that particular tool knowing that you have in your armamentarium and it actually works. Because many places before when I, I was not that experienced, much younger, I was myself, you know, uh, rupture of the aneurysm, bleeding, and I was looking for that clip that was not available and that's a disaster. So make sure you have everything available and you're extremely familiar with what we have available. Uh, the other thing I always emphasize a lot with my fellows is uh, to practice incredibly, I mean, thoroughly trying to avoid it as much as you can brain retraction. It sounds obvious, but when you put a spatula, very likely you can cause some trouble. So if you really train yourself not to use as much spatula as possible, and how you do it, just try to make those corridors wider, 
so that you don't have to retract the brain too much. So learn how to dissect the arachnoid is extremely important because die alone will open up those corridors and makes your surgery, make your surgery much easier and much safer. Uh, surgical microscope sounds something obvious, 2020, but you'll be surprised. Again, I see this one by traveling around a lot. Many neurosurgeons sometimes don't use the microscope or sometimes they use the microscope only for particular stage of the operation. I would, strong, I would strongly advise to use the microscope all the way through the, the surgical procedure because it's extremely important to have a good grip of the anatomy and do have a good understanding of anatomy, for example, in vascular surgery, perforate and so on. Be humble. This is uh, something I need to uh, emphasize a lot. Again, it comes from my experience to have be teaching some uh, resident fellows of so many years now, a lot of them, that sometimes you know people are boasting for a beautiful technical gesture, but make sure you remember you're working with the patients. Sometimes people come from the lab, they feel so, or even from just a surgical course, like three, four days, they've done cavernous sinus dissection, and they think they're so good, and they're eventually they're very good technically, but you need to understand, you need to transfer those techniques on a patient. This is extremely important. So rem remember always be, be humble. And what is really important is the incredible clinical results, more than just a great technical gesture. We are not just soccer players like Maradona, somebody else, but actually from our great technical set, the gesture has to come a good clinical result. Um, take a minimalistic approach. Again, this advice comes from my, my long experience because when i first started neurosurgery many years ago skull base surgery was just you know becoming success i mean uh, uh, popular and they were they were we were doing so many demolishing approaches the globe facial the i remember there's so many complicated approaches and as we see along the years that some of these approaches were were not really necessary so uh, always take a minimalistic approach, uh, always consider the simple solution, uh, avoiding grandiose options. The other thing is just what, you, what would be best for you, sometimes not the best for the patient. And remember, your intellect should control your emotions. So these are some advice that I feel like I need to share with, the, with you guys that are very young, just at the beginning of your career, and that will make your surgery uh, much safer and much more successful. Um, again, talking about the approaches, the entire spectrum approach will be a little complicated, so I try to make a little bit more simplistic and more schematic. Uh, today, we're going to uh, we're going to consider first the, all the anterior approaches. So we're going to consider the frontal approaches, and I include that one, the transvenoidal as well. We will mention a little bit about craniofacial approaches which I, I won't spend too much time because it's a little bit more specialistic. I mean, this is more for courses and stuff like that. It'll be a little bit complicated. But I just want to mention that, that those craniofacial approaches in the past were extremely, were very popular, particularly when I started skull base surgery a few years ago. And, and as time passed by, they became they become less and less popular, being replaced. Most of them have been replaced by transphenoid or minimum basic endoscopy, right? But some of these are still Viable is still important for some lesion when they're extremely big in some skull based procedures. So, I'm only going to briefly mention those one, and they're still available. And particularly for skull based surgeons, um, it would be still good to have it in the neurosurgical you know, armamentarium. And then we go progressively a little bit more lateral with the anterolateral approaches. And we will consider what is uh, the main approach everybody will use in the neurosurgical practice, which is the perioneal approach, which we was very much popularized by Dr. Yasagi uh, many years ago. And it's an incredible surgical uh, corridors to the entire cella, uh, pericella, paracella area, anterior fossa, part of the middle fossa, and also for uh, retrocellular compartments, so, uh, particularly the upper cellular compartment on top of the uh, posterior cranial process. So it's an incredible surgical avenue for the entire anterior fossa and middle fossa, a little bit of posterior fossa. And uh, with, in the course of the years, this approach has been modified many times. 
has been expanded, has been minimized. So we're going to cover very briefly what's the modification of this well-known Terran approach. In within the anterior approach, I will consider the supraorbital as well, which is a, a little bit more minimal approach compared will be the same surgical direction and perspective as the, as the, the subfrontal approach. The only thing will uh, will have a, a much less bone resection and uh, some limited um, indication. But when uh, when uh, for some for some particular pathology, it's a very good alternative to more invasive uh, procedure. Uh, and then I was go posterior, as I mentioned, on the modified uh, terminal approach like orbital zygomatic, frontal orbital zygomatic, and we'll see this one a little bit more in detail. And as we go a little bit more lateral, we will consider, let's see on this other side, we'll consider all the uh, transpetrosal or peripetrosal approach to the middle fossa, to the posterior fossa, brainstem, all these pathology they around the mesencephalic uh, system as well. Particularly, we will consider the subtemporal uh, with some variation of that subtemporal like anterior petrosectomy. Um, this is a little bit more complicated surgical approaches, but I'm going to mention, we do specifically in our courses at Cornell, um, is the posterior petrosal approaches, which is an incredible avenue to the entire petrocliva area, a cerebellopontine angle. So we'll consider the translabyrinthine, transcochlear, and this will be the green area, translabyrinthine, the mastoidectomy, going through the mastoid, which is very complicated because we are going to transfer some really uh, delicate, uh, complicated structure in within the temporal bone. That needs a lot of training. That's why it's unthinkable if somebody uh, would be able to perform this operation without the tedious dissection job in a, in a, in a microsurgical lab. Um, that's why I think particularly this complex approach is having, spending some time dissecting is extremely important. And you see this one in blue, Will be another approach will encompass the anterior pedrosectomy or subtemporal with the transmastoid, will be so called combined approach. Which, in, in the course of years, I've been using more and more, it's getting more popular now, and I particularly like it because it's an incredible approach to the entire petrocliva area, the perimesencephalic structures, all the way to the cerebellum combined angle, and allows to spare structure before it was impossible to spare with more invasive approaches like transcochlear, translabyrinthine, because you can do a conservative petrosectomy, uh, sparing the hearing and the function of the fissure nerve, but going transdentorial, we can still achieve the same amount of, amount of exposure, basically. And then as we go a little bit more posterior, we're going to consider all the median, midline approaches, uh, the suboccipital and supracerebellar. So the suboccipital will be the one in green, as you see here, which is, uh, is good for all the lesion localized at the occipital lobe and uh, some lesion on the pineal gland, particularly if you go transtentorial, we're going to see a little bit more in detail all these approaches. And as you can see, as I go a little bit inferiorly, we'll go the supracerebellar infratentorial approaches, which we can divide in uh, median, paramedian and lateral. And this will allow the beautiful exposure all the way to the, I mean, particular to the tactile area, pineal gland from medium to lateral to extreme lateral. And after that, we go a little bit more uh, lateral. We're going to consider the far lateral, so called far lateral, uh, transcondylar approach, uh, which allows a good exposure of the entire uh, anterior portion of the foramen magnum. And um, the area of the upper cervical particular, the anterior upper cervical, lateral, lateral upper cervical. And I don't want to forget one of the most important approaches together with the pterion approach, which is the retrosigmoid. Retrosigmoid is extremely popular and is a, it's replaced many years ago, which, uh, which everybody was using only, I'm talking about 34 years ago, everybody was using only the midline suboccipital for any lesion around cerebellum pointing angle and uh, for foramen magnum. I can imagine now going all the way anterior to the foramen magnum from this uh, posterior opening. That was unthinkable, but the people were doing it until the retrosigmoid was popularized, basically so-called suboccipital approach, lateral suboccipital, which is a nice opening and offer a beautiful perspective and trajectory 
all the way to lesion that is a bellocon angle. And many surgeons, a majority of surgeons use this approach also for petroclival lesions. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not going into uh, some kind of, you know, just uh, the, the so-called diatribe, but whether petroclival region and needs to be addressed by retrosigmoid or so. But I, the, the message I want to give to young surgeons, make sure they learn any possible approach and they decide themselves which one will be best suited for that particular territory, the approach they feel a little bit more familiar with without being conditioned or somebody else is going to tell them, right? So my message is always trying to learn as much as you can do it during your residency programs, because really you don't make a difference in the end, the reality of approaches. And then we're going to see some of the interhemispheric approaches as well, uh, particularly approaches to the ventricular system, we're going to see anterior interhemispheric transcalosal. We're going to consider a little bit of the transcortical and see the difference between an advantage and disadvantage between the uh, transcalosal interhemispheric and the transcalosal transcortical. And to, to finish, we're going to consider a little bit of um, surgery, neurosurgery for uh, uh, trauma. Uh, so it's a little ambitious. Uh, we have three hours, so I hope you I don't, uh, I'm going to get too tired. Uh, but I'm going to be a little bit more, again, I won't go too much in technical data as much as I can. Uh, uh, before I go on, I have to tell you some of these features and information data will come from my lectures, previous lecture, some from my publication, some I, I took from some, some other books, like, for example, the two atlas of uh, neurosurgery, uh, another atlas of neurosurgery, the Meyer atlas, and some from the atlas of the emergency neurosurgery, Ullman emergency neurosurgery. So I collect some pictures from other places as well. Um, um, just in, within all these approaches we're considered, uh, I do mostly skull base. I design my practice and I'm very lucky because I, I, given I consult in different countries, I can collect only the cases, particularly the skull base and vascular. So basically in skull base surgery, out of what we've seen before, the one that really popular, all the pterygoid approach and the orbital, front orbital zygomatic, all the variation in the pterygoid approach. And uh, the lateral approaches, which is anterior pedrosectomy, transpetrosal, like combined anterior pedrosal, posterior pedrosal, and the far lateral with the retro -sigmoid. Basically, these three approaches, particularly for skull-based surgery, are the one that really allows you to get access to the entire clivus, all the way from the uh, retro cell area, top of the clivus, down to the front line. So these are the main, main approaches, which we're going to cover a little bit within the spectrum of approaches. Um, I want to start with some uh, generic, uh, generic consideration about how to organize the OR. And again, this is some general consideration. It comes from my experience again to moving so much around that sometimes I had to find what I, to, to use what I find basically in different ORs. But if I, if I had to suggest, um, this would be like the most standard, right? Basically, uh, the operating table is positioned in the room so that the surgical team has a maximum access to the microscope and to the other eye instruments. Um, the problem sometimes is that the position of the table is conditioned by the presence, for example, of ceiling mounting lights or ceiling mounting microscope. So it depends where is your microscope, what kind of microscope you have. Usually the anesthesiologist and the gas columns are on the left side of the patient. Um, this particular, I'm right-handed, right for example. For me, this, this particular layout is very, uh, very, uh, very successful. And so the nurse can pass the instruments to the surgeon's dominant right hand in this case. And the assistant, which is very important, he has to be very comfortable and is able to work alongside the surgeon's right hand, all right? I prefer, as far as, for example, in my lab, I, I, in my surgery, I always sit because I, uh, skull based surgery, I really uh, feel like you have to be comfortable. And so I do all my surgery always in the ceiling uh, with the surgical chairs. And I did my best in my lab to provide the fellows and residents with the surgical chairs because I want them to 
they use from they were very young to use surgical chair, particularly with armrests, because I sometimes I see them using awkward position, and that really makes your life much harder, much more difficult. So if you can train using a surgical chair, it'll be important. But it's again, again, it's up to everybody. Uh, preference basically, you know, I just my preference too is uh, sitting down when I do this surgery. And uh, the cranium is fixed to the operating table with a three pin fixation device. That's what we, that's another thing that's very important and different now. Nowadays, everywhere in the OR, they use three pin. Uh, we don't use different kind of headrests except in some particular setting, which I'm going to show a little bit later. Now, the other thing is very important is to be able to change the angle of the, the, the surgical table. That's why it's very important to have an electric surgical table. And but not only having an electric surgical table, I'll be able to use it the best. So basically, what I always suggest to be able to learn now, particularly to the young resident, how to secure the patient properly to the table so that at some point in your operation, you'll be able to move the table, particular, for example, transpetrosa surgery, because sometimes people really uh, underestimate the importance of the initial step, positioning a patient. That's why I'm going to talk a little bit more about positioning and how to use the table properly, because if you wrap the patient and secure the patient properly to the table, you'll be able to move the table, particularly during transpetrosa, because in that case, uh, together with the microscope swinging, you really want to adjust uh, in, um, um, optimize your surgical trajectory that allows you not to use spatula, which is always my ma major goal not to use spatula. For me, not to use spatula is extremely important because I really try all my, my best to avoid complication. And using spatula is definitely, obviously, a source of complication. There are many different surgical positions. Uh, I'm considering this picture some of the most popular, uh, supine, uh, with the head on the turn on the other side. This is the lateral position, uh, modified park bench, sitting position. So there are different positions, and I would say that the one I use the most uh, are two basic patient positions for the whole spectrum of intracranial uh, position. Either is the supine or the lateral oblique. Basically, in procedure, they use the supine. The surgeon can expose the supradentorial cranial region and gain access to the anterior region of the posterior fossa and approach the anterior cervical spine as well. When you use a lateral oblique position, it's possible to expose the occipital region and posterior fossa while having access to the posterior cervical spine as well. So there is no position near surgery, which is more versatile than the supine position. It can be used for the most of the craniotomy, like the peterional, subtemporal, interhemispheric, skull-based approaches, transpenoidal, transoral, transpatial, and uh, posterior, sorry, and posterior approaches. Uh, that's why I think I don't. I hardly use sitting position. In some cases, uh, sitting position facilitates exposure because particularly in uh, posterior approaches because the cerebellum, uh, thanks to gravity, is just fall down. Uh, but I don't like it for a particular because uh, my, my arm gets tired after a long time using it. It's because of the problem or uh, embolism, air embolism, venous embolism, which is a major problem sometimes. So I prefer to use the modified park bench finding posterior lateral, right? And I learned this one particularly when I was spending my time as a fellow at uh, BNI from Spetzler that he, he used, he put, he modified this park, park bench position by putting the arm underneath the table. I'm going to show you this one particularly for what I use uh, many times in, uh, during far lateral approaches. I'm going to talk about this one when we, we cover the far lateral. So let's go back and let's start from the beginning, all right? After this little overview of the approaches, mm, direction, uh, let's start in detail now. Now let's talk about, uh, start with transpenoidal, which has gained uh, a lot of popularity uh, recently, thanks particularly to the, to the, and to use endoscope, right? 
when I start training, I did my training in, uh, in Scotland, Edinburgh, we had the legacy of Dr. Norman Dot, which is one of the first pioneer of uh, skull based surgery, particularly transpenoidal. And uh, actually, during my training in Italy, I, had, uh, I, had, I was in the same department with Dr. Capobianca. So I, I grew up with the idea of transpenoid, Dr. De Bilizis as well, uh, with different schools. So I had you know, a chance to compare different schools to different thoughts as well. Um, Professor Dot used to use a lot at that time. And, um, Translabial, uh, which was an incredible perspective, but that some disadvantage, of course. The, the advantage was particularly the surgical trajectory, which is more direct to the cell. Disadvantage was particularly for complication rate, right? Particularly lose of the sensitivity to the to the upper teeth. Um, the positioning now is extremely popular transpenoidal, particularly with the advent of the endoscope. The position is uh, supine, as you can see. And uh, the operating table is flex. And the, in this case, the patient's head is supporting a horseshoe headrest. Um, the advantage, advantage of the horseshoe is, a, is that they allow the head to be manipulated during the operation. The nose, the patient nose has to be parallel with the floor. It usually has an angle approximately 30 to 45 degree from the long axis of the body. And usually that's another good uh, practice when, uh, when uh, exposing large tumor with a supracellular extension, a lumbar spinal drain can be placed and uh, particularly to, to inject like 10 to 15 milliliters of air into the fecal sac. This because the head is elevated so the air ascends into the supracellular system and helps displace the tumor downward into the operative field. So particularly when the, the tumor is localized supracellular in a supracellular space, so the corridor becomes particularly long. To be able to push the tumor down, it will, be make, it will make much more accessible to the surgical tools and uh, through a trans uh, nasal perspective. And usually when we do this approach, the abdomen or, or the right eye usually is prepared for a possible fat or muscle graft, which is extremely important for reconstruction technique to avoid CSF leaks. So in this case, you want to prepare the patient properly to be able to, to have easy access to the, either the abdomen or the, the right eye possibly. Um, it is very important to use an image intensifier, the CRM during the operation. And this is important for a different reason. First of all, because it allows the neurosurgeon to confirm that the cell actually has been reached through this transpenoidal opening. And uh, sometimes when you are in the presence of a large tumor, the cell is enlarged and uh, thin, and the identification, identification is very apparent. But with microadenomas, it's, it's less obvious. So really you want to understand anatomically where the cell is, is placed. So the radiographic confirmation is very important before you actually move the bone. So it's important to set up the OR, uh, taking in account that you have to put the CRM on some image intensifier there. Um, it, when you, this is important, the importance of anatomy is very important, like Dr. Evitz was saying before, particularly understanding landmarks. And you can understand these landmarks only after drill, after spending a lot of time in the lab, understanding where exactly the common sign is displayed on both sides, in both sides of the cell, because that venous bleeding comes from the common sign inadvertently, because you access the sign with the sounds without knowing where exactly is located. That will cause a lot of trouble because remember your visualization is relying on a camera, on a tip or an endoscope, right? So if you if you inundate the field with the blood, it would be particularly difficult to control the anatomical region. That's why understanding the anatomy is extremely important because it uh, helps you in avoiding uh, troublesome complication there. Um, the, the, as I was mentioning before, the endoscopic, uh, the adoption, has uh, allowed people to steer away from a translabial, the sublabial approach. Uh, the translabial has several advantages. 
First of all, there is no gingival incision, and so you don't have to resect the anterior nasal spine. And the result of that is that there will be less numbness of the upper teeth. Um, so that because the approach is less traumatic, the patient has less osteoperative discomfort. So this is very important. So less uh, osteo time for the patient. So this, the, the sublabial, the translabial dissection has been, uh, has been, uh, has been, has, has not been used for many years now. Um, the disadvantage of the trans transnasal route, as you can see this trajectory, is the approach is more angle when you get to the cell at this level, as you can see from the difference from this kind of angle. So you have a, a more angle trajectory, but after the rostrum of the sphenoid sinus has been removed, uh, usually we use a hardy speculum just to find your way in the surgical corridor, basically. Yeah. So at this point, either you know the microscope is brought into, into view. If you use a microscope or just the endoscope, you're going to enter operation all the way from, uh, from the initial moment all the way down to the cellar opening, basically. Uh, I don't want to go in details of this approach because I'm, I'm sure somebody else will talk about details. So I'm going a little bit more. I don't talk about to prepare the corridor in, with, inside the nasal cavity, but just I want to show you some small, uh, small uh, little points about how to drill the bone, for example. Um, if the bone is particularly thin, for example, when in the case of micro and macro adenomas, which is bone is particularly thin, it's very easy to fracture the bone with a simple scalpel and, uh, and you can extend a bone opening with the carisons. But sometimes when the bone is particularly thick, uh, he has to use the bone, uh, the, the drill. Uh, using drill, it needs a lot of practice. It's unthinkable somebody. It's the same in skull base or different procedure we're going to see later on. It's unthinkable to use a drill in a location where you have a carotid artery on one side, eventually intracranially, you have the ocular motor, the optic nerve. Uh, in this case, you have the cavernous sinus on one side with carotid, the optic nerve. And if you make a mistake and you imagine the complication can arise from that. That's why I continuously, I continuously emphasize how important spending some time in the lab that get really familiar with the drill. The drill is something that really can uh, make your life much easier and your surgery much faster and safer. But if you don't use properly, it uh, could be a source of potential disaster. If you really, because uh, you know, a high revolution, like 70,000 uh, 70, revolution per minute and cause a real major disaster if you really don't know how to handle it. All right? And that's what we do with our resident fellows. Sometimes I spend days and days make sure they know how to use the drill before even do anything else to basically the basic steps, right? So when the, the, flo the floral middle of cell light has been removed, finally the dura can be cauterized. Either you can use a bipolar cautery or you use a suction cautery. Occasionally the tumor, the tumor can infiltrate or extend through the dura. Uh, so that's why it's important to cauterize, but uh, you have to be careful about the common signs of both sides, right? So always remember where is the junction and transition between the dura and the cavernous sinus, because at that level would be the two carotid, internal carotid artery, the intracavernous portion of the carotid artery running on both sides. So you can imagine if you just, you can make a major disaster at this level. And remember even the position of the optic nerve. Again, this and the knowledge of anatomy is particularly important. Here that we use a lot of very narrow corridor, it's very difficult to make this corridor wider. It's not like transcranial approaches. That's why, Sometimes it's very controversial. I do agree a lot with, I think it's an incredible approach for anything that's midline, broad way from the upper clivus down almost to the clivus or to the clivus as well. But I, no, I'm not particularly fond of this approach for anything lateral. Some other surgeon might object that, but I rather prefer a transcranial approach for anything a little bit more lateral, particularly lateral to internal carotid artery and the vitreous bone, uh, I would prepare transcranial. Where everything for a midline, even suprapella, is an incredible approach because it allows you to access the lesion without any brain need for brain retraction. Right? So 
So after the section of the tumor, finally you open the dura, you resect uh, in different fashion. Uh, resect, I'm not going to go into detail about technique how resect the tumor, but uh, mostly I want to mention a little bit about um, reconstruction, which is very important, particularly to avoid CSF leak, because this is one of the major complications. Uh, patient goes back home, no deficit, everything seems successful, but the rest of his life is going to be conditioned by the CSF leak prop complication they can't derive from CSF leak, right? So that's why it's extremely important to spend a little bit more time, don't be in a rush. That's why I suggest this one is a common practice for any kind of surgical approaches. Don't be in a rush, make sure everything is done properly before actually back up and may leave. And particularly in this reconstruction because the gravity and the fact that everything is just pushing on the floor of the cell line, it's very easy to have a CSF leak and that, that, that level. And the reconstruction technique are different. And, and sometimes it's best to harvest abdominal fat or some tight muscle graft and pack the cell. There are different techniques. Again, I'm going, I'm going in detail. I don't know exactly the program tomorrow. Maybe somebody is going to talk about this. Uh, the only thing is important that the cell, do, the cell should be overly packed. Um, sometimes some surgeon even suggests to pack the cell if it's a large cell, even if there is no CSF leak, just to prevent the herniation of downward herniation of the optic chiasm. So that's why it's uh, never uh, overemphasize the fact that the construction has to be done tediously and properly. And sometimes even uh, with the transition approach, some little cartilage is usually is available for reconstruction. So any technique is good to make sure that uh, the cell line is properly sealed. And again, without overpacking the cell, although it's very important. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the transfacial approaches, but I just mentioned some of these. I was I trained a lot in these approaches when I first started Scalbase, and I published a, 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 as well about this one. But this particular, we did uh, at the BNI, we did a classification in seven levels. And uh, before transpenal, that was not extremely popular, not like nowadays with the endoscope. And some of these are still used in some large skull base lesion, for example. This is a level one. Level one, according to our classification at that time, was just uh, taking the sub, uh, uh, was a frontal approach. Uh, Subfrontal, basically, I was in, in uh, involving also removal of the supraorbital ring up to the nation you know, at this level. And you can see, you know, taking down the ring, it will usually take this one in two pieces. And uh, uh, it, it was a good approach, particularly for anything anterior fossa, planum spenoidale, cella, and also all the way down to the cella, uh, retrocella area bilaterally. So it's a very good approach for large lesions that were extended bilaterally. The second level, sorry. The second level was, uh, in, it was the same approach as the number one, but was involved in also the nasal bones and the orbital ring. That was particular for lesion then extending intracranially, but were extending also in the nasal cavity. And this is a very good approach for uh, extensor neuroblastoma, for example, some more aggressive tumor of the basal skull that were eroding through the plant scrotale, lamina cribosa. Right? The level three. So, level three is uh, the same as level two, but was involving, it's still involving actually, it's the uh, lateral wall of the orbit. Basically, by doing that, is possible to displace the ocular bulb laterally. And that will uh, obviously will expand the, uh, the dissection and the exposure for lesion into the uh, extracranial, into nasal cavity particularly, though those one extend bilaterally. That was a good approach for, uh, for again, this stasial neuroblastoma or the major skull-based lesion. Um, the next approach, next level was level four which was a, uh, was a maxillectomy. This was a very good approach uh, when vision was originated from the common signs again to the nasopharynx, right? It's a very good approach, it's still used nowadays, uh, particular lesion extending laterally. Um, this is a, it's a very good uh, surgical avenue. Um, the other, sorry again. So this is a level four. Level five was a Lefort 
approach uh, with the splitting of the heart palate. And this very, was a very nice, still a very nice opening for major tumor of the nasal pharynx all the way up to the base of the skull. So it's very particular, it is a good approach for midline lesion, extend a little bit more lateral. For a more lateral exposure, I would have preferred still the level four because it's a max left to make you more exposure laterally. The level six was a purely trans oral approach, which is still popular, but a lot of these approaches have been replaced now for trans -tenoidal. But this was particular for a major lesion that was in, uh, in um, the distributed particular on the middle line. And the one with the best approach was the level seven, which is a mandibular swing, basically splitting the mandible, is swinging the mandible laterally. This was the major lesion that uh, were involved in nasopharynx up to the base of the skull in the infralabyrinthine space as well. So swinging the mandible, and some of these were um, um, coupled with the glossotomy. So it was, was very invasive approach. But sometimes it's difficult to, it's no other, you have no other option when the lesion is particularly big. This one, particularly for skull based uh, procedure, right? That's why I'm just covering a little, uh, I mean, quickly, I don't want to go in detail because otherwise I go off towards the major goal today. But let's talk about something which is very popular instead, which is the sound frontal approach, which is uh, con compared to that one, it's fairly simple. Uh, this approach, uh, as you can see in this, uh, we've seen before. Uh, before we used to do a little bit more the bifrontal. Now I do mostly the unifrontal as much as I can. The advantage of doing unifrontal, some frontal, unilateral, but, but subfrontal approach because I don't invade the frontal sinus, which I don't have to do any reconstruction or any cranialization or any uh, sealing of the frontal sinus. So I keep myself lateral to it as much as I can. And the other variation of this approach, which I will going to see a little bit later, will be supraorbital, which is made basically the same surgical trajectory, but just a little bit less bone resection. Um, basically, you know, most of the times you don't need that much bone resection because at the end of the day, you try not to uh, retract the frontal lobe too much. But in some cases, you have to because resection, I mean, the, the tumor is particularly large. Uh, this approach is basically uh, could be particularly useful for a large lesion of the anterior carnal fossa and cella with bilateral extensions, like craniopharyngiomas, plantar sphenodynia meningiomas, or even aneurysms. Right? You see the head is extended. Surgical position, again, I will emphasize constantly you will get tired of it because for me surgical position is extremely important because as i mentioned before i do my best to avoid the need for frontal lobe retraction right so whatever it takes for me surgical position so uh taking chance of the gravity second is bone resection sometimes that's why i need to object i'll be very fashionable if i tell you minimal invasive approaches bone resection to a minimum but I'm a strongly, I strongly advocate some good resection of the bone just because at the end, the good resection of the bone allows you to do a good, uh, you take chance of the gravity. So basically, if you free that bone around the frontal lobe, for example, that allows the frontal lobe to fall back following the gravity as much as it can, particularly if you are capable or just a good arachnoid dissection and detaching the dura from the base of the skull. That allows you, I'm talking about no enormous retraction. I want you to misunderstand. I'm talking even just one centimeter or a few millimeters would be incredible, successful target goal if you really want to try and avoid uh, uh, spatula. Together with a good positioning and a good angle of the microscope, all these three things together will allow you to just give a good unobstructed view to lesion and allow you not to use bare retraction. That would be incredible if you, if you achieve to do that. The, the approaches could be different according to the extension of the lesion. You can go from a simple subfrontal, because it is a typical subfrontal without involving the supraorbital rim, or you can involve the supraorbital rim in your approach, or you can extend the approach on the other side. So basically, bilateral subfrontal. Uh, the three different degree of surgical, I mean, bone resection, uh, 
they are according to the extension of the tumor. And humor, tumor is unilateral, you know, spinal wind and jaw on this side, which is not going too much contralateral. I will use the unilateral subfrontal. And other, if you have a particular problem which you expect to, to have to retract the brain a little bit too much, in that case, I will take the, the rim of the orbit. And that allowed me to change the angle of the microscope and to minimize the brain retraction. That's a good procedure just to avoid the complication that can arise from using too much spatula. If the lesion is extended bilaterally, so in this case, for example, a huge spinal wing and jaw or any kind of a tumor at the level of the lamina originating in the area of the plantar spinal lamina fibrosa, which extend mostly bilaterally, in that case, I had to do a bilateral extension of the subfrontal approach. And again, I don't go usually in technical, this is showing here is the burrow is done on top of the sinus. I usually don't do it. It's just my personal preference, but it does, it's not, I don't want to be dogmatic about that. I try always to make sure that I don't get some bleeding, troubles or bleeding, bleeding from the sagittal sinus. So always trying to manage this one on different, on both sides. Right? Once you open the, 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 after the bone resection, this case has been taken in the orbital rib, for example, the dura flap is going to be based inferiorly. And then you try to make your uh, opening as flush as possible with the base of the skull. And again, with the proper angle of the microscope, that allows you an unobstructed view to the, to the target, and which allows you to uh, use a less, less brain attraction, which is extremely important. And finally, you can do a tumor at the bulk and see. Now, I don't want to go into technical stuff, but understanding the arachnoidal plan is extremely important, particularly to separate the tumor from the you know, neurovascular structure, surrounding neurovascular structure. In this case, for example, we see the anterior circulation, particularly the uh, anterior cerebral artery and uh, the ACOM and the chiasm, for example, which is really want to do a meticulous dissection. That's a typical microsurgical skills. You want to practice in the lab first and eventually your surgical practice, right? But I always emphasize to learn the arachnoidal this is mostly anatomy, and then it's no point for me to discuss about this one. Once you know the anatomy, and the anatomy, remember, the book anatomy is good as a starting point, but it's no substitute for a cadaveric, something you can learn on a cadaver, because you really want to understand arachnoid. And you don't want to learn the arachnoid. Unfortunately, sometimes you have to on a patient, but it's always advisable, of course, it's obvious to understand anatomy, to practice how to open up those arachnoidal systems just on a cadaver. Believe me, you'll see enormous difference in your surgical practice. Whereas if you do it- frontal sinus has been uh, entered. Oh, sorry. And uh, the mucosa is three. This was a, a previous dissection and previous lecture. Um, so basically, the, you can see the trajectory at this point. You know, uh, the, the, the position helps a lot to be as flush as possible with the, with the base of the skull. So there is no need for brain retraction, particularly if we angle the microscope properly, if you are very basal with the flush with the floral mid of uh, the anterior fossa. So now let's consider the superobial approach, which is a uh, very much is the same surgical trajectory, share the same trajectory. See, this will be the unifrontal, unilateral subfrontal approach. And this would be the supraorbital. Basically, the dissection, uh, the trajectory is exactly the same. The only thing is different than the extension of the resection of the bone, right? So basically, uh, the goals of this approach, which uh, would be elimination of brain retraction, improved visualization, minimization of tissue, trauma of tissue, and the cosmetics as well, because this approach implies the the, the skin incision to do the skin incision in within the eyebrow. So basically, if you do it properly without extending too much, you will never see anything after surgery. Um, that's the major advantage. Uh, would you use all time as opposed to unifrontal? Uh, no, because there is some contraindication, which I'm going to see which one. Um, it is a very provides a very good access to most anterior skull base. 
supracellular region, lateral carotenoids, proximal ciliar fissures, circular willis, basal frontal and temporal lobes, and ventral brainstem. Um, this is good, particularly for uh, anterior willis circulation annual, for example, ACOM, IC annual. Sometimes even for MCA, proximal MCA annual, is a very good approach. The craniotomy requires only one burrow, uh, that reducing post-operative scarring and uh, cosmesis, preserving cosmesis. Indication, anterior skull base, supracellular region, lateral carotid sinus, proximal severe fissure, as I mentioned before, for example, MCA, proximal MCA aneurysm, circle willis, the anterior circle willis, will be pushing the envelope, trying to approach summoning retrocellular, although it's possible, it's feasible, but it's a very long corridor to get all the way down to the retrocellular area, upper clivus with this approach, although it's still technically possible, but there's a there's better option than that. And sometimes if you do, if you perform a vascular, the projection of the aneurysm and the nature of the aneurysm will influence the condition or suggest the trajectory, whether it's more anterior or more anterolateral, for example. Um, it's good to access front, uh, based on frontal, temporal lobes, and ventral midbrain. Contraindication, patient with a large frontal sinus. Uh, if I don't want to get into the sinus, just deal with the sinus and get bored, bothered with dealing with the sinus, I, I would rather go anterolateral. In that case, I will use, for example, the terminal approach. Or for lesion with a significant component based on the anterior greater, greater spinal wing and extending to the middle cranial fossa, in that case, a better approach with the pterinal craniotomy. So that goes back to those suggestions I was providing in the beginning. I don't have to do this one at all cost, just because I want to do a minimal invasive. But if I feel with a pterinal approach, I can provide a better exposure, which means to me that I minimize the brain attraction. I would rather use the pterinal approach, which I do care about clinical results, other than using the minimal invasive approach, the, my only for aesthetic purposes, like the supraorbital. For me, what I want to say is much more important, the clinical efficacy and the clinical outcome, other than just trying at all costs to be minimal invasive because it obtains some cosmetic uh, advantage, right? So that's always trying to say this is my philosophy, trying to share my philosophy with my fellows and people I teach to. Right? As far as the approach is technically, is not complicated because, as I mean, relatively not complicated. If I'm talking about some other complexity, we are going to see after this. Basically, the incision is within the eyebrow. So after inside the eyebrow, basically, I can do a pretty clean flap and extend the perineal clean flap inferiorly on top of the bone, as you can see. Now, what I do with the bone flap, I keep my bone flap very flush with the floor of middle or anterior fossa as much as I can. Sometimes you, I start the craniotomy in uh, so-called uh, McCartney uh, borehole, which we're doing, going to talk when we do the pterion approach in the uh, next one. But basically, I start with the bone, uh, bone for the craniotomy, it'll be like three centimeters diameter and going all medially. Uh, usually I keep myself lateral to the supraorbital notch, which you see this one, which housing the supraorbital nerve, which is very important because I have no need to go medial to die. If I go medial to die, it means I need to deal with the frontal sinus. So I already, if I already planned that pre before in the planning, so I know so I'm prepared to just cranialize the frontal sinus, different story. But if I don't have to, I don't do it. Particularly if I'm dealing with a small aneurysm, for example, if I'm dealing with acorn aneurysm, I do this one for acorn aneurysm, I don't need to go that medial. I keep myself lateral to the supraopial notch. It that means better uh, cosmetic result, a particular function, because I don't need to invade the front of science. It's much easier. I don't need to deal with complication after that. The good thing is very important. Again, I always emphasize this one understanding how to use the drill because I want to be as flush as possible with the cranial, anterior cranial fossa floor because that allows me with, together with a good inclination of the microscope or even with an endoscope. Even an endoscope can you be used in this case would be very particularly useful. I can basically minimize the need for brain retraction. And again, that translates along in less brain, uh, less complication. Right? 
So finally, I can look really, at this, the, the stand of the craniotomy from the McCarthy, that's anterior to the anterior uh, superior temporal line. And then I extend along the uh, supraorbital ring up to the supraorbital notch without passing it. And then I go like three, I told you like three centimeters diameter, I go back and then I join again to the passing again through the superior temporal line back to the original burrow. Basically, after I take this one, I'll be very flush. If I need a little bit more section, I will use a drill. Usually, in my, in my, in, in, when I teach resident fellows, I always am, encourage them to use the drill all the time because that's where they gain the confidence with the drill. But you can use a leg cell or whatever it takes to punch the bone, basically, I go very basal with a basal skull. And finally, you can open the dura. I go back, this is a surgical position the, from this is upright position. Basically, the dura is a C incision based inferiorly. Some, this is enough for a small lesion, for example. If you go after a small meningioma, if you're up for a small aneurysm. Uh, but if you, if you want to extend this approach, you want to minimize the amount of retraction, I would suggest to take the supraorbital rim as well. In that case, you can be like a triangular shape that allows to go even more inferior with your approach. But I don't want to go too much into technical aspect, but this will be like a modification of the problem. Some other extension, uh, look at this is what I was talking about, superobial nerve, superobial notch. Very rarely you need to go medial to that, you keep yourself always lateral, and that it, it allows you not to invade the frontal sinus. So I always do my best, but this comes from anatomical knowledge, not just for books, because you need to transfer this one in a, in a real scenario. And again, you will eventually in a patient, but it be much easier to go in, in through an intermediate step, which is a cadaver dissection, right? So if I want to extend this one, once I know the anatomy, it's very simple. According to what I need, do I to extend a little bit more inferior, take part of the lateral wall of the orbit, or extend a little bit more superior without getting into the purely, otherwise I'll, I'll go into the unifrontal if I need it, unilateral. But this basically are the, uh, the extension, the supraorbital approach. And they don't need to be studied. They're according to what you need, you can do, once you are very familiar with the anatomy, you are very, uh, very good confident with the drill, it'll be very easy. And look at the amount of exposure I can gain with this small, um, with a small craniac craniotomy or craniectomy. Uh, look, I can have a beautiful exposure, of course, it'll be like a fennel, I'll be all the way down retrocell. But again, I would suggest not to use this one for retrocell area, although technically you can get a retrocell area, but the corridor would be very narrow. Huh? I would do for that a little different approach, like a, a more lateral approach, which we're going to talk about now is the initially parallel yeah. approach. So basically the parallel approach is a little bit more lateral and in some of the exposure is overlapping the exposure of the supraorbital, uh, but a, it's much wider exposure of the cella, pericella, and paracella compartment and retrocella area as well. So basically, it's an extremely, as if it's done properly, that's the secret. The main point is doing this approach properly because you'd be surprised. It's such a popular approach, but still some, some surgeon I see around, they, they're capable of messing with it, you know. The, the reason is because you really want to center the pterion approach on the pterion. That's why there's a reason why it's called pterion, because by centering on this one, you basically you are halfway on a frontal lobe, halfway on a temporal lobe. And if you, again, if you do this one properly, if you use, take advantage of the gravity, the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe would fall back if you position the patient properly with the, uh, vertex of the head down 15, 20 degree. You can take advantage of the gravity, the frontal lobe, the front and temporal lobe will fall back and you have a much need for, uh, much less need for brain retraction, spatula at that level. Position is very important. Let's go, let's see how we can, uh, uh, how we do this one. Um, it's very useful for aneurysms, olfactory, groom, meningiomas, cavernomas, anterior, meso, mesotemporal region, temporal bone tumors, clival cordoma. This is just some small example. Basically, everything around the area could be accessed with the perioneal approach properly done. It's still the exposure, it mainly just uh, a, a regular, uh, uh, a, a standard perioneal approach. 
exposure is still limited by the presence of some critical structure. Like for example, in that uh, would be the would be the the presence of the ICA and in the middle of the, the, target the, on the other side would be the, the, would be the ICA the optic nerve and the overall nerve on the other side. So the exposure is still limited when you do just a typical telling approach. So that's why I, in my curriculum for the fellows in the lab, I always let them not open the dura for a month and a half. The reason why I do that, because I want them to train thoroughly how to prepare the approach extra durally, open up those corridor. And there are some little nuances, which I'm not going to talk about too much now, because that was beyond the purpose of our overview. But some little thing will make a huge difference in your surgical practice. And I can learn on in the lab if you open up a piece of your ring, mobilize structure. So those, they, they look like very narrow corridor. You can expand properly. And again, ultimately allows you to expose properly the lesion without retracting the brain too much. So that means less complications. Not only successful in taking out the tumor or clicking the aneurysm, but you are not going to deal with complications. This for me is, a, is an in, important priority. Right? So when you do uh, the pterium approach, basically is a preferred avenue for most lesions, for subfrontal, common sign, subtemporal, sylvian fissure region. Uh, so it's a very popular approach. Um, it gives access to the most aneurysm, vascular malformation, arising from the basal artery or around the circle willis. And the problem you need to, the surgeon needs to project the exact location of the spinal ridge so that both frontal and temporal lobe can be exposed equally. So, and the other thing is very important to understand is the vascularization of the skin, because that is going to condition the bone flap, the skin flap. Basically, what I always suggest, you don't need to learn this one by heart, but by remembering, and again, this stuff, you can, this is on a book, right? It tells me exactly, but it's just a, an orientation, just approximation, right? Where the, the superficial temporal artery is going to be with the branching, distal branching. So basically, this requires a good study, anatomical study, whether you do it as a, your medical student curriculum, when you're doing a cross anatomy dissection, if you think in the future you're going to be a neurosurgeon, you better do this part properly. Or you can just postpone this one when you are in your neurosurgical residency and you're going to do it in a dissection lab, but you have to be lucky in your department as a dissection lab, because I strongly emphasize again to rehearse this one in the lab, right? Because that tells you a lot, look where to put, where to start with incision. Usually you start, you see it book says one, two centimeters in front of the truckers, but there is a reason why, because you're trying to spare the superficial temporal artery just in case you want to need that one for a bypass intra extra cranium. So understanding how to do a skin incision, the most optimal skin incision requires you to have this, uh, so-called x-ray vision, understanding what's going on underneath, right? And that's what Dr. Evans was telling a lot, just these uh, landmarks are very important because, but you should be able to project those landmarks on the surface, not just by learning by heart, but just by having a good roadmap of what's going on underneath where you go to the side. So this is a typical skin incision. You can see it goes crossing the superior temporal line, goes half, on the half pupillary line, on this side. And now there is different way, and again, I don't go too much into the technical aspect, different way because you really want to, as you can see from this, uh, this you not only have the, the superficial temporal artery, but you have even the fissure now, which is crossing this level. So your goal is just to avoid both of these structures. So this is why we're going to see particularly when the orbital psychomatic is so-called in the facial dissection because we're going to spare the frontalis branch of the fissure now it goes, you know, this is the temporal branch, the frontal branch crosses this level. So we want to make sure we spare that vision now, particularly for cosmetic purposes and for functional, because you're going to lose the sensation on this level. And, the, and not only that, but particularly the, sorry, the, um, the, the motor skills of this at this level, right? Um, there are some ways of doing it. I'm not going to get into detail, but interfacial section allows to spare the nerve because usually the, Frontalis branch of the facial nerve is in within the fat pad in between the two fascia, the deep temporalis fascia and the superficial temporalis fascia. And I need to learn how to identify those ones in surgery. 
which seems a little tedious, but only the first few times you do. Once you're done, the first few times it becomes very automatic, and that allows you to just spread the artificial map. It makes a lot of difference, even uh, cosmetically. Yeah? So basically, it size the fashion. In the simple technical approach, it size everything through the galley and the fashion, the mass all the way down to the bone. It basically reflects the entire flap anteriorly. In that, by doing that, uh, avoids, this avoids both injury to the frontalis nerve and ischemic atrophy of the temporalis muscle, basically, you know, by doing this way. Uh, now, the, the bone flap is very, very important. There's a lot of mistake I see. Uh, it's, it's so obvious, it seems like something very simple. Uh, for example, now we train our fellows at rest and not use a perforators anymore. But we use a, a we use a just a simple drip burrow basically, you know. And then we with a craniotome we pass around, you know, skirting the skin flap all the way crossing the superior temporal line into the frontal. That's in underneath. I mean, superior to the frontal lobe. And then we cross again the superior temporal line. We go as peaceful as possible and come back. Now at this level, remember you should have the spinoid edge. Which, if you are going to eventually, you can do the entire craniotomy with one single burrow. Um, unfortunately, I have to tell you, in some other countries in the US, we are lucky because we can we can use a new burrow all the time. But I don't know if you have some student from the planet, not in this case. But some places they need to re sterilize, so there's no chance they can do this with one single burrow. They need to do two different burrows. And sometimes, if you want to spare the dura, particularly in elderly patients, Patients where the dura is more attached to the, the skull, you might want to do more than one burrow, eventually one. Usually, <clears throat> I might do one in here, just underneath the superior temporal line. But if I can, I try to get away with only one. But I need to be careful not to break the dura underneath, right? Particularly this dura as well. And remember, here now, this is going to be the spinal range. So the, 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 craniotome, the craniotome is passing freely all around. But I stop at this point because that's where the spinal range is going to be. So what I want to do eventually, I need to fracture. Once I do this, I need to fracture this bone flap. But if I keep this one like this, very likely I'm going to fracture in the middle because it's too, too the base here is too solid. So what I do, I usually use a, uh, I use a, the craniotome, just take off the foot plate and I make, I make a groove the inside the, the skin or region basically to make it weaker. So in that case, I can just slip the bone flap properly. All right? So at this level now, it's, you can stop at this level. It's a typical terrional approach. But now that's what we learned. That's why we inherited for skull-based surgery how to use properly the drill. So what's the suggestion here? It's just to flat this bone spinoid ridge completely uh, as much as you can. Why? Because again, that will allow you to avoid or minimize the need for brain to, to place a brain spatula. Because you have the frontal lobe. You yeah, have the temporal lobe. If I don't make this flush with the drill and I need to use, to know how to use a drill, what kind of drill bit, that's why you learn how to do in the lab, in the courses or, or so on, stuff like that. I make this one flush um, in this drawing, you know, you can see it's a drill and then make sure that you understand, you make this very thin, you understand on the other side you have the orbit and until the superior orbit of fissure, and again, I don't go too much into detail, but that's the most common thing or the, uh, the approach, right? Um, and once I make this one very thin, now I will see the advantage of doing that because once I open the dura, this usually is done in a uh, C shape uh, opening the dura. I can do even a linear cutting and then extending with the L shape all the way to plan sternodale according what I'm after to. But usually the most common one is a C shape curvilinear in incision that goes from uh, the plan sternodale goes frontal lobe all the way to the temporal lobe in here basically join the, the edge of the, the bone resection. And just the fact, look at now, I, this is just a drawing, but as a surgeon, I can enjoy, if I angle the microscope properly, I can have an unobstructed view all the way down to the, the planum sphenodale and uh, the middle force at this level, right? Just because I, I flatten very well this sphenoid bone and I have less need for brain retraction, particularly if I know how to uh, do a good arachnoid dissection and together with a good surgical position. So I had to use every weapon in my armamentarium. My final goal is the optimal exposure and 
less brain retraction, less complication. So that's what I want to do. And finally, I'm going to open the arachnoid. Again, this, you need to really understand how to do this one. In a book or in, in uh, for me, in wording, it's just difficult to do. It would be much easier if you can do on, uh, on a patient, of course, many cadaver possibly. But if you open up this arachnoid, it will be magically the entire structure of the system that will open up. And you're going to see uh, Alpha or the anatomy underneath the arachnoid, basically. The, uh, the other good thing, understanding the structure. Once you open the arachnoid, arachnoid in um, optic system, uh, the optic body system, the carotid ocular motor system, then later on you're going to open the Lilliquist membrane. But basically, in transparency, you already see structure underneath, and particularly you're going to see the edge of the tentorium. The edge of the tentorium for me is very important because it tells me it helps me in locating um, prematurely where the ocular motor nerve is going to be, which is getting to the ocular motor porous in here. So basically, I cut the tentorial edge to extend. The goal is always enhancing exposure, increasing exposure at this level. So this allows me to open up. Uh, by opening up the system and cut the entire open up the entire area in here, and again to use less brain retraction. Um, usually, use a, a suture, and then you you use you, it's a tuck up suture. You can just displace the entorium, the two edge of the entorium on the other side laterally, so it exposes this area underneath. Look, and that's what I do. This is a simple optimal approach. What we do, like in our curriculum training, fellows well, as a resident, usually we teach them how to, this is a very, once you do a pterion approach, it's still an arrow corridor. What do you done all the best arachnoid dissection, all the weapon in your hands, positioning, but still you have a very narrow corridor, particularly if you had to kind of, you know, play around because you have like legionally more medial lateral. So there are some common procedures which is really require a lot of training, how to displace and mobilize the carotid, just we call it cutting this subdural ring, uh, cut the anterior canal process, mobilize everything. Basically, the goal for a good surgeon is to open up this corridor. It means you spend a little bit more time initially. That's why I have my fellow spend a month and a half only extra dura without opening the dura because as surgeons, we are so anxious to go after the lesion. We can't wait to open that dura. We end up working in this narrow corridor. Whereas if you practice on uh, with this philosophy of open up this corridor by doing the extra dura preparation, open up the corridors, you have a much better visualization and opportunity to take out the, the lesion or address the lesion properly. Without going into details, because again, you're going to do this one later on with the next talk. Basically, you close watertight dura with the, you know, different, this different fashion. If you are interrupted, interrupt it as you want, basically as long as it's watertight. And then the bone closure is very important. This is very important for you for aesthetic purposes or cosmetic purposes. That's why I'm trying to drill as least as possible. So basically, you extend the bone flap as much as you can. So you don't have to place too much metacrylate. You don't have too much of bone defect. But you just make sure you have a good location on cranial plate. Right? And finally, there is, I mean, we still use a, a drainage sometimes to avoid collection of blood. And then yeah, this will you learn when you go into your, uh, your surgical practice. Now, we have modification on this pterion approach. We mini pterional frontal temporal orbital. I'm going to show a little bit of this one without getting too much into detail. Uh, frontal temporal zygomatic, frontal temporal orbital zygomatic. According, as you can see, this is like a, a building up menu. Basically, mini pterion means the same pterion, a little bit less bone um, resection. It's doable in some very limited indication. I'm not a strongly, I'm not a strong advocate of it because it's very fashionable. But I would rather take the bone because that allows me to retract the brain much less. So I, I, for me, it's, it's not mean to let be less invasive in bone resection. Doesn't matter if you take more or less bone, and then you're going to replace it, right? But it's doable technically. It's some limited when you really got something like, for example, MCA right under the pterion. MC annuals, you don't need to just do a lot. It used to be, you can do just the pinpoint small annuals. I will use this one. But other than that, instead, this orbital component of the front or front temporal is the pterion approach, right? Plus the orbital component. That alone gives me a lot of advantage. Why? Because I can change the inclination of the microscope. That's why I call it orbital, right? And that, that allows me to 
uh, avoid brain retraction and a good inclination. The zygomatic instead variation, adding this one allowing me to go a little bit more flush, me of the floor. The frontotemporal zygomatic hypodentia is the best approach. It allows you in afford you the best exposure there. Cellular, pericellular, paracellular, and retrocellular area. The only problem, of course, if it is not done properly, it will give you some aesthetic anesthetism, some aesthetic cosmetic problem. Right? So it has to be done properly. There is a lot of, I'm not going to go in detail, but I can talk with this is what we do in our course for skull base. This is a typical variation, the, the what we call frontotemporal orbital, basically the same as the peteronal. The only thing I take this cuneo is this triangle shape of the supraorbital. That allows me to change the inclination of the microscope. So I go a little bit more superior. So if I have a supracellular area um, uh, lesion, for example, on top of the posterior client, this is a very good uh, maneuver to do. Or I can use, for example, only the zygoma, I take the zygomatic arch without doing the orbital zygomatic, because this will allow me, can you see, it allow me to drill this area underneath the zygoma. So I mean, I have, if I have a lesion, for example, in the middle fossa, and I'm flush, I get a flush with the middle fossa floor. In this case, that allows me a less retraction of temporal load. So every procedure, I would rather train myself how to do this one, other than not to. So people take with a pinch of salt, people say, you don't need that. I need whatever it takes me not to retract the brain. Remember, because the patient is the successful when only when the patient leaves the hospital walking on his own, no. But I will make sure the patient 10 years from now, for a theory for a benign lesion, is a, there's no cognitive impairment whatsoever. Not just because I'm not following up the patient, I won't need to have, or her to have a normal life. So for me, rather than having a less brain retraction, a little bit less bone retraction, right? This is the mini pterion, for example, is more centered around the pterion. This is a good, if you have something around the proximal senior fissure, a middle senior fissure, MCA, I mean, small lesion at that level. But again, I would still uh, rather do, a, it's very fashionable, I would rather do just a regular pterion approach. Now, the one is very good for skull base, of course, and I'm not just going too much into the front orbital zygomatic. Basically, what it implies, this is a typical approach, implies taking down, do the pterion approach without getting too medial, but take the orbit as well, just basically the roof of the orbit, take the lateral wall of the orbit, part of the zygomatic, and do all the way down to the root of the zygomatic arch, right? So basically, this would be the whole point taken out. So that allows me just to have a much better inclination, afford me a good exposure of middle fossa, everything underneath the temporal, of the temporal lobe, everything underneath the frontal lobe in here, into the CDR fissure, pericella, paracella, clinoid, posterior clinoid, anterior clinoid, basically everything around the cell, everything anterior and middle from some posterior fossa where the upper part of the petrocliver region. So this is an incredible approach. And again, you know, it doesn't have to be used all the time. I won't use it if it's done properly. It's, it affords you an incredible um, exposure. The, the surgical position is exactly the same. The pterion, basically, how do I turn the head like 60, between 45, 60 degrees on the other side? As you can see, the head is, the body is elevated, the head is elevated still compared to the chest, but this, the vertex is down 15, 20 degrees because I don't take chance as much as I can of the, uh, the gravity, right? So I want the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe to fall back. Um, it requires, I'm not going to go into detail of this dissection. I want to just give you this, some more important um, uh, uh, key point. So basically, you can see the difference is here to cut to the roof of the orbit, lateral of the orbit. So the major landmark are the um, superior orbit of fissure, inferior orbit of fissure, zygomatic process. And I uh, give this, for example, and that's what we emphasize in the skull based courses with all time at Cornell, in our lab at Cornell or around the world uh, with all my fellows. So basically, understanding how to afford the best dissection, trying to keep in mind. To not to have some cosmetic problem as well. Just anatomy, anatomy landmark, very important. For example, considering the superior of the fissure, make sure you pull back the bone when you're done without drilling too much because you want to avoid falling back the uh, global thread of the, the orbit. And this basically are the bone flap. Uh, the first cut is going to be on the root of the zygoma. The second is going to be on the 
The second one is going to be on the zygomatic bone. The third cut is going to be on the, on the, we can see in here, this is the inferior orbital fissure. And sorry, this is the inferior orbital fissure. And the fourth one is going to be a roof of the orbit all the way down to the inferior orbital fissure again. And now the, 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 the fifth and the sixth is going to be underneath. So basically intracranially, and I joined this cut and I can isolate this orbital zygomatic piece and I lift all together basically. Like this is going to be lift. Well, so one cut, second cut, third cut into the orbital fissure, roof of the orbit, and I join intracranially this cut across the spinal region. I lift the, 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 the orbital zygomatic piece, basically. Now, the, the bone work has to be the same as the pterion. After I lift the bone flap, I do like the same kind of work with the drill. That's why I want to take as much bone as possible because I'm going to drill all this around because my goal is going to be to have an unobstructed view that allows me not to use the rain retraction. And this is extremely important as well. The dura flap could be done in a C shape or same as the pterional or more popular again in the, in the orbital zygomatic is it along the symbiont fissure all the way down to the orbital apex and then uh, steering medially along this, the planar spinal diameter like an L shape according who you after to. If you are covering the science, you want to go a little bit more lateral, of course. Now we have some modification we call pericavernous, transcavernous. Uh, I'm going to briefly mention this one, what that, what that means, just to have an idea. Pericavernous means I, I do that job I was talking about, basically means opening up the corridors. How do I remember where I was showing before this narrow, intradurally we have this narrow corridor between the carotid optic carotid ocular motor member. Basically, you end up working in these two very narrow corridors. And usually, neurosurgeon, they master working in this corridor. But what I say, it's still a narrow corridor. Why just uh, training yourself, working while you work in these narrow spaces, why you can make your life much easier, just opening up properly. That's why but you need to spend some time in training. Right? That is worthwhile, because if you really learn how to mobilize the carotid, how mobilize the ocular motor nerve, how to mobilize the optic. Basically, you can expand all those corridors. You don't need to use any spatula in here. And you can have a much better exposure at the area underneath. Right? So that's why we work a lot with our, our fellow, doing our courses, we and the rest, and we make sure they really understand this concept, right? This is the cavernous approach, which I don't want to go now because we really don't need to. Uh, this implies anterior crowd acting again. Uh, using the drill, I mean, reading on books and articles seems like so obvious and so easy. Put a drill in here, take the anterior client away, that gives you much better space. But one thing is saying uh, and in wording, and one thing is actually doing in a real life. Because the anterior client process, you can see, is between the optic nerve medially. And on the other side, I have the superior orbital fissure content with the ocular motor nerve is near. Our uh, uh, trochlear nerve is going to be passed by around all the extraneous structure, frontal nerve, lacrimal nerve. Everything is packed up in all this structure here, right? On the other side. So can you imagine even now with a drill, although the advantage is going to be enormous if I drill, but the potential disaster is going to be big as well, unfortunately, if I don't do properly. That's why, again, what I say all the time, practice, 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 right? This one I can do intradurally as well. I can cut the anterior kernel process, particularly if I want to, I'm not going to show you videos, but it will take forever. I'm sure Dr. Zad after me is going to show some video, particularly talking about the approach. But you can see just, for example, this is an aneurysm of the ICA, ICA, sorry, I don't know, the ICA. And if I drill the anterior kernel process, I have a much better exposure and much, much better possibility of placing a clip at this level. All right, so this is very important. Um, posterior craniodectomy is something, again, is we inherited from skull based surgery. Um, it means that basically I can drill the posterior clinoid and I can just get a good visualization of the um, retrocell area. This basically, uh, if I can show you, the this is a typical, um, look, this is a typical intradural visualization 
of course, without any neurovascular structure around. But you can see how the anterior cranial process and the posterior cranial process are going to be my surgical trajectory if my goal is going to be retrocellular, all this area in the, the upper pitrochlival region, right? So if I, for example, look at this drawing, if I put this one in transparency, I can see something that was completely hiding behind the structure before, which is a which is a eye kind of right? So it, that, that shows me like I need to draw this posterior cranial process. I have different way of accessing this one lateral as well, but if I want to go on to lateral for some reason, some, for example, the projection of the aneurys, in that case, I want, I decide that for me, the best approach is anterior lateral, I still need to draw that posterior cranial process. It is again means I need to put a drill in this area. Yeah, if I want to populate this one with structure, here's going to be the ocular motor nerve, here's going to be ICA, here's going to be the optic, right? So I need to go between these structures. So if I open up those corridors I showed you before, I have a much better chance to place a drill and not to not only place a drill, but not to cause any damage around. So this is the main point of just understanding the anatomy and practicing a lot in this structure. The other advantage of taking the orbit the roof of the orbit, as I wanted to mention before, was just by taking this one now, I have a much better unobstructed view. Look at it, particularly because I can incline the microscope, particularly for retro cell area on top of the posterior crown process. Look at the trajectory is very much better uh, just by taking down the roof of the orbit. So I can push on the orbit a little bit, but I I don't need to better push on the orbit and retract the, the temporal and the frontal lobe at this level. So there's again the main concept of using these dissections. Right? Look, if I take in the posterior client, I can get all the way up, almost to the ICA. Now the problem with this one, I won't be able to get completely to the ICA. So if I want to add to this area, so this is only for when I come from anterolateral, I can get only to the upper clivus. When I have something a little bit more inferior than the upper clivus, I need something more lateral. That's what we're going to see somebody now. This is, a, this is something I use a lot with my, with my fellows and residents to understand the anatomy. This is a, a simulation of the microscope, basically. As you can see, I'm, I'm interactive now, real time. Basically, I take down this beautiful anterolateral perspective through an orbital zygomatic. So this is a lateral side. This is this during basically the carotid has been uh, is possible to mobilize, as I was mentioning. This is usually a question resonating with this. this is the ophthalmic artery departing from the carotid. If I was in a live lecture now, I would have quite asked you all these questions. This is the pituitary stop, this is the pituitary gland. So you can see now the posterior kind of process used to be has been taken out. Look what beautiful corridor right here. I have the ocular motor and you have the internal carotid artery. This is the during mobilizing carotid, this optic nerve into the optic canal, which has been on roof. This is the chias, this is the uh, factory nerve. This is the picon, and this is the, the, you can see this side is the, the basal tip with the spread branching out. You can see the PCA, basically this P1, this P1, this SCA, SCA, P1, P2, picon, basal tip. So you have beautiful view, the entire cell, pretty cell, this is no obstruction. This is a little exaggerated, of course, because this is on a cadaver. But the concept is I take the anterior client, the posterior client, and mobilize the structure. I have a beautiful, a beautiful exposure of the entire cell, pericella, paracella, retrocella. So the entire anterior client, the middle anterior fossa, a part middle mid fossa as well, a part of the posterior fossa, particularly the upper pitrochlival region. In it. So now if you want to go, uh, the, the, the problem now we've seen, there's a limit for the orbital zygomatic. Sorry. The limit of the orbital zygomatic is that I, I cannot go too down in the petroclival region, posterior force, I have some limit. Limit is done by the limit of the posterior cranial ectum. So if I have a, a lesion which is a little bit more inferior, I need to use a more lateral approach. That's what we're going to use now. We're going to use either anterior, we're going to consider, or we're going to see the anterior uh, transtemporal, posterior transtemporal, or the combined one. That gives me much better exposure to the inferior portion of the clivus and the entire petroclival region, cerebral upon the angle, perimesencephalic, brainstem, 
So this all everything lateral from anterior to posterior, basically almost all cryos. The only limit I have in this one is the jugular bulb, which is at this level. So everything below the jugular bulb, but I need to use something a little bit more inferior, right? So let's see the difference. That's a nice animation to show you the difference between the, the, the two. For example, this orbital zygomatic trajectory, anterolateral, this basically is basal artery with the clios, this is the old clios, right? So now I have many options. I can go from anterolateral, or I can go in the same region, look at this orbital zygomatic, this is the trajectory of the orbital zygomatic, or I can go to the same region laterally, so transpetrosal, whether I use anterior pedrosal, or serial pedrosal, translap, transcochlear, but giving me a much shorter trajectory, much, much more direct. The only problem is that if I have an annulus, for example, is pointing, pointing laterally, if I come from lateral, the first thing I encounter is the annulus. So I have no surgical control. So in that case, I would prefer to go anterolateral, right? So by in, order, in order to do that, I need to have more eggs in my basket. It means I need to understand all this approach. I don't need to be, that's the message I give to the young guys. I don't need to be conditioned in an approach just because I only know, I only master that trajectory. That's why the, we go back to the initial guidelines and suggestion. Be humble, trying to learn and not, don't tell the patient this is the best, no, this is the best approach I know. So instead of being, having to do that, just learn how to do everything when you're young, right? So you have more options and then you decide which one is better. I'm going to tell you which one is better, but you decide on your own. But it's good to have more eggs. So for example, here, I can go from lateral, I can go from anterior. Lateral. That's the old point. Let's see a little bit technical aspect of the sub approach. Uh, it's useful for, uh, for aneurysm or the basal teeth um, at the level of the posterior cranial process. It, the problem with the, the simple subtemporal approach, I cannot go, I have basically the same kind of exposure as far as petrocella as the anterolateral because I have the petrous ridge and I'm going to show why. I'm a petrous ridge on my trajectory, so I'm not going to see too much inferior to the petrous ridge. But it's very good for aneurysm on the basal teeth, particularly if it's a high riding basal teeth. And also for neoplasm cysts and vascular malformation involved the territorial notch, the medial temporal lobe, or lateral aspect of the mesencephalon. Right? Surgical position, I, this is my preference. I always use a pad, a gelatin pad on this side, trying to lift a little bit the shoulder. Um, and then I, I turn that on the other side, the vertex down again. It's very important position because although the is uh, the, the head is elevated as so uh, compared to chest, but still vertex down because here yeah, I want to temporal lobe manipulation. It causes a lot of troubles, a lot of trouble, a lot of post-operative complication. That's why a lot of times, although this approach is technically very simple, a lot of surgery around the world, you'd be surprised, they don't do it because the potential complication rate. So you can avoid this one by a good positioning, taking chance of good the gravity, show the temporal lobe would fall back, good arachnoid dissection, and cutting the tentorium, just all this, this maneuver will, uh, will uh, grant you a little bit more exposure and less need for brain retraction. And basically, there is different, again, I don't want to be dogmatic, you, know, uh, you don't have to do this approach like this, this skin incision, this is very simple. Most of the time, because now I use a lazy ass, so just don't, don't disregard it, it's just for understanding basically the anatomy, the topographic anatomy. But usually what I do, I do a linear incision behind the hairline at this level. I don't do this much. I mean, uh, because they go for obvious cosmetic reasons. Right? But I, I just want you to grab the concept of the anatomy of the topography at this level. So basically, the most important thing to just uh, facilitate the, your goal or less brain attraction is to go as flush as possible with middle fossa with the bone flap, right? So I start with a single burrow, I go all the way down. I try to be as flush as possible the base. So I don't have to chew any extra bone at the end, particularly for cosmetic purposes, but, but mostly because I want to make sure that I don't need to retract that temporal lobe too much. Oh, sorry.
So you can see now the borders actually begin to this one. This is shown with the Excel, with the Ranger. Usually I use a drill just to go as flat, as flush as possible because my the Dura opening, I just want to be as flush. Look, I open the Dura, trying to be. Now this, where you really want to make sure you angle the microscope properly because this spatula, although you still need some amount of the retraction, but you want to minimize it. So positioning, bone resection until the end, um, angle of the microscope, and then finally we cut the arachnoid. The arachnoid the section is very important. Remember, in this case, the vein or bay in here. And then you just you protect the vein or bay with the absorbable gelatin sponge. And um, um, you can use the other, the other option, the other precision you can use is a lumbar spinal drainage and uh, manitol just because you want to shrink the brain and trying to, again, always to uh, minimize brain attraction. The arachnoid in size is usually a, a number 11 uh, blade knife. The other thing is important while you cut the arachnoid to identify the ocular motor name, the trochlear name. And again, I don't go in detail because it sounds more like a surgical course kind of thing, but it's, this is very important. It seems, sounds very simple, but to avoid complication, really want to understand the early in surgery to understand what the optimal model and the trochlear nerve are going to be because the relationship of the trochlear and the tentorium and the triage tentorium is peculiar. So when you're going to manipulate that level, there's very high chance to cause some complication, right? So knowledge of anatomy is extremely important. And now you can see the edge of the tentorium is tucked uh, lateral to the floral middle cranial fossa with the, in this case, with the inter an interrupted suture. Uh, and the stitch of the entorium is placed anterior, uh, anterior to the trochlear nerve, right? Uh, which you need to identify properly because it runs just alongside the entorium. And uh, the, this, you can see the trochlear nerve, the entorium, so this is anterior to the trochlear, and the ocular motor nerve is used as a landmark for orientation. This is the right side, so I can see very quickly because this, uh, the, the ocular motor nerve is anterior to the trochlear. Now, the anterior prodosis is the same approach as the subtemporal, but the difference is as a, as a, a little bit more inferior. Uh, the, the, the bone flap is exactly the same, but what we're going to do is just cut the petrous ridge, basically, resecting the petrous ridge, which is an obstacle when you're trying to get a lesion there a little bit more inferior. Let's say, for example, a lesion on this side. You can see this is the petrous ridge, so it means the lesion is going on both sides, superior and inferior to the petrous ridge. Basically, that this picture here means that if I'm coming from lateral through a subtemporal projection, I'm going to access everything above the petrous ridge, but everything below the petrous ridge is going to be hiding underneath the, the petrous apex. And a lot of surgeons, what they do, they pull up the lesion, they blindly dissect the inferior lobe, and then eventually they don't really and they don't really can see the relation between the inferior lobe of the lesion and the ICA, for example, or the, the sixth nerve, which is underneath, is running on the brainstem uh, from medial to lateral, from inferior to superior that level. So what you want to do is just cutting the petrous apex, basically. So just to make sure, to show you a little bit better. So basically, when I do a subtemporal, I come from this trajectory. So I have a good exposure of the upper clivus, upper petroclival region. But if a lesion is a little bit more inferior, I have this, this petrous apex on my trajectory, right? So I need to get rid of it. That's why anterior petrosectomy. Um, is it simple? It's not very simple because, again, it needs a lot of training because of the, the temporal bone is particularly packed up with, in, with a neurovascular structure inside. And you need to drill that bone, make sure that you spare the structure. You need to pass by the structure. So that needs a lot of training in there. In the lab and courses and stuff like that. That's why I'm trying to stimulate your interest. You know? uh, there are a lot of lesions that can, be, can benefit from a transpedosa, acoustic neuroma, meningioma, metastasis, neuroma. There's many of them. I'm not going to list all of them, just two examples. But you can see a difference. Uh, and again, it, this is a good picture from the Jack Atlas. You know, the difference be going all the way to a retro seat, all the way down to the clivus, but I still have some, some, uh, some, some obstacle, right? The problem is you need a good confidence with drill. Now, that's what uh, uh, Dr. Evans was emphasizing a lot. That's what we work a lot in the lab, understanding the anatomy first, before 
the guys that do the approaches understand the anatomy. It's not point to do the approach if they don't understand this anatomy. And once you understand thoroughly this anatomy, the approach comes as a consequence because all you have to do, you work around it. Right? It's not simple because extreme confidence, particularly as you can see in this one, the bone is completely common in this side. This is the Petrus apex I was talking about. So it's a piece of bone, but look underneath, you have all this structure underneath. So really you need to, and then basically you need to pass this small corner in here, in this little place, but in order to do that, you need to expose somehow these structures, internal carotid artery, the cochlea. So if I take this one, of course, you understand the disaster. If I take the cochlea, the patient is going to lose the hearing. If I damage the fission nerve, it's going to fission nerve pulses. And this again, the hearing for the vestibular nerve the, and, and then the, the balance and stuff like that. So I need to work in this narrow corridor. And this way of just making better, we do this one in courses. And again, it just goes beyond the, the, the purpose now of this lecture. But for many corner, and then we, I've been using this one, I used this animation when I had more time, when I was working years ago at the borough. Um, I, don't, I don't have time anymore about this, but um, we still use for lecture. And understanding anatomy, I was very, uh, for me, it was very important to understand anatomy from an embryological standpoint, because by knowing this, it would be, be much easier to understand the transition of bone, for example, when you use the drill and stuff like that. In particular, as you can see in this animation, the relation between different area and neighboring structure to avoid bothersome bleeding and stuff like that. This is uh, one other animation I used to use to understand the bone anatomy of the Peter's bone. For example, this is a Peter's bone I can place in any um, orientation. Basically, I put in transparency. But again, transparency allows me, this is left side, allows me to see very well what's underneath the bone, basically, and where to place my drill. And again, we go thoroughly about this one in the courses. And usually my fellows spend an entire week in just doing this approach before they, they, they actually they show me how to. Um, and again, just we, this is the Peter's apex. We work in this angle in this space between, which is medial to the intrapetrous carotid, anterior to the facial nerve, and medial to the cochlea. Basically, you need to identify the structure in order to spare them. And finally, you draw and you take the bone out, and finally, you have a beautiful view of the, once you cut the entorium and open the dura, you have a nice view of the uh, cerebellum pointa in angle, petroglyphal region, all the way from the seventh, you can see. So the limit is below the seven. I cannot go below the seven, my beautiful exposure above the seven and eight. And this is very nice. Uh, uh, I just to show you the progression of that section this is a left side, temporal bone left side. So this middle fossa floor, this is a trigeminal nerve. You can see the progression. You see the carotid, trapezius carotid, uh, GSPN. And finally, you see the internal acoustic canal. And this is the anterior pterosecton. This is the dura, open the dura and get right into the posterior fossa, right? So this is as far as the, the anterior pterosectomy. Let's go now a little briefly, the posterior pterosectomy, translab, transcochlear. Very briefly, only as a concept, basically the trajectory is always the same. So we're still talking about lateral, right? So lateral, but we are now, we go through the mastoid. So we go, this is why posterior pterosectomy. We are a little bit more inferior exposure. So that will overtake that limit, which was everything inferior to seven, eight, I was mentioning before. So the seven, I go below the seven and eight. So we'll be able to see on top and below the seven. So I go all the way from the jugular bulb down here. So the cerebral upon the angle, all the way up to the, exactly what we saw before, up to the, 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 the fifth, mostly the fifth. If I cut tentorium, I'll be above the fifth with su super tentorium. What, what does imply? Translab means I go to the mastoid, basically I drill the mastoid, then I, that's why translabrinthin, I drill the labyrinth. Nowadays, we, let's go back to the, what I was telling before, the initial time which used the skull base surgery. A lot, like 20 years ago, was very popular. Now we work around the labyrinth. It's called conservative lab, perilabyrinthectomy, a perilabyrinthine dissection. That means the result, as a result, I don't lose the hearing. So it's a hearing sparing procedure. The hearing is still in the middle of the trajectory, right? So if I want to do instead the translab, I take the lab and have a beautiful unobstructed view. So basically, if the patient has already lost the hearing, it's a no-brainer, I will just take the labyrinth because I have a beautiful exposure of the petroclival area. No obstacle, no need for the cerebellar retraction, so unobstructed view, right? 
But if I still have the hearing, I don't do this approach. So between the transpetrosal, the one that best allows me to get all the way mid midline is uh, transcochlear because it transports the fissure nerve. I'm going to show you. The, as far as the positioning is going to be the same, I don't like the other option would be a lateral uh, positioning, but I don't like that one because my, the shoulder would be my trajectory. So I like using a gelatin part on one side. It's giving me enough uh, reflection on the other side. Um, enough, again, I'm going from posterior. So the position is very important because I want to be flush and I don't need to use because otherwise the exposure is going to be very limited. So I want to be in this side. So position is very important. And securing the patient to the table is very important because in this surgery, very likely you might need to just rotate the table to enhance your exposure and to make that corner, that angle, which is, looks awkward, but to make it a little bit more successful right, for surgery. So basically implies working around the labyrinth. In the trans lab, I take down the labyrinth. Again, if I have already, the patient lost the hearing, otherwise I work around the labyrinth in a conservative approach, which is going to spare the, the hearing. Otherwise, this is a trans lab. I see the internal acoustic canal. And finally, I can open it. I can enjoy what's inside the internal acoustic canal. You know, the two vestibular nerve are cut. And I hope this is the facial nerve, genicular ganglion. This is the GSPN. This is the, the fallopio canal. And this is going to be the cochlear nerve into the cochlear. And finally, I can enjoy what's inside the cerebellum for the angle. For the angle. Now, look at this. You can see there is no need for retraction just because cerebellum is a, everything is anterior to the uh, sigmoid sinus. The superior limit is the trigeminal, inferior limit 9 and 10, anterior limit is 7 and 8. This is the basal artery. So it's a beautiful approach for the cerebellum point that angle all the way down to the clitoris. But still, you have a 7 and 8 in your trajectory. You can dissect the tumor. Um, to show you some, uh, uh, I just want to accelerate because I need to cover something else. But this is the progression of the trans lab dissection. You can see through the mastoid, this middle fossa dura, this sigmoid sinus, this is the fissure nerve into the fallopio canal, and this is the labyrinth block. Now, at this point, this is the pre sigmoid dura. Now I am into in correspondence or cerebellar point I name or underneath. So if I, if I keep drilling in here, I will lose the hearing. I can keep myself. Peri, that's why we practice a lot to do peri labyrinthine approach, which is sparing the hearing. If I have the same advantage in working around, basically I cut the dura coming across this uh, 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 the uh, endolymphatic sac, coming across the dura, pre sigmoid dura, coming across superior pterodactyl sinus, and cut into the, the infratemporal uh, version of the. So now, for example, the labyrinth here, at this point, labyrinth is not being taken yet. Now it's taken. You can see now this is the space where the labyrinth used to be, much better exposure, but as a result, the price I had to pay is losing the hearing, right? But the beautiful view is completely unobstructed view. So if I, the, the hearing is already lost because of the lesion, this is the best approach for the cerebellar point of animal because I don't need any retraction whatsoever. This is the flocculus, seven and eight, the fifth. And you can see here underneath this piece of dura is going to be the, the, Nine and, nine and ten, yeah. So glass pharyngeal and vagus underneath it, right? So basically, transparency, that's why I call X-ray vision. You, a good surgeon need to practice this, understanding where <clears throat> all structures are underneath the bone. Look at these old structures. And, and uh, you can see now it's beautiful and obstructed you all the way down to the cerebral point that angle. But you can see exactly where everything is. That's why you have to achieve by possibly working with the cadaver on that, or it's difficult to get this one on a patient. I, I mean, I would definitely not encourage to allow them. The transcochlear means, again, this is something we used to do a lot before, and I used to do a lot myself, uh, because in, when I was working in, in consulting in South America, in different countries, there were ENT at that time were not doing uh, any transcochlear, so I had to do I was facing a lot of uh, I was facing a lot of uh, big large scalp based lesion, so I had to to do this one myself. That's why I practice a lot to do transcochlear, and this means transposing the patient nerve out of the way basically. Nowadays, it's very rarely is used. I hardly use it anymore. Just when I'm really dealing with something in particular, total pretrosectomy, 
And pie is a beautiful approach because once you displace the fission layer and you're, the prize you may have some pulse you the fission layer, particularly the beginning when you're not very, you know, very experienced, may as you experience it, you practice more, the chances of get some complication get less and less and less. Basically the concept is lifting the trochlear, the fission layer from the fallopter canal all the way to the genicular ganglion and finally cutting the GSPN, freeing the genicular ganglion and uh, transposing posteriorly the, the entire fission nerve, as you can see. Now I finally have the cochlea, so I cut the cochlea, that's why I transcochlea, and then I die, it gives me a beautiful exposure all the way down to the basal artery. So you can see there's no obstruction whatsoever, as opposed to the translab, which I have the fission nerve in the middle. So my superior limit now is the trigemina as before, the inferior limit is nine and 10, I have no limit anteriorly. So I can work with two hands, no brain retraction, Everything is immediate exposure. Right? And basically, the dissection is exactly the same as translab up to a point in which now is the difference. Look, now I dislodge genicular ganglion, I transpose the fissure nerve posteriorly, and I go in this corridor all the way immediate to the trapezius carotid. You can see this is inferior pedrosa, superior pedrosa, basilar plexus, and go all the way down to the basilar. And the point is just transposing out of the way the fish on that. Look, just by doing that, I can work with two hands all the way. So this is a beautiful approach. And again, if you already lost the hearing, if you got or total it was actually, it's definitely an incredible approach to go all the way down to the, to the basilar and to the, to the clios, mid portion clios. This is the sixth nerve, which is coming along the brainstem, getting to the, the Dorellos canal. And again, this anatomy is very important to understand in order to be able to do this. And we see this is a typical aneurysm. Well, this is done, I, I did it, sorry, this is done many years ago, and it basically gives you an unobstructed view of the, nowadays a better, better option to do this one, but just in case, it's a good egg to have in your basket, just in case, those few cases which you really need, there's no other alternative, it's good to know how to do it. But again, there's no use in it. Now it's been very much replaced by this approach, which is a combined, supra infrantorial subtemporal pre sigmoid trans it's a lot of names basically what it means i combine the trans mastoid which we done the posterior petrosectomy with the anterior petrosectomy or with this just a subtemporal and instead of cutting the labyrinth i keep the labyrinth in place i work around the labyrinth the only difference i cut the entorium. so basically i go infradentorium supra dentorium right so if i want to project this one on a skull, basically this is the approach. The blue one, you can see this is the way I'm outlining now. So basically I combine the posterior pedrosectomy with the subtemporal, and I can do even anterior pedrosectomy if I want. And the only thing I work around the difference with the posterior pedrosectomy, I leave the labyrinth in place. So I, I spare, the, I spare the, the hearing, right? So the position is exactly the same. The only thing is extending anteriorly. I can do the skin incision in different. I don't want to be dogmatic. Don't take this as a dogma. This is just the orientation. But this I can be doing this one in different. As long as I respect the anatomy of the skin and the, uh, the vascularization. Look, this day, once you encompass both, you can see the posterior fossa, retro sigmoid, and this the temporal lobe in the infra -tem I mean the temporal temporal lobe here in on the subtemporal. Um, trajectory. And then exactly what I said, look at mastoid approach, leaving intact the labyrinth. And then I can combine with anterior pedosectomy, which you've already seen before, but the only difference basically, look, I leave the labyrinth intact, right? Leave the labyrinth in here, I do pre sigmoid subtemporal. And I can get like, this is the dura cut pre sigmoid subtemporal, the labyrinth is still there. So I, I open the dura in this way, crossing the superior pedrosa sinus. And you can see the beautiful and obstructed view. That's a nice view, the labyrinth is still here. So the patient you know, hypothetically is still, uh, the, the hearing is intact. I can see from just to orient the anatomy, this is uh, up to here is sub. Tentor, infratentorial is supratentorial, this is the fifth nerve, seven and eight, nine and 10, 11, six nerve down there. So this is a supratentorial compartment with the fourth. And uh, this is the ICA, SCA, 
in this the fifth, which is the fifth is the cutoff for supra intradentorial compartment. So everything inferior to the fifth is intradentorial, supradentorial. The dura is open all around. This you can see the supradentorial compartment is the trigeminal. This is the, the, the relation between the, the three edge, the dentorium, and the fourth. This is the, the ocular motor nerve. This is the, the dura incision. Like I see, this is a, it's very nice to see this. Uh, uh, it's missing the first one, but this is a, the, the dura incision is coming from the posterior compartment into the anterior trajectory. As you can see, it goes all the way down to the inferior pupillar sinus. And once it's open, you can see the entire uh, cerebellar pontine angle with the infra supradentorial compartment all the way to the clivus. So this is a beautiful approach, which is spared the light brain so that the, the, the one is mostly common. You, why I use this a lot of time for a petroclival lesion, other than using any more uh, invasive approach. Now let's see a little bit more the posterior fossa. Now we go a little bit more posterior. Uh, so basically, for exposure are most important. Basically, we have the uh, midline approaches, supra cerebella, which is the one posterior. We're going to consider this one separately. Then we have exposure to the fourth ventricle, upper brainstem, pineal region. Uh, <clears throat> plus, we have the lateral suboccipital approaches, which is this one that goes to cerebellar point and angle. And then we have the, the upper lateral suboccipital. This is the extreme lateral supracerebellar approach, which is called a little bit more lateral, right? So we go all the supra cerebellar infradentorial which is this, the projection on the median and paramedian. This is supracerebellar infradentorial, which is extreme lateral. This is suboccipial, lateral suboccipial or retrosigmoid, which is different modification. I'm going to go through all this modification. It'll take two days to, work the, to, to talk about all the approaches, right? Or it's synthesized a little bit. And this is the midline suboccipial approach for any lesion on the a fourth ventricle, posterior for an magnum and stuff like that. So now we're considering the posterior fossa approach. So basically we are closing the circle as far as posterior. Um, and as you can see in here, the approach is basically we're going to consider are going to be the retrosigmoid, which is the most popular, which has different modification will be upper retrosig, middle retrosig, inferior retrosig, or the entire retrosigmoid, which can be called as well suboccipital, lateral suboccipital. We're going to consider the foramen magnum lesion more inferior to the retro -seek, which is going to be the far lateral, and the old supracerebellar inflammatory approach, which is uh, the median, uh, midline, the median, paramedian, and lateral approaches, right? The retro sigma is extremely popular. Um, and again, it's been, as I mentioned before, has been replacing the midline suboxial approach, which used to be used a lot before for accessing lesion, which was even not only for the posterior foramen magnum, but also for lesion where more lateral and more anterior in the foramen magnum aimed to the cerebral point angle. So now can you imagine the long surgical route? That's why this is much more feasible, much better, much less retraction of the cerebellum. It still has a lot of limitation. Indication of pontine cover normal, pike aneurysm. Uh, SCA aneurysm, uh, CPA tumor, uh, microvascular decompression on the five and seven, foramen magnum lesion, particularly with C1 laminectomy. Right? Limitation uh, is the, the limit imposed by the imposed by the working angles, right? But the working angles big old, particularly if you want to go all use this trajectory to go all the way down to the petrochlioral region to the clios. You need to work in between the cranial nerves and you need to push posteriorly, medially a lot, the cerebellar hemisphere. That's why, and then you end up working on the like brainstem as well. So if you want to go to anterior, uh, it's objectable, although a lot of people use it and they master this trajectory. Uh, I, I'm not a strong advocate to use it, uh, this approach for anything anterior to seven, eight. Um, and the endoscope, again, um, they still, it, it, it can extend the, the limit of the microscopic view, but it's still there's some limits in the exposure for anything anterior. Um, the setup of the eye is going to be a little different. Of course, it will be the, the assistant because you are behind the patient, the assistant is going to be on the other side. So it's like kind of specular what we're seeing because it's a lateral um, position. Uh, this one I was, uh, I was mentioning as I learned from the 
from Spezia because he puts he, he uses the same lateral position, make sure that uh, this is very important uh, the position in this case because we have unobstructed view coming from posterior and you want to keep the head in a neutral position because you don't have any you don't want to have any venous engorgement, particularly the venous oozing is very troublesome to just uh, um, to just um, uh, um, um, overtake, right? So it's always trying to make this one the head as, as neutral as possible. And usually where I put the, 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 the arm on underneath the table now, just to avoid brachial plexus injury at this level and to be able to rotate the head a little bit better without having to a, too much of an angle in uh, rotation on the other side. So basically, you know, wrapping properly the patient to the, to the table or our table. And this again, what I use now, I put uh, the, the arm underneath instead of wrapping like this. So that's the only difference from this uh, modified park bench. Landmarks are very important because you really want to project on the surface the asterion, which is going to be very likely the your transition between transverse sinus and sigmoid sinus. And that's why you want to use, uh, is your limit to your crani uh, craniotomy using a single burrow. So the more you know, and the more you master the projection, the deep landmark on the surface, the more successful you're going to be your bone flap. And you're going to be, because particularly at the beginning, your tendon is going to be so mad than you. If you, a lot of times you miss the bone flap, it, it happens this all the time, you'll be surprised, even in some more experienced surgeon. But that's a, a moment of experience of your, the more you understand and the knowledge of the anatomy, you really understand that you, and some patients are different from each other, but with experience, you understand the bony landmarks change according to some, uh, some anthropological feature of the patient. Some patients have different bone, for example, if I find this one to be inferior, I know that the dura is going to be all inferior. So everything is going to be changed when I do these approaches. You need to look at the patient. You need to, nothing has to be uh, underestimated. Everything has to be carefully look at any landmark because it tells you that the, the, is a language. You're basically, the landmarks are going to tell you a lot of what's going to happen how to avoid any complication. So basically what you use, use a lazy, a lazy S. So again, I don't want to um, go too much to a skin incision. Everybody's got their own, it doesn't matter what you use as long as you have a good exposure of the bone. And look at this is a single pore hole which is going to skirt the sigmoid, sigmoid sinus anteriorly. And possibly you want to reach, particularly if you go with the full retro sigmoid, you want to reach the junction between uh, transverse sinus and sigmoid sinus, uh, particularly if you want to go up superiorly. You don't have to, but just in case, I'm just considering now the entire retro sigmoid uh, perspective, right? The dura opening, different fashion. You can do anterior, you can do posterior, but basically the idea is just have an unobstructed view on the cerebellum upon the particular, the lateral cerebellum upon the angle. You see the dura has been stuck anteriorly. And now you have beautiful exposure. The only disadvantage, again, this is a beautiful approach for anything which is lateral cerebellum on The only disadvantage, if you want to go anterior to 7 and 8, you have to work in within this cranial nerves, and you need to retract a lot of retraction of the uh, cerebellum surface. Right? So this is the only disadvantage. That's why I would do something different for purely um, um, petrochemical lesion, which is anterior to 7 and 8. And this is a typical anatomy. You saw this one in any rotten dissection, which is a beautiful dissection, a beautiful publication. And again, I would strongly emphasize this is a good for a, it's a good starting point, but you need just to appreciate this one in a real thing, right? So basically, hopefully, the gold gold standard should be cadaver. Unfortunately, now with this with climate, with this problem with the virus, now we have to stop our course. And hopefully, we can reestablish soon. We have a major program, of course, at Cornell that we do, we go through basic approaches, complex approaches, basic neurosurgery, We've been very successful the last 10 years now. We do at least uh, six, seven courses a year, basically. So you are more than uh, encouraged just to go on our website for any, any educational activity we do. But look, look at you can see the cerebral pocket angle, you see nine and 10, seven and eight, you can see the ICA and the bike branching out and looping at this level, you see the car plexus. And this is very beautiful anatomy once you really approach properly. Again, exposure is obvious. It makes a huge difference. Understanding particularly what's going on into internal acoustic canal, because at one point, if the lesion is getting, is insinuating inside the canal, you might need to expose that canal. You cannot do all the way down to the fundus if you come retrosigmoid, because it means you are going to, if you go to the fundus, it means I, you lose the hearing. 
because you need to go through the lab length. So there is some limitation as much as you can drill on the uh, posterior wall of the canal and, uh, and you need to stop the canal delusivity. Microvascular decompression use the same kind of approach, but the idea is just that you manage to avoid the conflict between the vessel and the, the, the fifth nerve or the fissure nerve, which is a hemifacial spasm, basically. And the same trajectory, same exposure allows you, once you open properly the arachnoid, the open the cisterna magna, you have a brain relaxation, you open up. The idea is always, of course, to minimize brain retraction, right? And uh, open up and use less spatula as possible. The other thing is opening properly, spending all the time in training yourself, opening the arachnoid, because that open arachnoid would reveal beautifully by magic all the anatomy underneath, right? So never over overemphasize how to uh, how important just to uh, meticulously open the arachnoid, they open up those spaces. And now we got pyga aneurysm, same thing we can do with retro sigmoid. Now, when it comes for this pyga, I would rather do a different approach. It comes after, which is the far lateral. Because now, for any approach which goes a little bit more inferior to the foramen magnum, I had to use a, an approach which goes a little bit more inferior. Look, now I can show it here. So, this is the territory of the, if I was using the retro sigmoid posteriorly, now if I had to go a little bit more posteriorly, inferior, and then I had to involve the foramen magnum. For example, pike aneurysm is uh, for a magnum lesion. And I don't want to go in details because I can combine this one for other skull based approaches for lesion at that level. Right? So, um, so this one is, uh, let's consider the for lateral. For lateral, uh, a lot of people, I mean, you, you hear a lot in your practice whether it's important to take the condyle or it's not. The jugular tubercle is not you know, needed. There's so much publication out there. People trying to to be to be smart, you know, I would strongly advise young residents to learn how to do everything. Just understand the condyle, understand the advantage of taking part of the condyle, only part of the condyle. Understand the advantage of taking a jugular tobacco because that will go, once you need it, those, those few times you need it, you're going to thank for the time you spend learning how to do it. Forget people tell you you don't need it. It doesn't matter. Eventually you're never going to need it, only a few times. And when you need, it's going to make your life much easier. So don't listen to people say, don't worry about it. The, that's what I'm talking about, modified park bench with the arm underneath the table to avoid brachial plexus injury. As far as the skin, this uh, angulation of flexion, uh, there's so many different things. I don't want to go to too much now, but landmarks are very important again, because you need to go all the way down to the foramen magnum. Uh, you don't want to have a position which is completely give you an obstructive view all the way down to the anterolateral brain stem and the foramen magnum. So these are all important. What I identify in four points with my resident the fellows, what's very important in the approach, identify the vertebral artery, amylaminectomy, which is taking the lamina because you want to go with the dura opening all the way down to C2. Learning how to take the only partial condyle, only a little bit, just enough not to destabilize the patient. I don't want to bring back the patient to st for stabilization, so I do my best not to destabilize the patient. And so I have to learn how to do it and how to resect the jugular tubercle. This jugular tubercle is something insignificant anatomically because it's only three, four, five, six millimeters, but technically is a challenge because immediately medial to the jugular tubercle is going to be nine and 10 and 11. So if you make a mistake, you can cause a trouble. It's technically, it's very simple, but the, the chance of complication is very high. A lot of people are going to tell you, you really don't need it. Believe me, just learn how to do it. it will take, even if you need only a few times, particularly if you end up doing vascular surgery, you will go after, for example, a, 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 a aneurysm, vertebral base aneurysm, which is very medial and giant. It's not possible to embolize for any reason. If you don't take that jugular tobacco, you'll have troubles. You know? Uh, learning the muscles are very important. Muscle layer, never, big, but in, in surgery, you're never going to identify a single muscle, like superficial layer, the middle layer, deep layer. But this one is very good to understand to avoid complication because once you close, you want to just really stitch a single layer with the, the one corresponding. That's why I avoid a lot of complication. I see a lot of this complication. The CSF leak and in the wound is very, is very, I mean, the, it really conditions success of your, your, your job. This one is very important, deep layer, rectus cavus, posterior smiles, and oblique, superior oblique, to identify, which is 
summoning the suboccipital tremor, which is summoning the, the resin, the fear a lot, because particularly when you are faced in, your, in surgery, in doing a far lateral approach, you don't ever know where the vertebral artery is going to be, and you don't want to injure the vertebral artery, the vertebrae, the, the spectrum, right? So there is a, a lot of way, we do this one in the courses a lot in the lab, how to identify the safest way using landmarks, particularly this muscle. Look, this is superior bleed, and then it's going to hide in what's very important, the atlantoxifial junction. This is the field oblique, which tells me where the lamina of C1 is going to be, together with the C2 ganglion and together with the, the birth on top of the sucrose arteriosus. And this rectus cavitus posterior minor is going to tell me the limit of the, the craniotomy all the way down to foramen magnum. And once I do the amylaminectomy, all the way down to C2. So all this muscle, they're telling me if I identify this one in a cadaver first, and then in patient, I know how to distinguish. They're going to tell me exactly what's going on. And even this muscle rectus cavity is telling me where the jugular foramen is going to be. So anatomy is very, very important. And again, it's not just the book anatomy, but in Israeli anatomy. So this is the, look, amenaminectomy, the dura flap, the dura, the craniotomy, go all the way down to the foramen magnum. And then once I take the C1, I go all the way down to C2 with the dura opening. And then finally, when I open dura, this different fashion opening dura, Usually I use a, a little bit more anterior to the skirting the, the sigma sinus. I make a dura cuff around the bird so I can close everything back when I open and have a very nice unobstructed view. So unobstructed view all the way to the anterolateral portion of the brainstem. This is going to be the, the condyle and the jugular tubercle is going to be at that level as well. So when I open the dura and I cut the arachnoid um, and I have a beautiful unobstructed view, you can see or to see if I position the patient properly, if I use a proper microscope, angulation on the microscope, I have a nice view. And sometimes, particularly the tumor is pushing, it's making a corridor, uh, and I don't need to use a spatula. There is no need most of the times if you're done properly. If you're flush, you're taking a little bit of condyle, only the posterior third, so not to destabilize that patient. And then plus I choose, I close with in a water type function. function. The midline, um, Midline approach is going to be particularly, we don't use anymore, as I was mentioning, for more anterior approach, particularly for foramen, for seroforamen magnum, for uh, fourth ventricle, and, and for, uh, for example, Chiari malformation. All these approaches can be, can, only lesion can be approached with, the, with midline uh, suboxidium. Now there is different seating position, which is a very, uh, in theory, is a good position. A lot of surgeons use it. I don't particularly favor it, just my own, I don't use it because I, I don't like being, uh, being tired with my hands, particularly if they work for a long time, pineal, particularly for pineal lesion. And another thing, because venous embolism, air embolism, and that's a very bad complication as well. Prone position, I usually don't use, I use mostly the modified park bench, ladder of the cubitus, or very popular is the prone position as well. Skin incision in midline goes all the way from the um, torque all the way down to the C2, C3, and according to what you after to, you know, if you have lesion on the fourth ventricle or for decompression, for serial decompression, for a Chiari malformation and stuff like that. In, uh, for a pineal, of course, you go a little bit more superior. Um, the dura incision, dura opening is, uh, uh, is important that you be able to control the arachnoid once you open the arachnoid. Is much better, uh, is good exposure. And then closure, usually for the carry malformation, for example, um, if after I decompress the tonsil, the tonsils, and um, and the floor of the fourth ventricle, and, um, and then you inspect the orbex, you see the floor of the ventricle, you make sure everything is okay, and you can put a loose, uh, very loose dura graft, which is sewn in place in a wide water type fashion. Right? Uh, there are some options for the graft that will include, for example, fascia lata with harvest from the leg, or you can use a bovine or cadaver dura graft, or even possibly a pericranium. Um, usually, it's difficult to obtain a piece of pericranium which is large enough to cover the entire, the entire dura opening for this particular operation, uh, but you know, it's possible. But it's good, particularly if you need to decompress, usually put a dura flap at this level. Yeah. 
Now, this approach is to the pioneer region. Um, you, in order to get to the pioneer region, you can use infratentorial uh, or supratentorial uh, uh, surgical corridor. Infratentorial, we have the infratentorial supracerebellar. Supratentorial, we have the suboccipital transtentorial, which is the most popular. But again, also the posterior transcarosal, transcortical, transventricular, the subtemporal. But the most useful supranentorial is suboccipital transentorial. So basically, as I've shown you before, these are the major approaches, right? So uh, the, the skin, the bone flap, skin flap is pretty much overlapping for the supra cerebellar infradentorial. Suboccipital is a little bit more superior, and then we go, you go underneath the medial to occipital lobe, and you go through the entorium to get to the pineal gland. Whereas with this one, you go through the midline and the super divide dividing medium, paramedian, and, uh, and lateral. Um, the venous anatomy, I know it's very important to understand the venous anatomy. I don't, I'm, going, I'm, not, I'm not going to spend too much time because I, won't, I don't have time, but this is extremely important to understand uh, the anatomy at this level, uh, particularly when you, when you need to open uh, all the way down to the pineal gland region. Uh, this is a typical skin incision for a uh, suboccipital transcendorial. This beautiful view in, in projection. Uh, this is a May, the Atlas made my mayor. Yeah, this is a nice view in projection on the, uh, the tentorium. And you can see once I open this to be the skin, the skin flap and the bone flap, uh, skirting the superior side of the sinus at this level. And a lifting a little bit the occipital lobe. Uh, now, in this case, when you do a sitting position, it, it, you don't have the advantage of the gravity because basically the occipital lobe is going to be uh, pushing on the tensorium, right? Whereas if you go inferior to that, the sitting position is going to be more advantageous because the cerebellum is going to go down because, because you want to go in between the cerebellum and the tensorium, right? So that's the advantage and disadvantage of the two surgical position. Uh, when I go through trans-occipital, I need to pull up a little bit the occipital lobe and uh, push a little bit more lateral because I need to expose the tent, the tentorial, tentorium at this level, this cut tentorium, that's why trans I get all the way down to the pineal gland. So basically that's your move. Uh, you cut, look, you push lateral and superiorly the occipital lobe, cut tentorium, and you go and you access the, the pineal region. Uh, the corpus goes with displays a little bit if you need it, but you have a good exposure, particularly the lesion, they involve the pineal region, pineal gland or region or tetral region, but they go a little bit more superior. That should be, instead of going from inferior cut tentorium, particularly if the extension is mostly supradentorial, I would prefer this one as opposed to the other one if you have mostly infradentorial, sometimes only a little component supradentorial, I would use the infradentorial supracerebellum. So basically these are the, the supracerebellum infradentorial, as I mentioned before, this one median, paramedian, lateral, extreme lateral, these are the major approaches uh, we've seen before already. And this is a nice view, uh, for example, I could see more all these approaches uh, uh, in the same traje different trajectory. So I have the median. This one I have a, I had more time when doing my fellowship to do all these animation. They, they work, I was working a lot in this. But this is a median, paramedian, and the extreme lateral. Basically, the trajectory is different according to what you have to do. So basically, the tetra region, the colliculi, you can see if I have something in the middle line. I will go from particularly infradentorial, I'll go to a median approach. If I go a little bit more lateral, I'll go to paramedian. And an extreme lateral is something in the perimesencephalic system. Basically, this one will be pretty much corresponding to the retrocycle, a little bit more superior and more posterior. And this one can be even uh, enhanced with a tentorial cutting. So either I can go, I can go even supradentorial or infradentorial, cutting the tentorium to join the two compartments, super inflammatory. So this is a very nice approach for lateral place lesion or lateral brain stem. Look at this, a very nice view of the, the entire option, the low option. And this, the dura cut is pretty much the same as the midline suboccipital, a little bit more superior, 
because you are and that's the one for the uh, from uh, paramedian and extreme lateral. This is the sitting position, which I don't favor, although in theory, technically, is very good because the cerebellar hemispheres are falling down, falling down in a way that you open properly because it gives you a little more space, super cerebellar underneath the ventorium. But because of the other complication, because of the awkward position of my arms, uh, my deltoids are going to uh, complain. So I always, I try, I use always a lateral uh, approach, modify. Bringy main, cut the bringy main, understanding the anatomy is, again, it's, it's difficult. It, it, there should be like a lecture only on anatomy of this approach. Uh, but the main point is taking the anatomy. Um, and uh, under magnification of the microscope, uh, the surgeon extends the dissection deeper towards the precentral vein, basically. And it's basically, you need to put a retractor most of the times there, just a single retractor over the roof of the cerebellum. And uh, you can see the precentral vein basically is uh, uh, unsheathed and by arachnoid and extend, extend to the gallium, the vein of gallium. gallium. Um, there are many tributaries to the uh, precentral vein. And this vein could be, should be cauterized and divided in order to be able to just gain access a little bit more inferior, I mean, uh, deeper. Uh, and finally, we have tumor exposure. You can see this is always a sitting position, but you can see the cerebellum is you know, lower. You can push it a little bit less than you should in a different position. If you have a very direct unexposed, and unobstructed exposure all the way down to the point by near prime. And as you can see, the final exposure after tumor resection, basically. Um, as far as cortical, uh, I think we're just uh, uh, um, cortical. Uh, something I usually, um, uh, because I, I, I mostly do skull veins and muscular, but after you've done technically, of course, and much easier. Uh, the problem is uh, uh, localized lesion, which sometimes might be particular lesion, a metastatic lesion, which uh, there are no surface, it will be difficult. If you don't use, but well now nowadays with the proper tools and neuro navigation, before with stereotaxis, now neuro navigation, uh, echography, ultrasound is much easier to identify, and uh, that allows to uh, create the least complication possible, at the least corticotomy possible. You choose the right surface, so the complications are much less. Um, the position, um, too good position on the lateral decubitus position with the head parallel to the floor and the supine position with the head straight up. Both of these positions are helpful in surgical orientation. If the lateral decubitus position is chosen, it is important as, as in any other approach to make sure that the neck is not over rotated. That's why I always use a place towers or blanket, blankets under the shoulder and to relieve the tension on the neck. So this is very important. Keep in mind when you do a surgical position to make sure that you um, you 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 consider taking count all this uh, this possible complication. Uh, the dura, I mean, it's typical. The dura is stuck to the margin of the 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 the, the bone flap, and uh, neuro navigation is very important now because it helps to minimize the size of the craniotomy and the brain exposure. Um, sometimes the exact location of the precentral gyrus usually is not clear. And so the, it's, it's very advisable to use somatosensory evoke potential monitoring. And these are very useful to identify the central sulcus. Um, I don't want to, I don't get into detail of the different, uh, you know, different electrodes, like in this case, A, B, and C, they are, they are going to be placed, one on the precentral gyrus, one is the central sulcus, and the other one is the post-central gyrus. But this one, in, in an alternative, this one will be mapping uh, with direct electrical stimulation on the cerebral cortex. Nowadays, it's, very, it's much easier than before to identify, before it was just a clinical and a visual feedback. Now it's much easier to identify the uh, functional eloquent cortex, just trying to, to do the least damage possible, right? Um, other than that, technically, I mean, going through the sulco, identify the sulco, then getting to the lesion and then do a deep walking is uh, as opposed to what, we did, what we've seen so far as the technicality is much easier 
is just understanding and ends up uh, to the experience of a surgeon distinguish the normal tissue from uh, pathology you know and but it's very important understanding uh, i mean using the neural navigation particularly to avoid to do further damage to the cortex and so the convexity uh, is, is i mean neural navigation makes this localization much easier nowadays um, now let's do a, a little bit of um, just to close the circle basically let's do some uh, uh, how to how to approach let's see how we approach the ventricles um they are de depend of course the, what kind of ventricle what, what uh, um if it's the body of the ventricle third ventricle lateral ventricle um there would be different organization mostly what we use is usually always the interhemispheric approach or the transcortical approach one is a, is a more advantage compared to the other vice versa because i honestly when I can, I always use the interhemispheric transcalosal uh, if I can, uh, instead of transcortical, for obvious reasons, try not to transgress the cortex, which always can carry some potential complication of particular uh, seizures. Landmarks is very important. Um, for example, this is a standard coronal section through the brain and level of the foramen magnum. And then you can see the relation between the fornix this is very important, the fornix and the core plexus at this level uh, with the, with the foramen morum. The, uh, the, the corona picture, uh, the corona section, you can see is showing the relation of the corona suture, which is very important to understand this relation, to the lateral ventricle and the foramen morum. So there's always this kind of fixed relation, which is very, very important, particularly if you do a transcortical because you really want to manipulate that cortex as least as possible but this is something we have we all familiar because particularly for placing external ventricular drainage to understand how to identify the body of the ventricle from the uh, cortical projection skin projection ventricular anatomy uh, this again i mean there's no place inside the brain of course where anatomy is not very important and we as a neurosurgeon should be extremely familiar with all this anatomy this obviously goes without saying i'm not going to spend any more time because i'll take a different lecture to do that uh, and actually my fellows spend a lot of time in understanding this anatomy although in a, in a cadaver uh skull based surgery practice much easier than trans uh, ventricular practice because of the the, the ventricles sometimes are collapsed but it's very very good to understand for you if you use a lot to formally for example understanding the intraventricular anatomy, although you don't simulate surgery because that is going to affect your surgery. So understanding, uh, for example, the uh, superior choroidal vein, I'm going to the body of the phonics, the thalamus, um, exactly what those structures are, where, how to get in, that's extremely important. Um, the, the positioning, um, I, the, heads, the patient heads is fixed in the pinion, as usual. Um, the, the, in some, most of surgeons, they will use the head at, at zero degree of orientation and slightly flex, and flex it and elevate the above level of the head to decrease intracranial pressure. Um, there are possible two craniotomy, one is a square one and one is a triangular. And usually the opening is center on the typical point is like two, three centimeters anterior to the corona suture, two, two centimeters lateral to the midline, right? Uh, I don't particularly like this position, but that's, that's just my preference. I, I like instead of this uh, lateral, um, lateral position because of the head lateral, I mean, not lateral, the supine with the head uh, um, um, uh, uh, rotating on the other side, because that allows me to work with two hands. And with this one, basically, I can uh, reach any, any digital at that level, particularly because I go from contralateral on the other side, the die allows me that allows me to work with two hands, left and right, no one hand on top of the other, like I would do in this area. So I prefer this one. And this one I, it allows me to use the gravity as well, which I, again, my point is really trying to use the least brain attraction as possible. So I, I've been using this one for many years and I still like it as opposed to the other one. It, these are the main advantages, visualization, eyes are horizontal, gravity, um, hand coordination, surgeon comfort, of course, so that's why I prefer this one. Um, the, the dura, basically, once you do the opening, whether you do a, a square or the triangle, basically the dura opening is based on a 
subito such the sinus, which you try and try the best not to damage, but you still need to be prepared to uh, repair a surgical a, 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 a tear on a sagittal sagittal, sagittal sinus. Um, damage of the sinus, of course, uh, you, you, of course, you know, is more, uh, is more uh, forgiven uh, if it's anterior, less forgiven if it's posterior, particularly for uh, uh, venous ischemic events. Um, so that's why you have to be very much prepared. We do a lot of training for this. Actually, even the medical book camp, the last series, we had a beautiful simulation um, uh, system just to, to train people how to repair sagittal sinus uh, tears just in case they occur. Um, and after the right frontal lobe has been protected, as you see with the, with the cottonoids, it generally I use a, a retractor to gently retract the, 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 the frontal lobe. And then you have to cut any arachnoid over bridging veins. And, uh, but if you can just preserve the bridging vein as much as you can, it's good. And you should just cut this bridging vein just when it's absolutely needed because you don't have space, but just yeah, you're on a you know, surgical trajectory, basically. Um, and for example, in, in case of the, in this case, we would be imitating a collar cyst. Um, I rather approach this one from the right lateral ventricle instead of using an interphonesial approach. Interphonesia, you go in between the two phonesics, phonesis, um, particularly because, you know, the obvious problem of memory loss, complication. So I particularly like just going through a lateral ventricle. And it's easy to identify the corpus callosum because it's whitish and uh, it's got whitish appearance, as opposed to the rest of the field. And usually the incision in corpus callosum is approximately 1.5 centimeters long. And that allows you a good access in within, inside the ventricle. Once you enter the ventricle, again, the anatomy is very important. It's, it's important the surgeon needs to to find all the identify and recognize all the structure, which are the core plexus, the thalamus triad vein, the anterior septal vein, and the anterior caudal vein vein. These are all important structure in issue because they, they the, once you identify, they, they orient you, they orient the surgeon in the, in, within the ventricle. And believe me, if you are not experienced, it's very easy to get lost and to even misplace, misunderstand one ventricle for the other. So, Experience uh, is very important. That's why training is very important. Um, sometimes the bulge, when, you, when you're dealing with the color, it's the bulge is very, very evident. Um, but it's very, still very important to identify the structure to become oriented at the beginning, in particular to identify the formings, because that's the one is more prone to complications, more the major source of complication when you do this kind of approach. And after you do an incision, um, uh, it's in case of colloid cysts, it's very, the incision is made in the cyst itself through the, um, particularly see the bulging and caused by the cyst in, within and through the foramen model. Uh, but again, it's simple technically, but it's very complicated uh, because uh, it's, diff it's very easy to get lost. If you don't identify, if you don't know the structure at the beginning, some of the structure might be distorted by lesions. So understanding the normal anatomy is extremely helpful, helpful particularly in, a, in when the anatomy is distorted. And I use contralateral approach, a transcalosa approach. The position is the same because it allows me a much, it's more for, a, for a exposure purposes because on the other side, as you can see, I have a much better visualization. If I, Taking advantage of the gravity in this position, a surgical position, I have the, the brain is just automatically um, goes down a little bit. So I have a much an obstruct, more an obstructive view, and I can encompass the entire legion at that, legion at that level. So I go underneath the fox basically, and I make an incision inside the corpus callosum on the other side. Transcortical, as I mentioned before, um, I use sparingly, uh, particularly for the complication, potential for complication. Um, I use mostly the, the, the interhemispheric transcalosal. Um, it's one of the advantage only of transcortical, the indication I would say particularly is that uh, uh, when the, 
the lateral ventricle is enlarged, it's much easier to find, to locate it. But still, you have to go to the transcostal. And this is a, it is still a good alternative to interinspheric. Uh, and usually, you go to the middle frontal gyrus. Uh, and usually, it can be achieved with a small prefin uh, type of craniotomy, which is only three centimeters, uh, always from the midline and two centimeters in front of the coronal suture. Basically, the same as we've seen before. The location is very easy if you are very much uh, oriented because you've done external ventricular drainage. The transcortical route, as far as access and exposure, is uh, it provides an excellent exposure of the, in this case, still a call assist, for example, uh, and, and, uh, particularly for the angle of the exposure. But the disadvantage of the approach, as I was mentioning, is the incision, which is on the cortex. And, and the bus, it, it has to be made, and there is a, a small risk, but still a risk of uh, for post operative seizure after that. That's why I still favor the, the intermesphere transcalosis. Um, I don't know if we have any time left just to cover some uh, trauma surgery. Um, just briefly, we see some epidural, subdural hematoma, for example. Um, the, um, the, the evacuation of extra axial hematomas after trauma, it, it can be a life saving intervention, intervention. That's why it's extremely important. Um, there is no absolute cutoff time after which patient become worse. It's very difficult to predict when a patient is getting really worse. Um, some is a very controversial study out there. There are actually some com a conflict study, uh, but some studies have demonstrated better outcomes with the earlier evacuation. Um, surgical planning is very important, uh, particularly if it's the presence of other intracranial lesion and uh, according to the patient clinical status. And then, of course, the patient polytraumatized. You have to take into account the hemodynamic status and the coagulopathy, all this kind of stuff. But let's keep ourselves purely technical. Uh, this is indication for surgery, so this is something more clinical. I don't want to go into just briefly. I mean, everybody knows when in neurosurgical handbooks, when the, the volume is more than 30 cubic centimeters, or there is a midline shift more than five mil, equal or more than five centimeters. Glasgow Coma Scale minus eight. This is a strong indication. Uh, a phase system and the neurological status deteriorating a very uh, absolute indication for surgery. For epidural, for a subdural hematoma, same thickness more than 10, equal or more than 10 millimeters. Middle end shift, which is a very typical feature, the same as the epidural, is more than five millimeters. Uh, with the oncol herniation possible, that's very important. Just one, uh, in particular, if you have uh, acid asymmetric pupils, which they show you that there's some uh, very high, high intracranial pressure, there is uh, oncol herniation at that level, or there is a neurological worsening by two or more points of GSCS. But uh, <clears throat> again, you guys are very familiar with this, so I don't, I don't want to get into it. The position it is pretty straightforward. We have seen so far which the supine position for tenor approach is the one really will, uh, uh, will be the best position for all this evacuation. Skin incision, usually it goes all the way from the anterior to the tragus. In this case, we go a little bit more because it's like a question mark is of course what you do for the typical pterion incision, go a little bit more posterior. Um, it's like a reverse question mark. Um, a other skin incision can maybe utilize to evacuate the smaller hematomas, however, but you know, usually the best one I would strongly suggest to do is still a, like a, a little bit bigger incision, uh, curbing a little bit more posterior. Because sometimes you know it's difficult to predict maybe some degree of brain swelling at this level. So in that case, you have a little bit more exposure. The you, you remember in this case you you need to have a rapid evacuation. Time is very important. In particular cases, very in particular cases are very dramatic. So in that case, you want to do one single uh, skin flap and uh, um, the temporized muscle together with skin is elevated simultaneously. And that gives you much uh, control time, actually make you 
much faster. This is the case in which you might want to place more, more than one bubbles in different locations of the around along the skin, uh, the skin skirting, the skin flap, for example. You know, in case of epidural hematoma, you can appreciate immediately the, the black collection as soon as you lift the bone flap. And usually this one has to be evacuated properly, but the, the first thing you really want to do, the source of the bleeding should be addressed as quickly as possible. And either usually with a bipolar cautery uh, on the vessel or bone wax on the band on the foramen spinosum or where the vessel is entering the cranium basically. You know? So early identification of the, um, the bleeding, the source of bleeding is very important. And again, once you in epidural hematoma, once you take out the bone flap, you can see immediately the collection of the blood. blood. So instead, in presence of a subdural hematoma, the collection is not so obvious. So the dura has to be open as quickly as possible to to allow access to 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 as much as the subdural space as possible in a very small time in, in within the, the exposure of the craniotomy. So time is very important and time particularly we have it in, in some dramatic situation. So the, the dura the, the dura has to open as quick as possible. Closure as we do close usually the, the typical closure would be like the cranial plating. Uh, in the past we used to go for wires, but now it's still you know in cranial plating and usually you can put a stuck up suture. Um, uh, there is a central epidural tucking stitch right in the middle of the bone flap, basically, to secure the dura layer directly to the bone flap, and then avoid the, the, the dead space underneath to be potential uh, accumulation uh, of, uh, of blood. Uh, drain, as we mentioned before. So decompressing craniectomy. Um, there is a, there's been accumulating evidence in, the, in recent years to support the use of decompressive craniectomy, craniectomy um, for traumatic brain injury. Um, and some other, some other indication as well be for large cerebral infarction, for example, which can be uh, can produce like severe edema and mass effect. Um, there are two types of decompressive craniectomies. One is the frontotemporal parietal occipital the compressive AMI craniectomy. And usually this procedure is mostly indicated for a traumatic lesion or edema concentrated in one hemisphere with the middle line shift and with risk of the own herniation. So if you have a, a, a imminent risk of your herniation, you can see like your pupil anisocoric and stuff like that is a very strong indication for a decompressed cranial craniectomies. Um, this is a typical frontal temporal parietal occipital craniectomy. The patient is uh, pushing position supine as usual, and the head is security with the still with a three point um, uh, head holder and is turned to a minimum 60 degree, degree on the other side. Ideally, it would be like 90 degree. Um, and usually, you know, it's always advisable to put a roll underneath the ipsilateral shoulder. To avoid some the 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 the, um, the turning on that will cause some uh, uh, venous engorgement as usual. The opening again is the same as before, but will be extending further posteriorly. Usually, it starts at the level of the zygomatic arch in one centimeter in front of the tragus, as we see in many skin incision for anterolateral uh, skin flap. And it stands superiorly and posteriorly in the same reverse question mark uh, fashion we've seen before. And then uh, ends anteriorly and uh, still at the uh, mid pupillary line on the same size. The burr hole, as before, this be at least 12, 15 centimeters in the diameter. Many burr holes are placed along the, the, the bone flap, a bit the skin flap incision. That because it will allow the, the brain to expand, and that would be the main point just to release the pressure, intracranial pressure. 
and the bone dissection usually is extending inferiorly. There is a new trend now. Some people have been advocating doing the same dissections in a skull-based fashion, opening the arachnoid just to uh, facilitate the uh, facilitate the expansion of the brain, particularly in the presence of um, great degree of brain swelling. But there's no really scientific study which has been uh, uh, confirming that. But some people still do it. They're strongly advocating the use of the same technique as a, as a as a as in skull base open up the arachnoid. There is some rationale actually, but there's no scientific evidence for that. Um, so once you when you do the decompressed cranectomy, the dura is open, the surface of the brain usually is inspected for a subdural hematoma. And they, of course, if they are present, it should be evacuated. Uh, usually the, uh, it's better to do a duroplasty. Uh, usually you can do duroplasty with uh, autogenous material like pericranium or synthetic, but usually be implants, for example. It is very important doing a duroplasty in this case, because otherwise it is obvious because you want to make sure the brain is expanding and relieving the, the intracranial pressure. The pericranium can be harvested easily from uh, its um, galleal attachment with a sharp dissection, just using a max bound. Um, if the pericranium is damaged, for example, in polytrauma patient or contaminated, in that case, you can use an artificial implant. So this is this is very simple, small technique. I don't want to go too much into detail, but usually it's better, usually the, you don't put back the bone flap in this case, and that's why it's important to do an incision in the right lower quadrant of the abdomen. And usually because that's where you place the bone flap uh, which is introduced into the subcutaneous pocket, basically you create it with a scissor. And the skin at this level should be closed in at least two layers uh, because you want to avoid infection on the bone flap. Uh, the other thing, the other fashion we decompress the craniotomy would be like a bifrontal, which basically follows the same, same guidelines as far as technique, the one we're using for the bicoronal, um, Unifront, I mean, bifrontal, uh, sub, uh, bilateral, subfrontal approach. The only difference is that this skin incision will be a little bit more posterior, basically will pass the corona suture. Um, and, and again, there are very different techniques to make this uh, skin, uh, the bone flap, bone opening. Uh, the one mostly common, you are starting the same with the uh, inside the temporalis fossa, and then going to the, through the burrow, we in the puterional. And usually it's a lot of people at different fashion. People do a borehole directly on a sagittal sinus. I still prefer to do to place the two boreholes on both sides to be able to control the sinus properly. But again, if you even if you do the same on top of the sinus with a good cranial to a more perforator, you'll be able to achieve the same result. And most important to do is as open as possible, I mean as wide as possible to allow the brain to. Uh, relieve the pressure basically and you do at the end same duraplasty as we described before um, I close I want to close now uh, just by uh, reminding everybody just a quick message of course I was difficult to go through an entire spectrum on your surgical approach is only three hours I, I, I try to give like a, not only give some overview of the approaches by I try with this lecture to spark some interest in uh, young people and make sure they understand the message of practice and practice, particularly now that you're young and try to do everything, learn everything. And just, I know, take with a pinch of salt, maybe not listen too much. If people are too dogmatic, say, oh, you don't need to do that when you're going to do it, because eventually there might be a point in your career in which you need to use that little nuance, that little surgical technique which you wish you had learned before when you were young. That's why I strongly emphasize, now that you got the time and the patient, believe me, you see later on, um, the time is very important to learn any possible technique and then just uh, practice a lot because everybody can do it. As you see this little kit, but you need, everybody can draw in between a ocular model and a carotid, but you need some practice if you want to avoid disaster. And the other thing, that's why I say always, train, train, train the lab. And again, I see many labs around the country and beautiful labs. It is sad sometimes I see they are not used properly or they are not used at all. 
Why I see people random go there for some dissections is shame because it's an incredible, incredible, invaluable resource for any neurosurgical department. And as a resident in the future, try to always find some time to pass by that lab every hour. Practice your skills with some rationale. Do not just go there, just mess up with those cadavers. Remember, those cadavers are very difficult to come by, very expensive, and it's very important. And the other quick message, oh, I don't find anybody with this one. But what I want to say is just nowadays it is a lot, it's so fashionable. Everything we follow fashion just to make some fame, just get some fame out, just make minimal invasive. Everything has to be minimal invasive. Just, but just think about the patient, right? Sometimes this is a message I got years, years ago. And again, I hope I don't offend anybody. But uh, years ago from Dr. Ammerf, you remember the first lecture, it'd be like 20 years ago, that he, he said, if you really want to enjoy it, sometimes you have to open that door. I mean, you really need to just make sure that you open. Sometimes bone dissection is not being invasive, but you need to use the bone flap opening take out the support of the bone to allow the brain just to relax together with a good surgical position a dissecting the, the arachnoid properly and mobilize structure all together will make your dissection, your surgery much safer and much more successful. All right, thank you very much for your attention. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world. And so we're gonna talk some, a little bit about some of the less invasive options as well. Uh, what you see on the left is the NeuroPACE device, which is a neurostimulation device. Um, uh, it's similar to a defibrillator in the heart. Uh, on the top right, you can see that's a uh, focused ultrasound. That's a, a newer technology that actually doesn't involve any kind of incision on the scalp. Um, and then the bottom right is a uh, laser ablation. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about each of those. And the neuropace and the laser ablation are things that we do here at UCI very commonly. Um, and I understand that the, with focused ultrasound, we should be getting that when we get our new hospital in the next few years. So we'll talk a little bit about that newer technology. So. With regards to neuromodulation, we have three devices that we use. There's responsive neurostimulation, deep brain stimulation, and vagus nerve stimulation. So with responsive neurostimulation, as I mentioned before, if you imagine that a, a patient, we, we do all the invasive monitoring and we see that the patient has seizures and let's say their language area are very close to one another. Well, obviously if we remove that area, they'll have a language problem. And you know that, that's a functional deficit that we obviously never wanna give our patients. Up until about 2013, before that time, we had no options available for those patients. So we would tell them, you know, unfortunately we can't do anything to treat this. But thankfully, since the time and the development of responsive neurostimulation, we've actually been able to really help this very difficult and challenging group of patients. So the way that it works is that we implant those electrodes onto the area where we know seizures are coming from. And then we also implant the battery into the skull as well. And the device is constantly listening for seizures. This is a true closed loop system in that it's listening for seizures. And as you can see here, when it sees that a seizure is developing, it'll send a electro electrical stimulation and that can either abort or shorten the seizure. And uh, really it's become a, a major, major, uh, help for us because, again, as I mentioned, prior to this, we had no real options available for patients with this type of epilepsy. This was a paper that we wrote a, a couple of years back looking at um, our experience using the robot as well as the NeuroPACE device. And we've done it now on over 25 patients and we've had really great success with that. Now I'm going to talk about deep brain stimulation. And interestingly, even though it's a very different stimulation pattern, a different area that we're stimulating, the long-term outcomes have shown, been shown to be very similar. And so with this device, we're actually targeting the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. So it's a very specific area. And what you see here is this, this is important to look at because um, over time you see that the seizure reduction in patients actually improves. So we go from 50% reduction in the first year, all the way up to 70%. 
we know that at around nine years, we actually see about 75% reduction in seizures by about 50%. Now, with all the neuromodulatory devices, I forgot, I didn't mention this earlier, but one of the important things to think about is that we're not, our goal is not necessarily to make patients seizure free. Our goal is to reduce the seizure burden, uh, especially if we can get it below 50% of what their baseline is. Um, because of the type of the nature of the disease and, and because of the type of stimulations we're doing, it's very rare that we get patients who become seizure free with this type of device. Although we have been uh, fortunate to have some patients actually develop that. And then the last option is vagus nerve stimulation. This is our oldest device. We've had this for about 30 years. Um, we basically implant a generator in the left chest wall and then uh, place a small lead over the vagus nerve, <clears throat> again, in the left uh, neck. Uh, with this type of device, we, we tell patients that about 50% of patients get a 50% reduction in their seizures. And so, again, we don't fully understand how these devices work, but we do know that um, it is better than medication because we know that once you fail two or three medications, the likelihood of becoming seizure-free with medication alone pretty much goes down to zero. Um, laser ablation is another very exciting and uh, novel treatment that we have available to us in epilepsy surgery. This is an actual patient that we did at UCI. And what you see here is that there's essentially a pinhole opening that we have. Um, when, we, when we remove it, we just put one staple in that hole, and that's actually how we close that, that incision. Really, the benefit here is that it's minimally invasive. Uh, it... it um, it requires us to go to the MRI machine because it actually is performing that ablation in real time. We use the MRI as an actual um, uh, real time observation of the, the ablation. And then one of the very nice parts of it is that we can actually get to very deep parts of the brain and uh, avoid damaging any of that collateral tissue, which is very important, um, especially when I show you some of these lesions that we've, we've treated. So what you can see here on the left is mesial temporal sclerosis. So with that procedure, we actually place the laser fiber from a posterior approach. And then we go right down the barrel of the hippocampus and the amygdala, and we can perform a very nice uh, oblong type ablation, usually in the range of three to four centimeters. The, the middle uh, graphic you see is a perinodular heterotopia. And just like you can imagine, to get to that point um, with open surgery does create a lot more collateral damage to the brain, to the surrounding tissue. And, uh, and so by doing it this way with a very small fiber, we can address these, these areas without actually doing open surgery and, and potentially injuring normal tissue. And the, what you see on the right there, that to me is the ideal use for this uh, laser ablation. So Hypothalamic heterotopias are very difficult to treat. Um, if you imagine that a, uh, a basketball, and if you imagine that right in the center of that basketball is a small tic-tac, that is like the, the, it's very similar to how a hypothalamic heterotopia works in that, you know, open surgery requires us to traverse essentially the entirety of the brain from above to get down to that area. And any injury to the hypothalamus can cause significant and long-term uh, endocrine disorders. Whereas if you look here, you can see that with this very small fiber, we can get all the way down to that hypothalamus and treat that area without causing any collateral damage. Positioning for lumbar surgery. The thing I want, want to notice is that the bed has been what we call reversed or the, the normal head of the bed has been placed on the longer side. And what this does, it allows more room in between the base and the arms to get a, a fluoroscope in underneath and localize for surgery. The other thing I wanna call your attention to is how the arms are positioned. So in this position, he's a little bit too extended. This is gonna uh, cause increased risk for both ulnar and axillary nerve palsies postoperatively, so we wanna minimize that. You're gonna bring his arm into a more neutral position or what we call Superman, and you wanna think 90 degrees here and 90 degrees here. So if he's like that, he's gonna be much more comfortable. We're also gonna provide additional padding over his elbow here and pad the ulnar nerve. And that is gonna pad two things actually. So one, when the C arm comes up, if the image intensifier rests against his arm here, it can hit his ulnar nerve here, but it can also compress the radial nerve and the radial groove along the humerus here. This morning, it is my sincere pleasure to welcome our esteemed visiting professor, Dr. Robert Spetzler. Thank you, thank you.
neurosurgery has undergone extreme innovation in my lifetime. It's truly remarkable. And I'm really excited to spend time here today reflecting on this and meeting all of you. Before we start, Dr. Spetzler, I just want to say I really admire the, the great institution you built in Arizona. It's truly phenomenal. The absolute best anyone has ever seen. Why, thank you, Donald. That is very kind of you. Donnie, shut up and let the man speak. Go to sleep, Joe. It's important to acknowledge greatness. Like you, Dr. Spetzler, I, too, want to build something great and fantastic along the southern border of Arizona. The people of Arizona will say it's the most magnificent thing they've ever seen. It will be the BNI of border security. Donald, that's enough about the wall. Let's please get back to business. Dr. Spetzler has a lot to cover. Hey, did Dr. Spetzler ask about me?